Chapter 23 A similar thing had happened to Jason on Duro three years back. At the time, he had been helping a group of Rin refugees fit a synth-plast dome over the prefabricated building that was to be their shelter. This time, he was off on his own in the middle distance, picking his way downhill to a still pool on the floor of a narrow valley. Jaina? On Duro, he had passed out and fallen, knocking himself unconscious. This time, a forest creeper swept his feet out from under him, and he pitched forward, sliding face first on muddy ground and sodden, deflated leaves, until he managed to somersault himself onto his back and extend his hands to the sides. He was still meters from the valley floor when he arrested his descent, but his lightsaber fell prey to momentum and soared free of the cloth belt that cinched his robe. Tumbling end over end through the air, it arced into the depths of the ice-fringed pool below. Jason leapt to his feet and vaulted to the water's edge. Focusing on the center of the concentric waves that were spreading across the pool, he immersed himself in the force and stretched out his right hand. The tubular alloy hand grip emerged vertically from the water, but not alone. It was held in the upraised four-fingered hand of Verger. Seacoat's thought projection of the diminutive Fosh, at any rate, looking much younger than the piebald, short-feathered Verger Jason had come to know in Coruscant. Her willowy ears and pair of corkscrewing antennae appeared smaller, and her slanted eyes were radiant with wonder. The splayed feet of her reverse-articulated legs rested just on the surface of the agitated pool. "'Lose something, Jason?' Seacoat asked through Verger's wide mouth. Not for the first time. His exhalations formed clouds in the chill air. It's not like you to stumble. My sister Jaina is in danger. I forgot to look where I was going. How often will you allow yourself to be distracted by the dangers she faces? This was Verger as remembered by Seacoat, Jason thought, in contrast to the Verger who had sacrificed her life at Ebak Nine to save him and Jaina. As often as necessary, he said. We're twins and strongly bonded. What if you were faced with the choice of saving your twin or your uncle? Which do you serve? I serve the Force. The Force would guide you to the correct decision. Why else would I serve it? Insubstantial Verger extended the lightsaber to him. Reclaim your weapon. He called the lightsaber to him and wedged it into the belt of his now muddy robe. The handle was wet and cold, as were his hands, which he rubbed briskly together. Zonama Seacoat had completed a second trial jump without sustaining severe damage. R2-D2 had calculated that the planet was on the galactic ecliptic, close to the Risi system in the inner rim, were the frontier of that arbitrary zone to be extended into the unknown regions. One more jump through hyperspace, and Zonama Seacoat could be back in known space. Verger seemed to be watching him. Do you use your lightsaber to slash or to heal? That's always been the dilemma. Jason lowered himself to the ground. Broad shafts of sunlight flooded through the giant Boris, dappling the leaf duff and dazzling the surface of the pool. Insects skimmed the water and bombinated around him. Were you searching for something here? Only answers. As to how best to end the pain, suffering, and death that the war has brought to the galaxy. You must trust in the Force, Jason, if you are to serve it fully. Being a Jedi isn't just about serving the Force, he said. It's a commitment to valuing all life. Seacoat brought a smile to Verger's whiskered face. You learned that from your mentor, Verger. My guide, Jason amended. My guide to the lands of the dead. My herald of tragedy. Verger learned it from me, Seacoat said, for that is how I felt on being brought to awareness by Lior Hal, the first magister. You wish to reiterate that the Yuzhan Vong are part of life, part of the Force, and therefore must be dealt with accordingly. More to be pitied, if stripped of the force, as you contend, Jason said. Verger's narrow shoulders sagged. I too am searching for answers, Jason, but I do not sympathize with the enemy as you appear to. 
Jason compressed his lips. Because of what Verger guided me through, I've developed a kind of sense for them. A Vong sense. I feel it more strongly here, not only when I speak with Harar, but wherever I go. He touched the hollow space in his chest that had once housed the slave seed Verger had implanted, and he recalled how it felt to have been racked on the embrace of pain, stripped of the force. You are forever lost to the worlds you knew, Verger had told him at the beginning of his process of being remade. Your friends mourn, your father rages, your mother weeps. Your life has been terminated. A line of division has been drawn between you and everything you have ever known. You have seen the Terminator that sweeps across the face of a planet. The twilight division between day and night. You have crossed that line, Jason Solo. The bright fields of day are forever past. By growing to understand you better, I grow to understand our enemy better, Seacoat said. Do you see a contradiction there, Jedi? That depends on whom Seacoat serves. I, too, serve the Force, but as defined by the Potentium, which does not recognize evil except as a label. Magister Lior and the Pharaohans were my guides to consciousness, but it was the far outsiders, the Yuzhan Vong, who taught me that while evil does not exist, evil actions do exist, and it is to those that we must direct ourselves. I had the power to halt the Yuzhan Vong when they approached me fifty years ago, and I have the power to halt them now. My instincts, such as they are, tell me that I have always had power over them. Jason thought about the force punch Seacode had delivered to those aboard Jade Shadow when the ship had first appeared in the Classa Ephemera system. Sanctuary. And you'll exercise that power to defeat them? He asked carefully. If necessary, but without contempt. If I defeat them aggressively, if I hate them for who they have become, then I will have separated myself from the Force, and permitted my ego to triumph over my desire to merge and expand my consciousness. I will have corrupted the light with my darkness, stained it forever. Self-awareness tricks us into believing that there is us, and that there is the other. But in serving the Force, we recognize that we are all the same thing, that when we act in accordance with the Force, we act in accordance with the wish of all life to enlarge itself, to rise out of physicality and become something greater. In that sense, all living beings are seed partners, Jason, passionate to unite with all life and to help give birth to grand enterprises. Whether a starship, a work of art, or a deed that will echo through history as a noble action, I am no different than you in wanting to play a part in the evolution of the spirit. My consciousness yearns for this. Easier said than done, Jason said. Yes, it is a matter of balance, but we are balancing the universe constantly with every action we take, some tipping it one way, some another. To triumph over the Yuzhan Vong, we must simply go where we wish to go. That is also what I must do to return us to known space. But the task entails far more than simply focusing on a set of hyperspace coordinates. Unless the destination is a place I wish to go, nothing will work out. Even if I execute the jump flawlessly, my actions will come to nothing. For your interest, Jason, that is something that Verger taught me. Jason was listening too intently to respond. Verger had set him on the path to remaking himself, but unless he could complete the process, he would be ensnared by the very self-conscious uncertainties Seacoat professed to have grown past, and prevented from merging fully with the Force. We must approach the turning points in our lives with purity of heart, Seacoat was saying. 
We must look beyond ourselves, and when we see danger approaching or a difficult choice ahead, we must calm ourselves well in advance, so that we can navigate with a clear mind. Once we have mastered the technique, we can learn to trust that we're doing the right thing without thinking about it. Do you know where you want to go? Jason asked when he realized that Seacoat was waiting for him to say something. By analyzing Yuzhan Vong Biotech, by what I intuited from Nen Yim, I have learned much about augmenting Zonama's hyperspace cores with energy derived from the planet itself. And the success of the trial jumps has encouraged me that I can safely return Zonama to known space. I begin to understand how the Yuzhan Vong created what they call Dovin Basils, Villips, Yamisks, and other biotes. Or perhaps I begin to remember. But I am worried about the potentially calamitous or destabilizing effects Zonama's sudden appearance could have on any planet in close proximity to our emergence. From records stored in the Chiss Library, Jason and Saba had learned of the widespread seismic devastation Zonama Seacoat had caused on Manlali Mafia, standard decades earlier, not only to the planet, but to the indigenous Jostrans and Krizlaws as well. My uncle thought you might be worried about that, Jason said. He was going to tell you himself that you shouldn't be. Verger glided toward him across the water and ice. Tell me what Master Skywalker has in mind. Chapter 24 Kalua's reddish sun was cresting the ridgeline, limbing the crowns of the tallest trees and warming the air. Leia began to rub her hands together, but stopped when she realized that the chill she felt had nothing to do with the temperature. North of the trail, in an area of trees that were snapped in half, the team had come upon a crashed coral skipper. The craft's translucent, mica-like canopy was cracked, and inside the cavity that served as a cockpit sat the dead pilot. The cognition hood that was the pilot's living interface with the coral skipper was shriveled and stuck to his face like a sheet of flimsoplast. Han was squatting on the craft's blunt nose, poking at a deep red heart-shaped mass studded with pale blue projections that had dropped from the fractured fuselage. Dovin Basil's dead, he said. Same with the rock spitters, Kip replied. The Jedi Master was circling the craft while Raw and Sasso inspected the cockpit. Page, Furfur, and Malok were scouting the forest to the north in the direction of Kalula City. The Timbus were grazing contentedly nearby. Han stood up, put the edge of his hand to his brow, and gazed at the splintered trees. Came in from that direction. He pointed to a depression some distance away. Hit the ground there, plowed its way through those bushes, and came to a stop here. Kip completed his circle of the craft, nodding his head. Only question is, what brought it down? Kalula Orbital, what else? Kip regarded the coral skipper. No signs of laser fire from batteries or starfighter cannons. Han's forehead wrinkled. Can't be. He ducked down to appraise what he could of the underside, then stood up. Must have caught a bolt straight through the canopy. No signs of that either, Sasso said, jumping down to the ground. Han looked at Kip. Could have been stunned by an ion cannon. He let his words trail off when he realized the impossibility of it. No craft comes down the gravity well at terminal velocity and ends up looking like this one. Kip nodded in agreement. From the way the trees are sheared off and the depth of the initial impact crater, the skip couldn't have been higher than three hundred meters. A patrol craft, Sasso said. That would explain why there's no heat damage. Han turned to the Rodian. Could one of your people have shot it down? Someone in the resistance? Sasso shook his head. We don't have the weapons for that. Raw leapt down from the cockpit. So what happened? 
It suffered heart failure. Han made his lips a thin line and shrugged. Maybe with the Yuzhan Vong devoting almost everything they have to the Armada, they've exiled their shoddiest biotes and least experienced warriors to worlds like Kalula. He laughed ruefully. They're in even worse shape than we are. No, Kip said. Only here are they in worse shape. Leia listened to them trying to convince themselves that there was a reasonable explanation for the crashed craft and the inept warriors they had ambushed. But in fact, lack of genuine explanations had everyone on edge. Worried that the team was under surveillance, no one had slept the previous night. In the morning they had made a decision to abandon the trail and bushwhack through the thick forest in the hope of avoiding detection. That they hadn't seen any reconnaissance biotes or evidence of foot patrols had only added to the suspicion that they were being led into a trap. Then their purposefully meandering path had brought them to the coral skipper. You know what could have happened, Han was saying. The Yamask could have steered it wrong. I can see that, Sasso said. I can even see that a crash like this could take out the pilot and the Dovin basil. But why would the cognition hood die? Do the hoods feed off the basils? He stared at the coral skipper. I spent more time trying to avoid them than study them. Our daughter could explain it, Han said. She's actually piloted a vessel like this. Jaina. A sense of deep concern flooded through Leia, but before she could begin to make sense of it, Han was yelling something at Raw. Leia saw that the Bothan had clambered back to the cockpit and was making sketches of the interior. Something to show the grandchildren, Raw said when Han demanded to know what he was doing. Grandchildren, you'll be lucky to even have kids of your own. Raw closed the sketch pad. If I do, I know I'll have sense enough to keep them out of the war. Han advanced on the Bothan with menacing familiarity. I'm going to have to teach you the ways of the world before this is over. Leia could see that Kip was ready to step between them, but the confrontation went no further. He's Karelian, Kip said quietly to Ra while Han was walking away. They don't make idle threats. Ra only sniggered. Sasso left to find Malok, Page, and Furfur. Han, Leia, and Kip were gathering the timbus when Han said, You realize we're being reeled in? Kip nodded. It's probably been that way from the beginning. But that doesn't mean we still can't pull this mission off. We just have to watch our backs. Speaking of which, did intelligence run backgrounds on Sasso and Furfur? You'd have to check with Raw. I do know that both of them joined the Resistance before the Yuzhan Vong showed up in the Kalula system. Sasso even served on Kalula Orbital for a while. So at least we're not being sold to the Vong. As far as I can tell. Sasso's whistled signal wafted into the clearing, and several moments later he, Page, the Wren, and Malok stepped from the trees. In her sucker-tipped hands, the Hodin cradled a dozen or so insects, delicately winged and equipped with large bioluminescent eye spots. She set them on the ground, then sat down beside them. They're dead, she announced in an anguished tone. The entire forest is littered with bodies. In most cases, they died inside their shells. Others appear to have died in flight. All of them? Leia asked, nonplussed. Malok shook her head. But the survivors are moving very lethargically. She gazed at Leia and the others. Something terrible has happened here. Han and Kip traded dark glances. Let's get moving, Page told everyone. Several hours of mostly downhill trudging brought Team Malok to a low ridge that overlooked the southern portion of Kalula City and the prominent hive-like Yuzhan Vong Minchao that harbored the Yanisk. There are three entrances, Sasso explained from the spot of cover the team found. Two in the front, and one on the east side. All of them are dilating membranes that can be pierced by blaster bolts. Guards are stationed at each, usually three or four at any given time. 
They stand long shifts, so it would be to our advantage to strike at sundown, just when the afternoon shift is ending. The garrison is made up of about seventy-five warriors. There's also a commander, his subaltern, at least one priest, and one of those long-tressed technicians. A shaper, Leia said. The Rodian nodded. As for the Yamask, I don't know how to kill it, but I'm guessing you have some idea. Leave that to me, Kip said. It's important that we take out their villop communications while we're at it, Page added. Leia gazed out over the flat rooftops of the simple city. Judging by the position of the sun, the team was in for a long wait. Furfer volunteered to find a place to conceal the Timbus. He rose, but had scarcely moved off when a gurgling exclamation of surprise rang from just inside the tree line. Everyone whirled at once to see the wren staggering toward them, his belly opened like a ripe fruit. Behind him emerged four relatively short and dark-complected Yuzhan Vong warriors. Han shot Leia the briefest of astonished looks and drew his blaster. Page did the same with his rifle, but he hadn't even lifted it to firing position when it was whipped from his grip by one of the longest amphistaffs Leia had seen, and hurled through the air like a twig. Sasso was already charging the enemy wielding the amphistaff, but he didn't get three meters when the warrior leapt over him and, on landing, whirled and thrust a kufi deep into the Rodian's back. Kip and Leia ignited their lightsabers at the same instant. Continuous fire from Han and Ra had driven two of the warriors to the ground, but neither had been hit. Kip raced for the nearest one, catching the warrior across the chest with a powerful upswing of his blade. The Yuzhan Vaughn growled and rolled, but his dark, unarmored flesh showed only a shallow, bloodless furrow. Kip whirled and brought the blade down like an axe. Evading the strike, the warrior rose to one knee and unfurled his amphistaff. The serpent-like creature elongated and wrapped itself around the hilt of the lightsaber. But Kip wasn't about to surrender his weapon. In a virtual tug-of-war with the creature, he spun and backflipped, but to little effect. At the same time, a second amphistaff lassoed him around the waist and arms and yanked him roughly to the ground. Han put three bolts into the second warrior, driving him two steps backward with each, but without killing him or persuading the amphistaff to loosen its constricting hold on Kip. Han yelled for Raw's help, but in a glance saw that the Bothan was trying desperately to keep the other pair of warriors from grabbing Page. Without really thinking about it, Leia judged that Han and Kip were in great jeopardy. Holding her blade at her right hip and pointed slightly downward, she moved against the warrior whose amphistaff was flinging Kip from side to side. Han felt rather than saw Leia race past him. Leia! he screamed, firing constantly while he rushed to catch up with her. A quartet of bolts hold the warrior Leia had targeted but at once the other warrior commanded his amphistaff to withdraw from the pommel of Kip's lightsaber and fly toward Leia. Seeing what was coming, Han dived forward in a frantic attempt to place himself between Leia and the attenuating weapon. Leia watched in horror as the amphistaff struck Han solidly in the neck, and not merely with its rounded head. The jaws of the living weapon gaped, and it sank two long fangs into Han's flesh. Han landed hard on his side, but quickly got to his knees. He managed to squeeze off three more bolts before the blaster slipped from his trembling hand. He slumped backward on his heels in shock, then tipped to one side, his body curling inward, with his shaking hands close to his chest. Kip raced forward, only to be set upon by three of the warriors. Leia's mouth fell open in a silent scream. She dropped the lightsaber and ran to Han. Gazing in horror at the twin punctures in his neck, she viced his spasming right hand between hers. Han, she cried, Han! Melok was suddenly by her side, lifting Han's head from the ground. His face was a bloodless mask of pain and sorrow. I knew from the start this wasn't my war, he stammered. Twin rivulets of blood coursed from the wounds in his neck. Han, Leia said, wide-eyed with terror. She looked up at the advancing warriors, two of whom had a tight hold on Kip, almost as if expecting them to come to Han's aid. Instead, one of them dragged her and Malok to their feet. 
No, no, Leia said, shaking her head back and forth. Han extended his hand to her, but the warrior kicked it aside. Han's eyes rolled up, his eyelids fluttered, and his body went limp. No, she screamed, as the warriors were hauling her away. Casualty assessment of the first engagement, Warmaster, Supreme Commander Loyric Khan said, gesturing to a wall niche in the command chamber of Yamka's mount. Nas Choka turned from the observation transparency to study the commotion of blaze bugs. Acceptable, he pronounced after a moment. A clever use of machines, Loyric Khan remarked. The War Master's finely haired upper lip curled, and he glowered at his supreme commander. Another act of cowardice. Stop thinking in terms of the weapons our enemy employ, and concentrate on how they fight. Think of the machines as living beings, if it will help you view the matter with more clarity. Loyric Khan bowed his head. War Master. Nas Choka moved to the blaze bug niche that displayed the disposition of the enemy battle groups. They seek to spare the new capital, Loyric Khan said, but they cannot save it now. Nas Choka beckoned to one of his subalterns. Escort Supreme Commander Loyric Khan from the command chamber. If this war could be won by words of confidence, we would have already vanquished them. The War Master kept his back turned to Khan while he was being led to the chamber's iris membrane. The number of ships is significantly lower than calculated, the chief tactician said when the membrane had resealed itself. Of course, Nas Choka said, trusting to the effectiveness of their deceptions, they decided to keep additional ships in reserve to execute their secondary objectives. Starfighter wings forming up for strikes, a subaltern reported. Nas Choka sniffed. Like a swarm of insects that can't be outdistanced or repelled, the pests can, however, be eradicated. He turned to the female stationed at the Villop Choir. Order domains Vang and Pekin to spray the contaminated areas, then command the Yamasks to spruce up our formations with auxiliary coral skippers. The War Master and the Chief Tactician swung to the transparency to see brilliant plumes of plasma discharged omnidirectionally from the core. Dozens of the small fighters disappeared, and as many others were shocked into submission. Again, Nas Choka ordered. A second torrent of molten death poured from the war vessels, obliterating yet more starfighters. Now assign Yorick Akaga and Yorick Vec to the rear. Let Matalox serve as our spearhead. The subaltern snapped his fist to his shoulders in salute. Warmaster, the Villip Choir tactician interjected judiciously. Communication from Supreme Overlord Shimra. Nas Choka turned to the array and genuflected in front of Shimra's dedicated Villip. Everyone else in the command chamber kneeled with foreheads pressed to the deck. It bodes well, dread lord, Nas Choka began. We will deliver victory to you this day, or die in the attempt. Better for you, War Master, that you die delivering victory. Understood, Lord. Shimra's Villop spoke again. You have my blessing, and the blessings of the gods. Yun Yuzhan and Yun Yamka soar at your sides, as your right and left hands. I sense their presence, great Lord. Does the enemy cower before us? For the moment their fleet holds fast. Then they have mustered the courage to meet us toe-to-toe. -to -toe. It will be their downfall. You have my full confidence, War Master. I leave you to your business. The dedicated villop inverted to its original leathery appearance. Nas Choka rose and paced to the transparency to observe the matched fury of coral skippers and star fighters, Yorick Vec and scimitar bombers. Sav and Krife are fighting with their minds, not their bodies, he said to the chief tactician. They are the smaller individual who engages a larger one. Even if he is swift enough to get inside his opponent's defenses, his hands are too small to cause severe damage, and his muscles lack the power to bring his opponent to his knees, so he plans more carefully. 
Perhaps he goads the bigger warrior to swing first and miss, hoping then to unbalance him with a precisely timed shove or kick to the knee. Or perhaps he brings his equally small friends to stand at his back, and he strikes first, confident that his cohorts will be ready to find openings. He offers them as a distraction, so that when the larger warrior risks a glance to the right, a blow arrives from the left. Nascioka's expression hardened. This battle is not the last stand. It has nothing to do with honor or a willingness to meet death. This is a feint. Fortunately, I have my suspicions about where the would-be surprise blow is coming from. The tactician nodded knowingly. Nascioka turned to the Villip choir mistress. Alert domain groups Shenga, Pasar, Eklut, and Tav. On my command... They will separate from the armada and prepare to go to dark space. She bowed to Tungul and Kalula, and from there to Yuzhantar. Nas Choka sneered, Play with your Villips, mistress. Leave strategy to those who live to fight. He summoned the chief tactician forward. Command her, tactician. To the Perlemian trade route, the slight Yuzhan Vaughn told the Villip mistress and from there to Kantrum. Leia was still in shock when the three surviving warriors led her, Kip, Page, Raw, and Malok into the Yamisk installation. Sasso and Furfur had been left to die in the forest. Han they dragged behind by his wrists like a slaughtered animal. He was alive but unconscious, or comatose, from the venom delivered by the warrior's amphistaff. Even in her dread, however, Leia was not too oblivious to notice that only one weary guard was posted at the Minshal's eastern dilating membrane, and that the membrane itself looked thin and weak, and oozed a viscous liquid. The guard struggled to rise as the trio of warriors approached. Barely strong enough to cross his arms in salute, he said something to them in a feeble voice. He's telling them that the commander is waiting. Page translated quietly. One of the warriors stumbled a bit as they crossed the threshold into the gloomy interior of the Minshal. Oddly, he was the only one of the three who hadn't been wounded during the brief action. Kip noticed the stumble as well. Something's not right. He received a hard jab in the ribs for speaking. Inside, the smell of rot was overpowering. Pools of sallow liquid had collected on the spongy floor and the bioluminescent wall lichen was rashed with black spots. Thousands of dying arachnid-like insects, similar to the ones Leia had seen in the living cofferdam, crawled about in seeming confusion. Dead flit gnats littered the ground. A female shaper was borne into the antechamber on a litter, carried by two more of the squat, dark-complected warriors. Her skin was as pale green as Leia's falsely colored face, and the many-fingered hand that had been grafted to her wrist hung limply at her side. The warriors shoved Leia and the others forward and rolled Han onto his back nearby. Leia's heart leapt when she saw him stir. The shaper was addressing the warriors from atop her litter. She's congratulating them on capturing us, Melok whispered to everyone. She says we will contribute greatly to the sacrifice. The Shaper called two of the troops forward and spent a long moment looking them over, inspecting their faces, limbs, and torsos. One of the warriors indicated a tumor-like growth on his neck and dropped to one knee at the foot of the litter in what appeared to be humiliation. "'What's going on?' Kip asked Malok. She listened for a moment. "'The warrior thinks he has become a shamed one, because his body is rejecting some sort of... Enhancement he received. Melok listened for a moment more, then added, The shaper's telling him that he is not shamed, that the growth of the tumor has nothing to do with the gods and everything to do with this world. Everything to do with Kalula. Kalula? Page repeated in bafflement. The warrior looked relieved. Rising, he drew his kufi and turned toward Leia, only to be restrained by the shaper's touch. He wants to kill us, Malok explained. I got that much, Kip said. 
She's reassuring them that we will die before sunset. That's relief, Ross said. For a minute I thought they were going to let us go. Kip glanced at the Bothan. Get out all your jokes while there's still time. The Shaper was speaking again. Leia recognized the word Yuzhantar. Malok translated. She's ordering the special warriors. The Slayers, she calls them, to return her to Yuz, to Coruscant immediately. She says it's imperative that she apprise her master of what has happened here to render everyone ill. She is promising the Slayers that the commander is going to see to us personally. Yun Harla suckers me in my time of need, a male voice said in basic. The accent was familiar to Leia and clearly to Page, who craned his neck to see who had spoken. A tall, rail-thin Yuzhan Vong elite entered the antechamber, his scarified arms draped in support around the shoulders of two large but plainly enervated warriors. Welcome, Jedi, Hodin, and Bothan, and to you, Captain Page. Did I not promise that I would see you on a funeral pyre? Leia suddenly recalled where she had seen him before, aboard the Yuzhan Vong convoy vessel. It was Commander Malik Carr. Chapter 25 With the Armada's rotation, the distal ends of several tentacles had whipped themselves into ensnaring loops. Starfighters trapped in the loops twisted and swerved to avoid scudding coral skippers, but they were fast running out of maneuvering room. The overwhelmed deflector shields of Jaina's X-Wing were barely viable, and Cappy was probably beyond repair. Each ton of plasma or missile of molten rock landed like a punch. Despite the harnesses that fastened her to the padded seat, she was flung like an insect trapped in a shaking bottle. Singularities yawned to all sides, ready to swallow anything she launched, but that hardly mattered, since the starfighter's fire control computer had yet to shed enough heat to come back online. A numbing explosion jolted the ship. Jaina glanced out the right side of the triangular canopy to see the mated ends of the starboard S-foils disintegrate and the laser cannon go whirling off into space. The power of the blast sent the starfighter into a wing-over-wing -wing roll that the fusial thrusters and attitude jets were unable to correct. Flights of coral skippers pinwheeled in front of her and fireballs geysered inward on spiraling trajectories. The out-of-control tumble reeled her out of a follow-up deluge of plasma from the core formation of capital ships. The E-wings took the brunt of it, along with Ijix Harona's scimitar squadron of highly vulnerable A-wings and Gavin's rogues. Caught by the Inferno, two dozen craft were blown clear of the tentacles, half of them vanishing before they reached clear space. Farther out, star destroyers and attack cruisers raced alongside the Armada, but with so many starfighters churning between them and the enemy war vessels, they couldn't risk firing without destroying countless Alliance craft. Jaina's flailing right hand found the inertial compensator and dialed it to maximum. As the cockpit instruments came back into focus, she saw that the display screens were white with noise. The battle net was unadulterated static. Around a bearing, ecliptic. Jaina tweaked the comm controls to find a clearer frequency. On squadron leaders and withdraw. Withdraw, Jaina thought. Fine for those pilots who could, but scores of fighters were incapacitated, many in worse shape than Twin Suns won. Only by virtue of their marginally intact shields were they bearing up under the constant barrage. Like bar brawlers curled on the floor against repeated kicks from gangs of opponents. Dovan Basil's singularities have been diverted to the forefront of the Armada, Alliance Control was saying. Destroyers will be attacking the flanks in an attempt to induce the Dovan Basils to shift focus, so that Harbinger, Guardian, and Viscount can resume fire. All pilots, try to maintain formation on withdrawal. Rally at 661 Ecliptic with battle groups Iceberg 3 and 4. By then the Armada had moved well past the system's captured comet and was bearing toward Sep Elipor, a ringed gas giant with more than thirty small moons. Auxiliary battle groups in advance of the tentacled cluster were already beginning to disperse, in part to deflect the battle from Moan Calamari itself, 
but also to convey the impression that the Alliance had recognized that it was outmatched and was on the run, determined to save as many of its ships as possible. A third surge of plasma spewed from the Armada core. Jaina called on the exhausted thrusters to propel the X-Wing out of its tumble and through a broad bank. At the same time, she reset the inertial compensator and got her bearings. She was still inside the kill circle of coral skippers and pickets, but Chiss Clawcraft and X-Wings were hammering away at the slowly contracting perimeter, creating exit holes for the trapped starfighters. Jaina saw Jag's Clawcraft destroy three coral skippers in a blur of corkscrewing maneuvers and laser fire. She sent him silent gratitude. With firing zones opening once more, bombers followed the rescued starfighters into the gaps they fashioned. In response, coral skippers were commanding their Dovin basils to deploy defensive voids to counter the infiltration. No sooner did the gravitic anomalies shift, however, than Harbinger and Guardian strobed salvos of ranged weapons fire against the least defended of the tentacles. Coral skippers were lanced and vaporized, pickets fractured and cracked open like seed pods, expressing puffs of atmosphere and more. Free of the enclosing tentacle at last, Jaina searched for the rest of her squadron. Twin sons four, five, six, nine, and ten were nearby, but she had no means of communicating with them. She reached out with the force for Lobaka, Alima Rar, Okta Ramus, and the Wild Knights, hoping that they would be able to interpret her distress call and relay her message. But it was Jag who arrived. Twin Sun's X-Wings were suddenly forming up on Jag's Clawcraft, and he in turn was leading them to her. The fighting was the most intense at the perimeter of the fluttering tentacles. Alliance frigates and corvettes were trading fusillades with Yuzhan Vong escort vessels and cruiser analogs, matelocks, opening dozens of new fronts along the flanks of the cluster. Starfighters and coral skippers pursued one another through blinding volleys of fire as the capital ships continued their long-distance duels. Even so, the armada managed to maintain its Yamisk shape. Then, without warning, three groups of enemy war vessels peeled away from the core, carrying countless coral skipper tentacles with them. It was as if the Yamisk had undergone mitosis. Jaina considered briefly that the Yuzhan Vong had decided to divide the battle into separate arenas. Instead, the coral skippers of the newly created flotilla began to return to the waiting arms of their carriers in a kind of reverse deployment. Three battle groups have detached from the main cluster, Alliance Control reported over the battle channel. Coral skippers are withdrawing, monitoring the new cluster for possible micro-jump to Mon Calamari. Primary planetary defense is at Code Red, with all shields raised. Iceberg three attack squadrons will regroup and stand by for jump coordinates. Jaina watched the smaller of the two clusters streak sunward and disappear. Enemy secondary has jumped, waiting for verification of hyperspace vector. Jaina's breath caught in her throat. If the new cluster jumped directly to Mount Calamari. Iceberg three attack squadrons are reformed and in position. Jaina waited in her crippled ship. Time seemed to drag out, even while the battle continued to rage around her. Then the voice of control returned. Vector confirmed. Secondary flotilla has jumped for the Perlemian trade route. Halonet transceiver ships at Quermia transit point are under attack. Primary flotilla is accelerating for Sep Elipor and Mon Eron. All starfighter wings regroup. Out of the fight, Jaina pivoted the X-Wing to starboard in an effort to observe the reformation of the scattered squadrons. Twin Sun's survivors were flying with Rogue Squadron, and Black Moon and Scimitar were similarly mingled. Vanguard was down to six claw craft, but Jag was still leading them. She sent him luck as the fighter wing streaked off to re-engage. Then she coaxed what life she could from the damaged fusil engines and crippled shields and followed him. Under guard of six warriors who could barely stay on their feet, Team Malok, including Han, had been herded into the Yamask chamber and left there to marinate in Blorash jelly while the female Shaper and the cadre of Slayers departed Kalula. From deeper inside the Minshal had come the sounds of at least three craft lifting out of their birthing spaces. 
An hour had passed since then, and something strange was beginning to happen to the Blorash jelly. Though it had held everyone fast when they had first been thrown into it, the jelly was losing viscosity. When it liquefied to the point that Leia could sit upright, she immediately started to crawl on hands and knees toward Han, who had been returning slowly to consciousness the whole while. The first words out of his mouth were, What stinks? Leia ignored the question and clamped her arms around his chest, hugging him to her. He blinked, stretched his eyelids open, blinked some more, and began to glance around. You're getting blorash all over us. Leia put her face close to his. Just my way of making sure we stay together, no matter what else happens. Welcome back to the fun, Paige yelled from across the chamber. Han raised his right hand in a curt wave to the captain, Kip, Raw, and Malok, who were more or less sitting up in the adhesive pool. He cut his eyes back to Leia. You want to tell me about the what-else part? Commander Malik Carr plans to sacrifice us to the Yamask. Han looked past Leia to the circular Yorick coral basin that housed the creature, then beetled his eyebrows in uncertainty. Malik Carr. From the Peace Brigade convoy, Leia said. The one who promised Judder that, well, that something like this would happen. Han grimaced. Could be worse. I mean, at least we're away from those blasted flitnats. Leia shook her head at him in a tolerant manner. It doesn't take you long to get back into character, does it? Hey, I know this role by heart. He smiled weakly, then grew serious. But tell me something. How come I'm supposed to be dead, and instead all I've got is numb lips, a sore throat, and a headache? We're not sure, but the reason has something to do with Kalula. They picked the wrong planet to occupy, Raw said, moving toward them. His fur rippled in a kind of delight. Everything's sick, Leia went on. Not just the winged stars. Everything here. The warriors, the dilating membranes, even the slayer's amphistaffs. Which means that their venom is probably also weakened. Slayers? The enhanced warriors. Han nodded. No wonder they were able to take us like they did. His eyes snapped open as if he had just recalled something. Sasso, Furfur. Dead, Leia said, almost swallowing the word. Han hung his head, then stiffened in her embrace. Where are our weapons? Leia stretched out her arm. There. Han followed her forefinger to where the weapons had been dumped in a heap on the far side of the chamber, close to where half a dozen Yuzhan Vong guards were either dozing or passed out. Every weapon, including the two lightsabers, was smeared with red blood perhaps fresh from Sasso and Furfur. If this Blorash keeps liquefying at the same rate, Leia said, we should be free in no time. She barely got the sentence out when Malik Carr shuffled into the chamber, accompanied by two ordinary warriors and a priest. The six sleeping warriors woke up and attempted to come to attention, but most of them were too weak to stand, let alone snap their fists in salute. Their amphistaffs sprawled sluggishly beside them. Stay where you are, Carr commanded, as the pair of warriors who braced him lowered him to a shallow step that encircled the Yamask basin. Seeming to sense the commander, the Yamask itself stirred, extending two tentacles over the rim of the basin and resting the tips on Carr's horned shoulders. The tentacles were a sickly shade of green and covered with large blisters. Carr caressed one of them. Breathing laboriously, the priest picked up one of the military blasters and handed it to Carr, who, with some effort, squeezed off a bolt into the domed ceiling. Still functioning, as you appear to be, he said in basic, gazing at his captives. His filmed eyes focused on Page. And I thought Selvaris a terrible place. You've no obligation to tell me, Captain. But what is it that is peculiar to this cursed world that has brought illness and death upon us? Page shook his head in ignorance. Maybe the insects we call winged stars, but a lot of the ones we saw were also dead or dying. 
So are Kalula's flipnats. Something about their deaths, then, Kara mused. If that's true, Captain, then you will have a powerful weapon to use against us. Although I heard rumor of one such weapon that affected our warriors on Garki. Holland, Raw answered for Page, the product of a semi-sentient tree from a world you destroyed. Ithor. Carr struggled to make sense of it. Is there some relationship between those trees and the winged star insects? No, Malok said. Carr inhaled raggedly. I'm dying, he said in disbelief. Neither in battle nor honorably, but of disease. Life turned against other life. It is something unknown to us, because we are symbiotic with all life. Our biotes, our weapons, our foodstuffs. We don't die of disease or of starvation. Many of us live three times as long as the human species in this galaxy. And yet we have been felled by another living thing. He almost grinned. Yun Harla is either laughing or outraged. Who can tell any more? I suppose I should take some measure of comfort in the fact that I will see all of you die first. But somehow, the fight has gone out of me. You are infidels. Yes, you are ignorant and primitive. And you have chosen to consort with machines as if they were living beings. But though I pity you for that, I no longer hate you for it. However, you do need to die, if only on the off chance that your sacrifices will persuade the gods to spare the life of our war coordinator. He turned slightly and lifted his gaze as if to the Yamisk. Are you even capable of directing a flight of coral skippers? I think not, poor creature, but I know that, like me, you will die trying. The priest groaned in pain, doubled over, and collapsed on the floor. The six guards also appeared to have died. Thud bugs crept from the warriors' bandoliers and expired. Leia realized that the Blorash had lost all of its binding qualities. The entire place seemed to be dying at the same time. The Yamisk issued an ear-splitting screech of agony. Its tentacles flailed for several seconds, then the bloated beast bobbed lifelessly to the surface of the agitated pool. Malik Kar hauled himself to his feet and lifted one of the amphistaffs, which hung over his hand like a length of rope. As docile as a mascot. He looked at Page. You have won the day, Captain. I salute you. The commander toppled like a tree. Page lifted himself from the jelly and hurried over to him. Kip and Malok clambered onto the step to regard the Yamisk. It's dead, Malok pronounced. A sudden commotion broke out in the antechamber. Kip and Leia called their lightsabers to them, activating the blades while Page and Raw hastened for the blasters. Hello! a voice called out. Into the basin room walked Lando Calrissian, Talon Card, and Shada Ducal, wearing armor-ply combat suits, white helmets, and knee-high boots, and armed with lightweight blaster rifles. Lando's bipedal YVH-1-1A droid brought up the rear. The hero of Tanab brought his fingertips to his brow in an informal salute. Kip, Captain Page. He flashed his bright trademark smile at Malok. Sorry, I haven't had the pleasure. Malok, she told him. Agent Raw, the Bothan said curtly, clearly vexed by the trio's sudden appearance. Leia stared at them in astonishment. What in the galaxy? Leia, so good to see you, Lando said. We just wanted to show that the Smuggler's Alliance has more to offer than hunter-killer mouse droids. Booster, Mirax, and Krev Bombasa send their regards. Errant Venture is here, she said, referring to Booster Terex's personal Star Destroyer. Card nodded. We came prepared to fight a war. What's the situation upside? Page asked. Peaceful. We only had to deal with a small skip carrier and a couple of patrol craft. Patrol craft, Page said. Kalula was supposed to be a major staging area for Mon Calamari. Lando nodded. 
That's what we thought. He glanced at Han. Booster's not too happy having expended so much fuel on a mission Wildcard could have handled. In fact, we would have been here sooner if we hadn't ended up in a firefight with the Peace Brigaders at the spaceport. The Brigaders are all right? Healthy? Malok asked. Healthy enough to have delayed us, Card said. Momentarily, that is. Leia showed Han a skeptical look. You knew about this. He shrugged. I didn't trust this whole operation from the start. I figured we'd been compromised somehow, so I wanted to make sure we had backup. Sorry I didn't tell you. That's against orders, Solo, Raw said harshly. So bring me up on charges when we get back to Mount Calamari. Don't think I won't try. Lando glanced from the Bothan to Han. Has it been this way from the start? Pretty much. Lando watched Han struggle to his feet. Are you all right, Han? He was bitten by an amphistaph whose venom wasn't working, Kip said. Lando glanced at Malik Carr, the priest, and the warriors. We've seen this everywhere we've been, at the spaceport, in the streets. What's going on? Page gestured to the Yuzhan Vong. They caught something, and not just the warriors, the Yamask, the weapons. Oh, no, Kip interrupted in a tone of tragic realization. Oh, no. Blood rushed from his face, and his expression turned grim. I know what happened here. I probably knew from the moment we saw the crashed coral skipper, but I didn't want to believe it. He looked at everyone. And may the Force help all of us, if I'm right. Chapter 26 Everyone was scrambling for shelter. From his perch on the rim of the abyss, Luke could see hundreds of pharaohs massed at the mouths of the tunnels below, the combined light of dozens of glow sticks creating halos around each entrance. Through Magister Jabitha, Seacoat had issued the alert that the planet was preparing to make a final jump to hyperspace. Luke could feel Zonama shuddering as the core hyperdrives heated up. He could sense the tension and uncertainty in the Boris, the seed partners, the myriad creatures the vast Tom Posse supported. He looked into the night sky. For no reason he could fathom, each jump seemed to have brought him closer to a familiarity that had nothing to do with star systems or planets. Even in the most remote realms of the unknown regions, his connection with the Force had never faltered. But with the previous jump, he had begun to hear the whispers of his fellow Jedi, and their urgency told him that it was critical that he, Mara, and the others return. If the imminent jump didn't succeed, or if it should leave Zonama far from where Luke wanted the planet to emerge, then he would do as Mara had wished and make use of Jade Shadow. He felt Jason approach from behind him, but didn't turn from the view. Something has happened, he said finally. I feel it, Uncle Luke, Jason said. The Jedi are friends. It's not only them. The danger is widespread. Jason came alongside him. A gust of wind tugged at the cowl of his robe. Another Ithor? Another Barab One? Not yet, Luke said. But a new evil has been unleashed. By the Yuzhan Vong? By the dark side. Jason nodded. Your real enemy. Luke turned to him. You should be thinking about your own course, Jason, not mine. Jason exhaled with purpose. I have no one but you to look to, to know which path I should take. Our courses are entangled. Then I guess I'd better listen to what you've decided about me. Jason took a moment to collect his thoughts. From everything you've told me over the years— about confronting your father and the Emperor. It has always seemed to me that neither of them was your real enemy. Each tried to entice you to join him, but they were never the source of your fear. You feared falling to the dark side. Luke grinned faintly. Is that all? he said finally. Jason shook his head. On Coruscant, at the ruins of the Jedi Temple, Verger said that the Jedi had a shameful secret and that secret was that there is no dark side. The Force is one, 
and since there are no separate sides, the force can't take sides. Our notions of light and dark only reflect how little we know about the true nature of the force. What we've chosen to call the dark side is simply the raw, unrestrained force itself, which gives rise to life as easily as it brings death and destruction. Luke listened closely. Now I shall show you the true nature of the force, the emperor had told him at Endor. On Mon Calamari, Verger had tried to lead him down the same path, by implying that Yoda and Obi-Wan were to blame for not telling him the truth about the dark side. As a result of their neglect, when Luke had cut off his father's hand in anger, he assumed he had had a close brush with the dark side. When he stood at the side of the cloned emperor, he had truly felt the dark side. Ever since, he had come to equate anger with darkness itself, and he had passed that along to the Jedi he had tutored. But in fact, according to Verger, Luke had been misguided by his own ego. She had maintained that, while darkness could remain in someone by invitation, it could just as easily be jettisoned by self-awareness. Once Luke accepted this, he would no longer have to fear being seduced by the dark side. You're suggesting that I've held myself back by not wanting to incorporate this raw power into my awareness of the Force, Luke said. For Jer received years of formal training in the Force, Jason said. The things she told me must have been common knowledge among the Jedi of the Old Republic. Verger was corrupted by the years she spent living among the Yuzhan Vong, Luke said evenly. Corrupted? Maybe that's too strong a term. Let's say, strongly influenced. But she felt she hadn't been influenced by them. She can't be blamed. Each of us stands at a kind of midpoint, from which we're capable of seeing only so far in either direction. Our senses have been honed over countless millennia to allow us to navigate the intricacies of the physical world. But because of that, our senses blind us to the fact that we are much more than our bodies. We truly are beings of light, Jason. The emphasis the Jedi have always placed on control operates the same way. Control blinds us to the more expansive nature of the Force. The Jedi of the Old Republic wanted only youngsters for this reason. Jedi needed to be raised in the light, and to come to see that light as unblemished, undivided. But you and I haven't had the luxury of that indoctrination. Our lives are a constant test of our will to exercise any darkness that creeps in. In that sense, your instincts about me are correct, and so were Verger's. The dark side has, in a sense, dominated my life. I've suspected for a long time that the fatigue I've sometimes experienced when drawing on the Force during combat owes to my fear of abusing the raw power you describe. It's true that the Force is unified. It is one energy, one power. But here's where I think you and Verger are incorrect. The dark side is real, because evil actions are real. Sentience gave rise to the dark side. Does it exist in nature? No. Left to itself, nature maintains the balance. But we've changed that. We are a new order of consciousness that has an impact on all life. The Force now contains light and dark because of what thinking beings have brought to it. That's why balance has become something that must be maintained, because our actions have the power to tip the scales. As the Sith did, Jason said. As the Sith did. The Emperor was perhaps the most self-assured person I have ever encountered, but he deliberately chose evil over good. And in the right climate, one individual, suitably driven and skilled, can tip the universe into darkness. For darkness has followers, especially where discontent, isolation, or fear hold sway. In such a climate, enemies can be fashioned, imagined out of thin air, and suddenly all good is lost, all perspective vanishes, and illness takes hold. Luke paused, then said, 
Do you believe that you spoke with Verger after her death at Ebac 9? Or were you conversing with the Verger who existed only in your thoughts and memory? Jason thought for a moment. I spoke with Verger. I am certain of it. Do you believe I had a vision of Obi-Wan, Yoda, and my father after all three had died? I've never had any reason to doubt you, Uncle. Then from where was Verger speaking? Maybe she learned to tap into a power that was more all-embracing than the living force. The unifying force, Luke said. That might explain it. In fact, all the years since the deaths of Obi-Wan, Yoda, and my father, I've felt as if the Jedi have been on a quest to recover the Force's power to glimpse the future, which is perhaps the nature of the unifying Force. The search has not been unlike our search for Zonama Seacoat, and there's a power here in the air and the trees and everything else that convinces me we've found our way to something even greater than what we were seeking. I feel that, too. Jason looked at Luke. I told Seacoat about your plan. Luke was surprised. You spoke with Seacoat in private? In the form of Verger, yes. And? Seacoat thinks it can be done. Seacoat also asked to speak with Danny about Yamask jammers and decoy Dovin basils. Luke nodded in satisfaction. That's good but it's important to remember that battles are not always decided by warships or other weapons. The important battles are won in the Force. He gestured broadly to the abyss and the starfield. All this will pass away, but the Force endures. We tap its power, and if we so choose, it moves us according to designs we will never be able to understand. Abruptly, Luke turned around. Jason followed his lead and saw Mara standing silently behind them. Unless you two are planning to ride out the next jump on the wing, I suggest you get to the shelters. We were just on our way, Luke said. This could be the last peaceful stretch we'll know for a long while. Chapter 27 Alpha Red, Kip said, as if having trouble believing his own words. He walked distractedly to the Yamask Basin, his boots leaving prints in the liquefied Blorash jelly. There he gestured to the gruesome scene, Malik Kar, the priest, and eight warriors, bleeding from mouths, eyes, ears. Amphistaffs, Villops, and Yamask, dead. Yorick Koro, bleached of color. Alpha Red Han and Leia traded questioning glances with each other and with Paige. Lando, Talon, and Shada did the same. Is that some sort of curse I'm not familiar with? Lando asked Kip. You could say that. Kip sat down on the basin's curved step. Alpha Red is the name of a Yuzhan Vong-specific poison developed by Chiss scientists and Diff Scour's intelligence gang. From what I know about it, and I don't know a lot, the starting point was Baffor tree pollen, and the bioweapon just kept growing from there. Kip, how do you even know anything about this? Leia asked. A dubious privilege of being a member of Cal Omas's advisory council, he said. The first batch, the trial batch, was refined about a year ago and tested in secret. It might have been deployed full scale at the time, if not for two things. Our victory at Ebac 9 and Verger. A Fosh Jedi of the Old Republic, Leia explained for the benefit of Page, Malok, and some of the others. Verger lived as a spy among the Yuzhan Vong for fifty years. She helped rescue our son Jason at Mirker, and died at Ebak. A month or so before Ebak, Kip added, Verger stole the sample batch of Alpha Red and destroyed it, or somehow transformed it into something harmless. He glanced at Leia and she nodded for him to continue. Alliance Command ruled it an act of treason, but not much has been said about Alpha Red since then, in part because it's been rumored that Jason had something to do with Verger's escaping the military cordon set up at Kashyyyk. 
I thought the project had been scuttled. Obviously, I've been kept out of the loop. This stuff doesn't only kill individual Yuzhan Vong, Han said, looking around the chamber. Kip nodded. You're right about that. It targets some genetic or cellular component that the Yuzhan Vong share with all their biotes, from the smallest right up to the largest, even their war vessels. The crashed coral skipper, Leia said. Han regarded Paige with suspicion. The captain raised his hands in innocence. Han, I swear, this is the first I've heard of Alpha Red. Han looked at tall Malok, who shook her head. If I knew about Alpha Red, I'm certain I would have done what the Jedi did. All heads turned to Raw, whose head first stirred. Then the Bothan intelligence agent shrugged nonchalantly. Alliance Command wanted field assurance that Alpha Red would work outside a laboratory setting. It's been used effectively on captives, but we couldn't be sure what would happen in an uncontrolled environment. When intelligence learned that Kalula had been targeted by the Vong for occupation, it was chosen to be Planet Zero. Step one in winning the war. Melok loosed a mournful sign. Extermination. More of the Bothan are cry. His hands curled into claws. Han stormed across the chamber, but he made it only halfway to Raw before Kip wrapped his arms around him in restraint. That's why Kalula's governor promised a peaceful surrender, Han yelled. Your people let the orbital station fall just so you could launch this half-witted plan. Take it easy, Solo, Raw said. If I'd been in on the planning at that level, you think I'd be along on this little joy ride? I'm here as an observer, nothing more. Nothing more? Han struggled against Kip's hold. The muscles in his neck stood out like cables. This whole op has been nothing but a reconnaissance to see if Alpha Red had done the trick. Not true, Raw fired back. Our mission was to destroy the Yamisk, and now the thing's dead. Alliance had good reason to believe that the Vong were planning to use Kalula as a fallback point. I've no explanation as to why there aren't more war vessels in orbit. Han relaxed and Kip let him go. So if Alpha Red failed, then we'd be on hand to make sure the Yamisk was killed. Raw shrugged again. Director Scour is big on redundancy, but yes, he wanted to be confident that the Yamisk would die one way or the other. You knew all along, Leia said to Raw. The patrol we ambushed, the crashed coral skipper. I'll admit that I was encouraged by what I saw. Han sneered. You know better than the Yuzhan Vong. Raw's fur rippled again. You said you wanted to teach me the ways of the world. Well, maybe it's you who needs the lesson. What we did here was necessary. He pointed toward the ceiling. That shaper and her special warriors are going to take Alpha Red to Yuzhan Tar. And from there it's going to spread to other occupied worlds up and down the invasion corridor. So instead of ranting at me solo, you should be taking heart. The Vong's days are numbered. The war is essentially over. You killed them, Malok mumbled, then yanked herself from her musings in a wide-eyed panic to glare at Raw. You killed the winged stars. Raw swallowed hard. You don't know that. She collapsed to her knees to the spongy floor as if her legs had turned to gel. Don't you realize what you've done? What you've unleashed? The effects of Alpha Red aren't confined to the Yuzhan Vong. Your superiors want assurance? Tell them that Alpha Red has surpassed everyone's expectations, Agent Ra. Sentient and non-sentient life is also susceptible. If those Yuzhan Vong craft reach Coruscant, the entire galaxy could be at risk. What craft? Lando asked. What's she talking about? A couple of enemy vessels went up the well just before you arrived, Page said. Card whipped his comlink from his belt and activated the call button. Krev, are you receiving me? Just barely, Talon. 
a deep male voice answered after several moments of static. What's your status? I'll tell you later, Krev. Right now, you've got to alert Booster's gunners to destroy every Yuzhan Vong ship in the area. Krev Bombasa laughed. What did you think we've been doing? Not that there's been a whole lot of targets. Thank the Force, Malok said quietly. Only one ship got past us, Bombasa continued. A Corvette analog like nothing we've ever seen. Scaled with three pairs of pincer arm rock spitters and an uplifted stern. Han looked at Leia. The skips that chased us to Kalua. They must have been grown for the Slayers. Han's alarm was enough for Talon. His hand tightened on the comlink. Krev, tell me you've still got that vessel in your sights. Hang on, Talon. Everyone fell silent, waiting through several more moments of static. Then Krev's voice returned. Talon, sorry to report that the craft jumped to hyperspace before we could nail it. Milok put her face in her hands and began to sob. Han worked his jaw in anger and dismay. Our only hope is that the crew dies before that ship reverts to real space. On the bridge of the Bothan assault cruiser Raoul Roost, Admiral Crefay swiveled the command chair away from the observation bay to listen to an update from the comm officer. Local space was strewn with warships, but untroubled. Blue Moon Calamari turned calmly below. Elements of the second and third fleets have repositioned to Moan Eran, the human officer said. Grand Admiral Pelion reports that right to rule is underway to complement defenses there. Also, two Hapen battle groups have arrived from Iceberg 3 to reinforce Moan Calamari home defense forces. We should have visual contact with them at any moment, sir. Crefe glanced out the observation bay. Raoul Roost, along with the Star Destroyer Rebel Dream and the cruiser Yald, had relocated to Moan Calamari's moon in preparation for meeting the advancing armada head-on. With the Yuzhan Vong moving towards Sep Elipor, the confrontation was hours, or perhaps days away, depending on Nas Choka's strategy. But now the inhabited world of Moan Eran, fifth in the system, was in jeopardy. The system's fourth and third planets were on the far side of the sun. With the unexpected departure of almost half the enemy armada, some semblance of parity had been established. But with equivalence had come renewed ferocity, and, given the mounting casualties, the Alliance was faring worse than it had at the start of the battle. Scanners displayed the heavily damaged frigates and pickets emptying their arsenals at the Yuzhan Vong, and star fighters with wings blown off, adding what they could to the fight. For every star fighter lost, three or four coral skippers disappeared from the theater. But the Yuzhan Vong seemed to have a near limitless supply of the small craft, and as fast as a tentacle was decimated, it was refreshed by flights of skips avalanched from the dusky innards of enemy carriers, and brought into quick formation by however many Yamasks flew at the core. Do we have news on the secondary flotilla? Crefe asked. Not yet, sir. To the best of our knowledge, the flotilla is still traveling coreward along the Perlemian. Seen Sav, Commodore Brand, and other commanders were still adjusting to the fact that the separated cluster had departed by the same route the Yuzhan Vong had taken to reach Mon Calamari. It was obvious now that the Yuzhan Vong had no intention of using Tungul or Kalula as fallback or staging positions. Both planets had been diversions. Crefe berated himself for not having realized that the Alliance had been deceived when the Armada hadn't jumped directly to the Moon Calamari system. Warmaster Nas Choka simply wanted to clear the transit points of mines so that on withdrawal the secondary flotilla could attack the transceiving ships with impunity. But where was the flotilla bound now? Surely Nas Choka couldn't have learned about Coruscant. Was it possible that he had learned of the Alpha Red experiment on Kalula? No, Crefe told himself. If the War Master had had an inkling about Coruscant, why wouldn't he have left the secondary flotilla there, instead of bringing it halfway across the galaxy, only to send it back home? 
More worrisome was the possibility that the War Master had learned about Contrum. At the first indication of the flotilla's intent to jump, courier ships had been dispatched to the Mid-Rim world, and alerts had been sent via transceiving ships strung between Mon Calamari and Kashiik, and Kashiik and the Hapes Cluster. Admiral, incoming communique from Kashiik Relay, the human officer said, pressing his headphones tighter to his ears. Sir, General Kraken and Commanders Farlander and Dabip say that, with the whereabouts of the secondary flotilla unknown, the situation at Contrum has become unstable. Two Ariadwan task forces have already abandoned the fleet. The feeling among many of the other commanders is that everyone would be better living to fight another day, rather than risk jumping to Coruscant only to be trapped between the planetary defenses and the returning flotilla. With all due respect, Contrum Command requests permission to move their fleet to Mon Calamari Extreme and attack the Armada from there. Negative, Crefe said, without having to think about it. Positioning his headset mic close to his mouth, he motioned for the communications officer to open an additional channel to Kashi Ik Relay. Until the secondary flotilla reverts from hyperspace, there's no telling what the plan is. Those ships could simply be lying in wait, hoping for you to show up here so they can place you between them and the Armada. But as for Coruscant, I agree with your assessment, and hereby advise that you scatter the fleet on the off chance that Contrum is the flotilla's destination. Coruscant can wait for another day. It's Mon Calamari that's at stake now. Contrum Command requests an update on the situation at Mon Calamari, a female voice at the other end of the transmission said. We're holding our own, Crefe said bluntly but I don't know for how much longer. We're still outnumbered, and the enemy is not falling for the usual tricks. It's as even a match as I've seen this entire war. The only difference is that Warmaster Nas Choka is prepared to battle to the last, where I am not, and he knows that. He would sooner lose every ship than return to Coruscant in disgrace. I, on the other hand, have to decide when it becomes more prudent to be careful than foolishly brave. Admiral, the female voice said a long moment later, Commander Farlander says that he regrets that he is not there to help you make that decision. Crefe grunted, If it comes to opting for caution, we will adhere to our contingency plan to jump the fleet's rimward of Kubindi. We're a lot more familiar with the hyperlanes and the spiral arm than Nas Choka is. The response was even longer in arriving. Should it come to that, Admiral, are the Yuzhan Vong likely to press the attack against Mon Calamari in your absence? There's simply no telling. We'll have to trust that their cell of spies on Mon Calamari reported that Alliance leadership has been evacuated and that the planet is of no strategic value. Nas Choka doesn't strike me as someone who would kill an animal once it has showed its belly, which is essentially what we'll be doing. That he managed to chase us off will be sufficient reason for him to claim victory and retain his honor. It's what he hoped we would do from the start. Retreat and be chased. Admiral, the communications officer interrupted. Following the officer's lead, Crefe swiveled to the long-distance scanner display and couldn't believe his eyes. The armada was tucking in its tentacles, recalling its legions of coral skippers, pickets, and frigates to their carriers. Enemy is preparing to jump to hyperspace, a Bothan officer said from his duty station on the port side of the elliptical bridge. Crefe came half out of the command chair in expectancy. Order all starfighter wings to withdraw from engagement, he shouted. Home defense capital ships and Golan defense platforms will cease fire and divert all power to forward particle shields. Instruct General Antilles that Moon Mothma should join Dauntless at Moon Bright Side. The Armada has jumped to light speed, the Bothan updated. Bearing, coreward. 
Crefe dropped back into the command chair as if he had gained fifty kilos. I don't understand, he muttered, with equal measures of relief and agitation. Even if Nas Choka knew about Coruscant or Contrum, intelligence would have assured him that the secondary flotilla by itself included more than enough vessels to thwart an attack. And why jump now, with the battle at Mon Calamari continuing to turn in the Yuzhan Vong's favor? It could only be another deception. He turned to the communications officer. Send word to all warship and planet-based transceivers that the entire armada is now on the move. I want immediate reports on any reversions to real space. The communications officer hurried for the comm board. Mystified, Crefe sat staring out into space. What in the galaxy just happened? Chapter 28 With the Armada engaged in a climactic battle at the distant world of Mon Calamari, there was little for the occupants of Yuzhan Tar to do but await word of the outcome. Even for a prefect who had already contributed some of his own blood to ensure victory, and who wasn't inclined to fraternize with the commoners gathered in prayer at the various temples. Instead, Nom Anor had opted for an afternoon nap but he had barely shut his eyes when his cushioned sleeping pallet began to shake with such increasing force that it was bucking across the room when he was finally tipped from it and sent sprawling onto the floor. Overhead, cracks and fissures were spreading across the domed ceiling and down into the walls. Yorick coral dust swirled in the light and rained down on the Vorak carpets, and from elsewhere in the prefectory came screams of pain and panic. A rumble built deep underground and rolled like a wave underfoot, sending objects near and far crashing. Dodging an overturned sklipune, a chest of keepsakes, then a toppling lambent stand, Nome Anor crawled frantically for the ledge-like balcony that overlooked the place of hierarchy. Everything outside was in motion, shuddering and crumbling, and the quality of the afternoon light was changing, as if fading to twilight. Groups of workers were rushing from the portals of the structures that surrounded the quadrangle. In a deranged herd they ran, stumbling and staggering for the tree-lined paths that wound through the public space. Kneeling, Nomanor shielded his eyes and gazed toward the sun. But it wasn't Yuzhantar's primary that had everyone in panic. It was the crescent of planet that took up an enormous portion of the lower sky. Even as he watched, the green arc thinned as it advanced visibly on the star. It was impossible to judge the planet's distance or true size, but it was twice as large as the shining orb it seemed intent on driving from the sky. And it suddenly struck Nomanor that the rainbow bridge had vanished. Clasping his hands on the balcony balustrade, he hauled himself to his feet. Across the quadrangle, the façade of a structure collapsed, burying hundreds of Yuzhan Vong under jagged chunks of Yorick coral. Then a harsh and terrible wind blew in, uprooting trees and toppling statues. The wind filled the air with so much grit that the permacrete bones of many a New Republic building and space scraper were laid bare. A roar raced through the sky, and a crevice split the ground, running diagonally through the quadrangle. Benches, shrubs, and a throng of hapless workers plummeted into the yawning opening. Swarms of sack bees, liberated from their hives, spiraled into the crazed sky. Thousands of birds were already on the wing, but not flying so much as being blown to wherever the howling wind was taking them, and everything it had ripped from the surface. Nome Anor planted his feet wide and stared into the sky, while the gale tugged at his tunic and tore tears from his eyes. Was this real? or a product of his feverish brain. Below the balcony, in errant defiance of the daytime curfew Shimra had imposed on them, a band of shamed ones were down on their knees, raising their hideous faces and rail-thin arms, in celebration of the newly arrived planet that was literally shaking Yuzhan Tar to pieces. Weakly, fatalistically, Noma Nor accepted the truth. Zonama Seacoat had not only returned to known space, it had made Yuzhan Tar its destination and target. An updraft carried the voices of the shamed ones to Nomanor's ears. 
The prophecy has come to pass. Our salvation is at hand. He hung his head in defeat. Everything he had predicted was coming true. The balcony groaned, and the front edge tipped downward. Carefully, Noma Nor began to back toward his work chamber. He had just reached the threshold when someone threw a forearm lock on his throat, and he felt the point of a kufi press against his temple. His assailant dragged him backward into the room and whispered harshly in his right ear, Tell me what you know of this, or die this instant. Nomanor recognized the voice of Drathul. A weapon of the heretics, he rasped, his own hands tight on the high prefect's forearm. The knife drew blood, sending a black trickle coursing down the yoke of Nomanor's robe. You would insult me further by lying. We know you have the supreme overlord's ear on this and other matters. Drathul aimed his blade at the sky. Zonama Seacoat was moving swiftly. Already its convex edge was nibbling at the sun. In moments, the sun would be not merely eclipsed, but entombed. We? Nom Anor asked weakly. Those of us who would have preferred to heed Supreme Overlord Quarial's admonitions, along with the wisdom of his priests who counseled against invading this cursed galaxy, Drathul said, This is the living world discovered by Commander Krashmir before the invasion. The same one recently rediscovered by Commander Ekumval. Then you know more than I, Noma Nor said, close to passing out. A portent of defeat. Portents serve weak rulers and superstitious fools, Nome Anor said with his last remaining breath. Abruptly, Drathul released his chokehold and spun Anor around. Grabbing a handful of Nome Anor's tunic, he pulled him close and pressed the kufi into the front of his throat. The land quake had ended, but Nome Anor was hardly out of danger. Speak the truth, or lose your ability to speak. Drathul's breath was foul with fright. The heretics who bow in jubilation beneath this very perch, while everyone else runs in panic. They know it is the living world. The primordial homeworld promised to them by the prophet. Not this travesty we have created of Coruscant. Do you deny it? Nome Anor was beginning to tire of the prick of Kufis. Shunmi's months earlier, Kunra's just weeks ago, and now Drathul's. It is a living world. He admitted, but only that. Neither portent nor fulfilled prophecy. Merely another surprise in a war filled to overflowing with surprises. Pushing the kufi aside, he brought his right hand to his neck to staunch the flow of blood. The living world whose return I tried to prevent, he added, glaring at his superior. You tried to prevent? Drathul's weapon arm dropped to his side. He gazed at Noma Nor in naked incredulity. On Shimra's command, Noma Nor said through his clenched jaws. He grabbed at his green robe. How else do you think I come to wear this? Through merit? Through domain privilege? He spat on the floor. Through acts of treachery and deceit. Drathul sank to the floor in weary confusion. The room was growing darker by the moment, as Zonama Seacoat cast its immense shadow across the face of Yuzhan Tar. Hailstones the size of Ungdins were striking the balcony, bouncing into the room and skittering across the floor. The High Prefect looked up at Nomanor. What should I do? Nomanor took a moment to languish in his small victory. Pray to the gods, Drathul, that Zonama Seacoat has come in peace. The blank expression conveyed by the dedicated Philip of Supreme Commander Salup Feng belied the dread in his words. The planet appeared out of dark space and hurtled into the Yuzhantar system, fearsome one. It nearly grazed the holy world, sundering the rainbow bridge and scattering the moons, the innermost of which nearly struck Yuzhantar as it was outward bound. It is a catastrophe of epic proportions, Warmaster, as if engineered by the gods. Enough, Commander, Nas Choka said. The vessels under your watch will remain where they are. None should attempt to move against the intruding planet. 
At your command, War Master. The Armada will soon return, and I will decide then our best course of action. The countenance of Salup Feng smoothed out as the villip relaxed and inverted to its normal leathery aspect. Nas Choka paced from the choir of Biotes to his command bench, but found on arriving that he was too agitated to sit down. He had ordered Yamka's mount to revert from dark space in the mid-rim, so that he could receive a follow-up report from the Supreme Commander on the events that had transpired at Yuzhan Tar some time earlier. The War Master had ordered everyone but the Chief Tactician from Yamka's mount's command chamber, and Nas Choka turned to him now. There have been rumors, the tactician said carefully, of a world capable of moving through dark space. The world encountered by Commander Krashmir's reconnaissance force during the reign of Quarial, Nas Choka said. Yes, War Master, I feared broaching the subject with you because... Nas Choka silenced him with a motion of his hand. He had been a mere commander at the time, but loyal to Domain Jaman, Shimra's domain, and one of a group of high-ranking warriors who had helped Shimra wrest power from his predecessor, putting to death many of Quarial's warriors and intendant supporters. Regardless, rumors of the living planet had persisted. It was rumored further that the planet, known as Zonama Seacoat, not only had warded off Zhou Krashmir's forces, but also had been pronounced an omen of ill tidings by Quarial's coven of high priests. Knowing, however, that Quarial feared the warrior caste, the commanders loyal to Shimra saw the priest's pronouncement as a ruse, a subterfuge aimed at steering the world ship convoy away from the galaxy to which it had drifted, and thus avoid an invasion that would escalate the warrior caste. Coriel had paid only lip service to the importance of sacrifice and war, without ever recognizing that the deterioration of Yuzhan Vong's society owed in large part to their absence. But Shemra knew better. He understood that the warriors needed a war, lest they go on killing themselves, and more important, that the Yuzhan Vong needed a home. All well and good, but now a living world had suddenly reappeared. Nas Choka was too much of a realist to give credence to the idea of the planet being an omen of defeat, but as a strategist, he had to wonder. If it was the same world that had defended itself successfully against Zhou Krashmir, then Zonama Seacoat had had an additional fifty standard years during which to become a weapon unlike any the Yuzhan Vong had ever faced. War Master, the tactician said, could this alleged living planet be nothing more than a fabrication of the Alliance? Or, more accurately, the Jedi? Nas Choka considered it. I would hear more of this. Fearsome one, perhaps this world, this fabrication, is the secret strategy the Alliance was engineering while we readied the Armada for the battle at Mon Calamari. All the rushing about— all the diversion observed at Kantrum and Kalula and other worlds. Perhaps all that was executed in an attempt to divert our eye from what was being fabricated and prepared for launch. Only a fool would reject the possibility out of hand, tactician, Nas Choka said. But suppose for a moment that it is not a fabrication, but an actual living world, the source of the rumors that have endured since before the invasion began. The tactician frowned. If that proves to be true, and if indeed the infidels have coaxed it to enter the war on their side, then they have perpetrated their greatest transgression yet. Nas Choka nodded sullenly, then took a deep breath. Whichever the case, the Alliance waited too long to spring the surprise. With our war vessels only two jumps from Yuzhan Tar, and additional battle groups being recalled from Hut Space and other sectors, no intruder, living or fabricated, can prevail. Part 3 A Time to Every Purpose Chapter 29 The Millennium Falcon meandered with design through a press of large and slowly tumbling asteroids, 
Just short of the outer edge of the field, the freighter slipped into the shadow of an enormous hunk of cratered rock, matching velocities with it so as to remain concealed. No sooner had the Falcon returned to Mon Calamari from Kalula than Han and Leia had heard from Luke and Mara. With the holonet crippled and Luke and Mara transmitting from Jade Shadow, the conversation had been garbled and brief. Han had summarized the events that had led to the ultimately bewildering battle at Mon Calamari, and Luke had as much as said that the Jedi search party had ridden Zonama Seacoat back to known space. Despite the fact that the Yuzhan Vong Armada had returned to Coruscant, Luke had assured Han and Leia that it was safe for them to join the Jedi on the living planet, and that Verger had been correct about Zonama Seacoats being the key to ending the war. He promised to explain fully when they arrived. Dismayed by what had unfolded on Kalula, Han and Leia had departed almost immediately for the Corps, but not before both of them had been thoroughly examined by medical teams, and Leia had met with Alliance Chief of State Cal Omis to acquaint him with the tragic truth about Alpha Red and what its deployment may have loosed on the galaxy. A fellow Alderanian, Omis had been shaken by Leia's report, and had claimed that deployment of the biological agent had been a difficult decision, born of difficult times, one that might have saved countless lives. The Yuzhan Vong vessel that had evaded errant ventures weapons at Kalula was still unaccounted for, and it was hoped, even by some members of the Alliance's militant factions, that the craft had died in hyperspace. Omis had given his word to Leia that the Alpha Red project would be terminated at once, but she feared that, with Diff Scour continuing to helm the intelligence division, and the Bothan still crying for our cry, Omis might not be able to make good on his pledge again. At best, the project would remain on hold until Alliance scientists could determine if Alpha Red had actually been responsible for the deaths of so many of Kalula's winged stars and flitnats. If the bioweapon wasn't to blame, then Alpha Red would continue to hang over everyone's head, as if a sword suspended by a delicate thread. That had been seven standard days ago. With the Perlemian still under sway of the Yuzhan Vong, Han and Leia had taken the long way to the Coruscant system, jumping the thoroughly repaired Falcon to Kashiik, Kala 4, and Kaminor, then skirting the Corellian trade spine into the core. At the same time, Sav and Kreefe had united the scattered Alliance fleets in the mid-rim at Kontrum. Alliance Command hadn't known what to make of the reports that had eventually reached Mon Calamari by couriers of a planet that had streaked from hyperspace into the core. With no actual recordings of the event, all Sav, Kreefe, and the rest had to go on were the statements of resistance fighters and smugglers, and a few grainy hollows of a verdant world that hadn't been there days earlier, now orbiting in the Coruscant system. What mattered was that whatever it was that had nearly collided with Coruscant had drawn the Yuzhan Vong Armada back to the core, along with the secondary cluster of vessels, which had turned up briefly at Kontrum, only to make an abrupt departure, presumably upon learning of the newly arrived planet. Not one of the top-ranking Alliance officers was willing to state publicly that a planet had transported itself to the core from the far reaches of the galaxy. Privately, however, many professed a belief that the Jedi had put their heads together and collectively moved the planet, as they were rumored to have moved Imperial warships during an attack on Yavin 4 some twenty standard years earlier. For days, Crefe waited for the recalled armada to storm the mystery planet, but no attack had been launched. Resistance groups were reporting that the planet had fomented widespread fear and confusion on Yuzhan Tar, not only among the shamed ones, but also among the priests and other elite. Whether or not that was the case, Warmaster Nas Choka had positioned the vessels of his mighty flotilla in broad cover of Yuzhan Tar, apparently while Supreme Overlord Shimra made up his mind about what to do. A proximity alert sounded in the Falcon's cockpit. Coming into visual range, Leia said, 
Han began to edge the Falcon out from behind the asteroid. Let's have another look at those charts. Leia called a map to the display, showing Coruscant's system of planets, sunward from Revisa to the Oborin Comet Cluster. The coordinates Luke had sent placed Zonama Seacoat on the ecliptic, in orbit between Coruscant's rimward brethren, Musk Cave and Stentat, at approximately 90 degrees to Coruscant. Unless the Nava computer agrees with me about this being a crazy mission, we should be seeing it soon, Han said. Leia pointed out the wraparound bay. There. Han sighted down her finger, far to starboard, to a gibbous green planet. Well, it's sure no moon. Or Death Star, Leia said. With a squeaking of joints, C-3PO entered the cockpit. Excuse me, Princess Leia and Captain Solo, but I wondered if I might view with my own photoreceptors our destination. He motioned behind him. Mistress Silgal would also like to see the living planet. The Moon Calamari healer wasn't the only Jedi on board. Kent Hamner, Waxarn Kel, Mark Remedjev, and several others were in the forward compartment. Still other Jedi were due to arrive at Zonama Seacode aboard Errant Venture. Jaina, Kip, Lobaka, Alima Rar, and the Wild Knights had come by Starfighter. We should probably let Luke know we're here, Han said. Leia turned to the comm board. Jade Shadow, this is Millennium Falcon, she said. Just wanted to let you know that we're in the neighborhood. Luke's voice issued from the cockpit annunciators. Leia, welcome to Zonama Seacoat. Luke, Han here. I'm not imagining this, right? I mean, that's really a planet I'm seeing, and not the after-effects of being bitten by an amphistaph? Zonama Seacoat is every bit as real as the Falcon, Han. It's beautiful, Leia said. Luke laughed lightly. I wish you could have seen it before all the hyperspace jumps we've been forced to make. You've got a lot of explaining to do. Han said, how about giving us some landing instructions? Luke fell briefly silent. Han, I'm afraid you're going to have to leave the Falcon in synchronous orbit. Han showed Leia a puzzled look and muted the mic. The pollen must be affecting him. He reactivated the mic. You're kidding, right? I'm dead serious, Luke said. Booster's going to have to do the same. Luke, a Star Destroyer, I can understand. Han said. But if this is about suitable landing platforms, I've parked the Falcon inside asteroids. It has nothing to do with that. Seacoat refuses to allow warships on the surface. But we're a freighter. Sorry, Han. Han worked his jaw in annoyance. I don't like it, but I'll do it if I have to. Who's this Seacoat, anyway? The governor or something? Seacoat is the planetary consciousness. Han blinked. Say again, Jade Shadow. I thought I heard you say planetary consciousness. Han, I told you I'll explain everything when you're planet side. Luke, in case Seacoat hasn't noticed, Leia interjected, the Yuzhan Vong Armada is so close we can practically touch it. They also have battle groups orbiting Muscave, Stentat, Impraco, and the Covey. Seacoat has parried the Yuzhan Vong before, Luke said. I'm guessing that Shimra knows this. That's why the Armada is staying put for the moment. It's been a while since they met, Han said. Maybe the Vong have forgotten. Not as long as you think, Han. Besides, Zonama Seacoat can go to light speed if it has to. Yeah, well, you'd better tell this Seacoat to keep the hyperdrives idling. Because after what almost happened at Moon Calamari, I don't know that anything can stop the Yuzhan Vong now. He fell silent briefly, then muttered, well, there is one thing. We may know a way, Luke cut in. Han blew out his breath. I hope you're right, Luke. But how are we supposed to get planet side from stationary orbit? We can't just jam everyone into the escape pods. You won't have to. In fact, your transport should be visible to the Falcon scanners just about now. Leia and Han watched the display screen. Shortly, a vessel that might almost have been Yuzhan Vong grown came into view. The ship's lobed, faintly luminescent hull was made up of six oval modules, 
smooth as skipping stones and seamlessly joined. Knife sharp, the leading edges of the modules glowed with what appeared to be organoform circuitry. Han whistled in amazement. The waiting list for those things must be a kilometer long. The pilot's name is Aiken, Luke said. Her ship will accept your cofferdam as soon as you're ready to extend it. From the moment Leia stepped from the pulsing, multicolored cabin of the Sea Coton ship and beheld the sight of her son, her brother, her sister-in-law, and so many friends, some of whom she hadn't seen in almost a year, and all of whom were standing against a backdrop of incredibly tall and wondrous trees, her heart skipped a beat. She felt like a child again. Even from the air, Zonama Seacoat had appeared more fantastical than real. A world of red and green-leafed trees, shimmering aqua lakes and cryptic mountain ranges. The wounds the planet had sustained through its several hyperspace jumps, its crossings, were obvious and numerous, but they were surface blemishes and couldn't impair the planet's aching beauty. This far from Coruscant's primary, Zonama Seacoat should have been frozen, but Luke had explained that Seacoat was keeping the planet warm from within. Leia didn't know whom to embrace first, but since Han had captured Jason in a wampa hug, she went straight to Luke and Mara, throwing an arm around each of them and tugging them to her. There are times I thought I'd never see you again, she said, her eyes closed in joyous relief. No sooner had Leia let go of them than Jason was in front of her, smiling enigmatically. Mom, he said. For a moment Leia was too spellbound to move. She stared at Jason as if he had manifested from a dream. He stepped into her open arms and allowed himself to be held for much longer than he ever had. Leia finally let him go, but only to arm's length. She stroked his cheek with her right hand. You look changed, Jason. More than after your time on Coruscant. I am different, he said. Zonama Seacoat has matured me. Leia turned through a slow circle, her gaze falling on Saba Sabatine, Danny Kui, Tekli, Corin Horn, Tahiri Vela. All of them seemed to be re-experiencing their initial awe of the planet through the eyes of the newcomers. You all look so different, Leia said to her son. Is it the months we've been apart, or is it something about this extraordinary place? Seacoat makes a lasting impression, he said ambiguously. Leia repeated the name as if trying it out on her tongue. I keep hearing about Seacoat. Will I get to meet Seacoat in person? I hope so. Jason! Leia recognized Jaina's voice and stepped out of the way just in time to avoid being trampled. Leia turned another slow circle, trying to commit every scene of reunion to memory. There was bearded Corin, welcoming Mirax, along with his father-in-law, Booster Terek. Elsewhere, Silgal and Tekli were conversing in the latter's native Chadrafan. Danny, her blonde hair elaborately braided, was surrounded by Talon Card, Lando, Tendra Rysant Calrissian, and several other members of the Smugglers' Alliance, who were celebrating with sips of Corellian brandy from a shiny flask. Saba and some of the Barabel Wild Knights, including Saba's son Tisar, were having an animated conversation, as were C-3PO and R2-D2. What adventures you've had, C-3PO was saying. Let me tell you, R2, you haven't experienced anything until you've been inside. The astromech droid razzed, tootled, and whistled. C-3PO straightened. You did what? You're exaggerating. The entire planet? That's impossible. You need to have your circuits serviced. R2-D2 churred. I do not need to defrag myself. I am perfectly... Again the diminutive droid beeped and zithered. C-3PO bent his head to one side. Did I understand you correctly? Did you actually say that it's good to see me? Why, R2, this world must have done something to you as well. Yet by far the most arresting sight of all was the manner in which Kenth, Kip, Lobaka, Alima, Octa Ramus, and more than a dozen other Jedi were clustered around Luke, who now stood in the center of the circle his comrades had formed around him, 
some of them seated, some of them actually down on one knee, paying close attention to everything he was telling him, his every word about Zonama, the planet, and Seacoat, the planet's animating consciousness. He has become a true master, Leia thought. Momentarily overwhelmed by the emotions flooding through her, Leia began to move away from the transport landing platform, as if dazed. Han was suddenly beside her, his arm about her shoulders, leading her into a kind of glen. You okay? he asked worriedly. She took a steadying breath. It's just so much to take in. I know. He gazed around. Some place. Have you ever seen anything to compare to this? He took his lower lip between his teeth. Well, there are some canyons on Luke too, that are every bit as deep. Then there's Hismano for cliffside dwellings. And, of course, Kashi eek for trees. His words trailed off as Leia began to weep. Hey, hey, what's all this about? You should be happy about being here. She wiped away tears with the back of her hand. I am happy, Han. This place. It's the safe harbor I've been dreaming about for months now. But I'm sad. For so many things. For Anakin and Chewbacca. And Alagos. For my parents, my homeworld. So, so many friends. She cried softly against Han's shoulder, and when she looked up into his face, she saw tears in his eyes. I feel like we're coming to the end of a long voyage, Han, and I hate the fact that additional violence is the only thing that's going to get us there. It's like a final payment we have to make to conclude this thing, and to ensure that our children and our children's children don't grow up with the threats we've been forced to face at every turn. I keep thinking that my father must have finally come to this point when he summoned the strength to save Luke from the Emperor. I know from her journal that my grandmother felt this way, and I have the strongest feeling that my mother must have also reached this stage. With war erupting all around her, her home world threatened, is this what Jason has been trying to tell us all along? That violence is never the answer, even if it seems the shortest and most direct path? Han shook his head. I don't know, Leia, but I know I'd die to give him and Jaina a better life than the one we've had. He smiled lopsidedly, even though I wouldn't change a day of it because of you. Leia nodded. I know. I know because I feel the same way, Han but I can't bear the thought of anything happening to you, especially after what I saw you go through on Kalula. Come on, he said, lifting her chin. Look who you're talking to. She smiled faintly and sniffed. If bluster counts for anything, you'll outlive us all. Leia, Han, Luke called out. I want you to meet someone. When they returned to the landing platform, Luke introduced them to some of Zonama Seacoat's tall and pale blue-complected indigenous residents. Pharaohans, including a middle-aged woman he called Magister Jabitha. Seacoat has agreed to fashion living ships for some of the Jedi, Jabitha told everyone gathered. The process will require several days, but I promise you, that it will be unlike anything any of you have ever experienced. Only three Jedi have ever gone through the process, Luke told Leia, and only one of them ever piloted a Seacoton ship. Anakin Skywalker. Our father, Leia realized. Her astonishment and elation endured for only a moment before the sadness returned. Ships, she told herself, then it was to be war after all. She had persuaded herself that Luke had found some other way to end the conflict. But she should have known better. The dark side was strong, and right thinking alone wasn't enough to abolish it. She struggled to resign herself to what lay ahead. For Luke, she forced a brave smile. Her brother's expression promised even greater surprises to come. There's someone else I want you to meet, he said for everyone to hear. Turning to the Pharaohans, he called one of them forward. A tall man, 
who lowered the hood of his cloak as he approached, revealing a face of tattoos and scars, a hint of nose, a sloping forehead. Leia felt Han tense beside her. This is Harar, Luke said, a high priest of the Yuzhan Vong. He, too, is going to help us end this war. Chapter 30 A redemption is at hand, the shamed one cried from the mound of Yorick coral rubble that was her momentary pulpit. Her rapt audience of a hundred or so heretics was sitting at the base of the mound, either oblivious or indifferent to the danger they had placed themselves in by gathering in broad daylight, in the midst of the sacred precinct, no less. Yusha urged us to watch the sky for signs, and that sign has appeared for one and all to see. She spread her emaciated arms wide. Gaze around you at what is coming wrought, and pray that Shimra has taken its message to heart. The shamed ones have been granted a new home, and a more powerful one than Shimra's. When the prophet reappears to lead us to salvation, we will be ready. Seated atop the shaded litter Shimra had sent to carry him to the citadel, Noma Nor lowered his head by reflex, then resumed his upright posture. Though within earshot of the gathering, he was far enough removed not to have to worry about being identified, should Kunra or one of the other heretical leaders be lurking about. Besides, it would be only a matter of minutes before warriors arrived to disperse the crowd. Despite the fact that Zonama Seacoat had jumped into orbit between the system's sixth and seventh planets, after shocks and tremors were continuing to rock Coruscant, and the living world remained visible as first to rise and brightest in the altered night sky. With one of Coruscant's moons whipped from orbit and the rainbow bridge collapsed, Shimra's shapers were already positing that the celestial intruder would return to tug Coruscant gently away from its primary, reversing what Dovin Basils had done to raise the planet's surface temperature. It was as if Zonama Seacoat had proclaimed, Look at what I am capable of doing, and fear my return. Eager to launch an attack on the newly arrived enemy, Warmaster Nas Choka's Armada and other battle groups had returned to Coruscant only to be leashed by Shimra himself. Coruscant, Gnome Anor thought ruefully. He had never been comfortable calling it Yuzhan Tar, except, of course, when necessary. Shimra's shapers might have fashioned a leafy Uglith cloaker for the planet, but scratch the surface, and you found ferrocrete, transparasteel, kelsh, and millennium, the foundations and skeletons of once robust edifices and the corpses of thousands of droids. Now more than ever, what with the remains of buildings protruding through the vegetation like bones through flesh in a compound fracture, and with each tremor exposing a bit more. Coruscant wasn't a living world like Zonama Seacoat, but rather a kind of infidel world ship shrouded in layers of technology, which, regardless of what anyone said, had a mind of its own. More, it was haunted by the members of the diverse species that had originally shaped it. And deep down, even deeper than the realms claimed by the heretics, machine systems were still operating. At night, if one listened closely, one could hear them coming online, moving about, humming, and pinging like electronic ghosts. Even discounting what he figured Jason Solo had done to the world brain, Coruscant could never have truly belonged to the Yuzhan Vong. Many of the workers were beginning to grasp this. Noma Nor read it in the eyes of those he had passed on the littered journey from his residence. Distraught folk extricating trapped crash members, searching in vain for keepsakes and valuables, offering blood sacrifices at the temples, hauling the dead to the Maulures. Shimra's citadel and the huge hemisphere of coral that protected the world brain had survived, but many secondary structures and hundreds of minshals, damuteks, and grashals had been toppled. Forests had been flattened, and intense electrical storms had ignited countless fires. In remote areas of the planet, lava gushed from what had once been leveled and tamed mountains. 
Skowru and Tusgard had been loosed on the sacred precinct to dismantle structures on the verge of collapse. Ungdins writhed about, sopping up blood. Everything standing had been adorned with flowers and ferns in an effort to keep further destruction from being visited by the lowest and most feared in the pantheon of gods. Most Yuzhan Vong had little conception of what had happened, except, of course, for the heretics, who had their own ideas, most of which had been inspired by Nomanor himself. Brought into being by Yun Shuno, in defiance of the other gods, the haggard shamed one was saying, the living world is a sign that the old order has come undone. And much like Yun Shuno, we stand in defiance of Shemra and the elite, demanding equality, freedom, and salvation. It is not our aim to engage the elite in contest. We are prepared to revolt if they fail to prevail upon Shimra to end the long war. Clearly the gods have switched sides and now stand shoulder to shoulder with the Jedi and the varied species of this galaxy. This galaxy Shimra bade us invade. This promised galaxy he bade us purge and purify. In truth, this galaxy that will prove a maw lure for the Yuzhan Vong, unless we embrace the truth. A professional dissembler, Noma Nor, couldn't help but have a grudging respect for what the heretics were attempting to do by playing on the fears Zonama Seacoat's unforeseen appearance had awakened in the elite. The secret supporters of Quariel were adding fuel to the fire by disclosing information about Shimra and how he had come to power. Even so, Noma Nor had to wonder what the heretics expected to happen should the elite agree to ally with them. Perhaps they actually believed that Shimra could be persuaded to make a peace overture to the Galactic Alliance, and that the Alliance would allow the Yuzhan Vong to retain Coruscant for themselves, since the planet at least appeared to be beyond restoration. But the heretics weren't fools. Surely they realized that the warrior caste would never acquiesce. Nas Choka's forces would battle to the last war vessel and warrior. Perhaps the heretics were counting on just that, if only to increase the chances of the other castes being spared. But spared for what? Eminent or shamed, those Yuzhan Vong who survived the war would be packed into what few world ships existed and returned to the void from which they had emerged, doomed to die in deep space, rather than on the living world they saw as the province of their non-existent Yun Shuno. It was pathetic. The heretics' only real hope was that Shimra would turn Nas Choka loose and that the Alliance and Zonama Seacoat would be defeated. Once more the heretics would be forced to accept their lot as shamed ones, but at least they would be alive. No Manor certainly felt that way. You did whatever you had to do to survive. The sound of running feet echoed from the tumbled walls, and a moment later several dozen warriors rushed onto the scene. Without preamble, they moved against the gathering of heretics, launching thud bugs and lashing out with amphistaffs, sending a fortunate few scurrying back into the crevasses from which they had crawled, and leaving the paving stones spattered with blood. Struck by no fewer than four amphistaffs, the female orator was dragged roughly from her perch to the base of the rubble mound, where ultimately she collapsed in a spasming heap. Everyone was willing to be martyred now, Noma Noor thought, as he signaled his litter-bearers to hurry him on his way. Word had reached the prefectory that a few bands of heretics had even forged tenuous alliances with resistance fighters. It was the duty of the intendant caste to quell the riots and put the populace at rest. But with the heretics emboldened to turn every public space into a gathering, the task had become near impossible as had become Noma Nor's personal tasks. Without doubt, Kunra was expecting him to return to lead the heretics in open revolt, just as Drothul was expecting him to join the pro quarial confederates in unmasking Shemra. The high prefect hinted that they were ready to enthrone a new supreme overlord, assuming, of course, that Shemra hadn't already executed the handful of candidates. It was what Noma Nor would have done. For absent a worthy replacement, 
one who would find instant favor with the gods, the high priests would be reluctant to remove Shimra, regardless of what was brought to light about the lies he had fostered. The only question that mattered to Noma Nor was why he had been summoned to the citadel. When the litter-bearers had first arrived at his residence, he was certain that Shimra had ordered his death for failing to have kept Zonama Seacoat in the unknown regions. He had briefly considered fleeing into the underground and taking up the threadbare robes of the prophet again. But the more thought he gave the matter, the more confident he grew that his safety was assured. Shimra had never believed that the living world wouldn't return at some point. Its sudden appearance now was nothing more than bad timing. More important, while Shimra might very well be displeased, he was in no position to announce that he knew about Zonama Seacoat, not without risking an uprising by the elite. Shimra's best approach would be to deny any knowledge of the initial contact with the living planet fifty years earlier. Failing that, he could claim to have been led astray by priests he had since put to death. But one thing he couldn't do was admit to having had an audience with Commander Ekam Val, or of having put Val to death to keep the secret of Zonama Seacoat. The solution would have been simple if Noma Nor had been the only person who knew about Val. But in fact, High Prefect Drathul and perhaps dozens of others also knew about the late commander's mission to the unknown regions. And if Noma Nor was wrong, and he actually was riding to his death, well, there were always ways to escape the citadel. I commanded the litter-bearers to make haste, dread lord, Noma Nor said, prostrate on the unyielding floor, so that I might serve you all the faster. Nom Anor could feel the force of Shimra's enhanced vision as the Supreme Overlord gazed down from the throne in his private chambers in the crown of the citadel. Let us see how quick you can be, Prefect, by telling me why I sent for you. Because I have failed you again, Lord. About Ebak 9, I was duped. At Zonama Seacoat, I evidently did less than I should have. The living world is here, and now Yuzhantar itself is threatened. Death, and nothing less, is all I warrant. Probably so, Shimra said, but not because of the arrival of Zonama Seacoat. For that, it is the gods who have failed me. With his face pressed to the floor, Nomanor's baffled expression was hidden from view, although out of the corner of his eye he could see Onimi, kneeling down as if to get a closer look at his face. The gods, Lord? Shimra issued a short laugh. You are unrivaled, Prefect. Even in this darkest hour, your skepticism holds fast. You accept as truth only what your one eye shows you. He paused, then said, You are hardly the coward many accuse you of being, and perhaps there is even a bit of wisdom in you, though I fear you do a disservice to yourself. Rise and look upon me. Nomanor took a quick glance around as he was getting to his feet. The room was absent priests, attendants, slayers, or courtesans. It was just the three of them. I am certain you remember that I told you our real war was with the gods. I remember, Lord, and I'm equally certain you dismissed my words as those of someone deranged. Never. Shimra waved him silent. I ask now that you consider all that has transpired these past few clackets as one whose own efforts have been undone time and again by the Jedi. Ask yourself if there is not the hand of Grand Master at work here, a god's hand, if you will. Recognizing the rhetorical nature of the question, Nom Anor said nothing. You and I know exactly what Sonama Seacoat is. There is no denying the truth of it, and no denying the threat it represents, to everything I have attempted to bring about in this galaxy. You told me that you had sabotaged the world, and I do not doubt that you tried. And yet, it outwits us again. Nom Anor waited. The gods deliberately saved it, Shimra said. They spared it your treachery, and they placed it in the hands of the Jedi. He shook the scepter of power in anger. This is an act of war on their part, their salvo against those 
who would retire them and rule in their stead. Fortunately, Shimra wasn't expecting a response because Nomanor was speechless. It follows, then, that if we destroy Zonama Seacoat once and for all, we will not only have defeated the Jedi, but will also have vanquished the gods themselves. Shimro waved the formidable-looking Amphistaff again. To do that, we must respond with a salvo of our own. If I can't divest the gods of their power over us, then I can at least attempt to turn them against one another. How, Lord? Nomanor asked in complete befuddlement. Shimra glared at him. I am granting you special powers as my envoy. High Prefect Drathul will hear this from my own lips. As my envoy, it will be your duty to inform the priests in all the temples that they are to cease performing rituals to Yun Yuzhan and Yun Yamka, and instead to devote all their labors to venerating Yun Harla. But the trickster is believed by many of the priests to have already played a role in our setbacks, Nomanor said. In the Hapes Consortium, and at Borlias, the Jedi, Jaina Solo, even masqueraded as her, and outlived Savong La. All the better, then, Shimra replied calmly, because already Yun Harla's head swells with conceit. The gods are already jealous of her, and now we will give them something to get angry about. We will do to them precisely what they did to us during the voyage through the void. Set them against one another. Then, while they are occupied fighting among themselves, while their attention is diverted from us, we will strike at Zonama Seacoat and be finished with all of them. Nomanor nodded, trying hard to keep uncertainty from the gesture. Onimi was regarding Shimra with what might have been incredulity, but looked more like misgiving. For one brief instant, Onimi's eyes met Nomanor's, and that sense of apprehension was communicated. If it hadn't been obvious before, it was obvious now that Shimra was beyond control, deranged. Events had conspired to make a believer out of one who had long prided himself on being the master of his own destiny. Nomanor had never experienced a sadder moment, and he knew suddenly that all was lost. Kunra and Drathul were already breathing down his neck, and now Shimra had added his breath to the mix. He would carry out Shimra's ridiculous edict, even though there was little point in doing so. But he no longer trusted that Shimra would come up with a final surprise to spring on the alliance. Nomanor's only option was to return to the sensibility he had shucked at Zonama Seacoat. He needed to think only of himself. Survival was in his own hands. He had come full circle to the very place he had found himself in after Ebak 9. It was no manor against everyone. Shimra, Drathul, Kunra, the Jedi, Sonama Seacoat, the universe. His fight was with all of them, and yet with none of them. He wanted nothing more than simply to disappear. Chapter 31 with the Yuzhan Vong Armada regrouped at Coruscant, Errant Venture was able to reach Kantrum without incident. No sooner had the Star Destroyer reverted from hyperspace on the frontier of Kantrum's dense system of inhabited worlds than Booster Terek sought out Luke and Mara in the main docking bay, where Jade Shadow was already being prepped for launch. Alliance Command has ordered us to hold at Contrum 6, the ample Corellian said as he approached the warming ship. Guess the invitation you received doesn't extend to friends. Corrin Horn's father-in-law, Tarek, had a ready smile and a pirate's glint in his roomy eye. We can fix that, Luke started to say. Booster waved in dismissal. Don't bother, but after not being allowed to park on Zonama Seacoat... I'm beginning to feel unwanted. He laughed affably to let them know he wasn't serious. At least Lando managed to smuggle his brandy planet side. The immense hold was stacked high with cargo containers of every conceivable shape and size. 
In the launching bays sat Lando and Tendra's Lady Luck and Talon's wild card, along with dozens of motley starfighters, everything from retrofitted headhunters to uglies, the owners of which had attached themselves to the Smugglers' Alliance after the fall of Coruscant. Krev Bombasa, Talon, and Lando stood at the perimeter of Jade Shadow's landing platform. Mara walked to the open hatch, where Booster was extending his meaty hand to Luke. Take care of yourself, Luke, and remember to put in a good word for us with Wedge. After coming this far, I'm not about to sit out the big one. We'll do what we can, Luke said, but we've been away for almost a year. I'm not expecting an especially warm reception. He turned to Lando and the others and nodded his head goodbye. Mara walked up the ramp and Luke followed her into the ship. Kenth, Silgal, and Madurin were in the forward cabin, strapping in, and R2-D2 was waiting in the cockpit. Mara dropped herself into the pilot's chair and, without another word, lifted Jade Shadow through the docking bay's Magcon field. The several battle groups that made up the Galactic Alliance fleet were arrayed around Contrum Six. A small, frosty planet with only two major cities, Six was a micro-jump from the Perlemian trade route, and two from the Hidian Way. Mara hadn't seen so many warships gathered in one place for a long while, and the sight gave her pause, especially after the long months on Zonama Seacoat. One small light moving among hundreds of others, Jade Shadow began to close on the white behemoth that was Raal Roost. The Yuzhan Vong have done the impossible, Luke said. They've united the galaxy. Nothing like war to bring folks together, Mara said. Everyone rose as Luke, Mara, and the other Jedi entered Raal Roost's war room. Wonderful to see you safe and sound, Admiral Triest Crefe said from his position of prominence at the head conference table. Good start, Mara whispered to Luke while Crefe and the rest resumed their seats. He returned a subtle nod. Let's hope it doesn't go downhill from here. The conference tables formed a square around which were gathered more than twenty Alliance commanders and strategists, including Admiral Seen Sav, Commander Brand, Generals Garm Bell Iblis, Aaron Kraken, Wedge Antilles, and Kean Farlander, Grand Admiral Gilad Pelion, and Queen Mother Tenel Ka. In a noisy hollow field transmitted from an undisclosed location stood half-sized images of Cal Omis and several of his chief advisors, including Niuk Niuv, Golden Ferd Kamasi Reliki Akla, former judicial prosecutor Talam Ranth, and Jedi Master Tracina Lobi. Luke, Mara, and Kenth took seats along the side of the square reserved for them. Silgal and towering Madurin opted to stand. Luke had wanted to have Kip accompany them, but he, Lobaka, Korin, and many of the other Jedi Knights had remained on Zonama Seacoat to begin the process of bonding with seed partners, the embryos of Seacotan ships. Welcome back, Master Skywalker and Mara, Cal Omis said from the weak hollow field. I apologize for having to attend virtually, and also for the absence of Trebok who is on Kashi Eat just now. We understand, Luke said. Crefe cleared his throat in a meaningful way. Because time is of the essence, I will come straight to the point. Preparations are underway to move the combined fleets to Coralag, as phase one of a planned assault on Coruscant. How soon will you launch? Luke asked. Within seventy-two standard hours. Luke glanced around the tables, his gaze lingering slightly, almost clandestinely, on Wedge, Tenel Ka, and Kean Farlander. All of you are in agreement on this? Crefe nodded, seemingly for everyone. But that's not to say that we won't delay the countdown, or even rethink the operation, if you can show good cause for our doing so. We didn't invite you here as a mere courtesy. The Jedi have played an instrumental role in this war from the start and we have come to rely on your guidance, as well as your special strengths. I hope your months of journeying 
have given you insight into some way of ending this war. They have, Luke said. Sav looked at him. Just where have you been, Master Skywalker? In the Unknown Regions, searching for Zonama Seacoat. The planet you appear to have ushered into the Coruscant system, Brand said. Luke turned to the human Commodore. I had no more to do with ushering Zonama Seacoat into known space than I did with designing the planet's hyperspace engines. It came of its own volition. It? Brand said. Zonama Seacoat, Luke repeated. Crefe and Brand swapped perplexed glances. We're eager to hear your reaction to our plans, the Bothan said. Luke nodded. When I learned that you'd moved the combined fleets from Mon Calamari, I assumed that Coruscant was to be the target. Were we wrong to reposition? No, Luke said emphatically. With the holonet incapacitated, the closer we are to Coruscant, the better. Coralag is closer still, Sav said in a leading way. Luke firmed his lips. Coralag is too close. By moving there, we're certain to provoke a response from the Yuzhan Vong. Sullustan Niuk Niuv spoke to it. The Yuzhan Vong are going to want to finish what they began at Mon Calamari. Whether the flotilla repositions or holds fast, an enemy response is guaranteed. Niuv had long been opposed to Jedi intervention in military matters. Some had interpreted his split from would-be chief of state Puo, after the Battle of Borlias, as a hopeful sign, but in fact, his presence on the advisory council was little more than an accommodation to lingering anti-Jedi sentiment. Not necessarily, Luke said. The presence of Zonama Seacoat has thrown Coruscant into turmoil. By now the so-called heretics are rising up, and the elite and the military are divided on what course of action they should take. The hyperspace jump was designed to bring this about. The fact that the timing was so fortunate, that Zonama Seacoat's arrival drew the Yuzhan Vong Armada from Mon Calamari, convinces me that our actions were right. As a means of continuing what we've started, I hope to persuade you to allow the disorder on Coruscant to play out. If we do this, it's my belief that Shimra will be brought down from within, and that we can then reach an accord with the Yuzhan Vong Warmaster. Luke's statement unleashed a torrent of criticism and rebuke. With everyone speaking at once, Mara leaned in to whisper, Welcome to the downhill stretch. Luke's confidence in the heretics was not all it might have been, considering that the so-called prophet was none other than Noma Nor. But given the galvanizing effect Zonama Seacoat had had on the heretics, it was possible that the movement had taken on a life of its own. The reports we have received corroborate that Coruscant is in turmoil, Crefe allowed, when most of the separate conversations had died down which is precisely the reason to strike. The Yuzhan Vong may never be this weak again. Yes, Shimra stands a chance of being brought down by the heretics, but it's not Shimra we're worried about. We're worried about the Armada. We succeeded in inflicting damage at Mon Calamari, and unless we follow through now, we fear we'll lose what scant advantage we have. The Armada isn't any weaker now than it was when Mon Calamari was attacked, Kent said. What damage we did has been offset by the arrival of Yuzhan Vong battle groups from far-flung sectors. More important, Coruscant's planetary shields, the Dovin Basil Gravitic fields, have yet to be tested, let alone stormed. We're not concerned about the orbital Dovin Basils, Sav said in a dismissive way. Regardless, attacking Coruscant is not the solution, Luke added. Under Shimra's influence, the world brain has the capacity to render the entire planet uninhabitable. So unless that's our aim, we must rethink our strategy. The matter of the world brain was raised at earlier briefings, Sav said succinctly. With all due respect, Master Skywalker, that information has never been confirmed.
We will also have the advantage of fighting in our home system, Brand said. Our pilots will be able to fly circles around the Vong, lead them on chases, attack from Weirden, Thakas, Salich. Thanks to what the Remnant has provided, we now know routes into and out of the deep core that the Vong haven't explored. Insertion points from Empress Teta, exit points up and down the Ag circuit. What's more, we don't have to worry about inflicting secondary damage on the planet-side population. Not all of it, at any rate. Crefe regarded Luke. You must understand, if it were any world other than Coruscant. But retaking Coruscant is fundamental to building and maintaining the Galactic Alliance. Who controls Coruscant controls the core, and without the core, the Alliance is nothing. Luke set his elbows on the table and interlocked his fingers. You're thinking like the New Republic did. You were a member of the New Republic, Master Skywalker, Niuk Niuv's hologram said. Luke nodded. But this is a different war, a war that can't be won the way you're planning to win it. Would you annihilate every Yuzhan Vong in order to free Coruscant and all other occupied worlds? We might, Brand said. Was that the intent when Alpha Red was deployed? The question hung in the air for several moments before Seen Sav spoke. Alpha Red is not under discussion at this conference. Then it's not terminated? Silgal asked worriedly. I will say again that the project is not under discussion. Crefe was quick to change the subject. We have a window of opportunity that could seal itself at any moment. How long would the Jedi have us wait? Luke frowned. It's not a matter of days or weeks. The Yuzhan Vong have demonstrated time and again that they won't surrender. It's no more in their nature than a policy of extermination is in ours. He looked around. Unless all of you have changed dramatically in my absence. Would you seed them, Coruscant? Aaron Kraken asked. If I thought it would end the war, I might. That's a treasonous statement, Brand said, then softened his tone to add, We've had our disagreements in the past. Can we trust the Jedi not to interfere with what we have to do? We won't interfere. Crefe shot Brand a warning look. For the sake of argument, and in the spirit of good fellowship, what would you have us do while we're waiting for things to unravel on Coruscant? Divide and redistribute the combined fleets, Kent said. Dispatch battle groups to Bathawi, Bilbringi, and other essential worlds. Reclaim those systems while the Yuzhan Vong are preoccupied with the heretics. Then, when they are truly at their weakest, move against Coruscant from as many systems as possible. Sav made a fatigued sound. Perhaps the Jedi are unaware that... Several Yuzhan Vong battle groups have not heeded Nas Choka's orders to withdraw to the core. Rather, they appear determined to hold on to the systems they've conquered, regardless of what happens at Coruscant. The dereliction of those commanders has nothing to do with maintaining superiority, Luke said. They're afraid that they will be ordered to attack Zonama Seacoat. Crefe shook his head in confusion. Why should they be afraid? Just what is this planet to them? Luke stood up, encouraging everyone to focus on him. Everything the Yuzhan Vong might have been. He paused, then added, Fifty years ago, when the Yuzhan Vong were first scouting our galaxy, they attempted to claim Zonama Seacoat, and the planet fought them off. As a living world, it figures deeply in their religion, and its sudden reappearance is viewed as an omen of defeat, a sign from the gods that the invasion itself was a terrible mistake. In some respect, the shamed ones view the planet as important to their destiny, their liberation, and they will revolt if Shimra sanctions an attack. But the real danger to Shimra will come finally from his elite some of whom are bound to see Zonama Seacoat as a divine intervention. Crefe stared at Luke in wonder. How do you come by this knowledge? 
Luke turned to the admiral. From the lips of a Yuzhan Vong priest, who even now is on Zonama Seacoat. Brandt narrowed his eyes in suspicion. How do you know that this priest isn't a spy? He looked imploringly at Sav. If word of our operation gets back to this priest. Zonama Seacoat knows the Yuzhan Vong, Luke insisted. It knows how to deal with them. It is more like the original Yuzhan Tar than Coruscant can ever be made to seem. Crefe was clearly in a quandary. You keep saying it. Are you referring to the planet itself? Yes. Sav was beginning to lose patience. If Sonama Seacoat has some secret plan for ending the war, as either mediator or battle station, it had better act quickly. As things stand, I see no reason to alter our plans for moving against Coralag. There's no room for neutrality at this stage, Brand said. You're part of the Alliance or you're against it. Gilad Pelion broke a brief but uneasy silence. I've been reluctant to broach this, but Imperial records suggest that former Grand Moff Tarkin once expressed interest in Zonama Seacoat based on rumors that the planet was capable of producing living ships. Sav and the others watched Luke. Is that the planet's secret? the Sullustan asked. Is Zonama Seacoat planning to wage its own war on the Yuzhan Vong? Zonama Seacoat will not produce warships, Luke said flatly. Crefe gave his head a mournful shake. Master Skywalker... Unless Zonama Seacoat's governing body is at least willing to permit the planet to be employed as a staging area for the assault on Coruscant, it is of no use to us. The governing body won't permit that. Then can we at least employ it as a diversion? Brand asked. If, as you say, it has already destabilized the Yuzhan Vong, perhaps we can make it appear more of an actual threat. If the Vong can be induced to attack Zonama Seacoat, we may have a clear shot at Coruscant. Luke considered it. It may be willing to do that. Crefe put his hands flat on the table. It's now or never. I'll grant that attacking Coruscant constitutes a perilous risk, but it's one we have to take. We can't afford to be placed on the defensive again. Scatter the fleets, and who knows how many additional systems might fall. We simply don't have the resources to jump from one to the other each time the enemy launches an attack. Attrition will become our enemy. He looked at Luke and the others. I realize that the Yuzhan Vong are still strong, but battles aren't always about numbers. As you well know, Master Skywalker... Having turned the tide of the Civil War with a couple of well-placed proton torpedoes. I had help with that, Luke said. Are you suggesting that the Force isn't with us now? Sav asked. The Force is always with us, Admiral. Then we can rely on your help, Crefe said. Luke nodded and motioned to the Anx Jedi, Madurin. What Jedi we can spare will continue to serve on the bridges of our capital ships, as they did at Ebak 9 and Mon Calamari. He was about to add more when Tycho Selchu suddenly entered the war room. Before Tycho so much as uttered a word, Luke caught Silgal's sharp intake of breath. Please forgive the interruption, Admiral Sav, the blue-eyed human general said in a low voice. I regret to inform everyone that my wife, Winter, has just contacted me from Mon Calamari, with news that retired Admiral Akbar has died. As she approached Zonama Seacoast landing platform, Jaina saw that Corin, Kip, Tekli, Alima, and several of the other Jedi had gathered while she had been off searching for Jason. With five seed partners apiece, Kip and Saba had bonded with the highest number. Fist-sized, fuzzy white orbs, the seed partners had attached themselves to Kip's robe and Saba's tunic. Corin had four, while Kyle, Lobaka, Alima, and the other candidates were hosting only two apiece. Jabitha had said that Anakin Skywalker had bonded with nine, 
the highest number anyone had ever bonded with. The Magister had also explained that when the seed partners eventually sloughed their shells, they would be able to crawl about on four tiny legs and issue shrieks and whimpers. Thinking about it only increased Jaina's disappointment and confusion. Zunama Seacoat's air was still a comfortable temperature, though not as warm as it had been when she first arrived. Reuniting with everyone had been wonderful, but after two local days of swapping stories, the inactivity was starting to get to her. She recalled having felt the same on Moon Calamari after her return from Hapes. While Luke had been occupied matching wits with Verger, Jason had been off reef diving with Danny, and the members of the Smuggler's Alliance had been busy rigging the election of Cal Omis. With Coruscant a micro-jump sunward, and a final confrontation with the Yuzhan Vong looming on the horizon, she wanted more than ever to be back in the cockpit of her X-Wing, if only to keep from losing her edge. But Twin Suns One, along with the Millennium Falcon, Tsar Sabatine's Skip Ray blast boat, and the other starfighters, remained in stationary orbit. That left only the Seacoton shuttle, which was off-limits to her, and the planet's numerous airships, which were more for sailors than fighter pilots. She was considering her options when Jason stepped from a dense growth of Boris. "'I've been looking all over for you,' she said. "'Where were you? Practicing making yourself small or something?' Jason emerged from his trance or musings, or daydreams for all Jaina knew, and gazed at her. "'The force is strong here. The usual methods don't work.' That's for sure, she muttered. Jason watched her for a moment. Are you angry about something? She pressed her lips together and shook her head. I guess I'm just disappointed. Jason glanced at Kip and the others and understood immediately. Because none of the seed partners bonded with you. What else? she snapped. I mean, I'm as good a pilot as Kip, Saba, or Corin and they bonded with seed partners right away. At Moon Calamari, I flew my X-Wing into combat with only one engine. Piloting skills have little to do with the bonding process, Jason said, or with courage, for that matter. She forced a sigh. Great, then I guess I'm just not as attuned to the Force as they are. You know that isn't it. Jason placed his hand on her shoulder and turned her toward him. It could be that Seacoat sees some other purpose for you. She rolled her eyes. Easy for you to say you didn't even try bonding with the seed partners. The idea appeared to amuse him. I'm not anything close to a pilot. Yeah, well, neither am I. I'm just the official sword of the Jedi, whatever that means. She fell silent for a moment, then said, Jason, do the Yuzhan Vong pose a threat to the Force? He shook his head. They're a threat to the Jedi because they'd have us all embrace their religion and their gods, and see the universe strictly as they see it. But no matter how the war is decided, individuals will continue to find their way to the Force. It's not a flame the Yuzhan Vaughn can extinguish, any more than the Sith could. And you're still wanting to fight to make sure that doesn't happen. In my own way, I've learned something about myself since Centerpoint. From Verger, you mean? From Verger, from Seacoat, from all of you. I'm starting to think that the Force, at least as we understand it, is only one facet of a finely cut gemstone, and that maybe the sum of it is even greater than its parts. Jaina looked over at Kip and the others. At least Zonama Seacoat is willing to fight alongside us. That will be Seacoat's decision. She turned to him. Based on what? On whose interests the Jedi are serving? We serve the Force, Jason said. None other. Is that justification enough for obliterating the Yuzhan Vong? No, he said, seemingly more firmly than he had intended. They are not outside the Force. According to Seacoat, they have been stripped of the Force. So I've heard, Jaina said. But then, what do you think the Force wants for the Yuzhan Vong? 
Jason smiled lightly. If I knew, we'd have the answer to ending the war. Chapter 32 Look at you, cowering like a herd of yanskaks. The Supreme Overlord railed at the elite from his spike-backed throne in the Citadel's Hall of Confluence. On the eve of victory, you allow yourselves to be frightened by an illusion, a piece of celestial chicanery. Even while cringing with the rest of them, Noma Nor had to give Shimra credit. Despite the tremors that continued to rock Yuzhan Tar and the dangerous innuendos that threatened to undermine his divine right to rule, the Supreme Overlord refused to be intimidated, if not entirely unmoved. With his long arms jerking about and his legs quivering, he looked like a puppet in a shadow play. Some said that his implanted eyes, too, were rarely still and were constantly shifting color. Shimra raised the scepter of power toward the hall's ribbed ceiling. Some of you are whispering that the bright light that rises at sunset is an omen of doom. A living world rumored to have been encountered during the rule of my predecessor, whose name I will not deign to mention. I am not unacquainted with this rumor. Following my ascension to the throne, I dispatched forces to search out this world, this Zonama seacoat, only to be informed that it was not to be found. So I asked myself, had it disappeared? Had Zonama seacoat been destroyed? Or was it nothing more than a lie perpetrated by my predecessor in an attempt to keep us from conquering and occupying what was by God's given right our entitled domain? While Shemra paused, Onimi circulated among the audience, baiting members of the elite to respond. Much to the displeasure of High Prefect Drathul, Nom Anor had conveyed Shemra's orders to the priests of the temples, enjoining them to devote their attention to Yun Harla rather than Yun Yuzhan or Yun Yamka. As a result, the royal seers were beside themselves with apprehension, expecting deception and manipulation of the worst sort and the elite were wondering whether Shimra's actions had been undertaken for the benefit of the Yuzhan Vong or for Shimra himself. I will reveal the truth of it, the Supreme Overlord said at last. The bright light is not a trick of the eye. It is, in fact, the same living world. The audience was stunned into even more profound silence, especially Drathul and his coterie of Coriol supporters. But the pronouncement was every bit as staggering to Noma Nor. Coming clean was the last thing he had expected Shimra to do. How could the gods allow this, you ask yourselves? Shimra went on in a tone of theatrical melancholy. How, after all we have done to provide them with sacrifices and converts? After all we have done to cleanse this galaxy of infidels and heretics, could the gods turn on us? Again, I will supply the answer. This ill-omened world has been placed in the hands of our enemy as a final test of our worthiness to reign over them, a final test to gauge the strength of the Yuzhan Vong heart. Shimra pounded the floor with his amphistaff in a demand for silence. And yet, what a daunting test they have set before us. A weak-minded person, a dissenter or a skeptic, might be tempted to believe that the gods have abandoned us, and that there is no possible way for us to succeed. I have thought long and hard about this. I have prayed, and I have ventured beyond contemplation and entreaty to look deep into our history for answers. And the gods have rewarded my search. Shimra paused again while a tremor rumbled the citadel. Then he pointed the scepter to Kila Quad and her adepts. The shapers know what I'm referring to when I speak of the Eighth Cortex. But for you commanders and intendants, even for some of you priests, I will explain. The Cortex contains the protocols for shapings. The protocols that originally guided the hands of our ancestors in creating Dovan basils and villips, coral skippers and yamisks. It is not a place, but a state of mind. 
and as one approaches the superlative cortex, the eighth cortex, one comes full circle to the beginnings of the Yuzhan Vong, to our primordial state of being. And what I found there, after enduring much pain and letting much blood, so much blood that my body howled in torment, was the solution, cast in the form of a simple lesson, such as might be taught to our spawn in the creches. The lesson is this, that when they fashioned the universe, and ultimately the Yuzhan Vong, the gods dispensed with all inequities by ensuring that the qualities of one creation would always balance the qualities of another. Where a poisonous tree takes root, adjacent to it, stands a tree that provides the antidote for the poison. Where there are deserts, there are oases of water. And where the waters are vast, there emerge islands of sand and stone. This is the way of the gods, ensuring balance at every turn. I held this thought in mind when, in the depths of the eighth cortex, I heard a voice utter. The rainbow bridge will appear and disappear, Onimi recited from the center of the hall, and the gods will make it seem that they are the authors of a great conflict. When the eclipse of the sun will then be, the divine omen will be seen in plain sight. Quite otherwise will one interpret it, for when a menacing stranger appears at the portal, look close at hand for the amphistaff that will send the stranger on its way. A revelation, I told myself. Shimra took over, clearly from Yun Harla. So I ordered the temple priests to beseech the goddess for help, to sacrifice to her, and to treat her as if she were supreme overlord of the universe. And our supplications have not gone unnoticed, for she has provided us with the solution to the test the gods have placed at our portal. Noma Noor could barely keep his features from mirroring his inner state of confoundment. He wasn't the only person in the Hall of Confluence who knew that the Eighth Cortex was nothing more than a pretense, empty as a gravitic yield of a Dovin basil. So what was Shimra doing, conjuring revelations from non-existent protocols? Obviously, he had concocted the riddle and its resolution, but to what end? Once more, the elite had to wait, while a more powerful quake shook the citadel, causing Yorick coral dust to rain from the vaulted ceiling high overhead. The solution has only just been delivered to Yuzhan Tar, Shimra said, delivered in the form of a stricken space vessel and its crew of afflicted slayers and a dying shaper. On a remote and insignificant world known as Kalula, the vessel and its passengers fell prey to a virulent chemical agent created by our enemy, and released in the hope of destroying all things Yuzhan Vong, from myself down to the simplest of our creations. The chemical agent might have done just that, had it not been for the acuity of the Shaper, the unconventional actions of his valorous crew of warriors, and the perceptiveness of your supreme overlord, who ordered that the vessel be kept from setting down on Yuzhan Tar, or coming in contact with any other vessels. Now, witness the beauty of cosmic balance at work. Churak, Yun Chalat. Witness the will of the gods. For this ill-omened world that lights our night sky, this living world encountered by our forces so many years ago, drifting at the very rim of this galaxy, must, too, have been fashioned by Yun Yuzhan, and be linked to us in prophecy, linked and therefore vulnerable to the deadly contagion fashioned by our enemy, and sanctioned by the gods. Once more Shimra gesticulated with the scepter of power. The crippled vessel is the amphistaff we will hurl to drive the stranger from our gate. The ship that shall be our salvation, and our means of transcending the test the gods have seen fit to engineer. Nome Anor was beginning to feel like a newlith, inflated by Shimra one moment, only to be deflated the next. A toxic chemical agent capable of poisoning Zonama Seacoat? 
Anyone familiar with Commander Zhou Krashmir's reconnaissance mission to the living world knew that Krashmir had attempted and failed to poison Zonama Seacoat. And if a Yuzhan Vong-created toxin had failed, how could an enemy-produced toxin be expected to succeed? More important, if such a bioweapon existed, surely no Manor's former network of spies among the Peace Brigade, or those still in place on Mon Calamari, would have learned of it by now. Had Shimra concocted the story only to rally the warriors and priests, and ensure that the Yuzhan Vong die in a blaze of glory? Or had No Manor underestimated the Supreme Overlord yet again? Was he even more brilliant than he had first seemed on usurping the throne? Zonama Seacoat is a Death Star, Shimra was saying. He aimed his amphistaff at Nas Choka and his Supreme Commanders. Fly to it, Warmaster. Take your mighty armada to Zonama Seacoat, and make clear to the gods the unflinching resolve of the Yuzhan Vong. What does the Force want for the Yuzhan Vong? The question echoed in Jason's mind long after he had returned to the hollow that had become his haunt on Zonama Seacoat. He drew his lightsaber from his cloth belt, activated the green blade, and waved it through the brisk air. Unnerved by the thrumming sound, birds perched in the surrounding Boris took to the pale blue sky. Jason stood with his feet parallel, right foot forward, carrying his weight on the balls of his feet, then springing off his rear foot in attack. On the slope of the hill, he spread his feet wider and angled them to one another. He swung the blade without ducking or flinching, bobbing or weaving, assuming an ideal attitude as he glided forward in uninterrupted motion or took short steps with each foot to maintain his focus and equilibrium. He held the pommel at middle guard, slightly in front of his stomach, with the tip angled up at thirty degrees, and worked through several velocity and doulon sequences. Then, lowering the tip as if to point at an opponent's knees, he slashed diagonally upward. He raised the lightsaber over his head, handle pointed to his imaginary opponent's eyes, critically angled for a Yuzhan Vong, and slashed downward. Elbows pointed to the ground, he held the lightsaber upright over his right shoulder and alongside his head, then spun through a series of Jung attacks and Jung Ma parries. Finally, he held the lightsaber low on his right side, with the blade pointing at the ground behind him, and performed a sweeping upward diagonal. Front flipping high into the air to the edge of the pool, he threw himself through force-assisted rolls and full-circle whirls, shooting to his feet to execute rotating side strokes and short-twisting wrist snaps until his breath came fast and sweat dripped from his face. Sensing then that someone was watching him, he deactivated the blade in sudden self-consciousness. He sighed and sat down. He was a decent lightsaber master and psi acrobat, but nowhere near as skilled as Luke, Kip, Mara, Corin, or Anakin. His heart just wasn't in it. As he stared at the hilt of his lightsaber, his thoughts began to spiral back three years to the planet Duro, and the vision he had had returned to him as if no time had passed. One moment he was working alongside a group of Rin refugees, and the next he was falling backward into a vacuum. Hearing Luke calling to him, he pivoted to see his uncle robed in pure white, half turned away, holding his shimmering lightsaber in a diagonal stance, hands at hip level, point high. Jason shouted that Jaina had been hurt, but Luke didn't respond to him. Luke's attention was fixed instead on a Yuzhan Vong warrior, in rust-brown armor, who was holding an amphistaff across his body and mirroring Luke's stance. Standing on the far side of the slowly spinning disk that held the three of them, the warrior wasn't visible through the Force. He was simply a void, a darkness that promised death as surely as Luke's luminosity promised life. The disk resolved into a spiral-armed galaxy. Poised at the center, Luke dropped into a fighting stance, raising his lightsaber to his right shoulder point upward, while Yuzhan Vong warriors advanced from the darkness. Luke was steadfast, 
holding the center and counterweighing the invaders, until at last their numbers increased sufficiently to tip the balance of the disk in their direction. Desperate to know what to do, Jason called to Luke again. This time Luke turned and tossed his lightsaber in a low humming arc, trailing pale green sparks onto the galactic plane. Anger welled up in Jason, even as fear and fury focused his strength. He wanted to destroy the enemy. He stretched out his hand for the lightsaber and missed. That miss was all it took. A dark, deadly tempest gathered around the invaders, and the galactic plane tipped more swiftly toward them. Jason felt himself begin to shrink until he was no more than a tiny, insignificant point in the dark tempest. Helpless, disarmed by a moment of anger, doomed by a single misstep, the galaxy doomed with him. A voice like Luke's, but deeper, shook the star fields, booming. Jason, stand firm. The horizon tilted farther, and Jason lunged forward, determined to lend his small weight to Luke's side, to the light, only to misstep once more. He flailed for his uncle's hand, missing time and again. Finally, Luke seized Jason's hand and held it tightly, urging him to weather the storm. The slope steepened under their feet. Stars extinguished. The enemy scrambled forward, eclipsing worlds, entire star clusters, distant galaxies. And again the voice boomed. Stand firm. As the Yuzhan Vong attacked. Jason returned to himself, to the here and now. Since that vision, he had fought the enemy and countless worlds. Wounded War Master Savong La, triumphed over many lesser opponents, been stripped of and returned to the Force by Verger, and been deemed a knight by his Jedi Master Luke. And yet he continued to feel as if he were a student. The Jedi of the Old Republic had been too focused on indoctrination and ranks. If you were a Padawan, then you were something less than a knight. And if you were a knight, you were something less than a master. But who was to say, now that there was no Jedi Council of sagacious masters, that even a mere Padawan couldn't be more forceful than someone of higher rank? Perhaps it was something a Jedi needed to hear directly from the Force? Ranks now were more like battlefield promotions, like Jaina's promotion to colonel. Even the Jedi knighting ceremony, it made no more sense to him than it had to Jaina. They had to analyze their paths separately from those things. But if his twenty years of tutelage had been his education, and the time he had spent with Verger in the bowels of the Yuzhan Vong seed ship and unconquered Coruscant had constituted the trials of a Padawan, what then was the decision he faced now? Was it, too, not a trial of sorts? What does the Force want for the Yuzhan Vong? Stand firm, the voice in the vision had told him. Occasionally he would get a sense that his education was nearing completion, and that the past year had been his true trial, possibly unlike any a Jedi Knight had ever faced. But the feeling never lasted long. Practicing, Jason? A female voice asked suddenly. He knew then who had been watching him. Seacoat's thought projection of Verger rose from the center of the pool. Always, he said. To achieve what? Mastery. Verger nodded. Jason, to tap deeply into the unifying force, we will have to surrender our desire to control events. We will have to unbridle ourselves of words and of thinking, because thoughts, too, are born of the physical world. We must refrain from analyzing the Force, and simply allow the Force to guide us. Our relationship with the Force must be impeccable, without the need to be supported by words or reason. We must carry out the commands of the Force as if they were beyond appeal. And we must do what must be done, no matter who attempts to stand in our way. Chapter 33 We are committed, Wedge told himself, as explosions bloomed like time-lapse fire flowers over nightside Coralag. Its surface etched with intersecting trails of light, the core world filled the bridge viewports of Mon Mothma. Between the planet and the refitted Star Destroyer floated Yuzhan Vong Matalox and Yorika Kaga. 
blushed cruisers and pearlescent pickets, arrayed to provide cover for a swift-moving Yamask carrier cluster ship. Harried by squadrons of X and E wings, disgorged from the warships, Moan Adapine and Alagos Akla, the enemy vessels were saturating local space with blazing projectiles and gouts of superheated ejecta, but they were already beginning to pay the price for having been caught unawares. A state of controlled frenzy prevailed on Moan Mothma's bridge with couriers and officers coming and going, and Wedge attempting to sustain half a dozen separate conversations. Displays flickered and computer consoles chirped as updates were transmitted from gunnery, communications, and tactical centers elsewhere in the ship. As accustomed to the noise as Wedge had become, he couldn't help but reflect on the reasons that had prompted his retirement, especially now in the wake of Akbar's death. His uniform and command cap felt borrowed from someone two sizes smaller. The surprise attack had required his battle group to jump directly from Contrum to the Bormia sector, inserting as close to Coralag as was achievable, given the planet's several moons and formidable defenses. Once the site of an Imperial Navy base, the largest moon had been transformed into a kind of rest facility for enemy patrol vessels assigned to the Perlemian trade route. Scimitar assault bombers were laying waste to the facility now, while Shocker and Black Moon Squadron starfighters nipped at the Yamask carrier like packs of rapacious howl runners. Generals Farlander and Selchu have the enemy boxed in, Moan Mothma's commander reported. Harbinger has dropped from hyperspace and is pressing forward at battle speed to rendezvous with the Lagos Akla at rally point Manka Flechette Dubak. With Moan Mothma too far removed to allow for visual contact with any of the capital ships, Wedge studied the tactical console's checkerboard of display screens. Determined to shield the Yamask vessel, the Yuzhan Vong cruisers were indeed bracketed by Moan Adapine and Alagos Akla, both of which were lancing the enemy configuration with continuous bursts of turbolaser fire. And now, closing fast, was Harbinger, the Moan Cal cruiser commanded by Garm Bel Iblis. Caught in the crossfire, coral skippers were being pulverized almost as fast as they could be deployed. With its quick-response cannons and gravity well generators, Moan Mothma was seeing to any skips that escaped the cordon. Korlag itself was taking punishment. Evidence of orbital bombardment and surface fighting, infrared hotspots were flaring in and around many of the major cities. Decrypted transmissions revealed that the fighting was intense and atrocities were widespread. Unlike other worlds along that important stretch of the Perlemian, Chandrilla, Brental, and Raltir, Korolag had capitulated to the Yuzhan Vong to escape devastation. No one had expected otherwise of a planetary government that had supported the Emperor during the Galactic Civil War, and had since been forced to languish in Coruscant's shadow. Regardless, most of Korolag's ten billion citizens opposed the puppet government set up by the Yuzhan Vong, and simmering discontent had finally erupted into open rebellion. The wealthiest and most influential families fled for Kuat and Kaminor. But there was no evading the Yuzhan Vong. Kuat had fallen soon after Senator Puo's brief visit, and Kaminor had been hit hard and repeatedly. Galvanized by the rescue of Korlag's unofficial hero, Judder Page, Resistance groups on and off-world had reached out to the Alliance for help in liberating the planet, at whatever cost to life and limb. Sav and Crefe couldn't have been more receptive to in-system support for the invasion. If Korlag could be reclaimed, the Alliance would hold a key hyperspace position in the core. Even two standard months earlier, an assault would have proved catastrophic. Yuzhan Vong forces had been deployed well into the slice, from Coruscant through Al Sakin, almost all the way to Coralag, and from Ixtlar and Wakar on the Corellian run a quarter of the way around the core toward Kuat and Kaminor, 
But with dozens of battle groups withdrawn to join the Armada, Korlag had been left vulnerable at last. Wedge's gaze was still glued to the displays when Captain Devis drew his attention to a tight formation of fighter craft emerging from Korlag's crescent of transitor. Ties? Wedge said in genuine surprise. Ours or theirs? I'm not sure, sir. Then find out. Transmission from Coromel, Lieutenant Sell interrupted while Devis was hurrying off. Governor Foradell, sir. Wedge recognized the name of Corlag's capital city, but not the name of the governor. Nodding curtly to the comm officer, he swung to the hollow projector, where a quarter-scale human figure stood in the noisy field. We've been waiting almost two years for this, Fordell said jubilantly. Sporting an eye patch and a floppy cap, he could have stepped from a suspense holodrama. Corlag will forever be indebted to the Alliance. The battle's not won yet, Wedge said. And just, who are you, anyway? Foradell saluted awkwardly. The Resistance has appointed me provisional governor. Where's the former governor? Foradell smiled. I'm glad you asked, because I've been eager to show you. Images from what were obviously Coramel media feeds began to resolve in the hollow field. One showed the former governor hanging by the neck in a city square, while a lynch mob of humans and humanoids pelted him with stones. Other scenes showed bound and bloodied Yuzhan Vong and other members of the occupation government being dragged or shoved through the streets by crowds of vigilantes. Wedge was thankful that he hadn't been asked to oversee ground-based operations, as he had done at Borlias. Soon enough, similar scenes of vengeance would be repeated on countless worlds. The rage was understandable and reminiscent of the retributions that had been doled out to imperial forces in the wake of the Emperor's death. And Wedge held little sympathy for the captured Yuzhan Vong warriors. All his life he had fought for what he believed in, and for the protection of those he loved. Iela, his daughters, his sister and friends and the Yuzhan Vong had nearly torn his world and family apart. A point could be made that the Yuzhan Vong fought for similar reasons, but the invaders had yet to demonstrate even an instance of charity or tolerance. Worship and blind obedience substituted for love and honor. And yet for all his soldiers' resolve, Wedge recognized that he could still be rattled by a canny glance from Luke Skywalker. Listening to him and Mara address the command staff on Raoul Roost, Wedge had been struck once more by the fact that the Alliance and the Jedi were waging very different wars against the Yuzhan Vong. Where Alliance command measured victory in terms of control, the Jedi were focused on a means of ending the war that would also conclude a cycle of violence. Luke feared that the extermination of the Yuzhan Vong would deal a death blow to the newly hatched Galactic Federation of Free Alliances. With a single step toward the dark side, the fate of future generations would be sealed. As was true with the Yuzhan Vong, the Jedi were prepared to martyr themselves to an ideal. Both were fighting to sustain a world view. At the center of one stood the gods, at the center of the other, the Force. Wedge wondered what might become of those Yuzhan Vong who weren't burned or beaten to death in the streets of Kuramel or some other once-occupied capital city. What was the next step after disarmament? Imprisonment? Exile? Could an entire species be put on trial for its beliefs? And even if found guilty of war crimes, would the Yuzhan Vong permit themselves to be isolated under guard in some remote star system? Or would their defeat, the fact that they had failed their gods, drive them to self-destruction? Should self-extinction be accepted as an alternative because death figured so strongly in their society? Or would the death of the extragalactic species upset the balance of the Force in some fashion? That such questions were best left to the Jedi was the reason Wedge, Kean Farlander, certainly Tenel Ka, and many other Alliance commanders had implicit faith in Luke's leadership, 
At Borlias, when Wedge himself had formed the secret resistance group known as the Insiders, he had essentially made a pact with the Force and felt duty-bound to uphold it. You've entered a reign of evil, General Antilles, Foradell was saying from the hollow field. You should be proud. Wedge cut the provisional governor off before he could continue. Our scanners have picked up a squadron of TIE fighters launched from Kuramel. Peace brigaders, Foradell explained. The fighters were restored from parts warehoused at the old Imperial Academy. Hunt them down, General. Don't leave a single ship unscathed. That's all the information I need at the moment, Governor. Wedge waved for Lieutenant Sell to end the hollow transmission with Coromel, then said, Alert General Selchu that those ties are not friendlies. Tell him that Harbinger has his back if he needs help dealing with them. The fighting above Nightside Coralag was heating up. Coral skippers and snub fighters were engaged in a mad dance of mutual destruction, while the capital ships they flew from were attempting to pummel one another senseless with plasma missiles and energy bolts. Two globules of the cluster vessel had imploded, but judging by the performance of the swarming skips, the war coordinator was uninjured. On the moon, bombers were continuing to hammer the repair installation, but they were now taking fire from ground-based KDY turbo lasers, probably refurbished by the same turncoat technicians who had resurrected the ties. Sir, Admiral Crefe, Sell said from her duty station. Wedge strode back to the hollow projector in time to see Crefe's image take shape amid random bursts of diagonal static. General Antilles, the Bothan began, on your say-so, I'm prepared to move Raoul Roost and elements of the First Fleet to Coralag. Wedge shook his head. We need more time here, Admiral, a couple of standard hours at least. You have one hour, General, Crefe said evenly. We've received word from Coruscant that our actions at Coralag have not gone unnoticed. Nas Choka's armada is active. It's not clear just yet whether the War Master is repositioning his vessels to defend Coruscant, or if he intends to move the armada rimward in advance of going to hyperspace. If it's the latter, I doubt he'll squander his forces by reinforcing Coralag. He may, however, elect to jump the armada to Contrum, and I want to be gone from here by then. Where do you want us? Wedge asked. Take Moan Adapine and Alego Sakla and rally with the Second Fleet at Muscave. I realize I'm placing your battle group in harm's way by sending you directly into the Coruscant system, but our objective is to accomplish the reverse of what we did at Moan Calamari by drawing the enemy into engagements at Outer System Worlds. Concurrently, I'll be dispatching elements of the Third Fleet to Coruscant from the Shawkin Spur of the Hidian and elements of the fourth by way of the Marshall Cross. Regardless of whether the Armada jumps for Contrum or advances to engage your forces at Muscave, the assault on Coruscant can commence. Did I hear right that Vanguard Squadron has been attached to the Fourth Fleet? Wedge asked. That's correct. That means that the Chiss will be directly involved in the assault on Coruscant. Vanguard and Twin Sons have been folded into a single squadron, commanded by Group Commander Fell. Wedge was perplexed. Jag is leading Twin Sons. Where's Jaina? Jedi Skywalker asked that we exempt her from the roster. Crefe muttered, I recognize that Coruscant is a long way from Chiss space, and I know that you're concerned for the welfare of your nephew, Wedge, but Jag himself requested the mission. Wedge nodded. I'll just have to find a way to explain to my sister why I didn't talk some sense into her son. Crefe gestured noncommittally. Colonel Fell's group, along with Rogue and Wraith squadrons, will fly escort for the troop transports and gunships we hope to slip through Coruscant's Dovin Basil Gravitic Wells. Once planet side, Captain Page's commando company will rendezvous with resistance forces and proceed to the landing field at what was Westport. Moon Mothma's tactical officer sent a star chart of the Coruscant system to the hollow projector. 
Wedge saw that Coruscant and the outer worlds of Muscave and Stentat were all on the same side of the sun, within sixty degrees of one another. Calculating the time required for the hyperspace jump to Muscave, Wedge's battle group would be arriving just as Shimra's citadel and the sacred precinct were heading into daybreak. Admiral, is Zonama Seacoat still orbiting between Muscave and Stantat? To the best of our knowledge, Crefay said, but that planet is the Jedi's problem, not ours. Even before the transmission from Rao Roost faded, Wedge spun on his heel to Lieutenant Sell. Inform General Selchu and Farlander that we will be repositioning in one standard hour. Then find me a secure frequency to errant venture and patch it through to my comlink. Replacing his command cap with a headset, Wedge paced away from the bridge duty stations while the link to booster Tarek's Star Destroyer was being established. Insider One, your transmission is secure, a voice said through Wedge's earphones. Lando here, Wedge. Wedge adjusted the fit of the headset. Lando, in just under a standard hour, I'll be repositioning my group to Muscave. Good news. That means Zonama Seacoat will be inside your lines. Not as good as it sounds. Alliance Command has written the planet off as the Jedi's concern. You think it'll go to hyperspace? I don't know, Lando, but some of us should be there in case anyone needs to be evacuated. You can count on us, Insider One. I'll also pass the word to Tanel Ka. May the Force be with you, Lando. It had better be. Mired at Contrum for longer than they had anticipated, Luke and Mara had missed the seed partner's ceremony, but everyone who had participated was still talking about it long after Jade Shadow returned to Zonama Seacoat. Kip, Corin, and Saba spoke in wonderment of having been led across a symbolic bridge and through a lamina-surfaced tunnel into concealed courtyards, filled with pharaoh and celebrants wearing brightly colored costumes. Having adhered to a special diet, the Jedi candidates had worn sashed robes and necklaces strung with blood-red, gourd-like fruits. Following a series of litanies chanted by Magister Jabitha and the Pharaohans, each of the candidates had had to offer a gift and introduce him or herself to Seacoat in a way that reminded Kip of the ceremony that had taken place at Ithor four years earlier. Finally, the seed partners emerged from their shells as pale oblate bulbs, with eye spots and tiny grasper-equipped legs, had been separated from their bond partners and conveyed to the cybernetic organisms that would summon lightning and give shape to the living ships produced from the seeds. Bred by Zonama Seacoat's original magisters, the cyborgs were known as the Gentari. After listening to a dozen separate accounts of the ceremony from as many Jedi, Luke almost felt as if he had attended it personally, and he was eager to see the living ships. Seacoat had had extensive conversations with Danny, and now Silgal, about Dovin Basils, and Lobaka and others were trying to figure a way to use comlinks for ship-to-ship -ship communication. With so much information to catch up on, Luke had decided to wait for the proper moment to report on the briefings at Contrum. He chose to do that in the Skywalker's cliff dwelling, even though few Jedi were present. Assembled were Jason, Jaina, Kip, Corin, Saba, Tahiri, Danny, Han, Leia, Magister Jabitha, Harar, C-3PO, and R2-D2. Jason was the first one to comment on Luke's lengthy summary. Did you explain to Admiral Crefe what the world brain will do if Coruscant's attacked? Half of the command staff has dismissed the report you furnished, Luke said, and the other half just doesn't want to believe it. Han growled in exasperation. Forget about the world brain. Can Crefe even get past the planetary Dovin basils? Mara glanced at Luke. You know, they never really answered that question. Sav said that they weren't worried about the Dovin Basils. I think I know why, Luke said. Zonama Seacoat not only tugged one of Coruscant's moons out of orbit, 
but also tore apart the planetary ring that the Yuzhan Vong manufactured from the moon they managed to shatter. The Dovan Basils are probably so busy dealing with infalling debris that they can now be overwhelmed by lasers, concussion missiles, and whatever else Crefe plans to hurl at them. That still won't stop the world brain from carrying out its tasks, Jason said. That's correct, Harar said, then looked questioningly at Jason. I wasn't able to communicate with the Duryam while we were in the Unknown Regions, and I haven't been able to sense it in the same way since we got back. Then perhaps Shimra has managed to establish a rapport with the brain. Harar turned to Luke. You must understand, Shimra is not an ordinary Yuzhan Vong. His body and his mind have been enhanced. His powers surpass those of other supreme overlords. Leia forced a sad exhalation. Hundreds of thousands will die, and the planet will be of no use to anyone. Unless we can get to Shemra first, Luke said. Harar nodded. The supreme overlord is our ultimate weapon. This war cannot possibly be won without defeating him. Because Shimra is our sole conduit to the gods, his capture or death will prove chaotic for Naschoka's warriors and Jakan's priests. Without Shimra's intercession, the gods will not be able to help or intervene in any way. Separated from the gods, the warriors and priests will be bereft. But capturing Shimra, let alone killing him, will be exceedingly difficult. He is well protected by skillful guards and by the world ship itself, which responds to him much as Yuzhan Tar responds to the world brain. Can the citadel be penetrated? Luke asked. With the armada fending off an attack, the Dovan Basils and world brain preoccupied. The shamed ones in revolt. Yes, it might be possible to infiltrate with a small force. I could advise you on the best route. You do that? Leia said, gazing at Harar. The priest nodded. I said I would do everything in my power to help end this conflict. Nothing has happened to cause me to reconsider that. Who and how many of us? Kip asked. Luke thought for a moment. Not more than six of us, and no one who is waiting for a Seacoton ship. Kip nodded, and Han and Leia traded uncertain glances. Where's that leave the rest of us? Han asked. Before Luke could answer the question, Kenth, Silgal, and Lobaka entered the cliff dwelling, the Wookiee ducking low enough to keep from banging his furry head into the crude beams that spanned the high ceiling. Someone calmed Jade's shadow, Luke said. Kenth nodded. The Alliance has reclaimed Coralag. Wedge's battle group has been ordered to Muscave to lure the Armada away from Coruscant so the major offensive can begin. Then the war is coming to us, Jabitha said softly. Errant Venture is on the way here, Silgal added, in case you're thinking of evacuating the Pharaohans or anyone else. Jaina shot to her feet. I should be with my squadron. Mara looked at her. You are, Jaina. How's that? she asked harshly. I'm not in line for a living ship, and my X-wing is still in stationary orbit. I mean that you're needed here, Mara said calmly. While Jaina stared at her aunt in indecision, Han put his arm around Jaina's waist. Let's just see how things develop, okay? Jaina nodded mutely. Should Seacoat be warned? Danny asked. I'm sure Seacoat already knows, Luke said. I think that's the reason Seacoat agreed to provide us with ships. I must caution all of you that Seacoat and ships are for defense only, Jabitha interjected. Sonama has other defensive weapons, but Seacoat has not spoken of those in some time. Mara looked at Luke. Presumably the same ones that repelled the original Far Outsiders and annihilated Commander Val's forces at Classa Ephemera, Luke said. Luke, we're talking about an armada. 
Han thought to point out. Seacoat might want to at least think about warming up the hyperspace drives. Jabitha shook her head. Flight would be a demonstration of fear. Zonama Seacoat will not flee a second time, especially now with so much at stake. Danny glanced around in puzzlement. It's irrelevant, isn't it? If Zonama Seacoat is an evil omen for the Yuzhan Vong, then Shimra would want his forces to give it the widest berth. Everyone turned to Harar. It depends on who knows what, and if anything, how much. The priest stroked his chin with his three-fingered hand. Assuming that they have some limited understanding of Zonama Seacoat, the warriors would first have to be convinced that they weren't defying the gods by attacking the planet. He raised his head in sudden apprehension. Unless Shimra has managed to convince them that Zonama Seacoat is some sort of Jedi weapon or fabrication that must be destroyed. How soon before the living ships are flight ready? Kip asked Jabitha in a rush. In time, the Magister said, Seacoat will make certain of it. Chapter 34 Warmaster Nas Choka gave Yuzhan Tar a final glance as Yamka's mount's powerful Dovan Basils prepared to tug the vessel into dark space for the short journey to the outer system world known as Muscave. A swirl with clouds, the green hemisphere that was Yuzhan Tar, had changed dramatically in the short time since the Armada had launched for Mon Calamari. Smoke was chimneying from volcanic vents, it was absent one of its moons, and the Bridge of the Gods had collapsed, all but force-fed rock by rock to the orbiting Dovan Basils, tasked with shielding the world from attack. And no grand ceremony on this occasion, no farewell blessings from Shimra, no fresh coats of sacrificial blood for warriors and war vessels. Yuzhantar appeared exposed, ill-prepared to defend itself. But Nas Choka trusted that Supreme Overlord Shimra would attend to that. More important, Yuzhantar would fall to the enemy only if the Armada failed in its mission to destroy Zonama Seacoat. In that case, Nas Choka wouldn't be alive to see the planet reclaimed. Judged unworthy by the gods, the Yuzhan Vong would die, individually and as a species and the gods would be forced once more to fashion beings worthy of nurture, as they had done three times before the Yuzhan Vong had been brought into being. Nas Choka had accepted Shimra's wisdom on the matter of Zonama Seacoat. Again the Supreme Overlord had demonstrated his brilliance, and that had reinforced Nas Choka's belief that he had made the correct choice in siding with Shimra when it had come to toppling Quariel from the Polyp throne. But Nas Choka nursed a secret distrust for the trickster goddess Yun Harla. The feathered traitor Verger had been the familiar of priestesses of Yun Harla. Two, Eminence Harar, had been devoted to her, and he had apparently vanished off the face of Yuzhan Tar. Worse, the trickster, without intervention, had for a time allowed her guise to be adopted by one of the Jedi. So what was to stop her from betraying the Yuzhan Vong now? Weary of being patronized by Yun Yuzhan and Yun Yamka, perhaps she wished to bring about the destruction of Yun Yuzhan's creation by tricking Shimra into trusting to a false revelation. To shore up his own faith and that of his warriors, Nas Choka had commanded a coven of Yun Yamka priests to accompany the armada. Having drawn blood from the tongues and earlobes of each and every supreme commander, the priests had pumped the bloated Ungdins that had absorbed the sacrificial offerings into a coral skipper and dispatched it into the void in advance of the armada. Hands clasped behind his back, the war master spun away from the view of Yuzhan Tar. Several strides across the course deck took him to the Villop Choir, where the mistress in charge of the array bowed her head in subordination. I would speak with the shaper aboard the failing vessel, Nas Choka said. 
the mistress stroked the appropriate villip, which inverted and assumed the sickly likeness of the shaper who had been poisoned at Kalula. My only surviving villip is dying, Warmaster, the ashen shaper reported. It lacks the vigor to portray your visage, but I suspect it is capable of relaying your words. Speak to the health of yourself and your crew, shaper, Nastchoka said. Do you have the vigor to carry out what has been commanded of you? The villop's thick lips formed words. Four slayers have died. Six remain. A sufficient number to pilot this ailing vessel. I am alive only by dint of chemical compounds I managed to mix and ingest at the onset of my paralysis. But my time is short, Warmaster. If need be, I will send hail warriors and youthful villops to assist you, Shaper. But only you can keep the vessel itself alive. If it dies before we reach Zonama Seacoat, then all is lost. I fear it is incapable of going to dark space, Warmaster. Nas Choka ground his filed teeth and swung to his chief tactician. Advise me of our options. Allow it to be ingested by a larger vessel, Warmaster, the tactician said. A sacrifice of yet another vessel and its crew, but essential to our task. Nas Choka nodded and turned back to the transmitting Villop. Shaper, command the vessel's doven basils, Villops, and weapons to rest. I will dispatch a vessel of sufficient size to engulf yours and carry it through dark space to Zonama Seacoat. Once there, the Slayers will pilot your vessel from its carapace. Then, under whatever escort I deem necessary, you will consign yourself and your vessel to the living world. An honor that finds me undeserving, Warmaster. Succeed, and undreamed-of rewards await you, Shaper. Fail, and suffer the disgrace of having sentenced our entire species to oblivion. When the shaper's villop had resumed its familiar shape, Nastchoka gestured for the tactician to follow him into the command chamber's blister transparency. What have you learned of our enemy's plan? Muscave has become the gathering place for the Alliance battle group that struck Coralag, and an even larger force of capital ships sent from Contrum. The enemy is now poised between us and our target. Part of our trial, Nas Choka said evenly, before we can even engage the planet the gods have placed in their hands, we must break through the enemy's line. At the same time, the enemy entices us away from Yuzhan Tar. Nas Choka grunted, they have devised a clever assault. Though ignorant of the fact, they have the complicity of the gods. Nas Choka clenched his right hand. We will do the same at Muscave, by offering ourselves as an enticement, so that our poisoned barb can fly true to its mark. We will present ourselves as a warrior would, brandishing his amphistaff in challenge on the battlefield. He nodded in self-assurance. When will the infidels arrive at Yuzhantar? The Alliance commanders have already sundered the fleet they assembled at Contrum, the tactician said. We suspect that the vanished battle groups have jumped to dark space and will emerge in our absence, to all sides of Yuzhan Tar, and from unfamiliar vectors. A study of Villop memories at the Battle of Ebak Nine has revealed worthwhile comparisons. There, too, the enemy made use of dark space corridors of which we had no knowledge. But the comparison ends there. After our spear has been thrust into Zonama Seacoat's flesh, there will be no need for a ground assault or an ill-conceived hunt for Jedi. Satisfied that we have overcome the trial, the gods will add their might to our armada, and we will be able to wipe the Jedi from existence. Nas Choka smiled lightly. It is a rare occasion when well-matched warriors have an opportunity to face each other a second time in a different arena. 
He paused for a moment, then said, As yet, no communication from domains Muyel and Lakhap? No, the tactician said. Their war vessels remain in the star systems awarded to them by Supreme Overlord Shimra. Nas Choka's tattooed upper lip curled in anger. Their punishment, too, will be swift and lethal. One didn't have to be a native of Coruscant to know that the planet had seen better days. Hollows displayed at the pre-mission briefings didn't do justice to the extent to which the Yuzhan Vong had transformed the world and Zonama Seacoat had wounded it. Once as green as the Chiss capital of Scylla was white, vast areas were now blackened by fire and fractured by sinuous flows of lava. Jag absorbed the desolation in a glance as his claw craft swooped from the open belly of the Star Destroyer right to rule. Twin Sun's complement of claw craft and X-wings streaked behind him in a trailing wedge. Off to Jag's port side, and slightly to stern, flew Rogue Squadron, to starboard the Wraiths and Tanab Yellow Aces. Centered and shielded by the near wing of starfighters were three lightly armed troop transports. Two were of the same vintage as the 170-meter-long, bulbous-lobed record time, which had been sacrificed at Coruscant shortly after the planet's capture. The third was a pre-Empire vessel almost 400 meters long and might have been a precursor of right to rule herself. The main body of the Yuzhan Vong Armada had made the jump to light speed only an hour earlier, but Warmaster Nas Choka had left enough vessels in orbit to test the metal of the Alliance. Even with Star Destroyers, Moncal cruisers, and Corellian gunships arriving from unguarded insertion points, the Yuzhan Vong were capable of engaging each separate battle group. The enemy flotilla that rushed to meet the Fourth Fleet was made up of light cruiser and assault cruiser analogs, from whose hull panels jutted forked arms housing plasma cannon emplacements and clusters of coral skippers. Simultaneous with the emergence of the starfighters, the skips had dropped from their barnacle-like perches and were now racing outward from the edge of Coruscant's envelope, eager for contest. Shield trios, Jag commanded his group over the tactical net. Stick close to the transports and stay alert for course corrections. Don't allow yourselves to be drawn into individual conflicts. The group was split evenly between Chiss and Alliance pilots, but for the first time since Twin Sun's inception at the Jedi base known as Eclipse, there wasn't a Force user among them. Jag had originally flown with Twin Sun's at Borlias, when the squadron had been handed over to Jaina, and he had flown with her for most of the past year at Galantos, Bakara, and in other campaigns. Their training, coupled with his deep affection for her, sometimes made him wonder if he hadn't become sensitized to the Force or at least to Jaina's use of the Force. At Hapes, and as recently as Mon Calamari, where Jaina's X-Wing had been crippled, he seemed to be able to intuit her needs or requests. Incapable of communicating with her squadron, she had reached out through the Force, and Jag had heard her, clear enough at any rate, to have anticipated and relayed Jaina's orders to her wingmates. With Jaina absent, on Zonama Seacoat, According to Gavin Darklighter, the Starfighter group felt less responsive, though Jag maintained a strong combat bond with the Chiss pilots, especially Sean Kier and April. Twin Sun Leader, said the voice of Right to Rule Control, bring your group to Sector Sabak 066. We're getting ready to light things up. Jag had flown with Grand Admiral Pelion's vessel at Asfandia, and the voice was reassuring. Copyright to rule, coming about to 066. The Broadbank Sunward placed the trio of transports and their starfighter escorts over Daybreak Coruscant. No sooner was the task force clear of right to rule than all its starboard quad laser batteries belched fire. Not far from the Star Destroyer, and similarly aligned to the planet, two Moncal MC-80Bs and the cruiser Dauntless added their blinding salvos to the light storm. 
half the amassed firepower was directed at the onrushing coral skippers, dozens of which were instantly vaporized. The other half was aimed at what remained of Coruscant's short-lived planetary ring. Hammered by massive packets of coherent light and high-yield proton torpedoes, the largest pieces of what had once been a moon broke into thousands of even smaller fragments, creating a meteor storm the likes of which Coruscant probably hadn't confronted since it had coalesced into a planet. Enormous singularities began to open as the chunks were sent tumbling into the upper reaches of the envelope. But the orbital Dovan basils that had created the gravitic anomalies were already overburdened, and many of the fragments plummeted past them, becoming fiery streaks as they entered the atmosphere. Jag knew that scanners aboard the Alliance capital ships were already analyzing the relative strengths of the singularities and monitoring the trajectories of the meteors that had slipped through the gravitic shield. Once the areas of greatest stress were identified, their locations would be relayed to the transports and starfighters. Not quite two years earlier, the troop transport record time had delivered its cargo of wraiths and Jedi to the surface of Coruscant in single-person containers. But that was before the Dovan basils had been seeded into orbit. More important, there was no reason for stealth now. As someone at Contrum had said to Jag, if we can't drop a moon on them, we can at least make it rain rocks. Twin Sons, Right to Rule Control said, you have open windows at coordinates 423 and 425. Rothana Transport is reorienting to follow you through. Jag passed the word to his pilots, even though the Nava computers on each starfighter had certainly received the course corrections. Configured in pairs and trios, twin suns formed up along both sides of the antique wedge-shaped ship and began to herd it toward the infiltration zone. Adapting their vectors to match those of the escort starfighters, coral skippers attacked from all sides, threading through the fragment cloud and augmenting it with plasma missiles and gouts of molten stone. Flying just at the perimeter of the transport shields, Jag's clawcraft was jarred by every projectile that found its target. The comm channel was a babble of voices as pilots issued warnings of strafing runs or declared the status of their ships. Explosive light washed into the spherical cockpit of Twin Suns 1 from astern, and Jag glanced at his displays to see Twin 8 and 11 vanish from the grid. With scant room to maneuver, he tried to make the most of every squeeze of the trigger, but the skips had the advantage of being able to take evasive action, whereas the starfighters were intent on protecting their ward. Carefully trained laser bolts from right to rule created a sudden corridor of destructive energy around the transport and fighters. A dozen more skips became extra fodder for the meteor-gobbling Dovan basils. Still in darkness, a Yuzhan Vong cruiser stabbed by convergent blasts from three separate Alliance ships cracked open and blew apart. A second vessel, spewing blades of flame from its midsection, rolled lazily out of orbit and began to fall into the atmosphere. The Dovan basils were trying desperately to prioritize, but more and more rock fragments were getting past them. As overtaxed as they were, the gigantic biotes still posed a threat to any ship that ventured too close. For that reason, the transports had been retrofitted with Bakarin designed HIMS generators, which should have allowed them to sustain momentum even in an interdiction field. At Contrum, few had expressed confidence in the retrofitting, and Jag was one of the first pilots to see why. His group of Vanguard starfighters was just passing between a pair of the Yuzhan Vong orbital monstrosities when two overlapping singularities yawned, catching the pointed bow of the transport and dragging it hard to starboard. The ship's aged cylindrical thrusters tried to compensate for the unexpected tug of gravity, but they weren't up to the challenge. The jury-rigged hymns failed, and the deflector shields followed. The transport twisted over on its side and began to founder. Armor flayed from the hull and surface modules disappeared into the swirling black mouth of the singularity. Breaches opened, venting precious atmosphere and unsecured objects. Then deep within the vessel, an explosion flashed, and it split wide open. 
ground effect vehicles, combat droids, and acceleration couches spun outward, some of the latter with commandos still strapped into them. In the blink of an eye, Twin Suns lost another three fighters. To port, trimmed in golden sunlight, one of the newer transports was banking as quickly as its bulk allowed. Rogue Squadron had reformed around the ship and was just beginning to shepherd it into the atmosphere. Jag looked to his right and overhead for the second transport, but couldn't find it. What he found instead were the wraiths, winning their duels with coral skippers, even as they blazed toward Twin Suns. Right to rule control boomed in Jag's ears. Twin Suns later come about to 003. You are redesignated escort for number one transport. As soon as your group is clear, we're going to try to burn a tunnel to the surface. Jag hauled on the control yoke, gravitational forces all but burying him in the seat, as he slewed to port. The dozen remaining members of his group followed in formation, sticking close enough to one another to provide adjuvant shielding. Ahead of them, Transport One had dropped inside the tier of Dovin basils and was rushing for the surface, blunt nose aglow from friction. Twenty years earlier, Coruscant had been liberated from Imperial forces by loosing a group of criminals to sow confusion and by sabotaging the planet's shield generators. Now, liberation would depend largely on the actions of a thousand commandos and a handful of resistance fighters, and the off chance of their being able to mobilize the Yuzhan Vong heretics into an insurgent force. As promised, coordinated laser fire came from the capital ships. Sizzling through the atmosphere, the sustained fusillade annihilated everything in its path and burned a ragged, bald patch in Coruscant's verdant surface. It was toward the denuded area that the starfighters and transport raced, firing on the run at the few coral skippers that had survived the laser shower. The control yoke shuddered in Jag's grip as he powered the claw craft into denser air. The ship rattled, as if on the verge of coming apart, but it held together. Surface features of Coruscant began to come into focus. Forest-covered spires and mounds, wide crevasses brimming with mist yet to be burned off by the sun. Gradually, he decreased the angle of his descent until he was flying into the sun and parallel to the undulating terrain. Frightened by the roar of the approaching craft, flocks of black birds with three-meter wingspans took flight from the branching crowns of emergent trees. A contour map resolved on the cockpit navigational display, showing the buildings and features of the so-called sacred precinct, from the craggy mountain that was Shimra's world ship citadel to the dome-like structure that housed and protected the world brain what had once been the most affluent and fashionable area of the planet. A counter at the bottom of the screen showed the distance remaining to the scorched landing zone, which was surrounded by dense forest and Yorick coral outcroppings. Without warning, enemy artillery fire erupted from the tree line around the clearing, fountaining molten ejecta and flaming projectiles high into the air. Flying nap of the forest, Jag spotted the distinctive sail-like spine plates of the armored beast the Yuzhan Vong called a Rakamot, and the Alliance knew as a range. The blue-green reptilian creatures were the size of small buildings, and on Borlias had proved almost impossible to stop. That plasma is coming from a range east of the landing zone, Jag said over the tactical net. Shankir, April. See if you can hold it at bay long enough for Page's commandos to insert. On our way, Colonel, Sean Keir responded. At Borlias, she had urged Jag to return to their native Chiss space. Now she was as much an Alliance pilot as he was. Dodging projectiles, Jag banked over the forest. He was doubling back to the transport when he finally caught sight of its sister ship, ten kilometers to the south and covered stem to stern in Grutchens. The Yellow Aces were pursuing the out-of-control vessel and using their lasers to dislodge the Gretchens, as if picking vermin off a pet. But the acid-producing, globular-eyed insectoids had ingested large areas of the hull and, judging by the way the transport was wobbling, had already infiltrated the cabin spaces. Jag watched helplessly as the vessel bellied into the forest, cutting a wide, burning swath through the trees. 
Sliding for a kilometer or more, it tipped nose first over the rim of a deep crevasse and began a slow descent toward the bottom. Close to the lasered clearing, Rogue and Twin Sun's snub fighters were making paired strafing runs over the Rakamot and Yuzhan Vong infantry units, creating an inferno with lasers and proton torpedoes. Slowed by its repulsor lift engines, Number One Transport was a few kilometers short of the laser denuded tableland when a large hatch opened in its ventral surface. First to exit the hatch were YVH droids folded into foam filled crash canisters. Then, sheathed in enviro suits and harnessed into jet packs, came Page's company, soaring from the rectangular opening and spiraling down to the surface. The pilots of Wraith Squadron followed, setting their X-wings down and scrambling from the cockpits. Jag swung wide to make another pass over the forest. With projectiles streaking out of the trees, Gavin Darklighter's rogues buzzed like angry hornets, torching everything that moved. Jag was racing to join them when a fireball caught the clawcraft from behind, blowing away pieces of the starboard solar panels and sending him into an uncontrollable spin. The crowns of the trees rushed up at him, then patches of soggy ground. The clawcraft whined as it slammed into the canopy, and darkness engulfed him. The view forward from the plush cockpit of Lady Luck revealed a panorama of stroboscopic globular explosions stretched across as well as two or three degrees above and below the ecliptic plane. That was the Alliance's salvo, Lando told Tendra. Her mouth was slightly ajar. She was shaking her head in amazement. I've never seen anything that was at once so beautiful and so dreadful. Tall, even for a Sikorian, Tendra was a regal beauty with sparkling brown eyes and full lips. The Sorosub luxury yacht, a somewhat flattened and oblate vessel, was well inside the Alliance lines, but close enough for long-range scanners to capture the continuous exchanges of fire, if not detail the individual warships themselves. Lando knew that Wedge was out there somewhere, along with countless other friends and comrades he had known from as far back as the Battle of Endor. He couldn't remember a time when he had felt so small or alone. In a gesture that combined affection and anguish, he tightened his grip on Tendra's hand. No sooner had the spherical explosions faded than a pyrotechnic display of what might have been fire-tailed comets rocketed from unseen sources, splaying against deflector screens too distant to discern, and in some cases creating explosions of their own. Nascioka's response, Lando said dryly. He flipped a switch on the communications console and swiveled his chair slightly toward the cockpit's audio pickups. You watching this? Can't take my eyes away, Talon Card answered from Wild Card, five hundred kilometers rimward and, like Lady Luck, running mostly silent. Scores of other starfighters, converted yachts and blockade runners, allied with the loosely knit Smugglers Alliance, were deployed between Wild Card and Errant Venture, which was closest to Zonama Seacoat and thus almost a quarter of the way to the outer system world of Stentat. How long are we just going to sit here and watch? Lando asked Talon. Talon laughed bitterly. Now is as good a time as any to make our meager but skillful contribution to the cause. All right, then. Lando straightened up in his seat and was preparing to wake up the ship's systems when Talon calmed him again. Hold on a minute, hero. My scanners are picking up something peculiar. I'm sending you the coordinates now. You might want to have a look. Tendra was already realigning the scanners when Lando glanced at the display screen. A sizable number of Yuzhan Vong ships had separated from the main body of the Armada. Accreting velocity, the group was vectoring for the sunward fringe of the battle belt. A flanking maneuver? Lando said. Maybe an attempt to jump behind Alliance lines? I don't think so, Talon answered. When they pulled this stun at Mount Calamari, the ships jumped for Contrum. Lando frowned. Cree Fay's long gone from Contrum, but they could be hoping to bait Wedge's battle group into pursuing them. 
Unless they're heading back to Coruscant. Tentra dialed the scanners to maximum magnification. The computer-assisted portrait, painted by the instruments, showed a diamond-shaped formation of destroyer and heavy cruiser analogs with a solitary but otherwise unremarkable vessel occupying the center. Major firepower, Lando said. They're going to hyperspace, Talon updated. Did you get the departure vector? Coming up, Talon said. Lando and Tendra heard Talon expel his breath in unhappy surprise. Zonama Seacoat, Lando surmised. Didn't that Vong priest Harar say that Shimra wasn't likely to risk an attack? Guess he doesn't know his supreme overlord as well as he thinks he does. I'll let Booster know. Lando silenced the calm and swung to his wife. Nava Computer is plotting a course to Zonama Seacoat, Tendra said. Gingerly, Han placed the palms of his hands against the faintly glowing hull of the Seacoton ship. Warm to the touch, the perfectly smooth skin was a shimmering green, lit from within in a way that brought to mind the bioluminescence of some denizens of the deep ocean. Low to the ground, broad where the cockpit was, and composed of three seamlessly joined oval lobes, the ship was a smaller version of the shuttle that had carried him from the Falcon to the surface of the planet. But unlike the shuttle, it was armed with plasma cannons that might have been, and probably were, patterned after those of a coral skipper. Speechless, Han continued his survey of the wondrous ship. Small compared to Jade Shadow, which sat on its hard stand nearby, the Seacoton fighter was equivalent to an X-wing in size, though it more closely resembled a vintage Saronian conqueror or one of the latest generation of Moon Calamarian starfighters. The single-pilot cockpit was an all-too-organic shade of red, made more unnerving by an instrument array that pulsed and throbbed. The gentle internal radiance of the tripartite fuselage was most intense along the forward edges, which were knife-sharp. In contrast, the trailing edges were rounded over, with the drive tucked into the space between the two rear lobes. Han had overheard Magister Jabitha tell Kip that the original Seacoton ships had had our tall Type 7 silver-class light starship engines with expensive hyperdrive core units and organoform circuitry. But the ships the Gentari had built for the Jedi lacked a conventional drive, unless Dovin Basil analogs had come to be considered standard equipment. The similarity to coral skippers didn't end with gravitic propulsion devices and volcano-like weapons emplacements. Though it required the pilot who had bonded with its formative seed partners, a Seacoton craft was alive and to a degree capable of independent action. Han wasn't the only person in awe. Working overtime, the Gentari had been able to shape ships for all the Jedi who had participated in the recent ceremony. Delivered from the cybernetic assembly lines by huge manta-shaped dirigibles, the Seacoton fighters crowded the canyon rim landing platform. None of them had been flown, but Han could feel the eagerness of the pilots. Kip, Corin, Lobaka, dark-complected Markra Mejiv, facially scarred Waxarn Kel, the stocky Chandrillan woman Octa Ramus, slight Tam Azur Jamin, gallant Kyle Katarn, the ever-brooding Zek, the Barabel Saba Sabatine, and the Twilek female Alima Rar all of whom were circling their individual crafts, much as Han was circling Kip's. Well, she's not the Falcon, Han said, but I'm sure she'll do until the next living ship comes along. Kip took his gaze from the ship long enough to glance at Han and laugh. Wish I could tell you to take it for a spin. Han nodded. Yeah, I wish you could, too. Distracted, Han wasn't aware of Leia's approach until she slipped her arm through his and rested her head against his shoulder. He turned slightly, expecting to see her smiling as broadly as he was. Instead, she was anything but joyful. What's wrong? Luke just heard from Booster. A Yuzhan Vong battle group is headed here. Han stared at her. I thought... 
It was all he got out before Luke, Mara, Jaina, Danny, Kenth, and some of the other Jedi arrived at the landing platform. The last to show up were Magister Jabitha, Jason, and Harar. The pilots hurried from their sea coton ships to join the circle that quickly took shape around Luke. We were hoping for more time, but that's not going to happen, Luke began. The Yuzhan Vong are on the way, which means you're going to have to get your ships airborne and give yourselves a crash course in piloting them. He swung to face Tisar Sabatine. The shuttle will take you and the rest of the Wild Knights to your blast boat and fighters. Saba nodded to her son. Good hunting, Tisar. Now do I get to fly my X-Wing? Jaina asked. Mara shot her a cautionary look. We've been through this. But may I say something? Harar said. Everyone turned to him in surprise. Assuming some of you are going to Coruscant, your war party will benefit by having both Jaina Solo and Jason Solo as comrades. Our warriors are very superstitious, and the sight of the celebrated Jedi twins united could demoralize them. The capture of one such as Jaina Solo would count for more than her death. The priest paused to glance around. Our forces failed at Borlias because Supreme Commander Chu Kang La was fixated on capturing the Jedi who had come to be associated with Yun Harla. It was my personal failing that I supported Chu Kang La's actions. Tahiri looked at Jaina. At Borlias, I told you not to accompany Luke and Mara to Coruscant, because I was afraid that your presence would endanger them. Now I agree with Harar that you should go. Jaina folded her arms across her chest. Nice to see that everyone is so comfortable with deciding my destiny. Jabitha stepped forward before anyone could respond. Seacote has requested that Silgal, Tekli, and Danny Kui Remain on Zonama. Danny looked at Luke in stark confusion. I thought I'd be going with you and Mara to Coruscant. Luke shook his head. Seacoat obviously feels that you're needed here. If I can accept not flying, then you can accept staying here, Jaina said. Han and Leia traded uneasy looks. Luke took his lightsaber from his belt, ignited the blade, and held it over his head. Wordlessly, the other Jedi began to follow suit. Taking note of Leia's hesitation, Han nodded in encouragement. Go, he said quietly. You're as much a Jedi as any of them. The Jedi tightened up around Luke, angling their lightsabers slightly so that the tips pointed toward his, and in the end creating a stand of colorful blades that thrummed ominously in the crisp air. This day has been years in the making. What we do from this moment forward will test our fealty to the Force in a way that the Jedi haven't been tested in more than a generation. Be mindful that we are not the purveyors of conflict and inequity, but the guardians of peace and justice. Above all, we want what the Force wants, no matter where that leads us. If some of us are not seen again today, that does not mean that our actions will have been in vain or will not be remembered. Han looked to those who didn't have lightsabers. The few outside the circle, Jabitha, Harar, and Danny, wondering where he fit in. But he added his voice to the rest when they said as one, May the Force be with us. Chapter 35 Scepter of power grasped in his right hand and trailed by a cortege of eight slayers, Shimra marched into the Hall of Convergence, his legs propelling him in such long strides that Onimi was compelled to run to keep up. Alerted to his approach, everyone present in the vaulted chamber, Nomanor included, had already assumed attitudes of obeisance. The warriors were down on one knee and the four seers had their heads inclined in reverent, if apprehensive, bows. The whole smelled strongly of sacrificial blood, yorick coral dust, and incense, 
and suddenly of floral scents as the supreme overlord's bare feet crushed the flower petals that had been scattered for him. Shimmer went directly to his ray-backed throne, but sat for only a moment before rising and beginning to pace back and forth, a confused onimi following in the wake of the supreme overlord's pliant flayed skin robe. Why was I summoned from my meditation with the gods? Shimra demanded of no one in particular. Is my role in our final campaign less than yours, Supreme Commander Late? He gazed balefully at the seers. Or yours? Late remained in genuflection. Supreme One, the War Master bade that I seek audience with you as soon as you would permit. Is War Master Nashchoka's inactivity such that he can find time to communicate with the likes of you? Dreadlord, the War Master had been anything but idle, Late said with a hint of exasperation. Engaged at Muscave, his forces overwhelmed those of our enemy. Thus was he able to dispatch to Zonama Sikot a task force that escorts and safeguards the ailing vessel that is our secret weapon. Shimra made a fatigued sound. I need to hear this from your mouth, Supreme Commander. Did I not just say that your urgent entreaty found me deep in rapport with the gods? Late snapped his fists to his shoulders in salute. I beg forgiveness, Great One. Then assuredly, you already know that Zonama Seacote appeared to be undefended, save for a handful of enemy fighters. Assuredly and that the task force commander dispatched coral skippers to engage those fighters. What of it? Shimra said heatedly. Would you hold me prisoner here with your pointless statements? Again late snapped his fists. Of course the gods told you, Lord, that the coral skippers have met with resistance from living vessels. Shimra came to an abrupt halt and stared at the supreme commander. Dread Lord. Onimi said, as if to prompt a response. Living vessels, you say, Shimra said finally. Late nodded in acknowledgment. Vessels that not only match our coral skippers for size and speed, but also are propelled by gravitic affinity, and answer our plasma weapons with theirs. Shimra pointed to the hall's villop choir. I would see an image of these living vessels. Supreme Commander Late stood and beckoned to the Villop Mistress. Shortly a ghostly image appeared, showing a vessel forged of smooth rocks, dimpled with plasma launchers and doven basal emplacements. Canting his huge head, Shimra regarded the glimmering image in silence. The Domain Commander reported to Warmaster Nas Choka that the living vessels have sown confusion among our ranks of coral skippers. Worse, the Yamask itself is perplexed. It is having trouble differentiating our vessels from the enemy vessels. Shimra swung too late. Why hasn't the Warmaster ordered the Domain Commander to bring his capital vessels to bear on Zonama Seacoat? The Warmaster wishes to do just that, God Chosen. He merely awaits your sanction for such an action. Shimra said nothing. Great One? Late said carefully after a long moment had passed. What do the seers say of all this? Onimi interjected into the ensuing silence, as if deflecting attention from Shimra. The auguries have left us troubled, great lord, their haggish spokeswoman said. The prospect of combating living vessels runs counter to the most sacred of our beliefs. Even as a test of our worthiness, the gods themselves would never have engineered such a sacrilege. We implore you, Lord, to explain how infidels have been allowed to access our biotechnology and been granted sanction to create vessels that mimic ours. There is more, Lord, a second seer said. Several enemy ships have outwitted our Dovin basal voids and found their way to the surface of Yuzhan Tar. Even now, our primary landing field is threatened. Shimra seemed to shake himself out of his daze. Need I remind any of you that I have looked deeply into the Eighth Cortex and conversed with Yun Harla herself on these matters? The chief seer nodded. We bear that in mind, Great One, and ask only for elucidation. 
Could the ancient prophecies and revelations be wrong? Could they have been misinterpreted? Is it possible that the gods have not engineered the living vessels as an additional test, but in fact have aligned themselves with the Jedi? Shimra's eyes flared like Nova's. Heresy! Heresy! Here in my very house! He aimed the scepter at the seers. You buffoons have outlived your usefulness. He whirled to the slayers. Rid me of them! A pair of slayers uncoiled their amphistaffs and advanced on the female quartet with deadly purpose. The seers offered no resistance, raising faces and extending their thin necks for the stiffened weapons. The slayers wasted no motions in decapitating them. One of the severed heads was still rolling across the floor when a herald entered the hall. Great Lord, High Priest Jakan, Master Shaper Kila Quad, and High Prefect Drathul request audience. Shimra went to his throne and sat. By all means, bid them enter, Herald. The elite trio entered in a rush, but lost some of their momentum on seeing the four headless corpses. Shimra smiled faintly. They had the audacity to doubt my interpretation of the revelation. His expression darkened. Be attentive to their present circumstance when you state your concerns. We have no concerns, Dreadlord, Drathul said, clearly improvising. On learning of the War Master's report of living ships, we came to offer you praise for your foresight. The Yuzhan Vong are escalated by the gods' willingness to present us with even greater challenges. You hastened here to tell me that? Shimra asked. One question, Lord, Jakan said. Have the gods furnished these ships to the Alliance? Or do the ships originate from the living world itself? Shimra gestured in an offhand way to Nomanor. Answer him, Prefect, since you are our leading expert on Zonama Seacoat. The object of Jakan and Kila Quad's astonishment... Gnome Anor slouched. Taken off his guard, he had to swallow to find his voice. Supreme One, I I know only what I hear from spies among the heretics, but I I suspect that there are no living ships. He grew emboldened as he continued. Instead, I propose that our coral skipper pilots have fallen victim to Jedi mind tricks. Drathul gestured angrily to the villip image of the living ship. You dismiss that as a Jedi mind trick? Shimra grinned maniacally. Answer your superior, Prefect Nomanor. Nomanor straightened his shoulders. Why not? We know that they are capable of projecting false images and putting words in the mouths of those they would manipulate. We also know that they have successfully confused our Yamisks in the past. Shimra spoke before Drathul could argue the point. Prefect Noma Nor is to be admired for his inventiveness, but in fact, the vessel our villops show us is no mind trick. In answer to High Priest Jakan's question, the gods have tutored the living planet in the creation of these monstrosities, but the Jedi are not responsible. He paused, then said, It is the heretics who have brought this latest test upon us. The gods have no desire to award us this galaxy, while heretics and shamed ones walk freely among us. They won't permit us to deliver the poison vessel until we have brought Yuzhan Tar into balance. Onimi shuffled to the center of the hall. Great one, he began. Our skies breached, our land despoiled. These heretic ravings we can later foil. Enough of your insolent rhyming, shamed one. Shimra cut him off. Only by my good graces have you been spared the life led by others of your kind. Do you too doubt me? Do you too harbor fears of defeat and rally suddenly to the heretic cause? Onimi fell on his face before the throne. I remain your most abject servant, lord. Shimra ignored him. The heretics must be eradicated. He turned to the commander of the Slayers. Half the citadel garrison of warriors, 
is to be placed at the right hand of Prefect Nomanor. He will lead them against the heretics and the shamed ones. Not one of them is to be left alive. Your will be done, great lord, the commander said. In unison, the slayers turned and snapped their fists in salute to Nomanor. Drathul looked from Nomanor to Shemra in mounting bewilderment. But what of you, Jantar, lord? Our Dovan basils are overwhelmed. The enemy has made a sieve of our sky. I will deal with those who would profane our soil. Shimra's gaze fell in turn on Jakan, Kila Quad, and Drathul. Go to the well of the world brain. I will communicate with it and prepare it for your arrival. What then? Jakan asked. By and by, priest. With a motion of his fingertips, Shimra dismissed everyone, including Onimi. As the elite were filing from the hall, Drathul dragged Nomanor aside. We know that Commander Ekam Val brought a sea coton ship to Yuzhantar, he hissed. You had the opportunity to say as much for everyone to hear, and put an end to Shimra's charade. Whose service do you do by concealing the truth now, with our future hanging in the balance? I serve myself, Nomanor said evenly. Drathul shoved him back, as ever. I would kill you now but for your new legion of bodyguards. But you will die before this day is through, Nomanor, if not by my hand, then by another's. Nomanor glanced at Jakan, then at Kila Quad, and finally at Onimi, who appeared to be watching him closely. Stand in line, High Prefect, he said at last. I've no lack of enemies. A human soldier wrapped the knuckles of his gloved hand against the circular viewport of Jag's inverted clawcraft. Hang on a minute, flyboy, he yelled. All at once the access hatch above or under Jag's head opened, and several pairs of hands were reaching inside the cockpit to release him from the crash webbing that secured him to the seat. Down you go, the same one who had rapped on the viewport said. Jag allowed himself to descend into the upraised hands of his rescuers and to continue to be supported by them while he was planted on his feet, with the world spinning around him and the blood that had gathered in his head draining back to where it belonged. Someone removed Jag's helmet and put the mouth of a canteen to his lips. When the long moment of dizziness had passed, he saw that the claw craft— missing three of its sweeping talon-shaped solar array panels, had crashed upside down into a copse of tangled fruit-bearing trees that rose from the middle of an oozy villa paddy. The soldiers around him wore jet backpacks, hollow transceiving helmets, and combat biosuits. Seen through the snarl of branches overhead, Coruscant's bruised sky was torn to ribbons with contrails, meteors, and countless dirt-bound coral skippers and starfighters. Explosions strobed and flashed in tears behind scudding clouds of gray smoke. A haze of smoke lay over the rank-smelling paddy as well, and from all directions came the reports of concussion missiles and torpedoes the sizzle and hiss of laser beams, the roar of Yuzhan Vong beasts, the bloodthirsty cries of warriors, all of it reverberating from the sheer faces of Yorick coral outcroppings and the digested facades of once grand space scrapers that studded the terrain. Is he hurt? someone asked, loud enough to be heard over the tumult. Jag recognized the lined face of Captain Judder Page under the camouflage cosmetic. Jag patted himself down. I'm unharmed. Page swung to his communications aide. Inform Starfighter Control on right to rule that Colonel Fell is groundside and back on his feet. Incoming, came a distant voice. Page and others dragged Jag to the ground an instant before a swarm of thud and razor bugs ripped through the gnarled trees stripping leaves and oval-shaped fruits from the branches and knocking down entire limbs. Two deafening explosions followed in succession, and the storm of projectile biotes abated. A flight of black-striped, bright yellow X-wings streaked over the treetops, firing quad bursts at some unseen target. Page, Jag, and the others crouched, then slowly got to their feet. 
Combat droids armored with laminanium had formed a perimeter at the edge of the trees. Close to what remained of Jag's clawcraft, two medical droids were field-dressing wounds sustained by a couple of humans and Bothans. Page stuck out his hand. I'm Captain. I know who you are, Jag said. Thank you for coming to my aid. Page shrugged off the gratitude and motioned to the men on either side of him. Garrick Loran, he said, naming the shaven-skulled one. Then Kel Tainer, naming the one with the receding hairline. Wraith Squadron, Jag said, shaking hands with each of them. I met both of you and Borlias. He glanced at Page. Just before my clawcraft was hit, I saw number two transport crash. Page nodded grimly. Gretchens took it down and chewed their way through the hull. We've sent a squad to search the canyon for survivors. Captain Page, a young Bothan interrupted. We've made contact with the indigenous force. Jag, Page, and the pair of Wraith Squadron intelligence operatives turned to see four Yuzhan Vong males being ushered through the perimeter. The humanoids were scarcely scarred compared to most of the Yuzhan Vong warriors Jag had seen, but all had pronounced deformities, some of the face, others of the limbs. Shamed ones, he thought. The tallest and most deformed of the four executed a facsimile of an alliance salute. Take us to your leaders, he said in basic, as if by rote. Garrick Loran and Kel Tainer exchanged skeptical glances. Who taught you to say that? Loran asked. I did, someone answered in a clipped Coruscanti accent, as the same shamed one was pressing his forefinger to his ear, presumably to adjust the fit of a translating Tezo worm. A tall, lean, dark-haired human appeared from the trees, beaming at the two wraiths. Son of a blaster, Tainer said, smiling. Jag was familiar with the name Baljas Arnjak. Also a wraith, Arnjak had remained behind on Coruscant following the combined wraith-Jedi infiltration mission almost two years earlier. With him walked a thin but dashing-looking middle-aged man with reddish hair, bright even teeth, and deeply tanned skin. Smiling broadly, Page immediately shook hands with the man, then pulled him into a mutually back-slapping embrace. I always figured you'd survive, Page said, when the two had stepped away from each other. The handsome man motioned to the four Yuzhan Vong. Thanks to them I did. Their heretic group rescued me and a bunch of others from what would have been some serious bloodletting at one of the temples. Page turned to Jag. Fell, meet Major Posh Kraken. Jag nodded in greeting. Coruscant was suddenly starting to feel like the veteran's home. How long will it take us to reach Westport from here? Page was saying. It would have taken about an hour, but we're too late. Kraken beckoned for everyone to follow him to the perimeter. Once there, he gestured to the northern horizon, which was a solid bank of billowing smoke. The entire sacred precinct is up in flames, Kraken said. Page pressed a blaster into Jag's gloved right hand. Welcome to the commandos, Colonel. The fires are Shimra's doing, Harar said. The Supreme Overlord has asked the world brain to set Yuzhan Tara ablaze, to prevent anyone from occupying it. The priest sounded despondent. Shimra wouldn't have done this unless he fears defeat. Either that, or the proximity of Zonama Seacoat has deranged him. Whether he's desperate or mad, we have him on the run, Han said, elated. Harar gazed at those around him. Judging by the nods of agreement, the always entertaining and sometimes perplexing Han Solo was expressing the sentiment of everyone gathered at the landing platform. His wife Leia, Master Luke Skywalker and his wife Mara, the twins Jason and Jaina, Yuzhan Vong marked Tahiri, the military-minded Jedi Kenth Hamner, Zonama Seacoat's Magister Jabitha, the two numerically named machine intelligences, droids, who sometimes seemed as alive as their makers and owners, and the pair of Nogri, who appeared at once to be bodyguards, familiars, and friends. 
The rest of the Jedi had taken to the skies in the Seacoton ships, or had been lofted by shuttle to their orbiting warcraft. Han Solo had ridden up the gravity well with the Wild Knights, but only to retrieve his battered freighter, Millennium Falcon, which, with Seacoat's permission, was now parked on its landing disks and warming alongside Mara Skywalker's Jade Shadow. Word of the conflagrations spreading across Yuzhan Tar had come from Booster Tarek, the penultimate link in a communications chain that began with the commando team that had penetrated Yuzhan Tar's defenses, and had apparently included the giant warships Right to Rule and Mon Mothma. How could even Shemra convince the Doryam to do something harmful to Yuzhan Tar? Jason asked. All things Yuzhan Vong answer to Shimra, Harar said. The Duryam is responsible for integrating the activities of all our planet-shaping biotes. It is not a servant, but a partner, fully intelligent, fully aware, capable of making decisions based on information it receives from telepathically linked creatures and from the Supreme Overlord himself. But Shimra may have convinced the Doryam that intense fires were needed to open latent seed pods, so that trees could grow to replace those lost during the recent land quakes. He may have suggested to the Doryam that it fashion clearings in the forests, so that saplings might glean additional light, as well as nourishment from trees felled and reduced to ash by the fires. All the more reason for us to get to Shimra now, Han said, pacing at the foot of the Millennium Falcon's landing ramp. If Page got his transports past the Dovan Basils, I know I can get the Falcon through. Harar shook his head. What now? Han asked, planting his hands on his hips in a posture of impatience. Capturing or killing Shimra may not be enough to save the planet. Actions taken by the world brain are incontrovertible. Once tasked, it cannot be swayed to alter its plan, even by Shimra. Harar glanced at the Skywalkers. If you are to save your capital world, the brain, too, will have to be destroyed. You can't do that, Harar, Jason snapped. Harar looked at the young Jedi. Then go to it, and persuade it otherwise. That's our job. Han said suddenly, reaching for Leia's right hand. With the other Jedi, Magister Jabitha, and the pair of droids gazing at him in sudden alarm, he added, Do you think we were just going to give the rest of you a ride there? He jerked his thumb at the Millennium Falcon. This ship ain't no air taxi, he snorted ruefully, then grew solemn. Besides, we started this together in the Outer Rim, and we're going to end it together. Or his name isn't Han Solo, Leia said, in a way that mixed amusement and resignation. Han grinned in a lopsided fashion. Took the words right out of my mouth. Chapter 36 Three hundred armed warriors borrowed from the Citadel garrison and on loan to Prefect Noma Nor raced through the squares and byways of the sacred precinct like an avenging army putting Kuthi and Amphistaff to every heretic and shamed one who hadn't had sense enough to go into hiding, which turned out to be many, hundreds, thousands. Enraptured by the prophesied arrival of Zonama Seacoat, certain that thousand-eyed Yun Shuno would guarantee their passage to a beatific afterlife, exulting in their newfound freedom, however short-lived, Confident that Shemra and the elite would be overthrown, the heretics were fervent to martyr themselves. Ostracized because of physiological defects rather than committed sins, forced to live in the shadow of the unshamed and under the scrutiny of merciless gods, guilty of trespasses they couldn't begin to imagine and would spend the rest of their miserable lives attempting to understand— they had at last embraced their peculiarities and cast their lot with the Jedi. There was simply no holding them back. Carried along by sheer exuberance, proclaiming their long-overdue equality and salvation for all to hear, they poured from their hidey holes like undins at a sacrifice, 
and indeed thousands of the meter-long blood soakers followed them out into rapidly darkening daylight, assured of more than the usual share of glossy black nutrient. Yuzhantar had become a feeding frenzy for warriors who should have known better, and for biotes that were doing only what they had been bred to do. Gazing down on the place of hierarchy, Nomanor was struck dumb by the butchery for which he was responsible, thanks to Shimra, and yet was powerless to thwart. He could no more command the warriors to desist than he could convince the shamed ones to flee. He was, as ever, caught in the middle, though placed there by his own schemes, lies, and masquerades. The realization made him desperate. The insatiable warrior pack had worked its way south from the citadel, through Vistu and Numesh, across bridges and down alleyways, slaughtering wherever they fared, until they had entered the public place that of late had become the heretic's hallowed ground, owing to the many who already died there during demonstrations and riots. It was immediately clear that the warriors had merely been practicing up until this point. For now, trapped in the place of hierarchy, was a crowd into which they could wade like thrashing biotes. Before them stood those responsible for keeping the Yuzhan Vong from total victory at Zonama Seacote. These were the ones who would pay, against whom the warriors would exercise their fear and confusion, even if those they put to death were as innocent as they were shameless. But the horror had scarcely commenced, with war cries answered by agonized screams, when fires began to break out in many of the quake-damaged structures that walled the place, including the prefectory and the temple of the lovers, Yunxin and Yunka. For a moment no man nor was certain that the sudden blazes were the result of firebomb strafings by Alliance starfighters that had punched through Coruscant's Dovin basal voids. From his vantage at the top of the flight of Yorick Coral Stairs that fronted the prefectory, he could see that similar conflagrations were raging in all precincts of the city and beyond. Flaring from the vegetation that cloaked the buttes that were the tops of buildings and towers, the flames were being carried by the wind to all quarters. But the hot swirling wind also brought the foul odor of marsh gas to Nomanor's flattened nostrils, and he swung around in disbelief to see a cavalcade of fire-breathing Yuzhan Vong beasts bobbing over the cityscape. Quickly he lifted his gaze. There were too few starfighters in the sky to account for so many fires, and no evidence of orbital bombardment, turbo-laser bolts, or proton torpedoes. Then he understood, and his heart filled with such anguish that he dropped to his knees and remained there until he had caught his breath and regained his senses. Shimra was responsible. Beyond reason, beyond madness, the supreme overlord had struck a deal with the Duryam to destroy Coruscant. No manors Coruscant. With the same ruthlessness that had allowed him to dispatch Warmaster Nas Choka's armada on a suicide mission to poison Zonama Seacote, Shimra had decided to eradicate all things Yuzhan Vong. He had become the Yuzhan Vong specific poison he had fabricated for the elite, if only to spite gods he had once professed not to believe in. Nomanor railed and shook his fists at the smoke and ember filled sky. I should have killed you when I had the chance. He struggled to his feet, his expression growing more grave with every centimeter of elevation. His fists were bald and his one eye blazed. His near lipless mouth was drawn back, and his muscles were bunched under his thin garments. His sloped forehead was as inflamed as the city itself. He stiffened his arm, catching in the windpipe a warrior too distracted by bloodlust to see the blow coming. The warrior fell to the steps gurgling, clutching his throat, eyes squeezed tight in pain. No manor summoned the warrior's amphistaff to come to him, and with one strike put the choking soldier out of his misery. He descended the broad staircase in a stupor, shucking out of the green robe and turban that identified him as an intendant. At the foot of the broad stairs, he grabbed the tattered robe skin of a slain shamed one, and, donning it, began to shoulder his way into the place of hierarchy. 
ignoring the bloodshed occurring on all sides and aiming for a tall rubble pile at the center of the square. Short of the pile, a warrior rushed him, forcing him to step back and fight, Amphistaff against Amphistaff. Parrying two blows, Nomanor ducked down and slashed his opponent across the knees, then rose, bringing the sharp end of the serpentine weapon diagonally across the warrior's face. The warrior screamed and raised his hands, and Nomanor speared him through the neck. With bodies falling all around him, he scrambled up the pile. There, alone at the summit, he loosed a blood-curdling scream and raised the arm around which the living weapon was curled. I am Yusha, the prophet, he yelled at the top of his lungs. Our hour is at hand. I will lead you to victory. A long moment of stunned silence fell over the place of hierarchy. Then a roar went up from the oppressed, and they surged against the warriors, crude weapons cleaving, black blood streaming and misting into the air, fiery embers cycloning about them like a sacrament from the gods. From one hundred thousand kilometers out, Coruscant was a vortex of destruction. Lanced from all directions by turbolaser bolts, modeled by yawning Dovin basal singularities, lit from within by flaring explosions. This party's just the way we left it, Han said, as the falcon streaked for the embattled galactic center. I miss that one, Dad, Jaina said flatly from the co-pilot's chair. Me too, Jason said from behind her. Peripherally, Han saw his son glance at the Yuzhan Vong priest in the adjacent chair. Harar and I were on a world ship over Mirkur. Regretting his facile statement, Han went back to attending the Falcon's instruments. The fall of Coruscant had been among the worst days of his life, almost as horrible as when Chewbacca had died at Cernpadal. The images of the evacuation were burned into his memory. Yuzhan Vong hurling themselves and hostages against the planetary shields, a steady rain of flaming spacecraft, he and Leia trying to flee Eastport with Baby Ben, C-3PO, a YVH droid, and a potted ladolim. Their escape sabotaged at the Falcon's docking bay by a disguised Senator Vicky Shesh and an innocent twelve-year-old kid named Dab Hantak. Tark who happened to bear a likeness to young Anakin. The death of Adarak, Leia's bodyguard at Shesh's hand. The sky dazzled by plasma balls. Towers crumbling, people stampeding for the few star liners and government yachts that remained on the surface. And light years away at the inner rim world of Mirkur, Anakin dying, Jaina fleeing in a stolen enemy ship, Jason in the clutches of Verger, Captured or rescued, depending on how you looked at it. Han squeezed his eyes shut in recalled despair. Hardy, Harar said abruptly, many of our warriors use that term to describe combat engagements. You have the makings of a supreme commander, Han Solo. Han laughed shortly, recalling that Jason had said that the priest was fascinated with him. Thanks for thinking of me, Harar, but no matter what anyone says about it, I happen to like my face just the way it is. Jason and an uneasy Harar had taken the cockpit's rear chairs after Leia and Luke had climbed into the quad laser turrets. Mara, Kenth, Tahiri, Kakmaim, Miwal, and the droids were in the forward compartment. At the cost of some discretionary power, Han planned to keep the Falcon's artificial gravity enabled for as long as possible if only to prevent everyone from being bounced all over the ship. Alliance capital vessels were concentrating fire along the transitor and well into Coruscant's bright side, but the battle was raging planet-wide. Star destroyers, cruisers, and frigates were still vectoring in from hyperspace routes rarely used since the days of the Old Republic, and enemy forces were blasting up the gravity well to reinforce the defense flotilla. The Yuzhan Vong were widely dispersed, but consolidated over the equator, above what had been Imperial New Republic City in the Western Hemisphere. The Alliance had yet to press any capital ships through the blockade of kilometer-long, weapon-studded vessels, but hundreds of starfighters had penetrated enemy lines, 
and were attacking the arrays of Dovan basils in orbit at the edge of Coruscant's atmosphere. Now it was the Falcon's turn to try to slip past. It was the opposite of what Han had had to do to get the freighter safely off Zonama Seacoat. There the upper reaches of the envelope had been a dizzying clash of coral skippers and Seacotan fighters. From what Luke had been able to gather from Kip and the other Jedi pilots, the sight of living ships had thrown the skips into disarray. But the Jedi had also discovered that Magister Jabitha hadn't been understating anything when she had said that the Seacotan ships were for defense only. As often as not, the fleet fighters wouldn't fire unless fired upon. And for all their astounding alacrity, they weren't flying circles around the coral skippers so much as matching them maneuver for maneuver. Two hundred thousand kilometers from the living world drifted the enemy task force that had delivered the coral skippers, along with the Yamisk-carrying cluster ship that was guiding them. It was still anyone's guess why Warmaster Nas Choka had sent a splinter group to Zonama Seacoat, but it stood to reason that the Yuzhan Vong wouldn't wait long before bringing their capital ships to bear on the planet. Although Errant Venture and Tenelka's flotilla of Hapen Battle Dragons and Nova-class cruisers were reported to be on the way, it was unlikely that they could prevail against the task force. Engaged in a ferocious battle near Muscave, Wedge Antilles and Key and Farlander wouldn't be able to lend support until Crefe's first fleet arrived to relieve them. With so much action in the Coruscant system, from Vandor III clear to the Ulabos ice bands, Han had considered staging the Falcon through a series of micro-jumps. Ultimately, however, he had decided to jump the ship directly to Coruscant. They had reverted to real space behind Alliance lines, but close enough to their target to be staggered by what they saw. Green and white, where it had once been a sheen of artificial light, orbited by the remains of a shattered moon, its polar caps reduced to icebergs. Coruscant might as well have been an unfamiliar world. A tone sounded from the comm board, and a baritone voice issued from the cockpit annunciators. Millennium Falcon, this is right to rule control. Your best insertion point is presently at Bacta Sector 817, but we'll keep you updated on the situation. Jaina leaned forward to study the tactical display. Copy that right to rule, and thanks for your help. Millennium Falcon, Grand Admiral Pelion wishes you good fortune. Tell him the same from us, Han said into the headset mouthpiece. Pelion's fourth fleet, which included a trio of Star Destroyers and an assortment of Strike and Carrick-class cruisers, was pounding the Yuzhan Vong battle group. In several sectors, the orbital Dovan basils had been overwhelmed by the barrage, but Alliance Command was using the debilitated zones only as corridors for the infiltration of troop ships and squadrons of escort starfighters. Your War Master appears to be deferring to Jason Solo's report that bombardment will prompt the world brain to render the planet unfit for habitation, Harar said into Han's right ear. Gazing at the turmoil planet side, Han said, Looks to me like the world brain is doing a pretty good job of that without having to be prompted. The Falcon was closing on the insertion point when two X-Wings appeared to either side of it. Good to see you, Millennium Falcon, one of the pilots said over the tactical net. Mind if we ride down with you? Who's escorting who? Jaina asked. Let's call it a party of three, the other pilot said. Party. Harar murmured. The spacecraft that housed the orbital Dovan basils might have been fragments of Coruscant's deliberately smashed moon, but the voids they generated were as large as shockball stadiums. With the X-wings pressing close, Han sent the Falcon on her starboard side to edge between two gaping shield singularities. The ship wasn't through the strait when a third void yawned. Feed that thing something, Jaina said over the net. The starfighter pilots responded by paying out pairs of proton torpedoes. Instantly warped off course, the glowing orbs were ingested by the gravitic anomaly. 
With the Dovin Basil momentarily distracted, Han called on the sublight drives for a burst of speed and rocketed the Falcon past them all. Yet another singularity opened in front of the ship, but this time Han made careful use of the braking thrusters to nuzzle the Falcon close enough so that gravity whipped the freighter around the void and threw it deeper into the atmosphere. He did the same with the succeeding quartet of wells, using the gravitic distortions to sling the ship in an elongated double S from one to the next. The Falcon shook and shuddered, and the engines roared in protest, but the gambit worked to keep the ship from being wrenched off course. One of the X-Wings wasn't as fortunate. Even while the pilot was attempting to confuse the Dovin Basil with stutter fire and two remaining torpedoes, the creature's singularity reached out and grabbed the starfighter, which disintegrated before it disappeared entirely. The falcon swooped lower on a sinuous tail of blue energy, but the gauntlet didn't end with the Dovin Basils. A Matalock cruiser racing up the well caught sight of the freighter and spewed a volley of magma missiles from its starboard side plasma launchers. Diverting power to the deflectors, Jaina said without being asked. Han yawed hard to port, and began weaving through the storm of ejecta. The X-Wing that had ridden in on the Falcon's tail hung close, but couldn't keep pace with the larger ship. Han tried to swerve back on course to shield the starfighter, but even the Falcon was capable of only so much twisting and veering. Molten rock splashed against the Falcon's screens, but the main body of the salvo flooded over the mandibles and caught the hapless X-Wing head-on. Han bit back a curse and leaned into the control yoke, dropping the falcon like a stone straight for the ascending Matalock. Intent on squaring off with the cruiser, he had the concussion missile launchers armed when the proximity alarms began to blare. Four skips to starboard, Jaina said. Intercept course. Han performed a lightning-fast pushover. Give your mom and your uncle a heads up. Displaying their customary contempt for evasive tactics, the skips broke ranks and came at the Falcon from separate vectors, firing at extreme range. Han heard the top and belly quad lasers begin to chuff and chunder, and banked slightly to starboard to place two of the hostiles in the money lane. Outwitting the shield singularities generated by the Dovin Basils, the powerful guns began to make immediate strikes, chopping away at the skips' Yorick coral hulls. A final burst from Leia in the dorsal turret sent one of the craft colliding into the other. Nice work, Han said. Now see if you can get rid of the other two. Again the reciprocating guns began to clack, loosing bright green salvos of devastating energy at the Falcon's pursuers. Voids formed instantly at the blunt noses of the wedge-shaped skips, and most of the quad bursts were swallowed but some of Luke's bolts got through, and hunks of Yorick coral flew off into space. Abruptly, the lead skip peeled away and tried to attach itself to the Falcon in what would have been the kill zone of an ordinary ship. Han merely applied power, rolled, and dived for the surface. Plasma projectiles streamed from the frustrated skip, but all it received for the effort were answering barrages of laser fire. Struck repeatedly, the coral skipper wobbled as pieces of its wide stern were blown away. Crippled, the skip went into a helpless wiggle, then commenced a long fall toward the planet, trailing a plume of smoke and Yorick coral dust. The surviving skip held position through the Falcon's corkscrewing dive and continued firing. As plasma ranged closer, Han boosted power to the rear shields and narrowed the ship's profile by pulling a snap roll that lifted the Falcon onto her starboard side. Luke and Leia triggered out-of-phase bursts, which began to wear down the Dovin Basil and penetrate the small voids it was managing to produce. Sustaining convergent strikes to the bow, the skip reared up and split apart. The Falcon flashed out of her evasive maneuvers, then banked broadly and darted for clear space. Raising the bow, Han leveled out and arced for the horizon. Let Luke know I'm deactivating the artificial gravity, he told Jaina. If he knows what's good for him, he'll climb out of that belly turret. Shortly, the Falcon was wending through forested spires that rose east of the sacred precinct. Below were villa paddies, interconnected orange-tinted lakes, and Yorick coral quarries. 
some containing skips in their formative stages. Flames mushroomed and stabbed from the deep canyons, and microstorms carried burning vegetation toward distant patches of woodland. We've been spotted, Jaina said, coral skippers approaching from the south. Han punched the throttle, whipping the freighter up and over a burning mound, then dropped down over the expansive plain from which the imperial New Republic city had grown. He had to keep reminding himself that he wasn't flying over hills but over buried structures, that what appeared to be an escarpment had been a kilometers-long block of residential buildings, that the geometric craters dotting the landscape were the foundations of the great edifices themselves, now filled with cobalt-blue water or lush forest. Better switch us over to the tactical frequency, he said. No sooner had Jaina reset the dials on the comm board than a tone sounded. Homing beacon, she told Han. A map of the Yuzhan Vong formed governmental district resolved on the terrain following sensor screen. Jaina tapped her forefinger against a pulsing bezel. That's our rally point. What should have come into view was Mount Umate, highest peak of the Manarai Mountains but what came into view instead was a massive crater encompassing all of what had once been Monument Plaza. Perched on the protruding permacrete shoulders of the ruined arena were flocks of winged creatures similar to the seabird-like flyers Han and Leia had seen at Selvaris. At the base of the ancient uplift, not far from where the Calarock Amphitheater should have been, was another immense crater, whose thickly forested floor was in flames. On the steep slopes, herds of six-legged beasts and packs of panicked lizard hounds were trying desperately to scrabble to safety. The smoke was denser at the outskirts of the sacred precinct. Eastport, where the Solos had lived and Han had kept the Falcon docked, was a memory. Dirigible-like, flame-spewing monstrosities wobbled and bobbed through the ruins of Sky Dome Botanical Gardens, Column Commons, and... Calicur Heights. Wherever Han looked, he saw evidence of the incredible damage wrought by ranged weapons and crashed Golan defense platforms, skyhooks, and orbital solar energy transfer satellites. Buildings that had stood for a thousand years had either been reduced to rubble or become trellises for profuse alien vegetation. Fires raged on the surface and smoke billowed into the sky. Through gaps in the clouds, Han could discern crowds of Yuzhan Vong civilians running every which way in pandemonium. Pursued anew by coral skippers, the Falcon raced across the devastated cityscape, then down into blazing chasms and corridors thick with roiling smoke. The landscape was jagged with ferrocrete debris. The remains of superstructures jutted up at odd angles like experimental sculpture. This place isn't worth saving, Jaina said in a stricken voice. Shimra obviously feels the same, Harar said, equally disheartened. Homing in on the beacon, Han veered the falcon slightly north and began a slow descent through the smoke. He realized that they were going to be setting down at the western terminus of the Glatani Esplanade, but principally because the map display established as much. Formerly a stretch of fashionable shops and restaurants spread across the spacious rooftops of Judicial Plaza, the Glatani was now a deep canyon, spanned in a few places by organiform bridges, and channeling a flow of white water toward the citadel. Aware of the Falcon's approach, Alliance soldiers began to appear on a spacious sheltered balcony that jutted out over the former promenade and had been secured by commandos for use as a landing zone. Engaging the repulsor lifts, Han steered the ship onto the ledge and let her settle down on her landing gear. Just to be on the safe side, he lowered the repeating blaster from its hidden compartment in the forward hull and activated the interrupter template that would prevent the weapon from damaging the landing ramp or hard stand. Last to file from the cockpit, Han found Leia, Luke, Mara, Tahiri, and Kent waiting in the ring corridor, already sheathed in biosuits. While Jason and Jaina were slipping into their suits, he palmed the bulkhead switch that extended the entry ramp. Cockmame, me wall! He shouted toward the forward compartment. You and the droids remain aboard. We're not going to be here long. 
Heads ducked, the Jedi landing party scrambled down the ramp. A scorching, debris-laden wind was howling across the balcony, tearing at the enviro suits worn by the soldiers who approached the ship. Welcome home, Judder Page said, shouting to be heard as two A-wings streaked low overhead. Two, as we like to call it, Necropolis. Like his comrades, Page was wearing a jet pack and helmet and carrying a blaster rifle. Along the lip of the balcony stood a dozen YVH droids. Han wasn't surprised to spy a couple of wraiths among the commando platoon, but Posh Kraken was the last person he had expected to see. Jaina was even more stunned to see Jag Fell, who was waiting with a few others for a shuttle that would convey them to Westport, where there were starfighters that needed pilots. Jaina hurried to Jag while Paige began to brief Luke, Kent, Mara, and Jason on the Situation Planet side. The shamed ones are up in arms, but word has it that Shimra has issued an extermination order. He's blaming them for every reversal the Yuzhan Vong have faced and is determined to see every last one of them die along with Coruscant itself. How fortified is the sacred precinct? Luke asked as the wind whipped his hair about his face. Several thousand ground troops, some reptoid slave soldiers, Kraken said, but not much in the way of air support. He nodded to the flashing sky. Most of the skips have gone upside. The better for us, Luke said. Leia stepped into the howling wind to embrace her brother and Mara, then hugged Jason as if she wasn't going to let him go. She did the same with Jaina after Jaina had said hello and goodbye to Jag. Luke, Leia started to say. They're in my keeping, Leia, he said of Jaina and Jason. But all of us are in the custody of the Force. Han embraced his children and Mara and clamped his hands on the tops of Luke's shoulders. We've been in worse straits than this, right? Luke grinned. More times than I can count. Han nodded soberly. Then maybe we should make this one count as the last one. I'll abide by that if you will. You just watch me. Han put his arm around Leia and began to lead her back to the Falcon after the Jedi, Page's commandos, and the YVH droids had moved out. At the ramp, Leia blew out her breath and looked up at him. For our next trick, we set a course for the world brain. And when we get there, Han compressed his lips. I'm hoping Harar will think of something. The living ship forged from the seed partners to which Kip had bonded, soared soundlessly and effortlessly through Zonama Seacoat's tormented sky. In pairs and trios, coral skippers pierced the planet's envelope to attack the vessels the planet itself had fashioned to frustrate them, but so far none had made it through to the surface. The few that had succeeded in getting past the Jedi pilots had been repelled by Zonama itself, with powerful updrafts or unseen gravity generators that had hurled the skips to the edge of space, repulsed in a way that reminded Kip of magnets when their like poles were brought into contact. Kip and one Coral Skipper pilot in particular had been testing and toying with each other for far too long, but each time Kip had drawn a bead on the skip, the Sikotan ship's weapons had failed or perhaps refused to fire. The same was true with the skip, whose controlling Yamask, falsely perceiving that the pilot was firing on another of its brood, would whisk the coral skipper through a turn to sabotage its shots. As acutely as Kip could feel the gravitic tugs from the Yamask, he could also feel draws and joggles from Seacoat. Sonama's consciousness was manipulating the Jedi ships into flying with the same unsettling sense of conformity displayed by the flights of coral skippers. Yuzhan Vong and Jedi ships alike were part of a zigzagging aerial dance that was being choreographed from afar. Against almost any of the enemies that had massed to test the durability of the New Republic during the past twenty years, a dozen Seacotan ships, a skip-ray blast boat, and a couple of X-wings wouldn't have been adequate to protect an entire world. But the Yuzhan Vong were not an ordinary enemy and Zonama Seacoat was hardly an ordinary world. 
True to the behavior they had demonstrated from the start, the Yuzhan Vong had their own rules of engagement, centering on challenge, honor, and persistence to the last. In the same way that their priests placed themselves at the service of a pantheon of cruel gods, the pilots of their war vessels surrendered individual action to obey the commands of the tentacled creature that coordinated them in battle. Their sense of honor was as distorted by their slavish devotion to sacrifice as local space was warped by the Dovin basils that propelled and shielded their weapons. Over and above what the Alliance had accomplished, it was the Yuzhan Vong's unswerving subordination to the will of the gods and the importance of captives that had cost them hundreds of vessels and countless lives at Ebak 9, Abroa Sky, and other arenas. As extraordinary as they were as a species and as warriors, it was foolhardy courage and inflexibility that could end up costing them Zonama Seacoat as well. That was assuming that the Jedi would eventually grow comfortable with piloting the Seacotan ships, Kip mused, merely settling into the pulsing red and green cockpits had required resolve. The canopy was similar to the mica-like transparency of a coral skipper, but like everything in the cockpit, it was warm to the touch. Comparable to a combination yoke, accelerator, and weapons trigger, the main control had actually reached up and wrapped around his right hand, molding to it the way some of the controls of Centerpoint Station were rumored to have molded to Anakin Solo's hand. The console was an organiform surround of control levers that resembled ligaments, switches that had the resiliency of blisters or calluses, and tracking displays as fluid as those on a Moon Calamari cruiser. Odors that were by turn cloying and sharp pervaded the cockpit, as if encouraging the pilot to make use of olfactory cues as well as audiovisual and tactile ones. More important, the ship engaged a pilot's mind in a kind of telepathic dialogue. There was no astromech droid to report on the status of the systems. No cognition hood interface, as on the stolen Yuzhan Vong vessel that had come to be called Trickster but the Seacotan ship incorporated some of the qualities of each by speaking telepathically to the pilot. The ship didn't have a voice. It wasn't telepathy on the order of that honed by the Jedi, but Kip could sense what the vessel was feeling and thinking, the way he had been able to sense the feelings of the crazy little seed partners that had clung to him. All this came standard with the ship, as well as with the ship's Zonama Seacoat had furnished for the lucky few Old Republic-era pilots who had been wealthy enough to afford them, and who had formed the requisite attachment to seed partners. But as Han Solo was forever saying about the Millennium Falcon, some special modifications had been made to the Jedi ships. Like coral skippers, the ships were capable of hurling plasma, but unlike coral skippers, they lacked shields, relying instead on astonishing nimbleness. Absent ion drives, heat exchangers, exhaust ports, or anything resembling conventional engine components, the ships were faster than A-wings and more maneuverable than TIE fighters. Kip was beginning to think of them as the Seacotan equivalent of lightsabers. The pilot didn't have to be a Jedi, flying the ships didn't require a special connection to the Force, but a ship's ability to perform appeared to be directly related to the degree to which a pilot could surrender him or herself, become egoless and empty. Saba, Lobaka, and Tam Azur Jamin, whose call signs were Hisser, Streak, and Quiet, respectively, were demonstrating this to be the case. Kip was in awe of the maneuvers they were executing, to the point that he sometimes lost focus on the battle itself. Despite his talents, his mastery of the Force, he had yet to be able to take his ship through similar moves. Or was it that the ship was having trouble taking him through similar moves? Kip's comlink toned. Over the past few years, since Mirker, the Jedi had become adept at communicating with one another through Force melds, but between attending to the Seacotan ships and flying in the atmosphere of the living world, these melds were proving difficult to sustain. Kip, you getting the hang of these things? Corin Horn asked. 
The intership comlink transmission was being relayed through Jade Shadow, which was in stationary orbit at the edge of the battle zone, unpiloted, but slave circuit and all countermeasures enabled. I've been wondering if the ship is having trouble getting the hang of me. You and me both. I did a lot better with the Seacoton ship Tahiri and I piloted from Coruscant. I mean, I know I'm targeting correctly, but a lot of my shots are going wide, even when there aren't voids standing between me and the target. Something about Seacoat's need for us not to be killers. I've got a theory about that, Corin said, but I'll save it for another time. Then why are we up here? Just for show? Maybe it's the same between Seacoat and us as it is between the ships and us. Seacoat's still trying to get a feel for us. Once that happens, we'll be able to target more accurately. So I should think of this as some kind of insane simulation, Kip said. With one difference, it's the ships that are learning. Kip thought about this statement after he signed off with Corin. Perhaps it wasn't only the ships that were learning. Why had Seed Partners bonded to some Jedi and not others? Why him and not Jaina? Was there anything to the fact that Kip had destroyed a world? Saba had seen one destroyed? And both Alima and Corin held themselves responsible for the destruction of theirs. Would Ganner Rysod have bonded with Seed Partners? Worth Skitter? Kip's own apprentice, Miko Reglia. Would Anakin have bonded? What did Seacoat understand about all of them that they didn't understand about themselves? Chapter 37 A sudden darkness had fallen over the Vong-formed cityscape. Their lightsabers ignited, glowing blue, violet, green. The Jedi drew on the Force to propel them across the fissured and rain-slicked rooftops and balconies that dangled over what was once the Glatani Esplanade. Piles of debris, precipitous ledges, and gaping chasms posed no obstacles for the Six as they hurtled, vaulted, leapt in a race to reach the Citadel and the Yuzhan Vong most responsible for what Coruscant had become. Thanks to their jet packs, Captain Page's commandos were just managing to keep up. Rain was falling hard and being driven every which way by fierce gusts of wind. Overhead, it was no longer possible to differentiate flashes of lightning from the artificial brilliance of deadly engagements. It was impossible to distinguish between the lament of the wind and the howl of strafing starfighters, the billowing smoke from scudding storm clouds the sizzle of fires being extinguished by the rain from the sound of laser boats cleaving the saturated air. The booming cannonades of distant weapons might easily have been rolling thunder, the red-orange pillars on the horizon erupting volcanoes or the glowing ejecta of plasma launchers. For Luke, the nebulous nature of the surroundings mirrored his inner state. The darkness was coercing a commingling of disparate realities. Coruscant was fast becoming a void, a singularity into which the very fabric of life was being stretched and distorted. Was this Coruscant any longer, or was it really Yuzhan Tar, as the original world had been at its end, when angered by the Yuzhan Vong's turn to violence, the gods had robbed their children of the Force and cast them into a bottomless abyss? The quickest route is through the North Concourse, Mara told Judder Page, when everyone had come to a halt on a puddled ledge. Rain dripped from the visors of their helmets and cascaded down the front of their biosuits. Mara was leading the combined teams from memory, though also relying on Jason and Tahiri's Vong sense, to keep everyone from encountering patrols of Yuzhan Vong warriors. Page had his gaze fixed on the water-beaded display of a positioning unit built into the sleeve of his biosuit. According to this, there was bridge access to the concourse. Mara nodded. The Bridge of Unity. I used to have lunch in the restaurant on the lower level. Even with all that Coruscant had become, she sounded wistful. Luke could imagine her, thirty years earlier, frequenting the Esplanade's expensive shops and restaurants, wandering among the crowds attending the Imperial Fair, a sometime visitor to the Imperial Palace in her guise as the Emperor's Hand. 
It was the Coruscant Luke had known only from holonet transmissions and the occasional dramas and documentaries that had found their way to Tashi Station on Tatooine. By the time he had finally visited the capital world in person, most of the governmental district had been in ruins following Coruscant's liberation by New Republic forces. But over the decades, Coruscant had become his home, as Yavin had, only to have suffered a similar fate. Luke hadn't expected to be so heartsick, but then he hadn't expected to find Coruscant so altered, so remade, in the two years since he and Mara had left. Mara was waving everyone back in motion. Fifteen minutes of flat-out running brought them to the Bridge of Unity, which had lost the ornamental wire work and inscribed plaques that had earned it landmark status. Now the bridge was little more than a ferrocrete slab spanning the Esplanade Canyon. Lashed by the gale, vines and slimy vegetation trailed from the edges, and a shallow but fast-moving curtain of water plunged into the frothing river far below. From the bridge's southern abutment, the Jedi had their first unobstructed view of their objective. Several kilometers to the east, illuminated by forking lightning and accented by the laser beams of circling starfighters, Shimra's citadel towered above the infernal landscape. A veritable mountain, it stood where the Imperial Palace once had, encompassing everything from the Mon Calamari Ingle Nook to the Pleiada Diam Imperium as the eastern terminus of the Glatani Esplanade was known. The citadel's base was lost in swirls of dark smoke, but halfway to the rounded summit, four walkways approached from separate directions, linking the citadel to surrounding structures. This close, the mountain was revealed to be as craggy and pocked as any of the Yuzhan Vong world ships Luke had seen. But Shimra's was adorned with a pair of filigree wings that lent something insect-like to its appearance. The way it sat in the crater that served as its cradle, it might almost have been nesting. Flights of X and E wings were taunting the crown, but voids blacker than the stormy sky were devouring everything the starfighters hurled at them. Two of the snub fighters were circling closer when plasma projectiles geysered from launchers above the wings. The X-Wings might as well have been flying without shields. Caught on their starboard sides by the superheated missiles, they began to spiral down, S-foils and ion engines slagged. Luke could see pieces fly from the fighters as they struck outcroppings in the Citadel's coarse hull. They disappeared into the smoke at the foot of the mountain, and seconds later, roiling fire mushroomed into view. Luke's silence spoke volumes. As he turned and leapt out onto the bridge, a resonant bellowing issued from the far side, and two huge eyes stood out in the gloom. As if under strobing light, an enormous beast waddled into view around the shoulder of a ruined building. It wasn't the first Yuzhan Vong creature he had seen since leaving the Falcon. The sacred precinct was literally crawling with escaped animals, but it was certainly the largest. A mandul, Jason said, yelling to be heard. If it's been implanted with a villop, the belly can function like an amplifier. It's harmless either way. Page kept his blaster rifle raised regardless. If you say so, kid. He motioned with the barrel. But you cross first. No sooner had Jason and Luke started forward than the mandul sat on its haunches, with its tympanum of a belly aimed out over the canyon. In a deep and menacing voice, someone began to speak in Yuzhan Vong. Perish, Tahiri translated. Perish, all of you who would stand between me and exaltation, who would seek to profane me in our finest moment. Shemra? Luke asked. Jason shook his head uncertainly. Could be. I battled the gods on your behalf, Tahiri continued and you repay me with rebellion. Perish, then. Go to your deaths and your gods while I remake the world. Too bad we can't answer him, Mara said. We will soon enough, Luke assured her. Jason and Tahiri walked slowly toward the seated Mandul. 
In eerie unison, they motioned with their right arms, and the four-metric-ton beast lowered its front legs to the ground and began to trundle off. Their Vong sense, Luke thought. Jaina hurried forward to drape her left arm around Jason's shoulders. You always were good with animals. He responded with a wry smile and hurried forward. The three young Jedi crossed the span together and turned east toward the citadel. Ahead of them, clad in vegetation, a palisade of ruined buildings extended all the way to the western access to Shimra's Mountain. Luke, Mara, and Kenth had just caught up with the trio when Jason and Tahiri called everyone to a halt. Lightning flashes disclosed the presence of a group of skeletally thin humans and humanoids dressed in dripping, frayed garments and aged robe skins. Come forward, Tahiri said in Yuzhan Vong. Two shamed ones approached, a male and female. Jedi, the young male said, his eyes fixed on Luke's thrumming lightsaber. More Yuzhan Vong began to appear, along with a dozen or so Coruscanti, who looked as if they had been subsisting on gray weave since the occupation. The shamed and the damned, Luke told himself as he deactivated his lightsaber. Pushing through the group came two winded and wounded human commandos who saluted Captain Page. Back to squad, sir, the sergeant said. We've just come from down below. It's a real mess, Captain. The heretics are fighting tooth and claw, but they need reinforcements, and fast. If you can spare anyone, sir. Page beckoned to one of his jet-packed commandos. Congratulations, Corporal. You've been promoted to squad leader. Take ten men and go with the sergeant. We'll regroup at the Citadel soonest. The commando saluted, spun on his heel, and began choosing his teammates. The wounded sergeant looked from Page to Luke. Master Skywalker, a couple of your people would make a world of difference, not only to us. He motioned to the shamed ones, but to them as well. Kent and Tahiri glanced at Luke, who nodded. Thank you, the sergeant said as the two Jedi moved to join him. We've heard that the Prophet has reappeared, but we haven't been able to locate him. Word has it he was last seen in the place of hierarchy. Leading them or helping with the slaughter, Mara asked, stepping forward. Leading them. Luke showed Mara a skeptical look. Maybe he's had a change of heart since Sonama Seacoat. She snorted in derision. Only if someone implanted a new one in his chest... Luke swung to the shamed ones, who had been the first to show themselves. Have you or any of the others even been inside the citadel? Tahiri translated. A male in the crowd spoke and showed himself. He was more hideously scarred than the others, and short horns sprouted from the tops of his shoulders. This one says that he arrived in the citadel, Tahiri told Luke. She listened for a moment more. He was a warrior before the gods before his body rejected certain enhancing biotes the shapers devised for him. The former warrior pointed to the walkways that accessed the Yorick Coral Mountain. Each cast uses a separate entrance, but all four avenues terminate at the Hall of Confluence, where Supreme Overlord Shimra grants audience to the elite. Ask him if Shimra is likely to be in the hall now, Luke said. Tahi rephrased the question and waited for the response. He says that you won't find Shimra there. He'll be in his private... coffer. The Yuzhan Vong aimed a thick, truncated finger at the lofty crown of the citadel. Up there is where you'll have to go. Thank you, Luke said to the heretic, who asked something of Tahiri. He has a question for the Jedi, she said after a moment. He wants to know if we plan to help them or kill them. He wants to know if the shamed ones will be able to find salvation in the Force. Luke looked at the Yuzhan Vong. We'll help you find your way back to the Force. Tahiri's translation prompted agitation and a flurry of hushed conversations among the shamed ones. Then she and Kent began to move off with the commandos. Mara shifted her gaze from the citadel to Luke. Ready, soldier? When he didn't respond immediately, she said, What's wrong? 
He held her gaze. Mara, I want you to go with Tahiri and Kenth. She almost laughed. I want you to go with them, he said again. Her expression changed, and a twinge of fear came into her eyes. Luke, tell me this is the Force speaking to you, and that you're not doing it because you don't want us fighting together. For Ben's sake. Would it matter? She gripped her hands on his upper arms. You promised me on Zonama Seacoat that both of us have a lot more living to do. He smiled and stroked her cheek with the backs of his fingertips. You think I'd drop you into the midst of all this to make you a widow or me a widower? She shook her head. That's not your style. Then go with them. Reluctantly, she nodded. Not because I want to, but because I trust you. Airborne at the extreme edge of the tempest that was lashing the northern quarter of the sacred precinct, the falcon banked toward the former legislative district. Owing to the toughness of its honeycomb and crumpled zone engineering, the Senate itself had survived the Yuzhan Vong barrage, but now the famed edifice was covered by the half-kilometer-high hemisphere that sheltered the world brain. No mystery why we're not taking flak from plasma emplacements, Han said, as he and Leia powered the freighter through a reconnaissance flyby. Nothing short of a planet buster is going to crack that skullcap. The Yorick coral has enzymatically digested and absorbed the Senate's duracrete and transparasteel, Harar explained from the navigator's chair. The constituent materials have been used to fashion a new exoskeleton, that goes deep underground and forms an impervious sphere around the Duryam, the brain. C-3PO had a tight grip on the chair next to Harar's, and R2-D2 was securely planted behind his counterpart. Cockmaim was in the dorsal gun turret, Miwal in the forward compartment. How impervious? Han asked over his shoulder. Sufficient to allow the Duryam to survive an invasion as a self-contained and possibly self-propelled vessel, similar to that which constitutes the crown of the citadel. An escape pod, Leia said. But massive, Harar elaborated, capable not only of preserving the Duryam, with all its engineered genetics and learned skills, but also of preserving the lives of any who happen to be in the well when the sphere launches. Oh, my, C-3PO remarked. R2-D2 seconded the protocol droid's stupefaction with a long whistle. Han growled and rubbed his head. So how are we supposed to get inside the thing if you're telling me that bombs can't? Harar leaned toward the viewport. Complete your overflight. Let us see if we can't locate the entrance to the secret passageway Jason and Verger used to escape from the well. As Han banked the falcon to the west, Leia gazed at the sprawl of vegetation-clad structures below, then pointed toward the extreme southwest projection of the dome. Borsk Felia's office would have been right about there. Han sighted down her finger. Right there, buried under who knows how many tons of Yorick coral. Leia glanced at him. I guess the dome has spread out since Jason was here. You could say that. An unexpected turn of events, Harar said. Han growled. I'm getting tired of surprises. There has to be another way in. Perhaps the front door, C-3PO said. Yeah, we'll just go up and knock, Han said. Isn't that how you got yourself into Jabba's palace? Actually, Captain Solo, the front entrance... May prove problematic, Harar interrupted. Continue your circle, and I'll show you why. Lit from within by explosions and flashes of lightning, the northern horizon was a towering anvil of black clouds. Han veered east around the two-kilometer-wide dome, and a long, elongated tunnel came into view, protruding from the dome. The hemispherical corridor appeared to be made of the interwoven branches of thousands of slender trees. The hedge maze, Harar said. 
the ceremonial avenue that leads to the atrium of the well. Han laughed. A walk in the park, unless you're going to tell me a hedge is impervious to weapons. The hedge is not only as solid and fire-resistant as your durasteel, but the trees that comprise it are studded with needle-sharp thorns that range in size from that of your thumbnail to that of your arm. The thorns contain a neurotoxin potent enough to devastate the nervous system of any creature hapless enough to be pricked by them. Han tightened his lips in frustration. I say we see how it handles a couple of concussion missiles. A waste of armament, Harar said. Any damage the missiles render, the Duryam will quickly repair. Yeah, well, since you're so smart, you think of a plan to get us inside. I already have. How wide is your craft, Han Solo? Twenty-five meters, give or take. Why? Harar took a breath. A tight fit, but given your piloting skills, I think it can be done. Leia swiveled her chair around to face him. You think what can be done? A flight through the hedge tunnel directly to the entry portal. Leia's jaw dropped. You can't be serious. Princess Leia is correct, C-3PO said as R2-D2 was mewling. Please confirm that your statement was in jest. A slow grin took shape on Han's face. He's serious, and he's right. He looked at Leia. We can do it. Leia started to speak, but swallowed whatever she had in mind to say and began again. Well, you said he'd think of something, and I guess he has. Han patted her left arm with affection. Better tighten up your crash webbing. You too, Goldenrod. C-3PO cantered his head in apprehension. If it's all the same to you, sir, I prefer to adjourn to the forward compartment with R2. Suit yourself, but be quick about it. Han brought the headset mic close to his mouth. Cockmame, get yourself to the forward cabin space with Miwal. He sent the Falcon into a broad circle from which they emerged, staring directly down the throat of the hedge tunnel. You're sure about this? Leia said while Han was flipping switches on the console. No, but luckily we don't have time to think about it. Han dropped the freighter lower and accelerated. The thorned half-circle of mouth grew larger and larger in the viewport. Reflexively, Leia leaned back in her chair and clamped her hands on the armrests. Hang on, Han said. Hang on. And suddenly they were inside the maze. But the Falcon wasn't even all the way through the opening when the three of them realized that the ride was going to be worse than they had imagined. The resilient knitted branches knocked the ship harshly from one side to the other. The Falcon rattled and shuddered, in danger of being spun completely around. The longest of the thorns drew prolonged and deafening screeches from the hull. External components groaned and squealed as they were ripped away. Cowlings, rectenna, fuel driver pressure stabilizers. And ahead of them, the throat of the hedge maze was closing, narrowing as they watched. Fire the concussion missiles, Han said. Leia squeezed the trigger, sending one pair, then another streaking down the tunnel, tearing through the thorns and branches, and ultimately exploding against whatever constituted the entrance to the dome. Angle the deflectors! Leia raised the forward shields as a boiling torrent of fire and debris came back at them, washing over the falcon, stripping away more parts, and scoring and scorching the hull plates. Then suddenly the ship broke through to a broad, wedge-shaped causeway formed by the limbs of great trees, whose leaf-bearing branches, now aflame, tangled toward the sky on either side. The foot of the causeway was a hundred meters high, but it tapered to an arrowhead as it rose, forming a thorn-hedged ramp whose point touched the massive, ruined hatch sphincter that had long ago enveloped the great door of the Senate. Han fought to keep the ship stabilized as it skidded across the former plaza and raced into the second stretch of hedge. But the durasteel hard branches prevailed, slowing, then snagging the spasming ship. Stalled, the Falcon came to a final rest angled to one side and ten meters from the missile-damaged entrance. 
While two of the landing disks were in touch with the paving stones, the entire port side of the ship was upended and held fast by the interlocked branches. Guess this is as far as we go, Han said, staring straight ahead, with his hands still clenched on the control yoke. Leia blew out her breath and swallowed hard. Nothing like a quiet arrival. She, Han, and Harar freed themselves from the chairs and staggered into the ring corridor, which was strewn with objects that had found their way there from all over the ship. We'll clean up later, Leia said. Han uttered a laugh. We could have 3 PO do it. I was hoping you would say just that, sir, the droid said, as he, R2-D2, and the two Nogri appeared from the forward compartment, leaning against the corridor's curving walls for support. That would be a delightful chore. R2-D2 began to twitter and tootle in protest. We'll have no complaints from you, R2, if Captain Solo wants us to remain on the ship rather than accompany him into the well of the world brain, the least we can do is... R2-D2 razzed loudly. C-3PO straightened in a huff. Never satisfied. All right, you two, quit arguing, Han said. Forget the mess. Just keep the ship warmed up and stick close to the comlink. Han extended the landing ramp, which didn't drop far before hitting solid ground. Once we are inside the well, we will be safe from ambushes by warriors, Harar said. But whatever you do between here and there, Han Solo, you must not kill the Shaper. We will need his or her scent markers to get us safely into the well. I know certain things about the brain, but not enough to incapacitate it. Han passed out thermal charges to the Nogri, then clipped two onto his own belt. Just in case we have any trouble persuading it to surrender. Leia activated her lightsaber and narrowed her eyes. And I promised I'd never set foot in the Senate again. Han nodded at her. We've all had to break promises we made to ourselves. The five of them hurried down the angled ramp and through the slowly sealing breach the concussion missiles had blown in the thick hatch sphincter. The hideously torn membrane opened onto a vast, dimly lit cavern of Yorick coral. Han scarcely had time to look around when fifty or more warriors armed with amphistaffs poured from a narrow corridor in the curved wall opposite the hatch. Someone shouted commands in Yuzhan Vong that needed no translation. A flock of whizzing bugs and hurled amphistaffs flew for the Falcon's company. I thought you said there wouldn't be warriors inside the well, Han yelled as he and the Nogri were ducking and triggering blaster rounds. This isn't the well, the priest said. This is merely the atrium. Batting aside thud and razor bugs, Leia led the retreat. They backed through the iris hatch, firing at their pursuers without aiming. Stumbling into the plaza, they raced for the falcon, only to find her completely enclosed by the thorned hedge. Despite the impetus the Prophet's rallying cry had given the heretics, the counteroffensive was not going well. Caught in a violent storm, the shamed ones and their newfound allies were being sliced to pieces by kufis, knocked unconscious by thud bugs, slashed and split by amphistaffs. Nom Anor himself was bloodied, slipping on hailstones and his own black flow as he fought with Kufi in one hand, Amphistaff in the other. The now-drenched throng of would-be insurgents had managed to fight their way out of the place of hierarchy, but Shimra's avengers were attempting to herd them toward the place of bones. If the warriors succeeded in trapping them in the sunken amphitheater, there would be no escape, no hope. Nom Anor was trading strikes and stabs with a warrior a head taller than himself when he heard the clamor of running feet and raised voices. When the warrior turned in the direction of the commotion, Nom Anor availed himself of the moment of distraction to send the point of his amphistaff through his opponent's right eye. All around him other warriors were beginning to add their voices to the tumult and to press the attack. Reinforcements, Nom Anor told himself bitterly. The heretics would be lucky now if they even made it to the place of bones. Unexpectedly, though, the war cries of the Citadel Guard began to fade, and the crowd was pushed back toward the place of hierarchy. It was the heretics who were being reinforced. 
Nomanor was suddenly inflamed. If every cell of shamed ones could find the courage to rise up, there was a chance, though slim, that the heretics would yet win the day. His convictions surged as the reports of stun and flash grenades began to echo and rebound from the walls of the temples and the dormitories of the intendants. Hundreds were instantly flattened to the saturated ground. Then blaster bolts rang out. Resistance fighters and alliance commandos, Noma Nor realized. It was the warriors who were trapped. Noma Nor charged into the brawl, slashing throats and hamstrings. Overwhelmed, the warriors fought brutally and valiantly but more and more of them were falling and being trampled underfoot. Nomenor was in the thick of things when new sounds drew his attention, and he froze in surprise and dread. Snap hiss, thrum. He risked a sideways glance to discover three Jedi parrying and slashing with their lightsabers. Worse, one of them was Mara Jade Skywalker, the very Jedi who had fallen victim to Nomenor's coom spores so long ago, now fighting all but alongside of him. Not far away from the red-golden-haired Skywalker was Tahiri Vela, the Jedi who had almost been shaped into a Yuzhan Vong, and with whom Noma Nor had fought and escaped from on Zonama Seacoat. And beside Tahiri, a tall, older male Jedi whom Noma Nor didn't recognize. He tried to conceal himself by wading deeper into the battle, but the conflict was too frenzied for him to make any headway. He began to angle toward the northwest entrance to the place of hierarchy, but there, too, he was rapidly hemmed in by clashing warriors and heretics. No matter which direction he attempted to move, he wound up being pushed inexorably closer to the two Jedi women. Whirling, he slit the throat of a shamed one and placed himself where the gushing blood could wash over his face. He found a sodden turban on the ground and pulled it down over his forehead, only to have it unwind and flop uselessly over his shoulders. He cursed himself for not having thought to carry an Ooglith masker with him. A group of enraged warriors made a sudden sally, forcing the heretics away from the place of hierarchy and out into the broad boulevard that ran north to the citadel. Again, Nome Anor heard the distinctive thrum of a lightsaber and shortly found himself pressed shoulder to shoulder with youthful Tahiri, who was shouting alternately in basic and Yuzhan Vong as her blue blade deflected overhead strikes from amphistaffs and lateral swipes from kufis. Nomenor's attempts to squirm away were in vain. He turned his back at the same time the Jedi did, but surges in the crowd kept shoving them hard into each other. All at once, Nomenor could feel Tahiri's body tense against his. He pivoted in time to see Tahiri throw up her hands in some sort of force gesture, and a dozen warriors hit the ground as if struck by a swarm of invisible thud bugs. A force wall, Nomanor thought. Tahiri used her Jedi powers a second time to create an even wider circle of clear space, then whirled and grabbed Nomanor by the arm, spinning him around to face her, her eyes already wide with discovery. Sending his amphistaff flying with a force command, she immobilized him by clutching the yoke of his robe skin. Then she turned and gesticulated toward her fellow Jedi. Mara, I have no manor. Over the heads of combatants, through the hail, misted blood, and forest of flailing arms, no manor could see Skywalker gazing directly at him in eager peril. Summoning his strength, Noma Nor slashed upward with his kufi, missing Tahiri by a blade, but succeeding in cutting the handful of robe she had gripped. Momentum propelled him backward through a splashing somersault, and while Tahiri's attention was momentarily diverted, he shoved a wounded shamed one at her feet. Crawling a sinuous and puddled path between the legs of warriors and heretics, he ultimately reached the northern edge of the place of hierarchy. There, where the crowd was thinner, he elbowed his way through a cluster of warriors and broke fast for the stairs in freedom. Much like Millennium Falcon, Lady Luck had in the past five years undergone an atavistic transition from pleasantly appointed family craft to war vessel. But where Han's Falcon was as armed as it was fast, Lando's fifty-meter-long Soro sub yacht relied as ever on stealth, speed, and advanced sensor arrays that allowed it to observe and scrutinize vessels at far remove. With three lasers and a reinforced hull, Talon Card's Corellian transport was better configured for battle, 
although hardly a match for a Yuzhan Vong task force, which was why the two ships were flying at the fringe of the battle zone and leaving most of the dirty work to errant venture and to the Hapens. Tenel Ka's flotilla had arrived moments after the Yuzhan Vong capital ships had begun their move against Zonama Seacoat and had immediately arrayed themselves in a blockade. The new generation battle dragons were twin saucered ships with turbo lasers and ion cannons placed along the rims, made all the more lethal since the New Republic had finally shared its weapons recharge technology with the Hapen Navy. The enhanced dragons were also equipped with pulse mass mine launchers that were nearly as effective as Dovin Basil singularities when it came to deflecting weapons fire and interdicting ships from jumping to hyperspace. In contrast, the shape and sleekness of the consortium's Nova class cruisers brought to mind old Republic era hand blasters. As agile as starfighters and as deadly as warships twice their size, the cruisers were preventing Yuzhan Vong vessels from penetrating the dragon's daunting barricade. Closer to Zonama Seacoat, flaming red errant venture, along with squadrons of X-Wings and Hapen Mital fighters, were preying on the advanced coral skippers the task force had dispatched to test the planet's defenses. Trapped between the deep space squadrons and the atmospheric craft flown by the Jedi, the coral skippers were being decimated and now that capital ships were involved, the planet itself had brought out its big guns, firing salvos of stunning ion fire from the summits of mountains twelve kilometers high. Equidistant from the task force and blockade, Lando and Tendra had an overview of the entire battle, but Lady Luck's seeming brazenness had made her the object of unwanted attention, and the Calrissians were being forced to do more running than spying. Their updates of enemy maneuvers had twice saved Booster Tarek from being taken by surprise, and they were a critical link in relaying intelligence between the Star Destroyer and the Jedi pilots, who at last word had finally managed to talk their living ships into returning fire. The Yuzhan Vaughn gave every indication of having been thrown into disorder by their obvious miscalculation. The pilots of the skips were fighting for their lives, and the task force itself was fast coming unglued, with cruiser and destroyer analogs maneuvering without rhyme or reason, making themselves easy targets for the precision lasers of the Hapen cruisers and the ranged weapons of the dragons. Only total confusion could account for the fact that some of the vessels in the task force were actually turning on one of their own. The victim was the vessel that originally had been flying at the center of the Yuzhan Vong's elongated diamond formation. It had remained at the center all through the initial coral skipper assault on Zonama Seacoat, but was now being raked with plasma fire by four of the surrounding cruisers. Lando and Tendra saw the vessel split wide open, and yet instead of exploding, the cleaved vessel released a smaller vessel that was concealed inside. A corvette analog, the six-armed craft, had a scaled hull and an upraised curving stern, not unlike two vessels errant venture had destroyed at Kalula, a slayer ship. They're supposed to be hyperspace capable, Lando said, so why did they need to transport this one? It looks off, Tendra said. One eyebrow raised, Lando glanced at her. Off course? She shook her head. Off color. It looks ill. Lando's blood ran cold. He commanded the scanners to provide him with a close-up and analyze the vessel's signature. Then he calmed errant venture. Booster, we're sending you signature data on a vessel in the task force, Lando began. We're busy, Lando, Booster snapped. You're not too busy for this. Run a comparison with whatever you've got stored in the venture's memory and tell me if we get a hit. Hold tight, Booster said. When after a long moment he spoke again, his voice was riddled with apprehension. The signature you sent matches the ship that evaded us at Kalula. The ship carrying Alpha Red, Lando said. And now closing on Zonama Seacoat. Chapter 38 
Jag thought of himself first and foremost as a starfighter pilot, not a dirt flyer. He had accepted the assignment to lead twin sons on to Coruscant, but without the enthusiasm he might have demonstrated for a space mission. Like many who had earned their wings in zero-g, atmosphere was anathema. Maneuvers weren't so much performed as rested from a craft, no matter how aerodynamic the design or how responsive the repulsor lift engine. The carbon-scored green X-wing he had been given at Westport felt sluggish and unwieldy, especially compared to a claw craft. But Jag's complaints were only that. There was a mission to execute, and he was not about to shirk his commitment to seeing it through. Streaking east from the now Alliance-occupied landing field, he wove the snub fighter through a hail of ascending plasma fire and descending wreckage. Dominating the forward view was the rounded summit of Shimra's fortress, rising from the thick blanket of cloud cover and smoke that smothered most of the sacred precinct. Only two years earlier, the elegant summits of dozens of space scrapers would have been visible above the clouds, but now there was only the craggy mountaintop. Somewhere below, Jaina was moving toward the same target, with her brother and uncle, and a small team of commandos and droids. Take care of yourself, she had said to him on the flooded balcony where the Millennium Falcon had set the Jedi down. And Jag meant to do just that. When he had urged Jaina to do the same, she had replied, The Force will take care of me. He hadn't debated the matter. He wanted it to be true with all his heart. Ahead of him, twenty starfighters were circling the citadel, loosing laser bolts, proton torpedoes, and concussion missiles at the summit. A sense of hopelessness began to erode Jag's resolve, even without the insatiable voids that were engulfing nearly every starfighter volley, the citadel appeared to be impregnable. It was like attempting to blow apart a mountain. There were no coral skippers to contend with, but outpourings of plasma from deep pits in the citadel walls were effortlessly overwhelming the shields of the starfighters. The X-Wing's droid sent flight information to the cockpit displays. Jag dialed the comm to the tactical net. This is worse than punching past the orbital Dovin basils, a pilot was saying. Keep a hand on your grab safety toggle, or those voids will take you down, another said. They're swallowing every bolt I'm feeding them. Just watch out they don't take a fancy to you. Yeah, they've developed a real taste for starfighters, especially yellow ones with black stripes. Copy that, rogue leader. All ships form up on me for a port-wise sweep. Set your weapons for stutter fire and follow up with whatever torps and missiles you've got left. Remember, it may look like a mountain, but it's actually a ship, which means it can be cracked open. Following you in, Rogue One. Jag saw that two of the fighters off his starboard wingtip were claw craft, and he opened a channel to the closest one. Twin Sons 4, I've got your port side. Jag, the pilot returned. I thought you were dead. Saved by a tree, of all things, Sean Kier. Are you about ready to go home now? As soon as we finish this, you have my word. She laughed shortly. This part of the galaxy has made a romantic of you, Fell. Still watching my back, is that it? Who will if I won't, Sean Kier said. Oh, I forgot. And just where is the sword? Below, moving west. Then we'd better take care not to bring this mountain down on her head. After he did so well with the Mondul, Jaina found time to say between swings of her lightsaber. Pinned down in a grove of fingerleaf trees one hundred meters from the westernmost of the walkways that accessed the citadel, she and Luke were fending off streams of attack bugs that were hurtling down from lookout areas in the Holy Mountain. Closer to Shimra's haunt, Jason was trying, without success, to pacify the beasts that were rapidly devouring the walkway itself. A trio of YVH droids had tried less subtle means of persuasion, only to have been ripped apart and ingested. At least Shimra can't speak through these two, Luke said. I'd say that's exactly what Shimra's doing, Jaina hollered back. Gargantuan symbiotes, Skauru and Tuscart, were partners in the walkway devastation. Considering that the former was female and the latter male, it was something of a marriage. 
At Gateway Settlement on Duro, the couple had demonstrated their talent for demolishing buildings, and they were doing an equally skilled job of dismantling and consuming the Yorick Coral Concourse. Hard-shelled, segmented Skowru was doing most of the grunt work. Beady black eyes dotted her white head, and her mouth writhed with dozens of feeder tendrils. Her powerful rear pincers gripped around the upper coils of her snake-like mate. She was using her stubby front legs and enormous head to smash the span to pieces. Loose chunks didn't fly far before being pulverized by sleek black Tuscart's elongated body. Absent their usual team of handlers, the creatures had emerged from a massive hollow beneath the concourse, through which the Esplanade River cascaded thunderously into the square at the base of the citadel. Lashed by rain and howling winds, the monolithic fortress loomed above the Jedi, rising up into the battle-torn sky like the rough-hewn blade of a kufi. Though winged, mottled with patches of dark green moss, and bedecked with vines whose seeds had taken root in the world ship's nooks and crannies, the citadel was simply too sheer to scale, even with the aid of the Force. Starfighters were still circling the rounded summit, but not one had managed to come within a thousand meters of Shimra's lair without being destroyed. The remains of those that had tried littered the uneven, inundated terrain for kilometers around. Far below the concourse, at the base of the citadel, a dark maw accessed the lower depths of the mountain. But that opening was heavily guarded by reptoid slave soldiers. Rocketing down the terraced wall of the urban canyon, Page's commandos and YVH droids were taking up firing positions above the Chaz Rock, but the enemy was well entrenched and answering Alliance blaster bolts with spouts of fire jelly and highly flammable spark bee honey. If the Jedi were to infiltrate the Citadel, Jason had to persuade Skowru and Tuskart to halt their destruction of the Western Concourse, while a narrow stretch still remained intact. He risked a few cautious steps toward the beasts, then stopped when tumblers began to rock the fragile span at regular intervals. Now what? Jaina yelled to Luke. Is Onama Seacoat making another flyby? The tumblers grew louder and more forceful. Jason managed to keep his balance on the swaying concourse, but the steady jolts proved too much for the unbroken expanse. Fissured, the York coral span gave way, plummeting in fragments into the white water torrent. At the same time, two armored quadrupeds appeared from around the curved base of the citadel, lumbering in concert and settling into fortifying positions behind the slave soldiers. Planting their splayed front claws in the raging river, they lowered their triangular heads. Plasma streamed from the thick horns that branched from their bony foreheads, spattering against the walls of the canyon and forcing the commandos and YVH droids to retreat to the rim. With the cavernous entrance at the base of the citadel effectively sealed, Jason saw Skowru and Tuscart as the only hope. The beasts had to be coaxed into breaching the wall of the citadel. Jason sensed that his best chance of accomplishing this would require him to abandon the force and give himself over fully to his Vong sense, something he had been unable to do since arriving in Coruscant. He felt like a switch being thrown between two poles, force at one pole, Vong sense at the other. He understood further that the only way to compel Skowru and Tuscard into action was by communicating with them through the world brain. It was while aboard the seed ship that had delivered Jason and the Duryam to Coruscant that they had first reached an understanding. By destroying the brain's would-be rivals, Jason had essentially determined which of several Duryams was to have the honor of transforming Coruscant into Yuzhan Tar. More important, he had installed a world brain whose very disposition was informed by the rapport it shared with him. All that the planet had become since then, beautiful and monstrous, delicate and coarse, symbiotic and parasitic, owed something to Jason. And yet when he reached out with his Vong sense, he again found himself in competition for the brain's attention. Some of that was due to the brain's preoccupation with Coruscant. Over and above that, there was the energy the brain was pouring into executing Shimra's requests. 
Aboard the seed ship and afterward, Jason had found the Duryam to be an intelligent creature, but specifically engineered to be intractable. Now the Duryam was twisted by conflict and anger. Shimra had succeeded in cajoling it into believing that the fires and drenching rains, the demolition and destruction, were necessary to repair the damage done to Yuzhan Tar by Zonama Seacoat's close passage. But in doing so, the brain understood that it was destroying much of what it had created, in addition to reneging on its pledge to compel Shimra and the Yuzhan Vong to accept compromise. Neither accustomed to being disobedient nor inclined to tolerate disorder, the brain was at war with itself for having brought harm to the world in its trust. As on the seed ship, it understood that its domain was suddenly falling to ruin and becoming a wasteland. The brain was struggling with the idea that it might do better by simply ignoring Shimra. Calling on his Vong sense, Jason promised the Duryam that he would help put an end to its inner conflict. He told it that he would force Shimra to release his hold. In return, he could feel it reaching out to him as one might a friend in time of need. A wave of gratitude, a plea for salvation, washed through him. Abruptly, Skalru and Tuskart turned toward him, clearly under influence of the brain. Jason grasped that the moment had come for him to demonstrate his faith in the agreement he and the brain had forged. Ignoring Luke and Jaina's loud-voiced misgivings, he advanced on the coupled symbiotes. Almost immediately his waist was encircled by two twisting appendages. Then Skalru picked him up off the demolished concourse and swung him out over the canyon, not toward the citadel, though, but as if to drop him directly into the midst of the slave soldiers and their artillery beasts. From the Falcon's cockpit comlink came the sound of blaster fire and cries for help. C-3PO recognized the voice of Captain Solo. Threepio, lower the landing ramp! Threepio, Threepio! The protocol droid stopped his worried pacing long enough to raise his hands in distress to R2-D2, whose extensible computer interface arm was inserted into an access port in the ring corridor near the head of the ramp. R2, do something before it's too late! Stiffly, C-3PO hurried into the cockpit. All he could see through the viewport panes was an impenetrable tangle of heavily thorned branches. He made a clumsy about-face and shambled back to the ring corridor, where he began to pound his hand against the landing ramp switch. Oh, it's no use. The thorn hedge has the Millennium Falcon in a deathlock. Captain Solo and the Princess will die and will be imprisoned like museum exhibits. R2-D2 tootled an encouraging phrase, and C-3PO ceased his pounding to stare at him. You can do what? Reroute power from the deflector shield to send a charge through the hull? C-3PO's hands flew up once again. Well, why didn't you say so earlier? The little blue and white astromech chirped and chittered in protest. Nonsense, C-3PO rejoined. You're simply trying to frighten me. You're never content until you've succeeded in working me into a frenzy. R2-D2 issued a series of solemn beeps. C-3PO adopted an akimbo stance. Don't you start that again. Everything terminates. Face it bravely. I'll have you know I've been facing my termination bravely since the beginning of this war. Indeed, long before I had the misfortune of meeting the likes of you. Now do as you suggested and send a charge through the hull. Shuffling back to the juncture of the ring and outrigger corridors, C-3PO placed himself where he could peer through the forward viewport, as well as keep a photoreceptor on his counterpart. A moment later, R2-D2's interface arm began to rotate, first in one direction, then the other, and an electrical crackling could be heard dancing across the falcon's skin. The olfactory sensor at the top of C-3PO's chest monitored smells of ozone and singed wood. It's working, R2, he shouted. The thorn hedge is retracting. Thank the Maker, we're free. R2-D2 squawked a question. Yes, of course you should lower the landing ramp, C-3PO said as he hurried for it. The sooner we leave this ship, the better. Skidding through a left-hand turn, he stepped onto the canted ramp, just as a foot was striking the paving stones of the plaza. Freedom, R2! Ugh! Without knowing precisely why, R2-D2 squealed in alarm. 
He might have squealed even louder had he realized that a tattooed and battle-scarred Yuzhan Vong warrior was rushing up the ramp. Too panicked to move, and certainly without thinking, C-3PO said, You're not allowed aboard. The warrior only growled in contempt and continued his charge. He was halfway to the top when a blaster discharged behind him and a crimson-tinged blaster bolt burned its way through the front of his neck, sending him face first to the ramp not a meter from where C-3PO was standing. At the foot of the ramp stood Captain Solo, his aged weapon in hand. C-3PO saw his master staring wide-eyed at something off to his left, at which he began firing, even as Harar, Princess Leia, Cockmame, and Weewall were hastening up the ramp, all but crawling when they reached the body of the dead Yuzhan Vong. Threepio, get ready to close the ramp, Captain Solo yelled. He fired off several blaster bolts, then ducked a hurled amphistaff and threw himself onto the ramp. Close it! But, sir! Leia, get into the cockpit! Raise the ship! Captain Solo was still bellying up the ramp when a sudden growth spurt sent the branches through the gap between the starboard docking arm and the ramp, preventing it from elevating entirely. Into the gap grew long, thick thorns. They're lethal, Harar shouted. While the priest, the two Nogri, and the two humans began twisting and contorting themselves to avoid the rapidly lengthening thorns, a hail of thud bugs slammed into the falcon's underside. In the confined space of the ramp, Princess Leia activated her lightsaber and started hacking at the lengthening branches. It's no use. They're growing back faster than I can cut them. Deactivating the lightsaber, she scrambled past C-3PO, heading for the cockpit. R2, C-3PO said, charge the hull again. A second crackling jolt passed through the ship. The hedge branches retreated, but instead of closing, the ramp tilted down. Two more warriors leapt in, only to be dropped by bolts from Cock Mame, whose right arm narrowly missed being pierced by a half-meter-long thorn. By the time the ramp started to close, the hedges had returned, stopping it from sealing. C-3PO heard the Falcon's repulsor lift come online, but the freighter levitated no more than two meters before the engines began protesting. Han, I can't raise her, Leia shouted. Another electrical charge shot through the hull. Once again the vines withdrew, and once again the ramp lowered to the paving stones. R2, no! C-3PO yelled. There was no halting the warriors this time, or the branches, which grew back in such profusion that the ramp refused to budge. Cockmame and Miwal did what they could to keep the invaders from entering the ship, but after shooting the first half a dozen, they were overwhelmed, disarmed, and pinned to the deck. Han shot a few more as they raced into the ring corridor, but reinforcements kept coming, backing him and Leia toward the forward compartment. Some warriors had the foresight to run through the Falcon and enter the main cabin space from the port side. Pressed against the Dejeric table with his blaster in one hand and his other gripping Leia's shoulder, Han dodged lashes and amphistaffs and thrust from Kufis, but he refused to yield until at last one of the warriors managed to press the tip of his serpentine weapon to Leia's throat. Then, grimacing, he dropped his blaster arm to his side in a gesture of surrender. All right, you've got us, he said to the advancing warriors. I'm sure we can work something out. It was unlikely that any of them understood basic, but they took Han's meaning when he set his blaster down and lay it to the same with her deactivated lightsaber. Moments later, a female Yuzhan Vong, with a crest of tentacles and an eight-fingered right hand, edged through the tight press of warriors in the forward compartment. On seeing her, R2-D2 loosed a prolonged and mournful whistle. C-3PO nodded his head. You're right, R2. A shaper. The shaper appraised Han and Leia, then turned to one of her warriors. C-3PO understood her to say, Gather their weapons and bring everyone out of the vessel. Cockmame, Miwal, R2-D2, C-3PO, Leia, and Han were marched from the Falcon in single file. Harar was already outside the ship. As they were being prodded toward the entrance of the Yorick Coral Dome, two Yuzhan Vong males emerged, both of them finely clothed and the shorter of the pair wearing a high turban. High Prefect Drathul and High Priest Jakan, Harar whispered to Han and Leia, 
The shaper waved her hand in a way that flung droplets of sweat or some other bodily secretion on the thorn hedge, which immediately began to sprout new branches. Within moments, the falcon was fully encased. I'm told that this particular ship has been the cause of much unrest, the shaper told Drathul and Jakan. She gestured to her seven prisoners. Worthy captives, including a Jedi, no less. Jakan's eyes widened in delight when they fell on Harar. All of us thought you were in the outer rim. He laid his thin hands on the priest's shoulders. You're home now, my friend. In fact, you will have the honor of officiating at the sacrifice we will perform in the well of the world brain. Harar held Jakan's gaze but didn't return his relieved smile. You failed to grasp the truth, High Priest, he said in Yuzhan Vong. I've come to neutralize the brain. Near the outer system world of Muscave, the battle was still raging. Hundreds of coral skippers and fighter craft and dozens of war vessels had been sacrificed to an engagement that had degenerated into a shameless brawl. Local space was a constantly shifting web of fire and light harnessed to ill purpose. Warmaster Nas Choka couldn't have been more pleased. He stood in the most forward area of the command chamber's blister transparency, as if a bowsprit figurehead, his folded arms resting on his slightly protruding belly, and his finely whiskered jaw raised in defiance. The enemy commanders continue to trade blows with us, not because they are valorous, but because they believe that by feigning honor they hold us from returning to Yuzhantar. They rely on the fact that we would never be the first to quit a contest of such magnitude. He turned slightly to face his chief tactician. We will encourage their blunder, order our supreme commanders to allow their vessels to fall back and begin to disperse. Let the Alliance Admirals think they have us on the run. The command chamber shook as a burst of turbolaser fire evaded the vessel's shielding singularities and blasted pieces of Yorick coral from the starboard hull. Thick fluid poured from an already damaged area of bulkhead, and strips of the luminescent lichen dyed, increasing the gloom. How much more can Yamka endure? Nas Choka asked of the vessel's shaper. Six of our principal Dovan Basils are dead, the Shaper was quick to say, and many of our plasma launchers have been destroyed. Perhaps, Warmaster, if you would consider withdrawing Yamka from the Vanguard Array. No, I want the attention of the enemy focused on us. We must remain a primary target. We could be destroyed, Warmaster, the tactician said carefully. Nas Choka nodded. An acceptable risk. For today we serve our species as no Yuzhan Vong have. We prove our worth to the gods who fashioned us. If we are to die, we do so discharging a transcendent obligation. The command chamber's lock dilated, and the vessel's supreme commander entered, snapping his fists to his opposite shoulders in salute. Warmaster, from our scouts, Raul Roost and forty other warships have just reverted from dark space. Nas Choka faced forward, his gaze directed toward the imperceptible enemy fleet. That would be Triest Crefe. He grinned faintly. All this is as it should be. The gods look out for us. The Supreme Commander genuflected. Warmaster, there isn't a commander who wouldn't gladly substitute his vessel for yours or die in your stead. Nas Choka betrayed no emotion. Return to your duties, Supreme Commander. The warrior rose and saluted again. When he had exited, the tactician moved to Nas Choka's left side. You have the unconditional fealty of your warriors, fearsome one. They would follow your every order, even those orders that might countermand their faith. Nas Choka's gaze remained fixed on the battle. Tell me of Yuzhan Tar, tactician. Enemy fighter craft have broken through our Dovan basal shields, and war parties are on the surface. Some one thousand ground warriors battle ours in the sacred precinct. Others have gone to the aid of the heretics. Fortunately, the Doryam has taken steps to confuse matters. How so? With fires, 
and by loosing some of our beasts. Nevertheless, the territory surrounding the citadel is in great turmoil. Naschoka waved his hand in unconcern. Structures can be remade. Where is Shimra? The Supreme Overlord is in his coffer. Then that, too, is as it should be. He wishes it relayed to you, War Master, that you do honor to your elite rank. The Supreme Overlord proclaims that your name will live on as an inspiration to others. You will be the zenith all those who follow you will seek to attain. That means little, unless we are successful at Zonama Seacoat. The tactician nodded. Hapen warships are still arrayed in a blockade, preventing our vessels from escorting the poisoned one to the surface. Naschoka frowned. I thought the Hapens had settled their score with us at Abroa Sky. But no matter. It is the nature of vendettas that they continue to escalate until one or the other party is wiped out. He gave the tactician a sideways glance. Divert to Zonama Seacoat, the vessels of Domains Tivik, Sun, Karsh, and Vorik. Caution the commanders not to make their intentions too obvious, even if this requires their taking additional time to reach the living world. We will make the Hapen suffer as they did at Fondor. Then our barb will find its mark, and with the gods on our backs, we will rid this galaxy of vendetta and warfare. Mara heard Tahiri call that she had found Nomanor, buried in the ferocious tangle of heretics and warriors, and even while dodging Amphistaffs and Kufis, Mara had had to stand on the crumpled body of a warrior to see him. The look hadn't lasted long, just long enough for her to see the fear in his eye. Then he was gone, slithering his way through the crowd. Unable to track him through the force, she did the next best thing, which was to force leap to the edge of the embattled crowd, then to the top of a flight of stairs, and there watch for some sign of him. True to their nature, shamed ones and warriors alike were running toward the melee rather than fleeing from it. No matter how bloodied they were or who was winning, as the outcome kept changing hands. But it wasn't long before Mara spied a lone figure slinking away, then scurrying down into a public square that was surrounded on three sides by groundquake-damaged structures. Though the relatively short figure was wearing the robe skin of a shamed one, he ran with the stealth of an executor. Taking a moment to touch Tahiri and Kent through the force, Mara vaulted from the steps to the high platform of a temple, then dropped down to the ground and raced after Noma Nor, her lightsaber close at hand, to deal with anyone who might try to stand in her way. Rushing into the square, she stopped to scan the several exits and again spotted her quarry disappearing around the toppled end of a high wall. She fairly flew after him, pursuing him up and over piles of rubble and debris, through stands of towering fire-blackened trees— then on a zigzag path down into what once had been the Column Commons, a mid-level area of open spaces studded with thick columns that supported the sprawling cityscape overhead. Hundreds of Holonet and Holodrama publishers had kept offices there, along with all the major media bureaus. During the Galactic Civil War, the Commons had crawled with Compnor Truth Officers, who had ensured that everything published was in keeping with the propaganda of the Empire. Mara was certain she was more familiar with the area, even in ruins, than Noma Nor was, but in his guise as the prophet he had obviously gotten to know Coruscant's canyons and depths as well as any slithmonger or deathstick peddler, because he led her on a chase that was as labyrinthine as the tracings of a conduit worm. The deeper they descended, the darker and danker became the surroundings. But Mara had already decided that she would chase him to the core of the planet if that was what it would take to apprehend him. The pursuit led ever downward into darker levels where fetid water dripped from cracked ceilings and the only light was that which found its way down through gaps in the crushed buildings and the riotously verdant areas that now roofed them. Closing the gap between them, she saw him grab hold of a fall of vines and swing himself across a wide chasm. Securing the vines on his side of the abyss, he stopped to smirk at her, confident that his escape was secure. She came to a brief standstill opposite him, 
just long enough to answer his sneering grin with a glare, then dashed for a narrower place in the chasm and leapt to the far side. By then no manor had disappeared into the ruins of a news bureau building. She could hear him stumbling forward, crunching through expanses of transparent steel debris and smashing through wooden doors. There, too, shafts of dismal light dappled the puddled floors, and a stinging odor of rot and decay pervaded the thick air. She second-guessed him when he tried to set a trap for her, making it appear that he had gone through a doorway, on the other side of which there was a half-kilometer plunge into pitch darkness and she outwitted him again by stopping just in time when he used his uncommon strength to dislodge a girder that supported a fractured slab ceiling. He remained as steadfast in his desire to escape as she did in her desire to hunt him down. He began to scamper through a warren of rooms in a building where residual power allowed him to seal doorways behind him. But Mara merely kicked through them, and when she couldn't, she found alternate routes never surrendering her momentum. Breathing hard and stumbling more often, Noma Nor was beginning to tire. Mara's acute hearing told her that much, and more. As she was kicking down a final door, she heard a hand blaster's safety click off and entered the room to discover Noma Nor hiding behind the putrid remains of a Twilik, still dressed in security guard garb. Mara used the force to call her lightsaber to hand, even as Noma Nor was triggering off the first bolts. Her blade deflected one after the next, until he had emptied the blaster of fuel. He had sense enough not to hurl the depleted weapon at her. Instead, he began to scrabble backward on the palms of his hands and feet, his gaze riveted on her as she advanced, calm but coldly fixed on her prey. A wall brought an abrupt end to his retreat. Growling, he shot to his feet, Koofy in hand, and began to slash wildly at her, the lightsaber notwithstanding. She leapt backward out of his reach, then deactivated the blade and encouraged him to charge. Her hands moved in a dexterous blur as she deflected his knife blows and got inside his frantic movements to slap and tap him in the chest or the jaw, never hard enough to stun him, let alone incapacitate him, but driving him backward with each smack. Ducking his increasingly desperate lunges and crosscuts, she swept his feet out from under him with a circling sidekick, then allowed him to come to his feet only long enough for her to cripple his knee with the toe of her right boot. He flung himself at her, but she sidestepped his headlong rush and sent him hurtling into a wall. She continued to hurt him, telling herself, This is for Monar too, where she had fallen victim to the coom spores he had unleashed, and this is for the trouble you stirred up at Romamul. Knocking the Kufi from his grip, she thrust her stiffened fingers into his windpipe, then sent him reeling with an uppercut. This is for founding the Peace Brigade, for your part in sending Elan to assassinate the Jedi with Boathouse, for your double dealings with the Huts and Vicky Shesh, and for sabotaging the refugee settlement on Duro. Making the most of her agility, she left deliberate openings in her defense, luring him into striking, only to set up combinations aimed at punishing his bald head, his flat-nosed face, his blue right eye, with its stripe of feline pupil. This is for the false appeals you made to Leia and Han at Bill Bringy, for your disdainful appearance before the Senate, for whatever role you played in the deaths of Chewbacca and Anakin for your attempt to deliver Jason into the hands of Savong La, for your sabotage at Zonama Seacoat. Her blows were beginning to do damage. Deftly she moved inside his flailing arms, using her elbows in the backs of her clenched hands to bloody his scarred lips and swell his ears, ever mindful of that dangerous left eye of his, which she was certain he was saving as a last resort. She pivoted on her left foot and kicked him hard with her right, forcing the wind from him. He dropped to his knees, his right hand pressed to his chest. He had trouble getting to his feet, but when he did, she sent him down again with a fist to the face. Dread shone in his real eye. He had spent too long among beings who cherished life, and he had come to cherish it himself. Unlike those fighting to the death in the streets and squares above, no manor wanted desperately to live. Mara could read it in his wretched look. She could smell it coming off of him in waves. He backed away from her until his back was pressed to a wall, then he sank slowly to his knees. Mara ignited her lightsaber and held it with the tip low and to her right, 
one upward swing, and she could send his head five meters. Gnome Anor bent at the waist and pressed his face to the littered floor in a posture of servility. You've defeated me, Mara Jade Skywalker, he said without lifting his head. I beg for mercy. When she made no immediate reply, he risked raising his face to her, and when he saw that she hadn't moved forward, he continued. What would killing me accomplish now? Yes, it will satisfy you. But will it put an end to the war? For the moment, I'll content myself with satisfaction, she told him. He gulped, then found his voice. I am a dissembler and a killer. I have brought woe to you and many others. But were you any less when you were in the service to the Emperor, to Darth Vader? An executor. You did what you were trained to do. We all serve a master, Mara Skywalker. But I was given to believe that you now served the Force. As Mara stepped forward, his pleas became more frenzied. You're a mother now. What if your son were watching you? Is this what you would want him to learn? The art of murdering in cold blood? Mara's nostrils quivered. You almost robbed me of any chance of having a child. I know that he said, holding her gaze. But am I not part of life, as your infant is? Part of the Force? He gestured to himself. I am helpless. Mara took another step, raising her lightsaber. I can help, he screamed. I've changed. You saw me leading the Shamed Ones. Just as you do, I want to see the war ended. I would have been an ally of yours already, if for Jer and Jason had agreed to take me off Coruscant in the coral craft I had built just for that purpose. You see, Mara Skywalker, I say Coruscant. I know this world is yours. It has always been yours. And it will remain so, even if we are victorious. One last chance. Let me prove myself to you. She brought the glowing blade of the lightsaber close to his neck, then deactivated it and clipped the handle to her belt. The expression on Nomanor's face was unreadable. Clearly, he hadn't expected leniency. He recognized that his words hadn't caused her to stay her hand. They had spilled from his mouth by rote. Something else had influenced her decision, something beyond his comprehension. For a long moment he regarded her in perplexity. A Yuzhan Vong warrior would have been disgusted by my actions, he said at last. He would have killed me as easily as if I were a droid. And yet you didn't find my cowardice contemptible. You let me live. Mara narrowed her eyes. I don't believe a word you said, and I've known from the first that you're a coward. You're guilty of too many crimes to list, but I won't be your executioner. Your ultimate disposition is a matter that will be decided by others. She gestured for him to stand up. If you really wanted to put an end to the war, you shouldn't have interfered at Zonama Seacote. I was only trying to spare the planet, Nomanor said. Even now, Shimra is out to destroy it. He believes it was given to the Jedi by the gods as a means of testing our worthiness. He claims to have a poison capable of killing Zonama Seacoat. A chill laddered up Mara's spine. What poison? Nomanor heaved his shoulders in a shrug of indifference. Something concocted by the Alliance and deployed on a world called Kalula. Alpha Red, Mara realized in anguish. She grabbed Nomanor by the shoulder and shoved him toward the closest exit from the building. You're going to show me you're deserving of the extra time I've given you. Echoing the shape of the world ship Citadel, Shimra's coffer, his bunker in the crown of the fortress, was a huge vaulted space with polished walls and stately columns. From the eastern side of its circular floor, a stairway of York coral spiraled into an upper level, where some said resided the controls that could launch the summit of the citadel into space.
in much the same way that the well of the world brain could be launched. To ensure that the supreme overlord and the Duryam survived, no matter what befell the rest of the Yuzhan Vong and their multitude of biotes. The coffer contained a throne, but Shimra had yet to take it since entering the coffer from the lavish shaft that accessed the bunker, a Dovin basal version of a turbo lift. The Supreme Overlord was too restless to remain seated, too mesmerized by Villip assembled images of Yuzhan Tar engulfed in flames, of shamed ones running loose in the streets of Alliance troops locked in battle with warriors, and of fighter craft darting through the smoke-filled sky, stinging the citadel with packets of energized light. Shimra's slayer bodyguards were with him, as was Onimi, perhaps the only shamed one on Yuzhan Tar or any other occupied world, still content to curl at the feet of the elite. A shaper doubled as a villip mistress to make certain that the supreme overlord didn't miss a moment of the devastation he had called down on the planet. We should be rejoicing, Shimra was saying as he meandered about, much to the consternation of his limited audience. He gestured to Onimi, who was squatting almost possessively close to the austere throne. What? No rhymes from you this day? No words of ridicule or mockery? No capering about while Yuzhantar burns? Solemn-faced, Onimi got to his feet to recite a poem, though absent his characteristic self-amusement, and with his gaze not on Shimra or any of the others in the bunker, but raised to the high-arched ceiling or perhaps the sky beyond. Who would stay cool while fires roar? The gods themselves might well abhor. But who would sport when death is near? The gods themselves do well to fear. Shimra stood silent for a moment, then began to nod. Yes, O Nimi, you're right to give them fair warning. Is it not just as I planned? Just as I imagined? Sonama Seacoat will die. Its living ships will perish. The Jedi will be stripped of their weapons, and the gods will have been defeated. I will have done away with them. Yuzhan Tar will recover, and I will rid the universe of all vermin. The Shaper waited until Shimra was finished, then stepped forward from her villip choir. Treadlord, High Priest Jakan reports that saboteurs have seized the well of the world brain. Apparently, the priest Harar is among them. Harar, Onimi said, then caught himself and hunkered down. Shimra glanced at him, then turned back to the shaper. Too clever, even for no manor, that one. It's no wonder he survived, but now on the side of the enemy. Enlisted or conscripted, I wonder. He swung to Onimi again. Betrayal is rife in our fair kingdom, my familiar. The gods breaking faith with their creations, shamed ones rising up against those who have for so long suffered them, and now our esteemed Harar giving up the elite. Assuming that it meets with your blessing, dread lord, the shaper said, the prisoners will be prepared for sacrifice. With all speed, set to it, Shimra said. Join them there. Let us give the gods their last ounce of flesh before we dispense with them. Muffled explosions punctuated the silence as the Shaper exited. The coffer trembled as the enemy's aerial bombardment continued. Admitted into the bunker, a wounded warrior in Von Doon Crab armor saluted and began to stagger toward the throne. He didn't make it halfway before he collapsed onto his knees, black blood curdled in a wound to his right armpit. Lord, he began weakly, enemy warriors have surrounded the citadel, and even now are attempting to battle their way inside. Shimra approached the warrior to have a closer look at his wound. No blaster made that injury. Three Jedi, Lord, at the western gate. The slayers stepped forward, but Shimra waved them back. Let the Jedi come to us. He looked at Onimi. After all, diversion needn't be the exclusive province of the War Master. Chapter 39 
What had been the atrium of the Senate was now a cold cavern of living Yorick coral. No less digested than the Great Dome, the imposing post-imperial interspecies statues that had once graced the arched enclosure resembled sandstone stalagmites, or immense candles festooned with flows of melted wax. The curving walls were swirled in blood-red, purple, and rust-brown, and lighted only by luminescent lichen or the occasional lambent. Yawning black hollows to either side of the vast room were all that remained of the ornate entrances to the grand concourse. It was in the atrium that Jedi Knight Ganner Rysode had died and become a legend among the Yuzhan Vong warrior caste. Or so Jason had said. But Jason had also said that Ganner had brought much of the atrium down, and that clearly wasn't the case. Leia decided that whoever was in charge of the world brain had tried to expunge any memories of Ganner's heroic last stand by having the atrium rebuilt. Their hands shackled behind their backs by pincered biotes, she, Han, Harar, Cockmame, and Miwal were being ushered by a cadre of warriors toward the five-meter-wide tunnel opposite the atrium's front entry. C-3PO and R2-D2 trailed behind, the protocol droid's leg joints squeaking and the astromech's retractable tread also in need of lubrication. High Priest Jakan's acolytes were doing a rush job of purifying the captives by wafting smoke from elaborate censers and anointing everyone with finger-flung drops of pungent-smelling liquid. Nearby walked Master Shaper Kila Quad and High Prefect Drathul, whom Harar had explained presided over a Vong-formed Coruscant. Red-orange light pulsed briefly from the far end of the tunnel. According to Jason, the round-topped corridor extended almost half a kilometer to what had been the Great Rotunda and was now the well of the world brain. I thought you had your fill of this on Kalula, Leia said to Han, who walked at her left hand. Ah, that was only a yamask, he said, feigning nonchalance. Now we're going to be sacrificed to a world brain. We really are coming up in the world, Leia said in the same unflappable tone. She paused, then in a more serious voice added, I don't suppose we can count on Lando and Talon flying to the rescue this time? Han compressed his lips, then gave her his best lopsided grin. Chin up, sweetheart. This isn't over yet. No sooner had the words left his mouth than a clamor began to build from somewhere outside the atrium's missile-torn entry. As the procession came to a halt, Leia could discern the sounds of running feet and dozens of voices raised in conviction. The voices grew louder and more determined, and then the air was filled with the strident whiz of hurled razor bugs and the angry snap of thrashing amphistaffs. The cadre of warriors shoved the captives to one side, whirled and fanned out across the cavern. Amphistaffs unwound from the warriors' forearms, stiffening into poison-spitting batons. Ensconced in their bandoliers, thud and razor bugs vibrated in urgency. All eyes were on the entry when a crowd of scrawny Yuzhan Vong began to pour into the cavern from the hedge-lined causeway, shouting demands and brandishing crude weapons. Shamed ones, Leia realized. Heretics. Han grinned at her again. See, what did I tell you? She wagged her head uncertainly. You're getting scary in your old age. Shamed ones continued to squeeze into the atrium, ultimately massing into a mob fifty strong, but taking no action against the marshaled warriors. Clearly appalled by the intrusion, Jakan hurried forward, raising his thin arms over his head, as if about to call on the power of the gods to smite the crowd. Standing alongside Leia, Harar translated the high priest's words. Jakan is demanding to know who or what inspired them to profane this most sacred of places. He's ordering them to leave or be killed where they stand. Individuals began to edge their way to the front of the crowd. A battered Yuzhan Vong male limped forward, shorter than many of his comrades, and wearing a shredded robe skin. The shamed ones quieted long enough for their apparent spokesperson to make a brief statement. Leia saw Harar's eyes 
widen in disbelief. He declares himself to be the prophet. The priest glanced at Leia. It's no manor. Leia traded astonished looks with Han, while the shamed ones went back to shouting and gesturing with their weapons. Others began to advance to the front, two of whom stood to either side of Noma Nor, as if his lieutenants or disciples, and three others who ignited the blades of their lightsabers. Seeing Mara, Tahiri, and Kent, the Atrium warriors immediately tensed and looked to High Prefect Drathul for orders. Leia was at once revived and worried. Several dozen poorly armed heretics, bolstered by three Jedi against almost one hundred able warriors. R2-D2 toned in disquiet. I completely agree, R2, C-3PO said. The odds are most unfavorable. The shamed ones recognized this as well, as did the Jedi, and they too began to spread out, if warily. Just as the tension was culminating, sounds of another commotion infiltrated the cavern. Reinforcements, C-3PO said jubilantly. But in place of boisterous cries came a repetitive chant, and in place of the determined shuffling of bare feet came the cadence of sandaled troops. A murmur of confusion swept through the heretic crowd. Expressions of fervor became looks of sudden concern. The fact that even Mara looked apprehensive was not a good sign. The shamed ones began to move away from the entry as through the gap marched one hundred additional warriors, armed with thick amphistaffs and armored in Von Doon crab. Leia could tell by the behavior of the crowd that the new troops were something to fear. No Manor, his lieutenants, and the Jedi held their ground, but the rest of the heretics fell farther back, pressing themselves to the atrium's coarse walls. Whatever chance there had been for victory vanished. Jakan, Drathul, and Kila Quad relaxed somewhat as the menacing detachment formed up parallel to Drathul's line of warriors, facing the entry and the quailing heretics. With a singleness born of years of training, they adopted defensive postures, amphistaffs held diagonally across their chests, and other melee weapons at the ready. Fixing Noma Nor with a menacing gaze, Drathul pushed through the double row of warriors and paced down the line until he reached the commander of the reinforcements. Stay your hand when it comes to dispatching Prefect Noma Nor, his subalterns, and the three Jedi, the High Prefect said. We'll want to add them to our offering to the world brain. The commander snapped his fists to his shoulders in salute. When Drathul had returned to a safe position behind his warriors, the commander issued an order, and as one entity the reinforcements performed a synchronous about-face, uttered a battle cry, and attacked, turning their amphistaffs and thudbugs against Drathul's forces. It took a moment for the shamed ones to realize what was happening. Then they peeled in triumph and rushed forward to lend their meager arms to the fray. Mark this as the moment the war truly turned, Harar said to Leia in a resigned voice. With the guards occupied, R2-D2 rolled up behind Cockmame and Miwal and used his laser to stun the creatures that secured their wrists. Once freed, the Nogri immediately moved Han and Leia out of the line of fire. C-3PO and R2-D2 followed, the astromech anxious to laser the pincer biotes, manacling Han and Leia as well. The atrium was in pandemonium, with Yuzhan Vong battling Yuzhan Vong, and Mara, Tahiri, and Kent fighting their way forward. Leia saw Nom Anor race for Drathul, but it was Harar who had her attention. Kila Quad, he shouted, as Cockmane was freeing his hands. She must be stopped before she reaches the Doryam. She can seal off the passageway. Leia whirled to see the Master Shaper disappearing through the archway that led to the Well of the World Brain. Harar started after her, but was tackled by Jakan before he had gone five meters. Leia called to Han, gesturing toward the tunnel entrance. The last thing she saw before disappearing inside the archway was Harar dropping the elderly high priest to the floor with a single blow, and Noma Nor with his hands viced on the slender neck of High Prefect Drathul. When the reptoid slave soldiers crowded at the base of the citadel realized that Serpentine Skalru was not going to drop Jason into their midst, 
but merely hold on to him until Tuscard completed knocking an opening in the western wall, they made the mistake of taking out their fury on the beasts themselves, by peppering them with razor and thud bugs and fire jelly grenades. Seeing others of their kind attacked, the claw-footed artillery beasts that had been spewing plasma into the Glatani Esplanade Canyon shambled through a turn and charged at the Chazrock, trampling dozens before any could escape back into the maw at the base of the citadel. But the reptoids found no safety even there, as the enraged beasts pursued them inside and the sound of the Chazrock's cries resonated in the air. The unexpected departure of the artillery beasts was all that Captain Page needed to send his commandos and droids rocketing back down into the canyon to finish what the mammoth biotes had begun. While the commandos plummeted for the banks of the swollen river, Luke and Jaina rushed to the edge of the demolished walkway and hurled themselves into the ragged breach Tuscart's stubby forelegs had opened, and in which Jason had been safely deposited by Skowru. That still left the problem of how to reach Shimra's bunker, but it didn't take the Jedi long to discover a narrow stairway that hugged the Citadel's curved perimeter as it wound toward the summit. Luke led the ascent, with Jaina close behind, and Jason a few steps behind her, silently thanking the world brain for interceding at the western walkway, and reaffirming his promise to end the Doryam's inner turmoil. Carved from the same Yorick coral that made up the fortress's unpolished hull and bulkheads, the stairway was a continuous spiral, occasionally walled in on both sides, but more often climbing without an exterior handrail through maintenance rooms and expansive living chambers. Dilating membranes sealed each individual level, and access quarters connected the stairway to interior spaces. The citadel shook with each seal the Jedi violated, as if each rupture sent a measure of pain through the living vessel. But the shaking could just as well have been a response to the ceaseless bombardment by starfighters, or explosions triggered by Page's commandos as they fought their way into the lower levels. Judging by the way the sinuous stairway had been engineered and the layout of the interior spaces, Jason realized that Shimra's world ship had obviously flown upright through space, a veritable mountain rather than a flattened oval or projectile-shaped vessel, such as the Jedi and Alliance forces had encountered at Helskafor, Cernpedal, Abroa Sky, and other worlds. It wasn't until the eighth level that Luke and his niece and nephew met with resistance, but it was clear from the ferocity with which the warriors attacked, from above, below, and through the various access corridors, that the onslaught was likely to continue all the way to Shimra's lair, and probably inside it as well. If the warriors constituted the first line of defense, it was difficult to imagine what might await them at the summit assuming they could even make it that far. In most places, the stairway wasn't wide enough for the two people to stand abreast, and in those stretches, Luke had to face the brunt of the attacks. He was his own vortex, deflecting amphistaff strikes, whip-like lashes, and spurts of deadly venom, dodging or redirecting flights of thudbugs, parrying the thrusts of kufis to sidestep duck maneuver his body in ways that seemed to defy gravity. Stunned or burned by Luke's green blade, thud bugs were ricocheting from the walls and high ceiling, chipping away at the Yorick coral surface. Dropped in their tracks, warriors sprawled with hands pressed to stumps of legs and opened foreheads, or with black blood welling where the lightsaber had found defenseless areas between living armor and tattooed flesh. Jason recalled watching his uncle on Belcaden, where the war had begun wielding two lightsabers when he had come to Jason's rescue. But the rescue on Belcotton paled in comparison to the control Luke demonstrated now. His single blade might as well have been ten or twenty. He took the steps at a lightning pace, burning his way through dilating membranes, but in complete control of his momentum. Seen through the Force, he was a maelstrom of luminous energy, a force storm against which there was no shelter and yet all his energy poured from a calm center, an eye. He made no missteps. None of his actions were interrupted by thought. 
In fact, Luke didn't seem to be there at all, physically or as an individual personality. Jason and Jaina were astounded, but they had little time to reflect. Their lightsabers were busy as well, turning the blows Luke dodged or defending assaults launched from below. On the fourteenth level, where the Citadel's exterior wings sprouted from the hull, they reached a fork in the stairway. Luke swung to Jason. Which way? He wasn't even breathing heavily. Jason extended his Vong sense. The left passage leads to living quarters on the next level. The other, to some sort of Dovin basal lift that accesses the summit. He screwed his eyes shut. Shimmer is there. He has guards with him. Not enough. And another. Once more, they began to race up the stairway, dropping, then leaping over bodies of wounded or dead warriors. Tapping deeper into his Vong sense, Jason again reached out for the Duryam, only to be staggered by what he felt in return. The brain was even more confused than before, by something else now. It felt threatened, concerned for its survival, and for what might become of its creation, Yuzhan Tar, should the brain be killed or forced to flee the planet. Jason stretched out with the force. Mom and Dad, he realized. And Mara, Tahiri, and Kenth. They had fought their way into the well and were preparing to destroy the Duryam with explosives. The brain felt betrayed. It sent to Jason that it should have killed him when it had him in his grip years earlier. It should have dragged him into the well and let him drown. It should have ordered Skauru to kill him. It had been foolish to trust him. Jason reiterated what he had told the Duryam two years earlier. Yes, I taught you to trust, and I taught you what it means to trust a traitor. But I have not betrayed you this time. I live in you. We're partners in this experiment. You need only choose whose side you're on. As he had done while on Coruscant with Verger, he shared with the Duryam his experience with the spectrum of life. The featureless whiteout of agony, the red tide of rage, the black hole of despair, the gamma sleet of loss, the lush verdure of growing things, the grays of stone and duracrete, the glisten of gemstones and transparasteel, the blue-white sizzle of the noonday sun, and its exact echo in a lightsaber's blade. We are one, Jason said with his thoughts. We are the union of all opposites. Reject the commands Shimra sends you. Overcome your conditioning as you have shown yourself capable of doing. Show those who threaten you that you pose no threat, that in coming to you, that in risking death to reach you, they have rescued you. Choose life over death. Either you're going to change its mind or we're going to change it, Han told Kila Quad. His right hand held one of the thermal detonators he had retrieved, his thumb close to the orb's trigger. He waited for Harar to translate the warning, then added, There's no two ways around this. The three of them, along with Leia, Mara, Noma Nor, and the droids, were standing on a trembling ten-meter diameter platform that overlooked the well of the world brain, a colossal bowl of Yorick coral that climbed more than halfway to the vaulted roof of what had been the Great Rotunda. Even if Han and Leia managed to discover the exterior entrance to the secret passageway Jason and Verger had used, they wouldn't have been able to reach the well. Yorick coral had overgrown the Kashi delegation's platform. Jason had said that the circular platform and the cantilevered bridge that accessed it were a hundred meters above the Duryam's pool. But either both had been redesigned and rebuilt at a lower tier after being destroyed during Ganner's last stand, or the nutrient level of the pool itself had risen, because the platform was now scarcely five meters above the turbulent surface. The battle was continuing in the atrium, but it was mostly a mop-up operation. The warriors who had been in charge of protecting the brain were fighting to the death, and the shamed ones and renegade troops were accommodating them. High Prefect Drathul was dead, strangled by Noma Nor. But Harar had spared Jakan's life, and the High Priest was in the custody of Tahiri, Kenth Hamner, and the Nogri, who had remained behind to guard the tunnel entrance.
A sulfurous mist overlay the Duryam pool, within which moved the bloated, fleshy black monstrosity Han and Leia had come to conciliate or kill. Some of the red-orange light Leia had observed was the product of massive patches of bioluminescent lichen that crusted the walls of the humid well. But most of it came from the pool as huge bubbles broke the misted surface, washing the rotunda with flares of scarlet and starflower yellow. Resembling nothing so much as an everted human stomach, the tentacled creature responsible for the explosive globules was thrashing about like a hooked fish. Recalling what Harar had said about the well actually being a self-contained sphere, capable of surviving even the destruction of Coruscant, Han couldn't help feeling that the entire quaking structure was either about to explode or lift off. Considering the grip lay ahead on his right bicep, she evidently felt the same. Han glanced at the shaper, then Harar. What's it going to be? Harar exchanged a flurry of sharp words with Kila Quad. She says that only Shimra can communicate directly with the Duryam. Han scowled. Yeah, well, Shimra's not here, so she's going to have to take a crack at it. Reaching out, he grabbed the shaper by the arm and flung her to the edge of the platform. Maybe if I just send you for a swim. No, Kila Quad said in basic. The Duryam cannot be touched. Take your hands from me, and I promise to do what I can. I figured you listened to reason, Han said, grinning as he let go. The shaper composed herself and leaned over the pool. Sweat began to bead her trestled brow, then fall into the agitated pool. Almost immediately the durian breached the surface, a yellow eye as big as a starfighter glaring up at those on the platform. Then its mate appeared, blinking and fixing on everyone. A spray of powerful tentacles surrounding the creature's mouth sliced through the humid air faster than Han's eyes could follow. Seems a bit upset, he said, backing away from the edge and readying the detonator's thumb trigger. Inside the Duryam's tentacle-ringed mouth gnashed giant teeth shaped like swords. Perhaps we should all wait outside, C-3PO started to say. Then all at once the well stopped shaking and the Duryam grew quiescent. Two of the longer tentacles stretched out to touch Kila Quad, then Harar, in what seemed a display of submission or compliance. The Shaper and the Priest traded looks of incredulity. It's as pliant as a young Yamask, Harar said. Han thumbed the grenade's arming trigger forward. Leia blew out her breath in relief. Jason talked to it. Kila Quad ridiculed the idea. If anyone convinced the Duryam to yield, it was the Supreme Overlord. He knows that whatever you do here won't matter, because we will have proved our worthiness, and the gods will rid this galaxy of all infidels. Harar shook his head ruefully. If the gods judged us by our military might, they would never have banished us from paradise. The Shaper sniffed in derision. This war will take care of itself. We prove our worth by destroying Zonama Seacoat. She held Harar's gaze. It is not long for this galaxy, Eminence. The Supreme Overlord discovered a way to poison it. Shimra lies, Harar said. Mara shoved Nom Anor forward. The Shaper's right, she said in a grim voice. Nom Anor can explain. At Zonama Seacoat, the battle had reached a fevered pitch. One thousand kilometers from the living world, the Hapen Line was holding, but three additional Yuzhan Vong battle groups had arrived from Muscave to strengthen the original task force. The double hulls of many a battle dragon were perforated or showed great crescents at their edges where plasma balls had seared through failing shields. Similarly overwhelmed, several Nova-class cruisers had been snapped in half or blown to pieces. Because his fighter was without display screens of any sort, Kip was left to imagine the intense fighting, but Lando had painted a vivid picture when he had calmed Kip from errant venture. Booster's Star Destroyer had been forced to retreat, with both Lady Luck and Wildcard back on board, and six Smuggler's Alliance ships unaccounted for. 
Under the joint command of Wedge Antilles and Key and Farlander, elements of the Alliance Second Fleet had withdrawn from the engagement at Muscave and launched for Zonama Seacote, but without the blessings of Crefe and Sav. With the shielding Dovan Basils at Coruscant overcome and thousands of commandos streaking for the surface, the two admirals had counseled for a full-scale invasion. In contrast, Warmaster Nas Choka seemed to be concentrating the Armada's swiftest vessels at Zonama Seacoat, as if the planet was somehow the key to winning the war. The fear among the Jedi pilots of the Seacotan fighters was that the Yuzhan Vong knew something about Alpha Red that the Alliance didn't. Perhaps winged stars and flit gnats weren't the only life forms that were susceptible to the bioengineered toxin, and all of Zonama Seacoat was at risk. Word that an enemy vessel contaminated with Alpha Red had been spotted flying with the original task force had placed the Jedi on the offensive. Although Jabitha had been unable to contact Seacoat since, the planet showed signs of having grasped the enormity of the unforeseen threat. Columns of fiery devastation half a kilometer wide were streaming upward from summits of skyscraping mountains, boiling through layers of gauzy ice clouds to vaporize attacking coral skippers and picket vessels. Scores had already fallen to Zonama's wrath, and scores more stood at the threshold of annihilation. Defending close to the surface, Kip would no sooner conclude one duel than another would present itself. Now that he and his ship had finally gotten to know each other, the fighter was responding to his every whim. But the Jedi fighters were only a dozen against hundreds, and skips were breaking through the hapen cordon to assail the planetary weapons emplacements or make strafing runs through the deep canyons of the middle distance, where most of the Pharaohans were holed up in the shelters. No less overwhelmed, Corin, Saba, Alima, and the others were streaking in and out of contests, their ships darting above the Boris like soldier hornets protecting a nest. As had so often happened in previous battles, the Yuzhan Vong were slowly gaining the upper hand through sheer determination and the strength of numbers. Whether the unrelenting assault echoed the will of the individual pilots or the resoluteness of the controlling Yanisk, the invaders were finding soft spots and creating openings to assure that the alpha-red poisoned craft would reach the surface intact. Kip was drawing on his ship's extraordinary speed to intercept a pair of coral skippers when a sudden coolness enveloped his right hand, the hand that the control console had engulfed and was in fact his interface with the ship. Almost instantly, the fighter began to shed velocity and grow unresponsive. Kip pressed the control stick trigger. Though the launchers were far from depleted, they refused to fire. Sensing that something had changed, the skip pilots began to harry him with plasma fire. With maneuverability lost, only the organic shields were keeping the ship from being destroyed. Kip's first instinct was to blame himself. His ego had crept back into the fight, and he had lost his rapport with the ship as a result. Or maybe he had been doing too much thinking. The frequent updates from Lando, the calm chatter with Corin and the other Jedi, the upsurge in the savagery of the fighting since word of the poisoned ship had been received. Then Kip realized that it wasn't only his ship that had powered down. Throughout the fire-fractured sky, other Seacotan ships were abbreviating their duels. The calm link grew noisy with reports from Corin, Zek, Lobaka, and Saba, confirming that their fighters too were no longer responding. Chased by the same pair of coral skippers, Kip swooped through evasive turns that took him over a saw-toothed mountain range just south of the middle distance, which had been responsible for some of the heaviest outpourings of defensive fire. Now, though, even some of those summit weapons were beginning to fall silent. Above Kip, flights of emboldened skips were plunging deeper into the gravity well. The craft Lando reported seeing at Kalula could have been a decoy. Corin said to Kip over the comlink, The Alpha Red vessel could have already crashed on the surface. That would explain why no one's been able to communicate with Seacoat, Kip said. The planet's already poisoned. Then the war is lost for everyone. Kip gritted his teeth. I'm not about to see another world die, Corin. You and me both.
Chapter 40 The final curve of the Citadel stairway terminated in an immense interior space with a convex ceiling of Yorick coral as jagged as the hulls of Yuzhan Vong war vessels. A wide circular aperture at the ceiling's lowest point was the mouth of the turbolift analog chute Jason had detected with his Vong sense. Bioluminescent wall lichen projected a pool of green on the floor directly below the opening. Jason was certain that the chute accessed the crown of Shimra's holy mountain, but the Dovin basil that controlled the chute was either malfunctioning or refusing to admit anyone other than Yuzhan Vong, because nothing happened when Luke positioned himself in the shaft of olive light. I guess we climb, he told his niece and nephew. Abandoning the watch for Yuzhan Vong warriors, they turned to see Luke spring high into the chute. At the apex of his leap, he pressed his back to the curved wall and his feet opposite. Then he began to chimney himself along. Jaina and Jason followed, recognizing that they were in some sense leaving the citadel itself and entering an enormous escape vessel, much like the one Jason had described as encompassing the world brain. Ascending through an outer shell of Yorick coral, they passed through a layer of metal-bearing nacelles, wrapped around the vigorous organisms that had created them. Next came a layer of nutrient capillaries, then one of musculature and tendons. Ultimately, they emerged in an antechamber with a vaulted ceiling and great curving walls, the innermost of which contained a large but unadorned osmotic membrane. Jason wasn't surprised to find the antechamber unoccupied. Shimmer's expecting us, he said. Jaina tightened her ringed grip on the pommel of her lightsaber. We should at least announce ourselves, Luke said. He aimed the tip of his lightsaber at the membrane. Jason and Jaina brought their lightsabers close to his, and the three of them pushed the glowing blades through. A rancid smell permeated the antechamber, and the thick membrane began to melt. Finally, the lock retracted with an audible pop. Luke gestured for Jaina and Jason to withdraw to either side of the opening, and not a second later, a shower of thud bugs whizzed out into the antechamber, caroming off the walls, ceiling, and floor. The three Jedi raised their blades, deflecting some of the winged creatures back through the portal, stunning others, and killing the few that remained. While Jaina was dispatching the last of them, Luke whirled and leapt through the opening. Landing in a crouch five meters from the membrane, he held the lightsaber in a one-handed grip extended to his right and slightly behind him. Jason was the next through, assuming a bent-legged forward stance, with his blade held straight out in front of him. Then Jaina came through, moving swiftly but vigilantly to Luke's left side, with her blade raised over her right shoulder. Though the floor was level, the walls of Shimra's circular, high-ceilinged lair were curved. A simple throne occupied the center of a raised dais that was encircled by a shallow moat flowing with what might have been diluted Yuzhan Vong blood. The far wall contained a much more elaborate entry portal, and to the right of the throne a stairway climbed into the summit of the citadel, presumably to the command and control areas of the escape vessel itself. Between the moat and the Jedi stood fifteen warriors of modest stature, arrayed in a semicircle and armed with hissing amphistaffs. They affected no armor, but their burnished and blood-smeared flesh looked as impenetrable as Von Doom crab top shells. Luke recognized them from Han and Leia's description as examples of the specially engineered warriors they had faced on Kalula, and against whom even Kip had failed. The Slayers presented a daunting obstacle, but they were surpassed by the one they were deployed to protect. When Luke had been brought before the Emperor, Palpatine's visage had been familiar to him from images that had reached even remote Tatooine, and his inherent power was immediately evident. The Supreme Overlord, however, was a void Luke could not fathom. He wasn't a shell of a human in a hooded cloak, more energy than flesh nor was his face that of a Sith master, prematurely wizened by years of calling on dark power. Instead, Shimra was very much alive, and all the more intimidating for it. In him was concentrated the combined strength of the Yuzhan Vong species, 
and if he couldn't be defeated, then all that Luke had done to reach this point would amount to nothing. He was the largest Yuzhan Vong Luke had ever seen, with lean limbs, a massive head, and an upper body so thoroughly branded and tattooed it was impossible to distinguish flesh from garment. Widely placed, his slightly slanted eyes gleamed in shifting colors. He wore a ceremonial cape made of tanned hide. Curled sedately around his left forearm was a thick-bodied amphistaff with an intricately patterned head. Only in his bemusement was Shimra similar to the enemy Luke had confronted at Endor, on the incomplete Death Star. Much as the Emperor had trusted in the power of the dark side of the Force, the Supreme Overlord trusted entirely in the power of the gods. And similar to that pivotal moment in the Galactic Civil War, a battle was raging in the skies. But Shimra's lair permitted no view of the contest. Only the muffled sounds of distant explosions infiltrated the sealed space. If Luke was at all worried about Jaina and Jason, if he had any regrets about having brought them to the very heart of the war, he kept his concerns so deeply to himself that they could not be felt by his charges, even through the Force. The strength of their meld was such that the three might have been sharing the same mind, and that mind was the Force itself. Luke had no doubt that what they were doing was necessary and in harmony with the will of the Force. Shimra's warriors were no less committed to the moment. A threat to all the Yuzhan Vong held sacred, the Jedi were driven by a dark and incomprehensible power that flew in opposition to the divine edicts of Yun Yuzhan and the other gods. No more than did those of the Jedi, the marked faces of the slayers displayed neither anger nor fear, only the full measure of their intent to protect their god-king at all costs. The Master and the Twins, Shimra murmured from the throne, in passable basic. How long we have anticipated this meeting? As we have, Luke answered. Shimra beckoned with the fingers of his left hand. Then come forward and show your respect, Master Jedi. Luke stayed put, and yet something began to move him forward. Just short of the moat, and much to the amusement of the slayers, he dropped to his knees and bent at the waist. His extended left arm shook as it fought to prevent him from pressing his face to the floor, and the lightsaber was nearly yanked from his grip. It's not Shimra, Jason said through the force. A dovin basil, Luke guessed. He sensed Jason abandon the meld momentarily, presumably to call on his Vong sense to disable the gravitic powers of the biote. Luke began to feel as if he were shedding weight by the second. Gradually, he raised his face to Shimra. Then, and as if defying gravity, he drew himself erect with a proud air. Incredulity almost raised Shimra out of his throne. For a split second, his glowing eyes fell on Jason, who by then had returned to the force meld. Jaina and Jason sidestepped away from Luke to create three separate fronts. Then Luke did something neither twin had ever seen him do. Shifting his stance, he called the lightsaber into his left hand. Abandoning form, he encouraged the warriors to attack him. In swift response, the fifteen divided themselves into three groups of four, four, and seven. The quartets began to square off with Luke and Jason, while the larger group formed up opposite Jaina. Sensing that Luke and Jason were the stronger fighters, the Slayers had decided to reserve most of their might for the Jedi they perceived as being the weakest, guessing that Luke and Jason would always go to Jaina's aid before attempting to reach Shimra. No one moved. Just when it seemed that the moment would be forever frozen in time, the Slayers charged, some with amphistaffs stiffened, others unfurling them like whips, and still others prompting their weapons to spit venom. There were no attempts to engage Luke, Jason, or Jaina in single combat for personal glory, as had happened on Yagdul and other worlds. The war had gone on too long. All that mattered now was that the conflict be decided, and that there be winners and losers. Luke's lightsaber was a blur of pure energy as he parried a four-pronged attack. His blade found exposed flesh time and again, but the slayers sustained each searing blow without surrendering ground. 
The amphistaffs hammered at the lightsaber with such force that flashes of blinding radiance filled the room, projecting giant silhouettes up along the curved walls. In an attempt to forge a united front, and despite battling warriors on three sides, Luke and Jaina began to move toward one another. For a moment, several slayers found themselves trapped between the two Jedi and the lashing movements of their comrades' amphistaffs. Pierced simultaneously from either side, one warrior dropped to the floor, then a second. Luke vaulted through a half-twisting front flip that landed him back to back with Jaina, killing a third warrior on the way down with a strike to the top of the head. With some effort, Luke saw Jason through the Force, pressed hard by the four slayers who had dedicated themselves to him. Again Luke leapt, swinging his blade through the air and cleaving the neck of the most formidable of the slayers, attacking his nephew. Two slender amphistaffs shot for Luke's legs, but he managed to jump over both as if skipping rope, then decapitated the slower amphistaff before it could withdraw. A kufi swooshed through the air millimeters from his right ear. Crouching, he extended one foot and pivoted on the other, knocking the feet out from under the knife-wielder, then amputating the warrior's left foot with a return swing of the lightsaber. Seeing an opening, Luke made a move for Shimra, only to be dragged down by the Dovin Basil. Immediately he rolled to one side, toppling two slayers, and removing himself from the gravity field. Jason leapt to Jaina's side of the bunker, and the two of them began working in concert to drive a trio of warriors back toward the moat that encircled Shimra's throne. One of the slayers nearly stumbled into the flow but caught himself in time. Surging after him, Jason swung his blade through a backhanded crosscut, which the warrior parried, then answered with a fast chop aimed at Jason's left knee. Jason jumped straight up, but not quickly enough, and the amphistaff struck him on the ankle. Landing off balance, he staggered into the wall. Two warriors hurried after him, but made it only halfway when the entire bunker tipped to the right. The unexpected movement sent everyone, slayers and Jedi alike, scurrying, sailing, and tumbling into the opposite wall. As if mounted on gimbals, the bunker tipped again, this time in the direction of the ruined osmotic membrane, bunching everyone against that wall. Guessing that Shimra was responsible, Luke spared a glance at the throne. The Supreme Overlord's clawed hands were indeed in motion, but the expression on Shimra's face was one of benign bafflement. The Duryam, Jason sent through the Force. Luke understood. The World Brain, joining the shamed ones in revolt, was causing the entire citadel to shake, perhaps by rocking the cradle to which it was wed, or by some means beyond Luke's imagining. Self-contained, the bunker was attempting to keep itself level, but cut off from the Duryam, it couldn't anticipate the Citadel's behavior. Shimra's hand movements were just that, the idle flutters of a god-king who was forced to accept that he had lost his most powerful ally and weapon. Without the Duryam's cooperation, Coruscant would never be Yuzhan Tar. Even if victorious in the war, the Yuzhan Vong would have failed to recreate their ancestral homeworld. And yet there was a look in Shimra's blazing eyes that promised Luke he had not seen the last of the Supreme Overlord's tricks. Shimra was concealing something, a secret of such power that it enabled him to remain seated on his throne, even with his world teetering around him. Luke noticed then for the first time that Shimra wasn't alone on the dais. Behind the throne crouched another Yuzhan Vong, whose asymmetrically swollen head and downcast features identified him as a shamed one. Aware that he had been glimpsed, the shamed one withdrew into the shadow cast by the throne, as if in an attempt to make himself small and unnoticeable. But Luke had no time to think further about Shimra's companion. The bunker was suddenly in motion again. The Yuzhan Vong Armada had suffered grievous losses at Muscave, but not nearly to the extent the Alliance had suffered. Molten blobs that had been starfighters and frigates drifted aimlessly against the distant backdrop of stars. The hulks of Alliance warships, nimbused by escape pods, languished. The battle would go down in history as second only to the epic confrontation that ended the Kremlevian War and the name Nas Choka would join the revered ranks of Yogand and other legendary warriors. 
The War Master left the command chamber's blister transparency to stand before the villip visages of six supreme commanders he had tasked with defeating Zonama Seacoat. The surface-based weapons have fallen silent, Supreme Commander Tivik reported. The living ships it threw into its sky have lost their wings and are going to ground like a flock of exhausted birds. Fearsome one, the planet is beaten. Nas Choka's expression betrayed neither satisfaction nor doubt. Press the attack, he said evenly. The Matalox of Domains Tevik and Sun will escort the dying craft to the surface. All other vessels will withdraw to avoid contagion. The pilots of any coral skippers remaining in the atmosphere of the living world after the poison has been delivered are commanded to drive themselves into the planet and destroy themselves. No vessel that has had close contact with the dying craft can be permitted to survive. Your will be done, War Master. May our deaths serve to harden your victory, Supreme Commander Sla to Sun added. Nas Choka nodded his head in salute. Rushhawk, Ichnar, Venemhawk, die well, brave warrior. Then he turned to his tactician, whose restlessness bespoke an uncommon urgency. Communication with Yuzhan Tar has become garbled, War Master, but we have learned that Alliance warriors and several Jedi have penetrated the Citadel. Nas Choka folded his arms across his chest. Give no thought to Shimra's capture or death. The gods would never permit it, especially on bearing witness to our victory at Zonama Seacoat. Our metal has been tested, and we have prevailed. He regarded the tactician for a long moment, then said, My words provide so little consolation. The tactician frowned. War Master, Yuzhan Tar has grown as serene as Zonama Seacoat. Our weapons are silent. Our beasts slumber. The fires are contained. Shamed ones and renegade warriors hold sway over much of the sacred precinct. Supreme Overlord Shimra would not have permitted this. Our fear is that the world brain has been killed. Then it will be the duty of the Shapers to train a new Duryam. With the enemy defeated, we need be in no rush to give Yuzhan Tar proper shape. Again, Nas Choka appraised his subordinate. The last of it, tactician. Raul Roost and other warships speed for Yuzhan Tar. I realize that you had hoped to witness the death of Zonama Seacoat, but... Nas Choka waved him silent. Zonama Seacoat's death does not depend on my presence. On Crefe's heels, then? The war master nodded. Place his vessel in our sights. Buried under half a dozen blood-smeared bodies, when the bunker had shifted, Jaina used what little maneuvering space she had to avoid amphistaff fangs and venom, the serrated edges of kufis, and the sharpened teeth and hardened elbows and knees of warriors. Out of sheer desperation, she tried to use the force to throw everyone off her, and was bewildered when the crushing weight of the warriors abated, or at least until she realized that the sudden turnabout had nothing to do with the force. Shimra's lair had simply tilted again, and now she and the same warriors were sent flying and tumbling toward the opposite wall. Hurled head first for the curved expanse of Yorick Coral, she just managed to get her free hand out in front of her and brace for impact. Loud grunts escaped the warriors as everyone hit the wall midway to the arched ceiling, then slid in a jumble to the floor as the bunker attempted to right itself. Backward somersaulting from the heap, Jaina shot to her feet and was preparing to force leap toward Shimra when the chamber cantered again. This time she used the force to hold herself to the floor. As the half a dozen slayers went rushing past her out of control, some running faster than their legs could carry them, and others sliding on their bellies or backs. Loose amphistaffs tried to sidewind for the safety of the moat, but only a few made it, and the rest were flung hard into the wall. Once more the lair leveled out before tilting a full thirty degrees, and those warriors still on their feet launched themselves at Jaina, only to slip on whatever it was that had sloshed from the moat and was fast slicking the entire floor. 
Close to the osmotic membrane, Luke and a sturdy warrior were in the midst of a fierce duel, their free hands clamped on the burned edges of the breach the lightsabers had opened. Though Jaina couldn't see Jason, she could perceive him behind her, and she could hear the burning hiss of his lightsaber as it connected with the Slayer's weapons and armored flesh. In the center of the bunker, Giant Shimra had left his throne and was tottering toward the moat, his powerful amphistaff unfurled and serving as a kind of walking stick. Also in motion was Shimra's companion, who was making steady, if tortuous, progress toward the curving stairway that climbed into the summit. Jaina had first noticed him moments earlier when the bunker had shifted, somehow maintaining his balance despite his asymmetry. Unarmed, he had seemed intent on hiding himself, but it occurred to her now that the shamed one might be heading for the summit to carry out one of Shimra's commands. So instead of re-engaging any of the slayers, she set out after him, reaching the base of the stairway, just as the shamed one was disappearing around a curve above. Pressing her back to the wall, she began to ascend a step at a time, her lightsaber ready in her left hand. She felt Luke and Jason reaching out to her through the Force, somewhat baffled by her actions. But instinct compelled her to continue following Shimra's furtive partner. Reaching the top stair, she saw that the next level was a vast ready room, similar to the organiform cabin spaces of the Yuzhan Vong ship she had pirated from Mirkur. Half a dozen dilating hatches led to adjacent cabin spaces and yet another stairway. More a ladder climbed into what could only be the vessel's cockpit. Jaina rushed to grab hold of the ladder as the bunker tilted. From below came the sounds of bodies being hurled first one way, then the other. In the midst of the swaying, she heard the thrum of Luke's and Jason's lightsabers and the agonized cries of at least two slayers. There was no sign of Shimra's companion in the ready room, and no dilating locks that might have been opened to access other areas of the sphere, so the misshapen figure had to have climbed into the cockpit. Her instincts came alive even before she glanced up into the ladder well. The shamed one was already plummeting directly for her. She raised her lightsaber over her head, but the Yuzhan Vong managed to evade the blade and land feet first on her shoulders, driving her to the deck. Bent over her, he wrenched the lightsaber from her hands and tossed it aside. Then grabbing her by the right ankle, he sent her sliding across the floor. She hit the wall solidly, but sprang to her feet. Shimmer's companion was on her just as quickly, driving his fang-like tooth into her right arm as his powerful hands pressed her to the wall. Even before he stepped back, she had lost feeling and movement in her arm, and now she could feel the numbness beginning to spread like a dark tide, coursing through her armpit into her upper chest, spreading across her chest and into her other arm, up into her neck and head, and down through her torso and legs. She became as pliable as soft leather. She remained alert, but her lips and tongue couldn't form words. Her eyelids fluttered, and sounds grew indistinct. One thought kept repeating itself in her mind as she slipped into the blackest of voids. Before he had dropped on her, she had sensed him through the Force. Buffeted by updrafts warmed by fires raging in the canyon, the Seacoton airship swayed precariously as it descended toward the landing platform. In the gondola's cramped cabin, Magister Jabitha, Silgal, Tekli, Danny, and two male Faroan pilots kept their gloomy silence. With the cold sky raked by the fiery streaks of attacking coral skippers, the trip to the cave had been dangerous and in the end in vain. If in retreat there, Seacote had refused to speak with any of them. Danny sat closest to the cabin door, trying without success to warm her fingers with her breath. The temperature was still a degree or two above freezing, but she felt colder than she had been at Helska Four so many years earlier, trapped under kilometers of ice. Born of dread and sadness, the chill rose from inside her, and she was powerless against it. No matter what Luke or any of the others said, she was not a Jedi. She couldn't even wield a lightsaber properly, much less warm herself by drawing on the Force, as tall Silgal and diminutive Tekli had obviously done. Whatever skills she had demonstrated while serving as censor officer aboard the Wild Knight's blast boat, or helping Silgal fashion Yamisk jammers, they did not owe to the Force, but to a talent for science she had inherited from her astrophysicist mother—
and to 24 years of working closely with droids and cutting-edge technology. Yes, like the Jedi, she could sometimes intuit the Yuzhan Vong as voids in the spectrum of life, but if she were truly as Force-sensitive as Luke, Jason, and Silgal claimed her to be, then how had she failed to recognize Yomin Kar as not only a threat to her ex-Gal-4 science team on Belkaden, but also a harbinger of a new evil about to be unleashed on the galaxy? She was not a Jedi. She thought of herself as a Sky Watcher who had been in the right place at the wrong time first to be taken captive by the Yuzhan Vong at the start of the invasion, first to have had an up-close look at their biotech, first to have witnessed the breaking of a Jedi Knight, and because of those events, catapulted to the center of a war from which she might otherwise have hidden. Had Jason not heard her distress cry through the Force, had he not come to her rescue in his ice borer, she would have died at Helska Four or perhaps been broken and remade into a Yuzhan Vong, as had nearly happened to Tahiri. She owed her life to Jason, and at one point had come close to falling in love with him. But as indebted to him as she was, and to Luke and the others, for allowing her to see and do things she might never have, she sometimes felt as if she had been conscripted into the Jedi Order much as Jaina had been named the Sword of the Jedi, and much as Jason was seen as almost emblematic of a new awareness of the Force, Danny saw herself as the would-be Jedi, part technical officer, part familiar. Spokesperson at Agamar, how proud her bureaucratic dad must have been, member of the Eclipse base team, reconnaissance agent on occupied Coruscant, and for the better part of the past year, visitor on the living world of Zonama Seacote. On her arrival, the planetary consciousness had used her in a counterfeit kidnapping plot, and only weeks earlier had used her as a resource for information about Yamisks and Dovin Basils. And yet, even after all she had been through, Danny had no true understanding of what she was really doing on Zonama Seacote or why Seacode had specifically asked that she remain on world, rather than accompany the Skywalkers and Solos to Coruscant. Perhaps Seacode merely wanted a would-be Jedi to bear witness to the end of the world. For what with the Seacoden fighters spiraling back down to the Canyon Rim landing platform from which they had launched, and Zonama about to be poisoned by a vessel infected with Alpha Red, no other course seemed possible. It was while stationed at Mon Calamari that she had first heard rumors of the Yuzhan Vong specific bioweapon. She had mentioned the rumors to Jason, and for months following Verger's theft of the prototype batch, had held herself partly responsible for much of what had happened. Ultimately, she had learned that Verger had actually overheard Luke and Mara discussing Alpha Red in private, and had acted on the knowledge. And now, all these months later, the Chiss manufactured poison had found her again, though the end of the war scenario for which it had been created had taken an ironic and tragic shift. With most of the Pharaohans secluded in the shelters, an eerie silence prevailed. To Danny, Zonama felt more adrift than when it had been lost in the unknown regions, and an autumnal spell had fallen over the Tom Posse. A few Seacoten fighters were already grounded. Corin, Kip, Alima, and Zek were waiting on the canyon rim landing platform when the airship finally touched down. Everyone retreated to the shelter of the giant Boris as plasma fire and wind-borne cinders rained down. Were you able to locate Seacote? Kip was first to ask. Seacote is everywhere, Jabitha told him. Her dismay was evident, but her tone was sincere. Seacote is merely silent. Silence is one thing, Corin said, but ignoring a threat is another. He gestured overhead. Somewhere out there is a vessel that could end up killing this planet. Maybe not as quickly as Ithor died, but just as thoroughly. The Magister compressed her lips. I'm certain Seacote is aware of the threat. Alima blew out her breath in exasperation. We should try to reach Jade Shadow, she said, mostly to Kip. It's better suited to preventing the Alpha Redcraft from going to ground. 
We can't simply blow the vessel to pieces, Silgal said, not without risking sowing the atmosphere with poison. We have to trust that Seacoat has reasons for taking the actions it did. Kip glanced at everyone in puzzlement. Why go to the trouble of creating ships if the aim all along was to surrender? That wasn't the aim, Danny said. None of us knew about the poisoned ship, so how could Seacoat have known? As for why Seacoat brought your fighters down, I have an idea, even though I hope I'm wrong. Say it anyway, Kip said. Danny glanced around. I think Seacoat's goal is to allow the poison to reach the surface so that Zonama can contain it, to keep Alpha Red from being spread to the rest of the galaxy. Corin shook his head slowly. I can't see Seacoat martyring itself. Besides, what's to prevent any of us from spreading the toxin off-world by accident? Unless Seacoat plans to keep us grounded permanently. It's highly improbable that Alpha Red can be spread by human contagion, Silgal said. Early tests of the bioweapon support that. Kip, Han, and Leia were already exposed at Kalula and ruled out as potential carriers. Corin's eyes darted about. What about Moan Calamarians, Silgal? What about Chadrafans or Twi'leks? Or Feroans, for that matter? He shook his head again. I don't think Seacoat would risk it. If Seacoat had kept the fighters airborne, we could have at least held the Yuzhan Vong back until everyone was evacuated, Zek said. Is there any chance Seacoat's planning to jump Zonama to hyperspace? Kip asked. The hyperdrive cores are as silent as Seacoat, Jabitha said. Errant Venture might be able to evacuate everyone in time, Danny said. Sure, if we could reach Booster, Kip said, but we're getting nothing on the comlinks. Seacoat could be blocking the signals deliberately, Zek said. Jabitha turned to him. You're assigning dark designs to a consciousness that knows little or nothing of subversion. Next, you'll be accusing Seacoat of refusing to allow your warships to land on the surface as a means of marooning you here. I'm only saying that Seacoat strikes me as a quick learner, Zek said. What makes you think that Seacoat would wish to sabotage us? Silgal said. Zek shrugged. Only what I've been hearing about Seacoat's belief in the potentium. If there's no distinction between the light and dark sides, then it won't matter what happens here or even at Coruscant. Seacoat wouldn't have agreed to return from the unknown regions just to die here, Silgal said firmly. That would hardly be the action of a world that considers itself the caretaker of the Force. The self-appointed caretaker, Alima said. Jabitha sucked in her breath in surprise, then looked at Danny. Danny Kui, Seacoat wishes to speak with you. Only the Force was keeping Jason from succumbing to the pain. The Force and what he had learned from Verger during the indeterminate amount of time she had kept him in the embrace of pain, breaking him. While under his mentor's tutelage, he had been able to go into himself to meet the pain on its own terms. Now he didn't have that curious luxury because he was having to call on all his abilities to keep from being killed. If not for the swaying of the citadel and the effects of its unpredictable oscillations of Shimra's coffer, his escape vessel, Jason figured he would already be dead. That was the world brain having finally decided which side it was on. The trouble was that decision mattered only to the reshaping of Coruscant and not to the supreme overlord, who was clearly able to control objects in his immediate environment without need of the Duryam. The Slayers, for one thing. Where initially they had been moving with individual vigilance and of their own accord, they were now moving as coral skippers did under the control of a battle coordinator. The change had come simultaneously with Shimra's rising from the throne and the escape of his shamed one companion, whom Jaina had pursued into the summit of the citadel. Jason knew that her exit had been prompted by something she had perceived through the Force, 
but he and Luke could have used her lightsaber now. Three slayers had Jason backed to the bunker's outer wall. Even through his Vong sense, he could not predict their actions or where their thrashing and thrusting amphistaffs were going to strike next. He had managed to evade copious sprays of venom, but his torso had taken countless lashings. His limbs were bruised by the heads and coils of the serpentine weapons, though none had yet been successful in sinking fangs into him. His lightsaber had returned as many blows, but the slayers seemed to be largely immune to pain, if not indestructible. A half-dozen corpses were sprawled on the floor, sliding or rolling with each random cant of the citadel. But more than the lightsaber, it was acrobatics that was keeping Jason from being overwhelmed by the specially engineered warriors. Time and again last-moment leaps had carried him out of the range of their shape-shifting weapons as the fight moved along the perimeter of the throne room. The gravity-tweaking Dovin Basil set in the base of the throne made it impossible for Jason or his opponents to venture closer to the throne than the shallow moat that encircled it without being tugged violently to the Yorick coral floor. Jason took advantage of the gravitic anomaly now as one of the slayers lunged for him. He leapt high into the air and the warrior flew under his feet, only to be pulled to the floor face first, so that by the time Jason had twisted in the air and landed, he was able to drive his blade into the small of the warrior's back, almost pinioning him to the floor. The other two immediately rushed him from behind. Unleashing his amphistaff, one warrior managed to wind the weapon around Jason's legs, while the other swung his amphistaff at Jason's head. Ducking the swing, Jason leapt again, taking the attenuated amphistaff with him. Yanked from the warrior's grasp, the weapon unwound and dropped before it could strike. Across the room, Shimra was moving stiffly toward Luke, who was being set upon by four warriors. The enormous Vong overlord stepped across the moat as if crossing a final line. Seemingly entranced, in sway of the Yuzhan Vong gods, he fixed his glowing eye implants on his prey. He held the thick-bodied amphistaff diagonally in front of him, with his giant left hand closed around the middle of the weapon's three-meter-long body. Jason sent a warning to his uncle through the force, which Luke acknowledged, not only through the force, but also by spinning away from the warriors, to provide himself with enough fighting room to confront Shimra. Whirling through a cartwheel, Luke caught one of the warriors on the chin with the heels of his boots, unbalancing him enough so that Luke could get inside the arm that held the amphistaff and drive his lightsaber through the warrior's neck. As he quickly withdrew the blade, a second warrior was ready to pounce. Luke stretched out with his left hand and impaled the slayer through the right eye. At once the other two converged on him, battering him with their amphistaffs and kufis, opening ragged wounds in his upper arms and chest. Abruptly, the citadel rocked and the room tilted to the right. Luke dropped to one knee, holding his lightsaber arm up to protect his head, then dived, somersaulting on landing and spinning to his feet to face the warrior's charge. His green blade moved up from the floor in a diagonal motion, cutting off the weapon arm of one of the warriors, then on the downswing grated across the abdomen of the second, leaving a sizzling burn in the slayer's hardened flesh. Wincing, the warrior tried to take hold of the energy blade itself and fell forward on his knees. Luke pierced him through the chest, then pivoted on one foot to take on the others. One of the warriors stalking Jason abandoned him to engage Luke. Jason moved against the others, the shorter of whom feigned a strike at Jason's right leg, then twirled the amphistaff in his hands and slammed the tail end of it into Jason's right cheek. Reeling from the blow, he staggered within range of the Dovin basil, which dragged him to the floor on his back. The short warrior hurried in, his weapon striking at Jason like a serpent, then stiffening, jabbed him hard in the left forearm as if to stake the arm to the floor. Jason twisted out from under the attack, grasping that Luke had again been pressed to the wall. Having killed three of his assailants, he was facing only one opponent, but his energy was beginning to flag. It was not fatigue born of fear of going to the dark side, but simple exhaustion, and Shimra was moving in. Eager to award the kill to the Supreme Overlord, the slayer closest to Luke turned and ran at Jason with his amphistaff held over a head like an axe, intent on splitting open his victim's forehead. Jason could feel Luke call deeply on the reservoir that was the Force. 
From Luke's left hand gathered a blinding tangle of energy, manipulated into being by the raw power of the Force. As if hitting an invisible wall, the warrior stopped short, then spasmed as green sparks began to coruscate around him. Enveloped, he fell like a tree. Still twisting and writhing away from the snapping amphistaff, Jason used his Vong sense to dampen the effect of the Dovin Basil, allowing him to move out of its gravitic field and get to his feet. His short opponent howled in outrage and whipped the amphistaff. Jason allowed it to coil around his body. Then, as the warrior was reeling the weapon in, Jason hurled his lightsaber deep into the slayer's armpit. The bunker inclined, sending Jason directly toward Shimra. Without thinking, and without his lightsaber, he lunged for the neck of the towering Yuzhan Vong. But Shimra perceived Jason's intent and threw his mighty right arm behind him. Jason was hit squarely in the center of the chest. Dropping to the floor, he blacked out. When he came to an instant later, he saw that Luke had obviously intercepted Shimra's follow-up blow. But now, monstrous in aspect and power, Shimra hovered over Luke like a rancor. Luke's lightsaber thrummed through the air, but Shimra refused to be kept at bay. Luke tried to force Leap out of reach, but the Supreme Overlord had him caged. The master of defense is one who is never in the place that is attacked, Jason recalled Verger saying. Shimra appeared to have learned the same lesson. Lunging, the thick, three-meter-long amphistaff wound itself around Luke's torso, pinning his right arm and lightsaber hilt to his side. The green blade aimed at the floor. Just in time, Luke managed to get his left hand gripped on the snake's uppermost coils and avert the head as it loosed volumes of venom at him. But Luke was rapidly being squeezed to death by the amphistaff. Feeling his uncle's suffocation in his own crushed chest, Jason summoned his strength and crawled frantically for his lightsaber. Calling it to his right hand, he sent it hurtling through the air at Shimmer's head. The Supreme Overlord raised his left hand in a parry. Then, with Jason's lightsaber spinning off toward the throne, he reached into the folds of his hide cape and extracted a lightsaber. With a flourish, he activated it. A violet blade shot forth with the familiar snap hiss. Jason recognized it immediately. Anakin's lightsaber. Weapon of the Solo we killed at Mirker, Shimra said, his eyes shifting through colors as the energy shaft thrummed conveyed to Yuzhan Tar by the traitor Verger, wielded by the Jedi Ganner against so many of my warriors, retrieved when he died and brought to me, and now yours to confront, so that you may know what my warriors experienced at Zonama Seacote, forced to fight against other living vessels. Jason was too stunned to respond, too disheartened to move. Shimra waved the blade close to Luke's head. Luke removed his left hand from the amphistaff's throat to grab Shimra's right wrist. The serpentine weapon immediately stiffened and plunged itself into the left side of Luke's chest. Luke screamed in pain. The Supreme Overlord reared back to gloat. One thrust, and the deed is done. Then all at once, Anakin's lightsaber flew from Shimra's grip into Luke's left hand. Through his Vong sense, Jason could feel Shimra's astonishment and dismay. In a motion almost too swift for Jason's eyes to follow, Luke slit the throat of Shimra's amphistaff. As its coils began to relax, he sliced his own lightsaber blade upward, cutting the amphistaff's body into segments. As a horrified Shimra leaned forward, as if to vice his huge hands around Luke's neck, Luke crossed the blades and shoved them upward toward Shimra's neck. The blades burned clean through. Shimra's decapitated head dropped to the floor with a loud thud and his body crumbled. Luke hauled himself out from under the Supreme Overlord's body and collapsed against the wall. Jaina, he said weakly. Swinging his left hand, he sent Anakin's lightsaber in a high arc across the room. Jason scrambled to his feet and had just started for the lightsaber when the floor dropped to the right and he stumbled. Jason regained his balance and leapt for the lightsaber, but it flew past him and rolled beyond his reach. The vision... Jason thought. He looked at his uncle for confirmation. Leave it, Luke said. Lips compressed in determination, Jason raised himself from the floor and raced for the stairway that curved up into the citadel's tower-like summit. Chapter 41 
Noma Nor had his first look at the devastation that had been visited on Coruscant when Han Solo landed the Millennium Falcon in the public square that fronted the Citadel. What structures had not been gutted by Shimra's fires, had been toppled by roving beasts, or blown apart by Alliance torpedoes and missiles? The sky continued to flash with explosions, and dozens of starfighters were in the air, but the beasts and fires had settled down, and most of the warriors and Chazrock that had attempted to defend the holy mountain were dead. The scene inside the shaking citadel was even worse. When he had been stirring the shamed ones to rebel, fighting shoulder to shoulder with them in the streets, he had felt exhilarated by the prospect of bringing down the existing order, of spearheading something grand for his people, something revolutionary, and better still, with no manor at the top of the heap. Now, separated from his impassioned followers, and in the full knowledge that the war was lost, the sight of so many dead warriors in the Hall of Confluence filled him with despair and self-loathing. Just there was where he had sat beside High Prefect Drathul and other high caste intendants. And over there had kneeled Nas Choka's warriors. The pews dedicated to the priests and to the shapers stood empty, as did the special platform that had been grown for the seers. At the center, Shimra's spike-backed throne was tipped to the cold floor, and the Dovin basil responsible for bringing subjects to their bellies was dead. Every surface was slicked black with spilled blood and piled high with the bodies of those who had fought to the end. And across the great hall, a hundred or more defeated warriors, deprived of their weapons and held fast by nets or encased by adhesive foam, were being denied the dignity of honorable death. Otherwise the hall was filled with armed soldiers and Yuzhan Vong hunter-killer droids. Droids inside the citadel. What had he done? The feeling had been building in him since the surrender of the world brain, an unthinkable development in and of itself, though he suspected that Jason Solo had had something to do with persuading the Duryam to rebel. Still on the side of Coruscant, perhaps, but no longer on the side of Shimra and the Yuzhan Vong. Noma Nor could only wonder at the irony of being able to sympathize with the creature, though his own disloyalty owed more to self-preservation than any real desire to protect what he had sired. And yet he still faced an uncertain future, including the possibility of execution which was why he was calculating his every word and move in the hope that he could save his neck. Han and Leia Solo, Mara Skywalker, Kenth Hamner, and Tahiri, his captors, as well as his protectors for the time being, were speaking with two of the commanders of the troops that had stormed the Hall of Confluence. Judder Page, the shorter of the pair, held the rank of captain. The other, a major, was Posh Kraken, who apparently had been one of the officers rescued during the heretic's raid at the place of sacrifice. "'Have you seen Luke or either of our children?' Leia was asking Paige. "'They said they were going after Shimra. The last we saw them was on what was left of the Western Concourse. After some huge creature knocked a hole in the Citadel Wall, in they went.' "'So where is Shimra?' Han asked. "'We think he's somewhere up top.' Some shamed ones Luke talked to said something about a coffer. Han swung to no manor. You know anything about this? The shamed one must have been referring to Shimra's private chambers, his bunker in the summit. Thinking fast, he added, I've been there. I can lead you to it. Then what are we waiting for? Han, Leia, Mara, Tahiri, and Hamner followed Noma Nor as he hurried through the dimly lit labyrinthine corridors of the world ship Citadel, up winding staircases and Dovin basil governed chutes. Portions of the fortress had been extensively damaged by powerful ground quakes, which Noma Nor assumed had been engineered by the faithless Duryam. Less easily explained was the lack of bodies along the route. But he decided that the three Jedi might have taken a different route to the summit, perhaps the winding stairway and lift chute used by Shimra's guards. When they finally arrived at the filigree-trimmed membrane to the bunker, the dilating lock recognized Noma Nor's scent and irised open. 
the first thing he saw on entering the circular space was Shimra's head, burned clean from his body as only a lightsaber could do, the menacing glow gone out of his implanted eyes. No Manor stared in disbelief. Shimra was dead. He kept repeating it to himself, but his mind refused to accept the truth of it. In their long history, the Yuzhan Vong had never been without a supreme overlord. And yet that was now the case, the evidence there on the floor for one and all to see. Massed on one side of the room by the tilting of the citadel were a dozen or more dead slayers, and slumped against the wall that contained the guard's entrance, which also showed the marks of a lightsaber, was Luke Skywalker, wounded and perhaps near death. A lightsaber dangled in his left hand, and the left side of his chest bore a deep puncture wound. Nearby, Shimra's amphistaff lay scattered in uneven segments on the floor. The Jedi twins were nowhere to be seen. Clearly staggered by the bloody tableau, Kent Hamner gazed at Leia. He took his comlink from his belt and headed back for the iris portal. Can you manage without me? Kreefe has to be informed that Shimmer's dead. Leia Organa Solo nodded her head wordlessly. Mara Jade Skywalker was already at her husband's side, holding his face between her hands and calling his name. He's been envenomated by Shimmer's amphistaff, Noma Nor said. There is no antidote. If the Force can't heal him, he will die. Blood drained from Mara's face. We have to get him out of here. Just then Luke's eyes opened, and he smiled weakly. Luke, she said, her voice cracking. She put her arms around him and lifted him into a sitting position. I'm slowing the blood flow, Mara. Skywalker's gaze found Han Solo, who went down on one knee alongside him. From the way this place was shaking, Han, I'm assuming you convinced the world brain to see reason. Han traded brief glances with his wife, then mustered a smile. A bit thorny, but we managed. Easing the lightsaber from her brother's grip, Leia took his left hand between hers. We've won, Luke. Once the word spreads that Shimmer is dead, the armada will deteriorate, if it hasn't already. No Manor felt Skywalker's blue eyes fall on him with a look that mixed disbelief, anger, pain, and resignation. Luke, Leia said, where are Jaina and Jason? Skywalker motioned with his chin toward the stairway. Han's eyes darted from the stairway to No Manor. What's up there? The upper decks of this vessel. Command and control chambers. The bridge. Vessel? Leia repeated in perplexity. No Manor gestured broadly. This was to have been Shimra's escape craft and shelter, similar to the one that would have kept the Duryam alive had it decided to flee rather than betray its makers. Leia looked at her husband. Why would Jason? Shimra's minion, Skywalker answered softly. No Manor's jaw dropped. He pivoted through a circle, scanning the scattered and heaped bodies once more. Onini had escaped. Instead of giving his life for Shimra, the shamed one had fled. Can the minion launch this ship? Han asked. Nom Anor considered his response. With Shimra dead, someone would have to serve as liaison between the Alliance and the Yuzhan Vong, and that someone might as well be Nom Anor. It responds only to the Supreme Overlord. He glanced around. Onimi, Shimra's familiar, must be in hiding. Without warning, the bunker began to vibrate. Someone has to tell the Duryan that enough's enough, Han said. Nomanor's heart began to pound. In sudden realization, he placed the palm of his left hand against the outer wall. The Duryan isn't doing this. The vessel is being readied for launch. Wide-eyed, Han looked at the three women. Take Luke out of here. Nomanor and I will find Jaina and Jason. He glanced at Nomanor. Right? Of course, Nomanor said in a distracted voice. Leia stood up. Not without me, you won't. Han regarded her, then nodded his head. Then get going, Mara said, as she and Tahiri carefully began to raise Skywalker to his feet. The Jedi Master pointed to something across the room. Anakin's lightsaber, he said weakly. 
Tahiri hurried to retrieve it. Han grabbed Nomanor by the upper arm. You said this ship would only respond to Shimra. Nomanor nodded. Onimi must have found a way to deceive the controls. Han pointed to Shimra's head. You're sure that's the Supreme Overlord and not a lookalike? The Supreme Overlord is dead, Nomanor said evenly, then thought, Or is he? Flagship of the First Fleet, Rao Roost accelerated toward Coruscant, around which the fighting was continuing unabated. The Star Destroyers of Grand Admiral Pelion's flotilla had overwhelmed many of the planetary Dovin Basils, and thousands of Alliance troops were now on the ground, but the Yuzhan Vong home fleet wasn't yielding a cubic centimeter of space. The fighting had been just as intense at Muscave when Rao Roost had left, and updates from Zonama Seacoat indicated that the Yuzhan Vong elements were storming through Alliance lines and hammering the planet into submission. From the command chair on the bridge of the Bothan vessel, Admiral Crefe gazed at Coruscant's expanding debris cloud of starfighters and coral skippers, picket ships and frigates, destroyers and cruisers. As he had maintained all along, Shimra's death, recently reported by Kenth Hamner, had had no discernible effect on the enemy commanders or pilots. At the climactic battle of the Galactic Civil War, Imperial forces appeared to have been thrown into disarray by the death of Emperor Palpatine. But Shimra was scarcely a Sith Master, capable of using his powers of battle meditation to invigorate his troops. Nas Choka's warriors were bound together not by evil, but by a need for conquest and subjugation, backed by an unflinching will to fight to the death. Until the Alliance could defeat and dismantle the Armada, there could be no hope for peace. But how? Crefe asked himself. How can the Alliance rid the galaxy of an enemy that will not quit? If he ordered Alliance forces to withdraw, the Yuzhan Vong might simply reclaim Coruscant or fall back to positions that hadn't been attacked. The former galactic capital was rife with heavily forested regions where the enemy could dig in, grow and train a Duryam to supervise the fortifications and the construction of new war vessels. The fighting could go on for years. The same would be true if Nas Choka decided to jump the armada to a star system still under Yuzhan Vong control, resulting in the alliance chasing them throughout the galaxy, as Crefe at Mon Calamari had expected the Yuzhan Vong would be forced to do with the alliance. The war had to end here, at Coruscant, he thought. But at what cost? How many more would die if he pressed the attack? If he did as Nas Choka by ordering his commanders to fight to the death. Tens of thousands? Hundreds of thousands? Millions? The situation was untenable. He was still pondering the implications of either decision when Raoul Roost's captain interrupted him to report that Nas Choka's battle group had jumped from Muscave and were expected to revert imminently at Coruscant. Shimmer's companion shuffled about the spacious bridge, activating the vessel's organic components with waves of his crooked hands and with what seemed to be telepathic commands. The living console began to pulse and ripple like muscle tissue. A cognition hood unfolded itself and an array of villips twitched. Blaze bugs frothed in a display niche. Jaina understood that she was draped from two hooks that grew from the bridge's inner bulkhead. Though the shamed one had yet to make offerings to any of them, carved representations of the principal gods of the Yuzhan Vong pantheon stood to both sides of her, suggesting that she had become the centerpiece of a sacrificial altar. Lichen and sconced lambents imparted a dismal green glow to the York coral walls, ceiling, and deck. Jason, Uncle Luke, she called through the force. When she reached out for them, her mind was assaulted with scenes of violence. Jason and Luke had overcome great odds, but both of them were injured. Except through their minds, she couldn't perceive the warriors, but she grasped that most of them were dead. Abruptly, the twisted figure turned from the console to face her, almost as if he had read her mind. 
I know you can hear me, he said in a guttural basic, because I gave you only a taste of the poison encapsulated in my fang, just enough to render you inert. With a glance at the console, he enlivened additional living instruments and systems. It was obvious that he was preparing the vessel for launch. When the bridge began to vibrate with anticipation, the shamed one nodded in satisfaction and turned to her once more. I'm grateful you elected to pursue me, Yun Harla, he said. At last, we have an opportunity to meet on a level battlefield. Both of us in captivity. You, hostage to my paralytic toxin. Me, to the half-a-lifetime of injustices you saw fit to heap on me. Jaina forced herself to speak. I'm not... Who was more faithful to the gods than Onimi? The shamed one ranted at her. Who was more faithful to Shimra's domain than the shaper who discovered the truth that the eighth cortex was empty, and that the species Yun Yu Zhan and the rest of you created was doomed to extinction? Yes, our ancestors utilized the gifts you supplied to make war on those who would have vanquished us. But instead of rewarding our attempts to rid the galaxy of such infidels and machines, you drove us from the ancestral homeworld, bled us of further kinship with you, forced us to wander for generations in search of a new home. Hatred gathered in his uneven eyes and shook his curled hands. In your omniscience, you know that's why I risked grafting Yamask cells to my own neural tissue, in the hope of being able to discover some way to escape the rack on which you had mounted us. But instead of rewarding my having the courage to emulate your bold works of creation, you condemned me. You granted me the powers to speak through the mouths of others, to manipulate them at will, to control remotely, as your Yamasks do. And yet you punished me with physical deformities that shouted to one and all that my attempt at self-escalation had failed. You shamed me so that I could no longer consort with nor move among the elite. Not only did you deny me the rank of Master Shaper, you prevented me from being able to contribute to the salvation of my species. That was when I chose to turn against you, Yun Harla. I was not alone in this rebellion, and yet, as if to increase my torment, you rewarded the others, while you left me to suffer in silence through the years of drifting, the long years of watching our society crumble, our creche-born starve, our warriors turn on one another. And then you dangled before our eyes a galaxy filled with habitable worlds. At first it seemed a blessing, proof that you had not abandoned us in our time of need. But I soon realized that you were merely setting the stage for a new form of torture. Again Jaina tried to respond, only to be shouted down. Only by means of the powers you conferred on me was I able to reach out for Shimra and make him my puppet, my most audacious act yet. But when I saw that you were either powerless to prevent it or welcoming the opportunity to do open battle with me, I knew that I was right to attempt to overthrow you in the same way. I compelled Shimra to announce that a galaxy had been found for the taking. I bade him to install me as his familiar, and as my telepathic abilities increased, he disappeared, except of late— when my preoccupation with defeating you allowed what remained of Shemra to re-emerge. When Zonama Seacoat was found once more, and this time made to appear to have been bestowed on the Jedi as a weapon, I believed for a moment that you were actually testing me. But I soon grasped the greater truth, the same one that had already been glimpsed by the heretics and some of our priests, that because I had grown past your control, you had decided to topple me. 
Onimi looked hard at Jaina. He's seeing me through the Force, she told herself. As much as the realization shocked and confused her, it gave her hope. Even now I can see the glow of the divine in you, Yun Harla, as Yun Yamka glows in the Jedi called Skywalker, Yun Shuno in the Jedi called Jason, Yun Neshel in the Jedi called Tahiri. Onimi allowed his words to trail off and grew introspective. When he looked at Jaina again, his lowling eye was narrowed as if in amusement. Shimra is dead, he announced. Your god cohorts have killed him, Yun Hara. Now let us hope they will pursue me as well. Then not only will I have the satisfaction of outwitting you at Sonama Seacoat, but I will also have the pleasure of killing you, as my first act in exterminating everyone and everything in this foul galaxy. Arms draped over Mara's and Kent's shoulders, Luke was carried out of the Hall of Confluence through the warrior's membrane, then down the corridor that led to the Citadel's south entrance, where a temporary bridge linked the fortresses to the public square in which the scraped, scratched, and dented Millennium Falcon sat on her hard stand. Heading for the freighter, Harar, Tahiri, and Captain Page walked point through groups of nonplussed shamed ones. Elsewhere, squads of commandos, resistance fighters, and YVH droids were disarming captured elites, warriors, and the few reptoid slave troops that had survived the assault. To all sides rose piles of kufis, tactical villops and crab armor. Three hundred amphistaffs were stacked like firewood. Smoke was drifting across the sacred precinct, and the sky was a patchwork of contrails and missile tracks, but the area surrounding the citadel had been secured. On the far side of the square, huge armored beasts were resting quiescently. Cockmame, Miwal, C-3PO, and R2-D2 were waiting at the foot of the Falcon's landing ramp. On seeing Luke, chin resting on his chest and booted feet dragging behind him, the astromech mewled plaintively. "'Master Luke has been wounded,' C-3PO cried in distress. "'Someone call for a medic.' Mara and Kent lowered Luke to the paving stones to check his status. "'Force trance,' Mara said. "'He's trying to heal himself.' Turning to the Nogri and the droids, she told them to get the Falcon primed for launch. No sooner had the four disappeared than Jag Fell pushed his way through the crowd and hurried forward. Where's Jaina? he asked no one in particular. Somewhere inside with Jason, Kent said. Han, Leia, and Nomanor are looking for them. Jag put his hand to his brow and gazed up the summit. I'm going in, he said. He hadn't moved before Mara stretched out her arm to restrain him. No, you're not, Flyboy. We don't know what's going on in there. We've got to get Luke to one of the hospital frigates, so if you want to help, the Falcon could use an escort. Jag looked from Luke to Mara and nodded. I'll bring my starfighter around. As Jag ran off, Harar turned to face the knot of elite captives. At the front... High Priest Jakan and Master Shaper Kila Quad were being restrained by the Yuzhan Vong warriors who had defected to the side of the heretics, if not the side of the Alliance. Supreme Overlord Shimra is dead, Harar said in a morose voice. The announcement met with shouts of celebration from the shamed ones and bellows of dismay from the captives. Shocked and demoralized, many of the priests fell to their knees and began to mutter incantations and prayers. Genuflecting, the weaponless warriors snapped their fists to their opposite shoulders and lifted their blood-smeared faces to their captors in unabashed pride. "'Congratulations, Jedi!' Jakan said to Mara, Kent, and Tahiri, while the heretics were chanting for Yusha the prophet." You have brought down our civilization. Mara answered for the three, as you intended to do to ours. Harar looked at Jakan. It wasn't the Jedi. It was the gods themselves. Kent glanced at Harar. 
What's going to happen when Nas Choka learns of Shimra's death? The priest shook his head in uncertainty. The sudden death of a supreme overlord is unprecedented. Mara and Kenth raised Luke and began to move him into the ship. They had just stepped onto the ramp when someone among the heretic contingent called out to them. Harar's gaze found the male shamed one who had spoken. He says that, if you would allow it, he can prolong Master Skywalker's life. There exists no antidote to effect a complete cure. Is it true? Mara asked disconsolately. Harar squinted at the heretic. That one is a former shaper. He'll be of more benefit to Master Skywalker than I can be. Perhaps of more benefit than Bacta. Jakan began to denounce the shaper who had volunteered. Harar translated for Mara and Kenth. The high priest says, You're ready to discard your beliefs like a worn-out robe skin over a mere military victory. Harar listened to the heretic's reply. The shamed one answers, Only those beliefs that supported this war. Jakan wasn't through. Harar heard him out, then said, The high priest says that he hopes to hear the shamed one repeat his words when the Alliance finds him guilty of war crimes, and a machine intelligence is charged with executing him. The former shaper heaved his shoulders in a sad shrug. Harar's voice broke as he translated. The shamed one says that death will be a far better place than any he has known on Yuzhan Tar. Without warning, the ground started to shake. For a moment Mara thought that the Falcon's repulsor lifts were the cause. Then she realized that the Citadel was the source. Frightened faces raised to the world ship fortress. The heretics began to retreat to the far side of the square, where the great beasts were on their feet and lowing in fear. As the shaking grew more violent, cracks formed in the facade of the citadel, and huge chunks of Yorick coral began to avalanche down its sheer sides. Paving stones under the falcon heaved, then sank, dropping the starboard landing gear disc a meter into the fractured ground. Anakin's lightsaber slipped from Tahiri's grasp and rolled into a crevasse. She tried to call the lightsaber to her, but it had fallen too far. Leave it, Mara said sharply, when Tahiri almost scrambled after it. A rending sound thundered through the air. Then the bullet-shaped crown of the holy mountain slowly separated from the base and lifted into the sky. Steadying herself and Luke on the falcon's trembling ramp, Mara whirled to Tahiri. Gina and Jason are in terrible danger. Her features warped by sudden anguish, she glanced at Luke, then at Kenth. We're not letting that ship get away. Jason was halfway up the ladder stairway that led finally to the command chamber when he realized that the escape vessel had parted with the world ship Citadel. While the liftoff came as no surprise, it couldn't account for the mix of emotions that began to whirl through him. Shimra's familiar wasn't only lifting them out of the battle, away from roiling Coruscant, out of reach of his parents and many of his fellow Jedi. It was as if he were also launching them outside space and time into a separate engagement. Jason kept climbing. On reaching the last few high risered stairs, he leapt through the well and landed in a defensive crouch on the deck of the vessel's immense bridge. Shimra's familiar stood opposite him, his disfigured body listed to one side, his twisted hands waving commands at the throbbing control console. Jaina hung between them, suspended a meter above the deck by horns of Yorick coral that protruded from the inner bulkhead, surrounded by intricately rendered religious statues. Jason perceived that she was paralyzed but conscious warmly alive amid the cold Yorick coral and bone of the bridge. She touched him through the force, her voice little more than a whisper, but clear enough for him to grasp that the shamed one's name was Onimi. Kali and Savong La had been set on pitting Jaina and Jason against each other in battle. Onimi wanted nothing more than to kill them. 
He was observing Jason from across the bridge, even while guiding the vessel through the tattered sky, willing it through the tattered sky, Jason realized, directing it the way a Yamisk might. You will find no integrity in me, Jedi, Onimi said in basic, as if mimicking something Verger had told Jason when he was in the embrace of pain. Trust that everything you perceive about me is a lie. Jason realized the truth. Onimi had overseen the warriors in the throne room below. Onimi, not the Duryam, had been responsible for the quakes that had nearly toppled the citadel. Shimra was Shimra, Onimi said, anticipating Jason's next thought. I am I. The Supreme Overlord, Jason said. As the realization deepened, he recognized that his Vong sense was allowing him to see Onimi in a profound way. Onimi was open to him, and in an instant, Jason understood how the shamed one, a former shaper, had attained such power. But even Onimi didn't understand that through his experiments, he had also found a way to reverse the damage that had been done in the distant past to the Yuzhan Vong. He had regained the force. Verger told Nomanor that you are the most dangerous Jedi of all, Onimi said. And well you should be, since you carry Yun Shuno within you, the betrayer of all I have sought to create. But soon, when I have killed you, you will be my passage to godhood. All you hold dear will have been destroyed. The species that gave you its blood and died to bring you worshippers. Most of all, the living world you returned from the unknown regions. Even now it anticipates its own death. It gasps for breath. Can you feel it? Our vessels are plunging through the shields you tried to create coming closer and closer to the surface. The consciousness of that world is crying out that you have failed to protect it. How is this so, you ask yourself? How did it come to this? Because your military created a poison that was to kill my people. And instead, I have sent it back to kill the very world you persuaded to join you in the fight against us. Is there not in that the hand of a new god, Jedi Yun Shuno? Where is your precious force now? The lingering exhalations of Yun Yuzhan, that this has been allowed to happen. Jason understood that Onimi was referring to Alpha Red. The toxin had to have arrived on the vessel that had escaped Kalula. He reached out for Seacoat, but the voice of Zonama's planetary consciousness was indistinct. Something had changed. Was Seacoat deliberately concealing its presence from him, or... Jason experienced a moment of insight. He could see Onemi through the Force. Was it possible that he would be able to find Seacoat through his Vong sense? Again, he reached out, touching Seacoat this time, and the astonishing truth struck him like lightning. Why hadn't he seen it earlier? But there was no time to dwell on it. Onimi was eager to train his awesome powers on Jason, and to do that, he had no need for an amphistaff or kufi. He was capable of manufacturing paralytic agents and lethal poisons. And in the same way the world brain oversaw Coruscant, Onimi controlled the environment of the living vessel, and could turn any or all parts of it against Jason. Jason realized that he was about to engage in a battle that would be decided not by knowledge of the Force, so much as fealty to its will. This was not a duel, but a relinquishment. Once more he heard the voice of the vision he had had on Duro, Stand firm. His heart told him that it was the voice of his grandfather, Anakin Skywalker. Chapter 42 Lando's urgent comlink transmission from Errant Venture found Wedge in the chaotic situation room of Mon Mothma, where a holographic image of Zonama Seacoat rotated slowly in a cone of blue light, and bezels of various colors showed the deployment of Alliance and Yuzhan Vong vessels. 
Technicians and droids were busy at every duty station, and the scrubbed air was filled with the din of voices and the incessant toning of damage and threat assessment screens. In the thick of the fighting, enemy Matalox and Yorick Vec were blinking out at the rate of one every five minutes. But closer to the living planet, Coral Skippers and Yorick Akaga had swept through portions of the Hapen line and were strafing the Boris and inhabited canyons of the middle distance. With Zonama's mountaintop defenses either incapacitated or determined to be ineffective against the small craft, Moan Mothma was speeding for the planet. Separate conversations among the tactical officers surrounding the projector table made it impossible for Wedge to hear Lando clearly, so he moved to a corner of the vast room and slipped a headset over his ears. The battle at Muscave was nothing more than a diversion, Lando was saying. Nas Choka was hoping to keep us too occupied to notice the poisoned vessel he's trying to get to the surface of Zonama Seacoat. He snorted. One small ship slipping past all the defenses. Does that sound familiar? Vaguely, Wedge lied. Do you have information on why the Jedi fighters have gone to ground? Negative. Could the Vong have already delivered the Alpha Red? That's as good a guess as any, Lando said, unless Seacoats decided to surrender. If that's the case, then it's grown weaker over the past fifty years. Or the Vong have gotten stronger. Lando paused, then said, Booster is going to take Aaron Venture as close to Zonama Seacoat as possible. We'll evacuate as many of the Jedi and the Pharaohans as we can. Wedge grimaced. Lando, you can't do that if the planet's already been poisoned. I realize Alpha Red probably doesn't pose a threat to humans or Bothans, but after Kalula, we can't be sure that it can't be spread by other species. Lando was silent for a long moment. Understood, Wedge, he said in a resigned voice. We'll check with Kip and Corrin before we lift anyone up the well. What do you hear from Coruscant? Tooth and nail. Shimra is apparently dead. Luke saw to that. But Shimra's death hasn't slowed Nas Choka. Even if we can eventually defeat his forces, there's not much chance of forcing a surrender. What's the answer? I'm worried that Kreefe and Sav are looking hard at Alpha Red. Lando exhaled audibly. Seems to be everybody's solution just now. Wedge signed off and removed the headset. He spent a long moment regarding the rotating hollow image of Zonama Seacoat. He refused to accept that the poison ship had gotten through. Starfighters could prevent it from reaching the surface. He thought back almost five years to the decision he had made to come out of retirement. He hadn't a notion then that he would end up piloting a starfighter at Cernpedal, be charged with holding Borlias, or attacking Coralag. But that was the way of war. You did whatever you could, hoping that even the smallest contributions affected the end result. He moved to the nearest duty station and asked to be patched through to the senior mission officer. I want you to ready a starfighter, he said when the female officer answered. For any particular squadron, she asked. They're all so shot up the pilot can have his pick. Who's been tasked with protecting Zonama Seacoat? That would be Red Squadron, General. Perfect, Wedge thought. Alert Red Leader to expect a reinforcement. What's the pilot's call sign, sir? Wedge considered it, then said, Vader. Impossible, Nastchoka told his tactician. The Supreme Overlord is a ward of the gods. Should we fail in our task, he will be the last of us to die, and our success is assured. He gestured toward Coruscant, readily visible through the blister transparency. Zonama Seacoat will die, and the battle here will turn as soon as I recall the rest of our forces from Muscave. We will chase the Alliance back to the Outer Rim where they will spend the next ten years licking their wounds and dreaming of the day they will be strong enough to mount a second counteroffensive. The tactician inclined his head in respect. But the announcement was made by Eminence Harar himself. Harar, the war master said in surprise. I thought he was in the outer rim. No, fearsome one, crossed over to the side of the enemy, 
at Zonama Seacoat, when it was in the unknown regions. Prefect Nomanor as well, now revealed to be the leader of the heretics. Nas Choka extended his hand to the bulkhead to steady himself. Harar, a traitor? Nomanor, an insurgent? Though painful to endure, those were reversals he could accept. But surely he would know if the Yuzhan Vong had suddenly lost their conduit to the gods. He glanced around the command chamber at his commander and subaltern, his villop mistress and priest. Not one of them was distracted or apprehensive. All of them were attending to their duties. A lie by renegades, he said to the tactician at last. A cowardly attempt to throw us into confusion. Again, the tactician inclined his head. War Master, my feelings echo yours. I should know. Inside, if our supreme overlord is dead. And yet the Villop reports from other commanders on the surface confirm that warriors and Jedi have overrun the Citadel, including Shimra's coffer. Jedi, Nas Choka repeated. May I speak my thoughts? Quietly, the War Master cautioned. Why should Zonama Seacoat's planetary weapons cease, unless the living world is fearless? Could Shimra somehow have been duped into playing into the hands of the gods, when their true aim is to punish him for arrogance, and us for our faithfulness to him? Naschoka's slanted forehead furrowed. I... War Master, Yom Kuzmount's supreme commander interrupted with a brisk salute. Lord Shimra's personal vessel has launched from the Citadel, and even now emerges from the atmosphere to join us in battle. Show me, Nas Choka said, whirling to the transparency. The commander pointed to a section of the blister, which showed an enhanced view of the Supreme Overlord's projectile-shaped coffer, its powerful Dovin basil tugging it swiftly from the gravitational grip of the planet. Alongside the vessel, though not yet engaging it in battle, flew two Alliance starfighters and a battered saucer-shaped freighter. Nas Choka showed the tactician a brief nod of acquittal. You see, a trick by renegades. Not only does the Supreme Overlord live, he seeks to reinvigorate us personally. He looked at the commander. We will demonstrate our gratitude to Shimra by immolating the flagship in his honor. Order all vessels to converge on Raul Roost. On the bridge of the vessel, whose every component answered to him, Onimi sent a blur of objects racing for Jason, beginning with the carved idols that flanked Jaina. Cloaked Yoon Harla, many-armed Yoon Yamka, thousand-eyed Yoon Shuno, and the rest. But Jason stood firm. Not wanting to risk hurting Jaina inadvertently by deflecting the objects, he pulled everything into a whirling cloud as if in orbit around him. Beyond the cloud, he was dimly aware that a transparency had formed above the console, and that constellations of stars were winking into existence, smeared in places by the explosive exchanges among the hundreds of warships battling at the edge of Coruscant's envelope. Jason's steadfast defense infuriated Onimi. Reaching deeper into himself, the Supreme Overlord used his telekinetic powers to create cracks in the bulkheads and ceiling hoping to add chunks of unrooted Yorick coral to his conjured storm. But as fast as the fissures formed, Jason repaired them, and those chunks that were torn away, he ordered the vessel to cement in place. Mismatched eyes opened wide in disbelief. Onimi charged, his feet moving so rapidly that he might have been gliding across the deck. Though crippled by the deformations that had resulted from poorly healed enhancement surgeries, and the consequences of experimental escalations, the former shaper was still taller than Jason and pound for pound more powerful. But the struggle had nothing to do with size and less to do with brute strength. Onimi's true potency lay in his abilities to amplify the electric current that flowed through his body. Or, like Verger, to call on his refined metabolism to fashion molecules and compounds and deliver them through his curving yellow fingernails, his single fang, his blood, sweat, saliva, and breath. But wherever Jer had learned to produce emollients and healing tears, Onimi was capable of producing a brew of fast-acting and deadly toxins. 
Compared to the former shaper's mastery of Yuzhan Vong bioscience, Verger had been a mere adept. He flew at Jason with hands upraised and mouth ajar. Jason lifted his hands in defense, and he and Onimi met with blinding discharges of electrical energy that entangled both of them in a flashing web. Their hands interlocked, they whirled from one side of the bridge to the other in a kind of mad pirouette, caroming off the coarse bulkheads and smooth instrumentation. Jaina sent her twin what reinforcement she could summon, but he told her to conserve her strength. The transmutated secretions from Onimi's palms and fingertips sent hallucinogens through Jason's skin and capillaries and coursing through his bloodstream. Onimi's paralyzing fang struck repeatedly for Jason's temples and neck. Poison wafted on his forced sighs and rode within the droplets of his frothing saliva. But the Jason that the Supreme Overlord had in his taloned grip was not there. Where once Jason had been unable to find Onimi through the Force, now it was Onimi who couldn't find Jason. What he found instead was formless, supple, and fathomless, an infinite emptiness, but as serene as a wind toppling trees to encourage new growth. A being of light, Jason was drawing into himself all of Onimi's lethal compounds, neutralizing them and casting them out as sweat, tears, and exhalations. He understood at last why he had failed to catch Anakin's lightsaber when Luke had tossed it to him. He was never meant to catch it, because he had become the lightsaber. He had attained the ability to cut through any resistance in himself, to sever the bonds of preconception, to open a gaping hole into a reality more expansive than any he had ever dared imagine, to heal. As his grandfather had done, he had broken through the apparent opposites that concealed the absolute nature of the Force, and found his way into an unseen unity that existed beyond the seeming separateness of the world. For a moment, all the cosmic tumblers had clicked into place, and light and dark sides became something he could balance within himself, without having to remain on one side or the other. The consciousness that was Jason Solo was strewn across the vast spectrum of life energy. He had passed beyond choice and consequence, good and evil, light and dark, life and death. All that had been required of Jason was complete surrender, a technique once mastered by the Jedi Order, but at some point misplaced, transposed to an emphasis on individual achievement, which had opened a way to arrogance. In that the path was available to any who chose to seek and follow it, Jason understood that the discovery was really a rediscovery. Indeed, the Ur Yuzhan Vong had adhered to it when they had lived in symbiosis with Yuzhan Tar. In that dim, proto historical time, they had been group minded, living in a world where the boundaries between self and other were permeable. By cutting that bond, they had isolated themselves from the Force. They had deluded themselves into thinking that they were worshipping life, when in fact they were worshipping the only route to symbiosis left open to them, which was death. Jason realized that, in a sense, he had paraphrased Onimi. He had passed beyond the tradition of the Jedi Order into a more embracing reality. But instead of attempting to steal the authority of the gods or to become a god, he had finally allowed himself to merge with the Force in its entirety, and become a conduit for its raw power, which flowed through him like the thundering headwaters of a great river. The conjoining of the Force and his Vong sense enabled him to render himself small enough to follow Onimi wherever he went or attempted to hide, to counter Onimi's every action and merge with his living vessel on a molecular level. Jason ended their spinning, bringing them to a halt in the center of the bridge, where he continued to parry Onimi's strikes. The Supreme Overlord's lolling eye fixed him with a gimlet stare. Gradually, Onimi began to understand as well. He grasped that Jason wasn't defending himself so much as using Onimi's own strengths against him. Jason was fighting without fighting drawing Onimi deeper into the struggle by demanding more of Onimi's indigenous toxins, to the point that he couldn't keep up. Jason was the vacuum, the Dovin basal singularity, into which Onimi was being sucked. Jason had become the dismantling void that was drawing Onimi into a slender thread, 
attenuating him to the point of infinite smallness. Onimi's self-deformed face began to change, his arteries pulsed, and his veins bulged from beneath his pale skin. Onimi fought with everything that remained in him, but Jason could not be overwhelmed. As a pure conduit of the Force, he was incapable of taking missteps or making wrong moves. He stood not at the edge of the tilting ecliptic of his vision, but at the center, as a fulcrum. The weight that would disturb the balance was Onimi, but to Jason that weight was no longer of sufficient mass to make a difference. The force encased Jason like a whirlwind, moving deep into the darkness the Yuzhan Vong had brought to the galaxy, and gathering it and sending it up the spout into the funnel cloud, where it was transformed and dispersed. Onimi was becoming more insubstantial by the moment. Jason continued to stand firm, writing the world. He had become so powerful as to be dangerous to his own galaxy, for he could see clearly the temptations of the dark side and the desire to force one's will on others, to so completely dominate that all life would kowtow to him. He purged his mind of all pride and evil intent and entered a moment of unadulterated bliss, where he seemed to have unlocked the very secrets of existence. He knew that he would never again be able to reach this exalted state, and at once that he would spend the rest of his life trying. Neither Jaina nor Jason had answered Leia's calls as Noma Nor had led the search for them, but the reason for their silence became clear the moment she entered the bridge of the accelerating alien vessel. She was last to arrive in the cavernous chamber. Noma Nor and Han, blaster in hand, had raced in ahead of her, only to be transfixed by the spectacle unfolding before their eyes. A sight Leia knew she would carry to her grave, and all the more spellbinding for the backdrop of familiar stars, hyphens of coherent light, roiling plasma missiles. She felt as if she were wedged between a dream and a vision, lifted into a realm that was usually denied to mortal beings. In the center of the bridge, Jason stood like a pillar of blinding light, feet planted, arms at his sides, chin lifted. The dazzling light seemed to spin outward from his midsection and surround him like an aura. His face was almost frighteningly serene and perhaps a touch sad. The pupils of his eyes were like rising suns. He seemed to age five years, features maturing, complexion softening, body elongating, as Leia watched breathlessly. What youth might have remained in her son vanished. Across the bridge, Shimra's shamed familiar Onimi was pinned to the coarse bulkhead like a captive shadow moth. Uneven eyes rolled up into his deformed head and slavering mouth opened wide in wonderment, agony, despair. It was impossible to know. Jaina dangled limply between her brother and Onimi as if a mournful sculpture, fragile but growing stronger by the moment. And as she strengthened, Onimi began to wane. For an instant, it appeared that the surgeries, mutilations, and disfigurements were reversing themselves. The shamed one's facial features became symmetrical. His twisted body straightened, assuming its original size, shape, and aspect. More human than not, though taller and leaner, with long limbs and large hands. But life deserted him just as quickly. He slid to the deck as if his bones had dissolved. Poured from his mouth, eyes, and ears, corrosive fluids began to consume him, leaving nothing more than a puddle of foul hydrocarbons, which the Yorick coral deck absorbed as it might a stain. Immediately the vessel spasmed, as if it had been struck by turbolaser fire, or had in fact sustained a kind of stroke. Color and warmth drained from the living console, and the instruments took on an arthritic look. Cognition hoods and villops grew desiccated. Blaze bugs fell out of formation and died on the floor of their niche. Coral fractured and the already scant green light faded. With its dovin basil dying, the vessel almost succumbed to a last grab by Coruscant. Then it lurched forward once more, aimed resolutely for the heart of the battle. When Leia finally came back to herself, Jason had lifted Jaina from the horns on which she had been suspended and was cradling her in his arms. 
You would let me help you, she said. Jason comforted her with a smile. I needed you to help yourself. Nom Anor watched in awe as Onimi disappeared into the deck of the bridge, his body dissolved by whatever corrosive poisons he had fabricated to use against Jason Solo. Death had come to the Shamed One who had brought Shaper Nen Yim to Coruscant, the Shamed One whom Nom Anor had once followed to a secret Shaper Grashel, the Shamed One who had sat at the feet of Shimra and whose rhymes had been a constant irritant to the elite. The shamed one who had tricked everyone into believing that Shimra was the supreme overlord. The supreme overlord who was now dead. Nom Anor stared at the discoloration that had been Onemi. Even if he lived to tell it, would anyone believe his tale? Would the Jedi be willing to corroborate it? A prolonged paroxysm from the vessel snapped him back into awareness of his perilous dilemma. His real eye darted from the Jedi twins to their parents. There was still time to render them unconscious where they stood, then pilot Onimi's vessel to rendezvous with whatever was left of Nas Choka's mighty armada. But perhaps not. Jason Solo was as dangerous a foe as could be imagined. What's more, Onimi's vessel, though roused from stasis, might not respond to Nomanor. If he was to escape with his life, he needed a more foolproof plan. The solution presented itself when the vessel lurched again and the controls began to surrender their suppleness. Onimi was wedded to the ship, he said in a rush. With his death, it has begun to die, and we will perish with it. When Jason nodded in confirmation, Jaina said, Mara is searching for us. Han rushed to the console and peered through the blister transparency. Then the Falcon's got to be out there somewhere. He turned to Noma Nor. I've seen Yuzhan Vong evacuate their ships wearing those Nulith masks. There's a better way. Noma Nor cut him off. This vessel is equipped with a Yorick Trima, what you call a crate, a landing craft. Han showed him a long-suffering look. What, you were waiting for me to ask? Quickly, Noma Nor led the Solo family out of the bridge and through a bewildering maze of corridors, whose throbbing walls were already showing signs of imminent collapse. The palm of his right hand opened lock after dilating lock, allowing them to weave their way clear across the vessel to the port side bulkhead and ultimately into a small grotto, equipped with a semicircular array of locks. Noma Nor opened what appeared to be the most exterior of the locks and gestured everyone inside. Get settled while I arm the launch organ. Han clasped his left arm around his daughter's waist and started for the lock, but Jason stopped him. This doesn't lead to the York Trima. He turned slightly and pointed to the innermost lock. That's the correct one. Jaina glanced around the grotto. Jason's right. She nodded to the lock Noma Nor had opened. It leads to a waste disposal area. Jason regarded Noma Nor. Once you had sealed us inside, you would have been able to pilot the landing craft to safety. Disappointment tugged at his features. And yet, despite your attempt at treachery, we owe you our lives, because I doubt I would have been able to find my way to this grotto. Nomanor glanced from the first lock to the second, then forced a relieved sigh. Thank you for catching my error, Jason Solo. What with leading the shamed ones in rebellion and witnessing Onimi's death, I was momentarily confused. Han drew his blaster. Save it. Nomanor raised his hands in surrender. It was an innocent mistake. Now isn't the time to argue. He risked a step toward Han. We must board the escape craft before this vessel. Noma Nor lunged forward. His eye, Jaina yelled. Poison spewed from the Playerian bowl. Han was too encumbered to twist himself or Jaina out of its path. In a blur, Jason interposed himself between Noma Nor and his father and took the lethal gush full in the face. Even better than hoped for, Noma Nor thought. With Jason out of the way, he could easily incapacitate the others. With his right hand, he reached for the little finger of his left. At the same time, he steeled himself for a dash across the grotto. 
It would take a moment for the knockout gas released by the false digit to reach full effect, and that moment constituted all the time he had to reach the escape craft lock and seal it behind him. In the instant his hands met, he heard the snap hiss of a lightsaber. And in the interminable instant that followed, he watched Leia's energy blade sever his left hand at the wrist and watched himself falling to his knees in shock and searing pain. Worse, it was Jason who came to his side, weakened by the Playerian bowl's venom, but very much alive. It didn't have to be this way, the young Jedi said. Nomanor clasped his stump of forearm in his right hand. Didn't it, Jedi? He smirked. Even if words from you kept me from execution or life imprisonment, what course was left to me? Just as my atheism renders me unfit for Yuzhan Vong's society, my utter contempt for the Force makes me unfit to live among any species that recognize it. I've been a stranger to all worlds. Even Yu Sha, leader of the Shamed Ones, was just another role for me, another lie. A rueful laugh escaped him. Uglith maskers can't hide everything, Jedi. On the other side of the grotto, Jaina was pressing her hand against the lock sensor organ to no apparent effect. It responds only to the flesh of Yuzhan Vong, Nome Anor said. He felt Jason's eyes on him. Then we'll use your severed hand, Jason said. Nome Anor blew out his breath and rose to his feet. Crossing the grotto, he pressed the palm of his right hand to the bulkhead sensor. Get inside, he said when the lock dilated. The landing craft will scarcely outlive the vessel that birthed it. Han and Leia helped their daughter into the Yorick Trima. Then Han reappeared, blaster in hand, to usher his son aboard. He stood at the lock for a long moment, coming to his own decision. Noma Nor watched Han's jaw bunch with fury, then relax. In the end, Han lowered his blaster and gestured for Noma Nor to enter the craft. Instead, Noma Nor took a backward step and shook his head. If I'm clear on one point, it's this. I want no part of whatever new order is in the making. I will die here with Onimi, for we have been two of a kind from the start. With that, he shoved Han back through the lock and pressed his right hand to the bulkhead, launching the craft into space. Nas Choka paced back and forth in front of Yamka's transparency, his troubled gaze fixed on Shimra's vessel as it climbed out of Yuzhan Tar's reach in fits and starts. Ral Roost wallows in our sights, the tactician reported. Shimra approaches, the Supreme Commander said from beneath his cognition hood, though he still refrains from communicating with us. Nas Choka traded glances with the tactician before replying. Give him time. He had no sooner swung back to the transparency to track the vessel's course than it began to stutter in flight and enter into an end-over-end -end roll. The Dovin Basil has failed, the commander shouted. The vessel is dismembering. Nas Choka wanted to tear his eyes away but couldn't. Atmosphere and other gases were beginning to puff and stream from fractures in the vessel's hull. Fluids leaked from the Dovin Basil blastulas trailing behind like frozen streamers. Vital components shut down and went spinning off into space. Broadening and deepening, the fissures joined, creating a network of cracks, from which hunks of Yorick coral began to tumble. Then, just at the leading edge of the planetary flotilla, Shimra's coffer exploded, sundering like a disintegrated planet and loosing a shock wave that crippled countless war vessels before it dispersed. A fearful silence descended on Yamka's command chamber. For a long moment, Nas Choka could only gape in incredulity at what had occurred. Never in their long history had the Yuzhan Vong been without a supreme overlord, their holy intercessor. Despite the success at Zonama Seacote, the Armada was nothing without Shimra. They had been cut off from the divine, deprived of any means of appealing to Yun Yuzhan or Yun Yamka for guidance or support. What had lighted the Yuzhan Vong universe had been extinguished. Truly the gods had abandoned the Yuzhan Vong and allied with the infidels. 
they had withdrawn their guardianship of Shimra, and the Yuzhan Vong had become shamed ones, rejected, passed over, a hopeless, godless species. Defeated. Nas Choka could feel the expectant gazes of his commanders and subalterns. He grasped the question implied by every look. The question every Yuzhan Vong on or off Coruscant was asking. Is there purpose to fighting to the death without any hope for salvation in the afterlife? Nas Choka marshaled his pride and moved to the Villop choir. All supreme commanders, he told the Villop mistress. Then, when the Villops had taken on the likenesses of his chief subordinates, he said, The war is ended. We are defeated by the gods and by their allies. Though they have abandoned us, we will suffer our defeat with honor, because it is what the gods would expect. But any of you who wish to follow the Supreme Overlord's example and die as warriors may do so just as any of you who wish to commit ritual death may do so. Those who choose neither will join me in accepting the shame of surrender and finding what nobility we can in capture and graceless execution. Rushhawk, Ichnar, Vinimhawk Even while the vessel's supreme commander, chief tactician, and priest were opening themselves with kufis, Nas Choka moved back to the transparency. Across the entire embattled face of Yuzhan Tar, of Coruscant, coral skippers, pickets, and cruisers were veering into collision courses with Alliance ships. Errant Venture hung over Zonama Seacoat like a freshly forged spearpoint, her blazing turbolasers providing cover fire for the modified shuttles, yachts, and blockade runners that plummeted from the forward launching bay. On detecting the smugglers' ships, the coral skippers that had been harassing the Star Destroyer regrouped and set after what must have seemed like more assailable prey. Lady Luck had been first out of the bay, with Wildcard close behind. In the cockpit of the Soro Sub yacht, Lando and Tendra were busy at separate tasks when Talon calmed them. Two skips on your starboard, he warned. Got em, Lando said into his headset mic. He nodded for Tendra to raise the yacht's rear deflector screen. If you two would allow me the honor. No need to stand on ceremony, Talon. Lando pushed the control yoke away from him, dropping Lady Luck into Zonama Seacoat's gravity well. The ship bucked and began to vibrate as the atmosphere thickened. Tendra called a starboard view to the console displays in time to see angry bursts of laser fire spew from the Corellian Transport's triple batteries. Struck full force, the lead coral skipper farthest from Lady Luck crumbled. The second skip slewed hard to port in an effort to come alongside the yacht, but Wildcard's follow-up bursts caught the enemy vessel while it was still outside the yacht's shields, and it too disintegrated. We owe you one, Lando said. Actually, that's two, Talon replied, but who's counting? Tendra eased the angle of the yacht's descent and set a course for the middle distance. By approaching from the east, they could avoid the hail of plasma missiles that were pounding the central canyon. The adjusted course took Lady Luck, Wildcard, and some of the other rescue craft almost directly beneath Jade Shadow. While it remained in stationary orbit, Mara's ship had sustained heavy damage. Below, youthful mountains poked from opaque white clouds, their flanks and foothills cloaked with unspoiled boris. To the west, the forest was interrupted by expanses of grasslands. Where those ended, the virgin terrain undulated, rose again to lofty heights, then angled down toward the central canyon, which was blanketed in layers of thick smoke. Toning proximity alarms told Lando and Tendra that Lady Luck had attracted the attention of some of the coral skippers that were strafing the canyon and surrounding woodlands. Four skips were already climbing out of the smoke to welcome the yacht to the fight. Talon, we might need your help again, Lando started to say, when two of the coral skippers were cracked open and knocked out of the sky by laser fire. The trailing pair deployed singularities, but the shields bought them mere moments of refuge before proton torpedoes blew them apart. An instant later, two red X-wings streaked past Lady Luck from astern, banking broadly to the south, before coming about to assume the same approach vector the smugglers were taking.
Lando opened a channel to the starfighters. Thanks from Lady Luck for clearing the way. Red two at your service, a familiar voice responded. Wedge, Lando said around a broad grin. How much grease did it take to get you installed in that snub fighter? Less than half what it took at the start of this war. Yeah, I suppose we're all back to fighting trim. Tendra stretched out her left hand and patted Lando's slight paunch. He means most of us, she said into her headset. Lando cocked an eyebrow at his wife and said, Where's that poisoned vessel, Wedge? Tell your scanners to look due north-northwest. Tendra tasked the instruments to provide a close-up view. Defended by a ring of eight coral skippers, the six-armed slayer's vessel was swooping down toward the south rim of the canyon. As many Red Squadron X-Wings were in close pursuit, needling the enemy with lasers and torps. But instead of answering them with plasma missiles, the skips were devoting all their power to fashioning shielding singularities to protect the poisoned craft. All the levity had left Wedge's voice when he said, There's no stopping it now. Lady Luck's proximity alarms began to blare again. Lando watched the friend or foe identifier cycle in apparent bewilderment, then he glanced around the sky. Wedge, our scanners are showing unfriendlies, but they're not registering as skips. Because they're not, Wedge said flatly, whatever they are. They're rising out of the forests. Hundreds of them. Lando leaned toward the forward viewport. A swarm of insectile ships showing green wings and red carapaces was corkscrewing up toward the Smuggler's Alliance ships. As they drew nearer, singularities formed to both sides of Lady Luck. The yacht pitched violently to port and began to slide for the surface. Lando lifted his hands from the control yoke and turned to his wife in wide-eyed confusion. "'That's not me piloting,' he calmed Wedge. "'We're caught up in some kind of tractor beam.' It's dragging us down. Wish I could help, Wed said a moment later. But they've got me too. Corrin had been the first to spot the ships, or creatures, rise from the Tom Posse east of the canyon. He, Kip, Lobaka, Silgal, and the rest of the downed Jedi pilots were gathered on the landing platform now, watching the red and green craft dart through the sky like maiden flies, making use of grasper claws and dovin basil-like gravitic anomalies to bring down Red Squadron starfighters and Smuggler's Alliance ships alike. A few kilometers east of where the Jedi were grouped, Lady Luck, Wild Card, and two X-Wings were descending to treetop level. We don't know what they are, Lando, Corrin was saying into his comlink. We've never seen them before. Another of Seacoat's surprises, Talon added to the conversation. Here's a piece of good news, Kip interrupted. He pointed to the southern sky. Seacoat's chasing the skips, too. The southern sky was a frenzy of insectile craft. But unlike the Alliance ships, the coral skippers were not going quietly to ground, and many of the swift darters were being annihilated by plasma missiles. A sudden growl from Lobaka brought everyone about face to see Danny Quee and Magister Jabitha approaching the landing platform trailed by a crowd of perhaps one hundred wary pharaohans who had emerged from the shelters. Kip met the two women halfway. You spoke with Seacoat? he asked Danny. Her yes was breathy with awe, but she offered nothing more. Corin looked hard at Jabitha. Who's piloting the insect craft? Seacoat, the magister said. Corin gave his head a confused shake. I thought the idea was to keep the fight from the surface. Only until Seacoat was ready to launch the grappler ships, Danny explained at last. Seacoat's promise to Jason was that the planet would only fight without fighting. She saw from the expressions that greeted her that she'd open the floodgates. Seacoat is only interested in welcoming the Yuzhan Vong home. Home? Corn and Kip said at the same time. There wasn't time for further explanation. Dozens of coral skippers were being hauled down into the Boris by grappler ships, all except for the poisoned vessel, which six unpiloted insectile craft were tugging back up the gravity well. The Jedi, Danny, Jabitha, and some of the Pharaohans hurried into the forest to be on hand when the coral skippers landed.
Two kilometers along, the ragtag group was joined by Lando, Tendra, Talon, Shada, Wedge, and several other Red Squadron and Smugglers Alliance pilots. Running at the head of the pack, Kip and Corrin ignited their lightsabers as soon as they saw the coral skippers and grapplers drifting down between the massive trunks of the balloon-leafed Boris. The first of the coral skippers settled into the loamy shade like sculptures in a garden. Dovin basils housed in the blunt noses of the vessels sent slender blue-veined feeders into the soft ground. In response, creepers and vines writhed to touch the coarse hulls of the skips. Some writhed into the seams that defined the edges of the mica canopies and popped them open. Shucking out of their cognition hoods, four Yuzhan Vong leapt from the cockpit cavities, brandishing short amphistaffs. The Jedi stepped in to engage them, but stopped short when they saw the amphistaffs slip from the hands of the enemy pilots and slither off into the lush woodland. Breather masks and shoulder-borne tactical villops dropped from the pilots like ripe seed pods. Two dozen thud bugs burst from one pilot's bandolier and took to the treetops. The Yuzhan Vong gazed at the Jedi like bewildered children. Caught between worlds, unacquainted with surrender, they did as they had seen their captives do and fell to their knees, their heads bowed in disgrace and their wrists pressed to their opposite shoulders. Kip was the first to deactivate his lightsaber. The rest followed. Silgal loosed a joyful exhale and put her arm around Danny's waist. These warriors will be the first converts, she said. This ground will become a hallowed place. Transfixed by the scene, Kip clapped his hand on Corin's shoulder and muttered, A world has been saved from destruction. Dying rapidly, the Yorick Trema was no longer accelerating but tumbling through space. Whatever flora was responsible for providing breathable atmosphere was failing, as the interior walls bioluminescent lichen already had. It doesn't want to respond to me, Jaina said from the controls. The hull's transparency was filmed by a thickening cataract, but Han and Leia could still discern the distinctive shape of the Millennium Falcon, racing to come alongside, escorted by two battle-scarred X-Wings. Come on, Mara, Han said through gritted teeth. Use the tractor beam. That won't help, Jaina said, as she tugged the flimsy cognition hood from her head. Our only chance is to get aboard the Falcon. Her eyes roamed over the irregularly pulsing control console. There's just enough life left in this ship for it to extend an umbilical. Oh, no, Han muttered. Not again. Jaina tweaked one of the organiform control arms that grew from the console. Accompanied by wet, squishy sounds, the central section of the craft's cramped deck softened, and an osmotic membrane began to form. Han glanced at the expanding circle in growing dismay, imagining the craft's intestine-like coffer dam flailing in space as it attempted to vacuum seal against the Falcon's portside docking ring or dorsal hatch. Abruptly, the freighter snagged the Yorick Trema, stopping it from tumbling. The deck membrane irised open, and a nauseating odor invaded the cabin space. Han clamped his right hand over his mouth. How do we know the umbilical's properly sealed against the hatch? It's not the tightest fit, Dad, Jaina said, but it's one we can survive. Jason peered into the confined, throbbing tube. Guess we're going to have to crawl. Han's face fell. Ah, this is too much, even for me. Leia glanced at him. I'll go first, if it'll make you feel better. Only thing that's going to make me feel better is an EVA suit. Leia stroked his whiskered face. Be brave, darling. Lowering herself to the deck, she wormed through the membrane and began to elbow crawl through the tube. Han took a deep breath and followed, his hands disappearing to the wrist and the slime that covered the floor. Two minutes later, Leia disappeared from view, and Han's hands touched the comforting solidity of the Falcon's airlock. One by one, coated with slime and reeking of putrid organics, the four of them squeezed into the freighter's portside docking arm, where Kenth, Harar, C-3PO, and R2-D2 were waiting. Oh my, the protocol droid said. I'll activate the sonic shower at once. R2-D2 rocked on his feet, whistling and tooting. 
No sooner had Kenth dogged the hatch than Mara came running through the forward compartment, calling over her shoulder to Tahiri and the Nogri that everyone was safely aboard. "'Where's Uncle Luke?' Jason asked. Mara grabbed him by the arm and hauled him into the aft cabin space where Luke was laid out on one of the small sleeping platforms. Han, Leia, and Jaina crowded in behind them. Jason kneeled by the bed and carefully removed the dressing Kent had placed over the deep puncture wound in the left side of Luke's chest. Luke's face and hands were white. His lips and the beds of his fingernails were slightly blue. His eyes were closed and his breathing was shallow. Shimmerous Amphistaph, Mara said anxiously. Jason looked up at her and nodded. I saw him get stabbed. Mara pressed her hands to her eyes and began to cry. Jason took her tear-moistened hands in his and brought them to Luke's chest wound. He held them there for a long moment, removing his hands only once to convey some of his own tears to Luke's wound. Luke's chest heaved as he took a sharp inhalation and his eyelids fluttered open. Sobbing openly, Mara laid her head on his chest, and slowly Luke's left hand rose to caress her red-gold hair. I'll live, my love, he said weakly. Leia kneeled down to wrap her arms around her son and Mara and cry with them. Swallowing the lump in his throat, Han put his arm around Jaina's shoulders, then the two of them all but fell on top of Leia and Jason. C-3PO and R2-D2 appeared at the hatch in time to see the Skywalkers and Solos in a weeping tangle. The astromech made a fluting sound that was at once rejoicing and forlorn. I know, R2, C-3PO said quietly. There are few occasions when I envy humans, but this is certainly one of them. Part 4. The New Order Chapter 43 Two meters above the ground, the military speeder twisted through the ruins of the sacred precinct, closing on operational headquarters at the northern edge of what had been, only two years earlier, the legislative district. Admiral Crefe perched on the back of the rear seat, his snow-white fur rippling in the wind and his short command cloak snapping behind him like a flag. To either side of him sat his Bothan aides. A human lieutenant had the repulsor craft's controls, and beside him was a Twi'lek gunner, her hands on the trigger mechanism of a front-mounted repeating blaster. A torrential rain had just ended, and the winding paths the Yuzhan Vong called streets were running with water. The speeder shot past columns of drenched infantry soldiers with mud caked like clay to their boots or bare legs. If nothing else, the rain had washed some of the cinder and Yorick coral grit from the air. Crefe had never evinced a great fondness for Coruscant, but it was only fitting that he tour the prize that had cost the Alliance so many lives. Estimates of battle casualties put the number of dead at close to five million, with twice that number of wounded. More than three hundred capital ships had been destroyed, along with some eleven thousand starfighters. The death toll for the entire war was almost incalculable, though the figure most often quoted was 365 trillion. Now that Seen Sav had designated Generals Farlander and Bell Iblis as occupation commanders, Trefe anticipated that he would be shuttling back to Raal Roost before nightfall. With the shattered Yuzhan Vong armada still arrayed two million kilometers away, Alliance battle groups remained anchored above Coruscant. When it had finally come, the ceasefire had had less to do with loss of discipline or coordination among the enemy than something closer to loss of hope, to a palpable sense of desperation and gloom. In the aftermath of Shimra's death, hundreds of vessels had self-destructed or hurled themselves against Alliance ships as living missiles. Other vessels had deserted, jumping to hyperspace for star systems yet unknown. With hundreds of functional Dovin basils continuing to deploy shielding singularities, Alliance landing craft and shuttles were being forced to adhere to strict descent corridors. Even so, the sky above the sacred precinct was filled with relief and patrol ships, and more were coming down the well every hour. 
orphan Coruscanti of diverse species lined the boggy byways and stood dozens deep at makeshift medical stations, supply depots, and identity verification centers. As Crefe's convoy of speeders made their way south from Westport, humanoids and aliens would turn to welcome the liberator of Coruscant with waves, cheers, and sloppy salutes. Squads of commandos were on foot patrol in all quarters, performing structure-to-structure -structure searches and controlling looting by Coruscanti and Yuzhan Vong alike. Heretics who had joined the resistance were acting as interpreters and wranglers of creatures capable of ferreting out spies and impostors wearing Ooglith maskers. Enemy weapons were heaped at each corner, awaiting cremation by aged AT-AT walkers and flamethrowers. YVH droids rolled and crawled like tunnel rats through warrens exposed by massive demolition and excavation machines. Elsewhere, teams of specialists were busy erecting temporary communications facilities to uplink with satellites already in orbit. Galactic Alliance flags had been raised at what was left of the truncated citadel, on the Yorick Coral Dome that capped the Well of the World brain, and atop other captured landmarks, but fierce fighting persisted in some districts that were without Villop communication and had yet to learn of Shimra's death. To complicate matters, the sacred precinct had been partitioned into more than a dozen occupation zones, each overseen by a different species. Everyone was working toward the common goal of pacification, but because of the vast amounts of technology that lay buried under the thick vegetation, some claim staking was inevitable. Tinged with sadness and misgiving, Crefe's gold-flecked eyes took everything in as the speeder rounded the mounds of debris and whizzed across the temporary bridges that spanned Coruscant's abysmal canyons. This is the prize we're going to present to the Alliance members as a sign that life can now begin to return to normal? The strangest sight he had seen, stranger than the groves of alien trees, the Ungdins sopping spilled blood from the streets, the Adats standing shoulder to shoulder with six-legged Yuzhan Vong beasts, was Grand Admiral Gilad Pelion and six of his Imperial officers touring the area where the Imperial Palace had once stood. One-time enemies, now unequivocal allies. Thousands of prisoners were being held at what the Yuzhan Vong had called the Place of Bones, but thousands more had escaped into the wilderness the planet had become. On the other side of Coruscant, entire battalions were dug in. The commanders of those units were said to have vowed that they would fight to the last, and Crefe saw no reason to doubt them. Questions and concerns tormented him. What was to be done with the heretics and the shamed ones? the non-combatants and the children, the world brain, the roving beasts, and the other biotes. Several chief commanders were already advocating that Coruscant be defoliated entirely. Others wanted to preserve some of the planet's new look, and still others wished to see the former galactic capital transformed into a kind of memorial, joining the ranks of Ithor, Barab One, New Plimpto, and other worlds. So despite the cheers and welcoming waves, Crefe didn't feel like a liberator, much less a hero. At least not yet. The Bothan Declaration of Arcry, Total War, meant just that, and his species was going to expect him to take the lead in pushing for extermination of the Yuzhan Vong. But the Alliance's chief commanders were hardly in accord on that matter, and now that a ceasefire seemed to be in effect, the politicians were eager to wrest control of the situation from the military. Crefe had long thought of Chief of State Cal Omis as an honest and honorable human. But as well-meaning as Omis was, he didn't always see reason. It scarcely helped that his very influential advisory council included six Jedi, a Kamasi, and a Wookiee. With everyone weighing in, it could take months or even years to reach a consensus regarding a final solution to the long war. The skimmer came to a rest in front of Alliance headquarters, an example of Old Republic classic architecture that had been partly released from its mantle of vegetation by lasers and missiles, 
Trees were still rooted in the roof, and vines dangled over the ornate columns and shattered window openings. Crefe strode briskly past logistics officers and communications specialists, analysts and slicers, protocol and mouse droids. Ultimately, his aides escorted him into a debris-filled room that was being readied for General Farlander. A hollow projector occupied the center of the cleared space, and in the blue cone emanating from the table stood half-sized holograms of Seen Sav and Cal Omis. For much of the battle for Coruscant, elected officials had been on the move, in and out of hyperspace. But for the past four days, Omis and the others had taken refuge on Contrum. Congratulations, Admiral Crefe, Omis said. Thanks to you, we have reclaimed our capital. Such as it is, Crefe said. Sav made a sound of agreement, then said, Nevertheless, your efforts are appreciated by one and all. What is the situation there, Triest? We're on the verge of turning a hopeless situation into an impossible one. Any change in the disposition of the enemy vessels? None. Any overtures by Nas Choka? Crefe forced an exhale. Much of the fight has been bled from the space-born warriors, but we've received no word from Nas Choka. He recalled the dregs of his Muscave and Zonama seacoat flotillas, but has neither advanced on Coruscant nor withdrawn. What do you suppose they're waiting for, Triest? They've never suffered a defeat, let alone had to deal with the sudden death of their supreme overlord. Normally, there would have been a pool of candidates, one of whom would have been chosen by the priests and shapers to accede to the throne. The elite would have been guided by signs and portents, and any potential successor would have to have demonstrated certain abilities. But it's all moot, because Shimra apparently saw to it that no one was standing in the royal wings. With Shimra and High Prefect Drothul dead, Nas Choka is the highest-ranking elite. But in fact, he wields no more real power than High Priest Jakan and Master Shaper Kila Quad, both of whom we have in custody. A scramble for power had broken out among some of the lesser prefects and consuls, but it's unlikely that any of them will be officially recognized as an heir apparent. What's more, the heretics, along with many of the shamed ones, seem to be looking to us for rescue, protection, even redemption of some sort. Sav took a moment to absorb Crefe's remarks. Should Nas Choka break the ceasefire and advance, are our fleets in a position to prevail? Probably, Crefe said, though at considerable cost. Do you wish to press an attack? Omis asked carefully. Crefe shook his head. Not at this point. Until this morning, we had no means of communicating with Nas Choka but we've finally been able to persuade the supreme commander of the enemy home fleet to act as our liaison with the War Master, commencing with Villop transmissions. Would a full surrender be too much to hope for, Admiral? Omis asked. Crefe touched his face in a gesture of uncertainty. As I say, sir, the Yuzhan Vong have no protocols for surrender. They're expecting us to behave as they would under similar circumstances, by executing most of them and enslaving the rest. Omus frowned. All these years of fighting, and they still don't understand us. He paused, then said, Admiral, you face the daunting task of convincing your commanders that there is nothing to be gained by exterminating the Yuzhan Vong. Crefe compressed his lips. Sir, after the barbarity the enemy has visited on us for five years, many local commanders won't be willing to put aside vengeance for compassion. But perhaps some will, and in time others may follow. By the same token, it may prove impossible to convince the Yuzhan Vong on occupied worlds to capitulate without a fight. Word of Shimra's death 
is being relayed by Villip to planets throughout the invasion corridor. In several star systems, the Yuzhan Vong are already decamping. But we have our work cut out for us regardless. So Nama Sikot survived the battle? Sav said. Kreefe snorted. I would say triumphed, though I failed to realize it at the time. The entire battle for Coruscant turned on that planet. If for whatever reason the Yuzhan Vong hadn't been so intent on destroying it, well, let it suffice to say that we might not be having this conversation. We've heard rumors, Oma said, that there was a second supreme overlord, a power behind the throne, as it were. Crefe nodded. I've heard those same rumors, but they have yet to be corroborated by anyone. There's also talk about a vessel contaminated with Alpha Red. That happens to be fact, sir. The vessel was one that escaped from Kalula. The Yuzhan Vong attempted but failed to deploy the bioweapon against Zonama Seacoat. Allegedly, it has been tractor-beamed into deep space. We have ships searching for it, if only to establish whether the toxin remains virulent. Stay on that, Admiral, Omas said. Crefe nodded again. Sir, assuming a surrender is forthcoming, have you chosen someone to negotiate the terms? Many are urging me to solicit the assistance of the Jedi. Crefe's face twisted. Is that wise, sir? In light of Master Skywalker's statement at Contrum, that he would consider giving Coruscant to the Yuzhan Vong if he thought that would end the war? Omus laughed shortly. I never took Skywalker's remark at face value, but we do need to reach a decision regarding Coruscant's importance in the scheme of things. Perhaps the fact that we reclaimed it will be sufficient to serve as a symbol of our unity. With all due respect, sir, Crefe said evenly, we can't allow the Yuzhan Vong to keep even a square kilometer of Coruscant. Even if we can't reoccupy the planet for a hundred years, Coruscant is essential to the stability of the Alliance. No species will rest comfortably with the Yuzhan Vong imprisoned at the center of our galaxy. Coruscant must be seen as a symbol that not only have we prevailed, but also that the threat has passed and order has been restored. I concur, Admiral, Omus replied in the same even tone. But we're going to have to do something with the Yuzhan Vong. Something more than disarm them and send them back into the intergalactic void. I suspect that they would sooner fight to the death than return there, Crefe said. In any event, we haven't ships enough to escort them from the galaxy. Some have suggested imprisoning them aboard their own ships, Sav said. Crefe grimaced. The warriors, perhaps, but do we also imprison every female, every child, every shamed one? Wouldn't we be sentencing them to a lingering death rather than an expedient one? Omas heaved a sigh. Those I trust to safeguard our financial health may not warm to the idea of spending trillions of credits to imprison warriors who are beyond being rehabilitated. Crefe turned slightly to face Omus's image. Sir, will you consider establishing a war crimes commission? Such a commission is under consideration, Admiral. But who would you have us bring to trial? We could begin with Nas Choka. Sav shook his head. We're going to need him if we hope to subjugate the warrior caste. Try Nas Choka, and you will have that fight to the death. I agree with Admiral Sav, Omas said. Shimra is dead, as are Savong La, Nom Anor, most of the Peace Brigade. More to the point, how do we separate the war criminals from the religious zealots? Should we attempt to root out those commanders responsible for attacking refugee ships? or perhaps those who were directly responsible for the deaths of hundreds of millions of hostages at Coruscant. They're all guilty, the entire species. 
we may as well start with their gods if we're going to initiate criminal proceedings. Crefay allowed the silence to linger for some time, then said, Sir, we still have Alpha Red. Omus nodded solemnly. I respect your courage in being the first to broach the subject, Admiral, but Alpha Red is no longer an option. Use of the bioweapon isn't a decision one person, three, or even a hundred can make. I promise, however, to discuss all other matters with the members of my advisory council. Crefe swallowed hard. May some wisdom accrue from it. If jubilant celebrations were taking place on many worlds, stars were the only lights in Zonama Seacoat's night sky, and by day only the remote disk that was Coruscant System's primary. It's getting colder, Luke said, as he and Harar followed Jason through the Boris. Most of the energy Seacoat dedicated to keeping the planet warm was diverted to the mountaintop defenses. Zonama can't remain in this orbit for much longer not without risk to the forests. Perhaps that's what Seacoat wishes to discuss, Harar said, inserting Zonama into a more nourishing orbit. Jason glanced over his shoulder at the priest. We'll know soon enough. The reflecting pool isn't much farther. Jason had mentioned the pool several times, though Luke had never been there and was eager to see it. The suggestion to assemble at the pool had been Seacoat's, relayed through Magister Jabitha, who had visited Luke in his and Mara's cliffside dwelling. Luke felt as if he had done little more than sleep since arriving on Zonama Seacoat a week earlier in the Millennium Falcon. While Jason had been successful in neutralizing most of the venom delivered by Shimra's Amphistaff, Luke knew that he was not yet completely healed and might never be. His body was gaining strength daily, and he was able to keep up with his nephew and Harar on the undulating path, but his physiology had been altered by the venom, and he was compelled to draw subtly on the force to sustain himself. Perhaps it would just be a matter of time until his body dealt with the vestiges of the venom, but he suspected that the damage had been done in the first instance of his being pierced by the serpent-like weapon. As had been the case with Mara, healing tears could only do so much. He realized that the battle in Shimra's bunker had brought him very close to the dark side, whose venom was every bit as potent as that of the royal Amphistaff. But he had no regrets about having skirted that razor's edge, and knew in his heart that he would have walked even closer to the edge to safeguard Jason or Jaina. What troubled him was that they, too, appeared to have suffered as a result of their confrontation with Onimi, Supreme Overlord Onimi. Several of the Jedi and the Pharaohans had already remarked to Luke in private that Jason looked older, and just that morning Luke had heard whispered exchanges regarding Jaina's sudden and uncharacteristic gravity. Neither Leia nor Han had said anything to Luke, though their concern was evident. But then, who hadn't been affected in some fashion by the events that had unfolded on Coruscant and Zonama Seacoat? The planet itself had been damaged, chiefly in the middle distance, where the Pharaohans were doing what they could to rebuild their homes and nurse the Boris back to health, the frosty conditions notwithstanding. Most of the several dozen Yuzhan Vong warriors who had been hauled to the surface were traumatized. After some effort, Harar had talked them into leaving the place where their coral skippers had been set down, but they remained confused as to whether they were prisoners or guests. The presence of the Jedi had confirmed their worst fear, the one the heretics had embraced, that the gods had allied with the Jedi to obliterate the Yuzhan Vong. And yet a few of the warriors had undergone what amounted to conversion experiences espousing to their humbled comrades that they could feel the gods in the sweet taste of Zonama's water, in the soil under their feet, on the wind, and inhabiting the giant Boris. To them the living world was a paradise regained, and they had urged Luke to recount that to the Yuzhan Vong elite should he decide to agree to mediating the surrender, as the leaders of the Alliance wished. We're here, Jason announced suddenly. 
he led Luke and Harar onto an intersecting trail that descended a short but steep slope, ending at a tranquil pool fringed with ice and surrounded by towering boris. Luke had expected to meet only with a thought projection of Seacote, perhaps Anakin or Verger. But instead Jabitha was there, having somehow arrived first by some other path from the canyon. Some of what I wish to say you must have guessed by now, Seacote said through Jabitha, as Luke, Jason, and Harar were approaching the edge of the pool, especially regarding the Yuzhan Vong. You told Danny that you wanted to welcome them home, Luke said. Were you suggesting that Zonama is actually their primordial homeworld? Much as I evolved from the consciousness that presided there, the consciousness of my parent, Zonama is a seed of Yuzhan Tar, the world that birthed the Yuzhan Vong and became the template for their gods. I wanted to believe, Harar said in astonishment, but I didn't dare. Where is Yuzhan Tar now? Jason asked. I hope in time to be able to answer that question. I suspect, though, that it was destroyed by its symbionts, by the species that became the Yuzhan Vong, in retribution for what my parent did to them, casting them out, severing its connection to them, stripping them of the Force, all as a consequence of their hunger for violence and conquest, which had been awakened by a single confrontation with a warfaring race. I further suspect that without my parent they were unable to move beyond the biotechnology they were given, or stole. In need of a guiding consciousness, they created a pantheon of gods, to whom they ascribed the powers that were once the province of the living world of Yuzhan Tar. The empty eighth cortex, Harar mumbled. The shapers accepted that they shouldn't create new biotes, when in fact... They couldn't. Jabitha Seacote continued. Evidently, before my parent died, it dispatched the seed of the world that would come to be called Zonama Seacote, and the seed drifted to this galaxy, took root, and grew. For untold generations I lay dormant in Zonama, while the Yuzhan Vong plundered the home galaxy, and were forced at last to embark on the search for a new home, carried on the same currents that brought Zonama Seacote here. Then those I originally knew as the far outsiders appeared, not by coincidence, but drawn genetically to Zonama Seacote, much as a creature finds its way home, as occurred a second time in the unknown regions. Jabitha looked at Harar. It's possible, too, that I called out to you. Welcoming us home, Harar said, only to be attacked again. Jabitha nodded. The unprovoked attack by the far outsiders stirred something in me. Counter to the teachings of the leaders of the Potentium, I became aware of the existence of evil. In a sense, evil helped give birth to my awareness. Now I understand that the acts of the far outsiders may have been nothing more than a reawakening of the evil my parent experienced when its symbionts used its creations not merely to defend Yuzhan Tar, but to launch an era of bloodshed that resulted in the death of countless worlds, along with many latent planetary consciousnesses. But I did not pursue those stirrings, those suspicions, until Zonama became lost in the unknown regions, and through Nenyim and Harar, I comprehended that the Yuzhan Vong had been stripped of the Force. My most grave misgivings were confirmed when I learned of the bioweapon that was being hurled at Zonama. I understood that a cycle of violence was being perpetrated, and that I had to make a critical decision. There was no right or wrong way to decide. There was only my choice and its consequences. I could have accepted the Alpha Red, ending my participation in the cycle, or I could have sent it back at the Yuzhan Vong, 
ending their participation. In the end, I elected to sue for peace. On Coruscant, Jason said, when I reached out for you with my Vong sense, I sensed your conflict. What are the consequences of your choice? Luke asked. Jabitha's gaze fell on him. I will tell you. Nas Choka sat stoically on the acceleration couch of the Alliant shuttle that was conveying him and five of his supreme commanders toward the gaping docking bay of Ral Roost. He wore an unadorned tunic, trousers, headcloth, and pectoral. Only the command cloak that hung from his shoulder horns distinguished him from his subordinates. And like them, his frame was thinner after long days of fasting, and his cheeks, lips, and arms bore fresh bloodletting cuts. The world again known as Coruscant dominated the view through the shuttle's starboard transparency, and between the planet and Rao Roost floated hundreds of warships, dispersed to protect Coruscant against a surprise attack by the warriors who had once taken and occupied it. Nas Choka considered how easy it might have been to launch a final onslaught and perish in the blaze of glory the Alliance certainly expected. But what glory could be derived from a battle the gods had no interest in supporting? No, while the reason for the gods' abrupt abandonment of the Yuzhan Vong was unknown, it was clear that they desired something other than sacrificial blood. Unless it was the blood of the Yuzhan Vong they craved. Did the fault lie with Shimra for having usurped the throne from Quariel, or perhaps for having failed to heed the prophecies regarding the living world of Zonama Seacote? And yet, if all Yuzhan Vong were to be punished for Shimra's pride, why hadn't the gods allowed them to be wiped out by the Alliance, or killed by the very bioweapon Shimra had sent against Zonama Seacote? It was because these questions remained unanswered that Nas Choka and his commanders had submitted without protest or anger to personal searches by teams of distrustful alliance warriors, and why they sat impassively now. The only item Nas Choka had been allowed to retain was his Tsaisi, his baton of rank, which he would present to the alliance's chief commanders before requesting that he be allowed to end his own life. Raul Roos' tractor beam conducted the shuttle through an invisible field and allowed it to berth. Released from their harnesses, the captives were escorted down the ship's ramp and toward an area of the vast hold where no less than five hundred Alliance officers and officials stood at attention behind a semicircular arrangement of tables and chairs. The sterility of the huge space chilled Nas Choka to the bone. The scrubbed air had an unpleasant tang. The intense yellow-white light gave every object a sharp aspect. The smooth deck was uncompromising. The ceiling was a chaos of girders and ducts. Hundreds of starfighters rested on their hard stands, and droids shuffled about like slaves. A mixed-species orchestra assaulted the captives with martial music, and an artificial breeze tugged at flags representative of some of the galaxy's species, several of which had been vanquished by Nas Choka himself. Humans and others documented the occasion with holocams and other recording devices. Though much of the meaning was lost on him, Nas Choka recognized the display as pageant and ritual pomp and circumstance. Sav and Crefe were determined to put on a grand show. The open end of the half-circle of tables faced a row of six chairs, atop which Nas Choka and his commanders were obviously meant to sit. Interpreters, alliance species and Yuzhan Vong heretics, by the look of them, were standing by to make certain that everyone understood one another. When the fanfare ended, the officers and officials seated themselves. At the semicircle's apex sat white-furred Crefe and big-eared Sav, along with several human commanders Nas Choka recognized from intelligence reports. Pelion, Brand, Bel Iblis, Farlander, Antilles, Raikin, Selchu, Davip, and the Hapen Queen Tenel Ka, who was a Jedi as well. 
Alliance intendants were scattered, but close to the military commanders sat Cal Omus and his principal advisors. The Wookiee named Trebok, the Gotal named Talam Ranth, the lank human director of intelligence Diff Scour, and the golden-furred Kamasi named Reliki whose intendant father had been ritually killed at Dubrillion by Commander Shadao Shai. The Jedi, in cloaks so homespun that they might have been made by shamed ones, had an arc of the half-circle to themselves. Conspicuous among the three human males was Luke Skywalker, the killer of Shimra. The two seated next to him had the look of warriors. The only other human was a dark-haired female— who struck Nas Choka as more intendant than warrior. The remaining pair of Jedi were non-humanoid females, a Barabel who might have been at home among the Chazrock, and a Mon Calamari, whose long head brought to mind that of a Yuzhan Vong beast of burden. Occupying the distal end of the Ark's left curve sat Jakan, Harar, Hila Quad, and several lesser priests, shapers, and intendants. When the captives had been positioned in front of their rigid chairs, Nas Choka waved for his commanders to be seated and stepped forward. The dread moment had arrived. Proffering his baton of rank, he dropped to one knee. In surrendering this, he said in basic, we surrender ourselves. It was a historic utterance, and every Yuzhan Vong in the docking bay loyal and heretic alike, inhaled sharply and with purpose. I ask only that I be allowed to be the first to die, by my own kufi. Rise, war master, Sav said. We understand that honor attends such actions, but that cannot be permitted here. Still kneeling, Nas Choka regarded him in confusion. Then appoint any warrior you see fit to kill me. Saab shook his tiny head. There will be no executions, War Master. Nas Choka gritted his teeth and came to his feet. So you mean to enslave us, as we did the Chazrak? In place of coral seeds, you will implant us with devices that will control. War Master, Jakan cut him off. Hold your reply until all has been laid before you. Great things are still expected of you, Harar added. Nas Choka glared at the priest. This from a defector? Harar made no effort to parry the accusation. What I did, War Master, I did for all of us. Nas Choka made a chopping motion with his right hand. I no longer wear that title, priest. If we are neither to be executed nor enslaved, what would the Alliance do with us? This bold new order holds no place for the warrior caste. He turned to Skywalker. The Jedi are warriors. What will you do without war? Skywalker rose from his chair. From the start, you've mistaken us for warriors, when we are nothing more than the guardians of peace and justice. You could be that as well, Nas Choka, though it would require that you adapt your battle traditions to a new form. He held up his lightsaber and ignited the blade. This was once a weapon. Nas Choka laughed ruefully. Thousands of my warriors would willingly attest to the fact that it is a weapon still. Skywalker acknowledged the remark with a nod. In peaceful times, it is only a symbol of the fight we wage with ourselves, to keep us from taking the wrong path. Nas Choka lifted his chin. We have always acted in accord with the warrior decree. We accept that, Skywalker said, but you're going to have to learn to do without many of the biotes that defined you as warriors. Name them Jedi. Your amphistaffs and kufis. Your blorash and fire jelly. Your thud bugs, razor bugs, and plasma eels. Your vessels and war coordinators. In exchange for what? Digging implements and plows? That remains to be decided by your custodian. Nas Choka scanned the officers and officials. Who is that to be? Sonama Seacoat, Skywalker said. Nas Choka stared at him in alarm. 
You would surrender us to our true enemy. The living world we tried to poison. The world where our amphistaffs slither away, our thud bugs take flight, our villops and doven basils turn to fruit. And yet you deny that we will be executed. Send us instead back to the intergalactic void, where we can at least die with dignity. Perhaps our biotes have something to teach us, Harar said. If they can overcome their conditioning, perhaps the warriors can. Words, Naschoka snapped, because the priests, shapers, and intendants have nothing to lose by imprisonment on the living world. We lose more than you know, Naschoka, Harar said sadly. We honor a tradition that cannot be altered. Harar stepped from behind the table to approach. You honor a much older tradition, Warmaster. One that began on the planet that was parent to Zonama Seacoat. Parent? Zonama Seacoat is our world, Warmaster. It is Yuzhan Tar. Nas Choka threw his head back and bellowed at the ceiling. Then we are truly defeated. He looked at Harar again. Was all this due to Shimra, priest? Were our wanderings nothing more than a ruse to return us to the world from which we were cast? Only the gods can answer that. Nas Choka narrowed his eyes. Do the gods reside there? In the sense that Sonama Seacoat incorporates all aspects of Yun Yuzhan, Yun Neshel, Yun Shuno. You make no mention of Yun Yamka. That one we concocted, Harar said, when we turned to war. Nas Choka snorted in disdain. I thought as much. You've been deceived, priest. The shamed ones proclaimed that the Jedi incorporated all aspects of the gods, and clearly they are not gods. He allowed his words to trail off, then said in a more controlled voice, on these matters, I speak only for myself. We are the defeated. Do with us what you will. But tell me, Jedi, is our imprisonment to endure in the shadow of your Coruscant as a constant reminder of our failure? Skywalker shook his head. Zonama Seacoat has no desire to remain in known space, risking reverence, exploitation, or both. Zonama Seacoat will return to the unknown regions, where it has knowledge of a star system that, over time, could be colonized by the Yuzhan Vong. That is, once Zonama Seacoat and the Yuzhan Vong have become reacquainted. What of our childbearers and offspring? They will also find a new home on Zonama Seacoat. And the shamed ones? The heretics? They will need little persuading, Harar answered, On Zonama Seacoat, our society will be able to redefine itself, without the need to abandon completely its core beliefs. Nas Choka's broad forehead wrinkled. His gaze lingered on Saab and Krefe, on Cal Omus and Luke Skywalker. This seems a curious leniency. We haven't yet stated all our terms, Krefe said sharply. Nas Choka folded his arms across his chest. Then do so. Villops have been relaying the news of Shimra's death to occupied worlds throughout the invasion corridor. Some of your commanders have left. Others remain entrenched. We don't want to have to liberate each and every one of them at the cost of additional lives. Nas Choka nodded. I will summon them to Coruscant. Those who refuse, we will help you hunt down and kill. He held Crefe's baleful stare. State the rest of your terms, Admiral. We demand that your shapers assist in the reconstruction of Coruscant by persuading the world brain to reverse some of the changes it wrought. Nas Choka almost smiled. Will it not trouble you, Admiral, to know that a Yuzhan Vong Duryam rests at the center of your galaxy? Crefe sniffed. Consider it, Warmaster. The Foundation, 
for an enduring compromise. Chapter 44 In the weeks that followed the summit on Raal Roost, Luke spent endless hours walking through the Boris forests, sometimes with Mara when she and Lobaka weren't effecting repairs to Jade Shadow, but more often on his own, roaming and reflecting, the hood of his cloak raised against the cold, and his hands thrust deeply into the opposite sleeves. His body seemed to have struck a compromise with the traces of venom that were still circulating through his bloodstream, but his mind was still struggling to find a similar balance. Sometimes he would confront voids in the Force where there shouldn't have been any, and at other times the Force would seem to expand infinitely around him, heightening his perceptions beyond all expectation, or surprising him with prolonged visions of possible futures. For a brief time during the summit on Raal Roost, he had been able to perceive Nas Choka and Harar with the same clarity Jason described when he spoke of his Vong sense. Cal Omis and the Alliance leadership had expressed their gratitude to the Jedi for finding a practical solution to the war. But now that the terms of surrender had been ratified and the Yuzhan Vong had been disarmed, the Alliance had ceased asking Luke for advice or assistance. The reconstruction of Coruscant had commenced with a great deal of fanfare, in conjunction with a grand memorial service for Admiral Akbar, and the inauguration of a new holonet. Jason had traveled to Coruscant to confer with the Yuzhan Vong shapers, who had been entrusted with mapping out an accord with the world brain. Initially the Doryam was averse to tampering with any of its creations, but thanks to Jason, it had agreed to allow the Alliance to excavate the sacred precinct, with an eye toward restoring those new Republic structures that had survived. In the course of the excavations, vast amounts of serviceable technology had been discovered. But it would be decades before Coruscant would be suitable for anyone other than structural engineers and construction droids. Until then, the Galactic Alliance government was to be headquartered at Denon, a heavily populated inner rim world that had risen to prominence during the Old Republic era and, more important, had escaped bombardment or occupation by the Yuzhan Vong. Nas Choka had succeeded in recalling many, but not all of his commanders, from occupied worlds. Every few days, word would reach Zonama Seacoat of a costly skirmish in one star system or another. On Coruscant, too, many commanders had surrendered, though rumors persisted, and would probably continue to persist, of bands of Yuzhan Vong warriors hiding out in the dense temperate forests of the Northern Hemisphere. Instead of returning to normal, the galaxy was slowly changing. Having been crowned a hero, even by his own Bothans, Admiral Triest Crefe had assumed the rank of Supreme Commander of Alliance Forces following the unexpected resignation of Seen Sav. Diff Scour, the impetus behind Alpha Red, was also gone, gently forced into early retirement by Cal Omis, and replaced as Director of Intelligence by Belindi Kalenda. Omis had assured Luke that all stores of the bioweapon had been destroyed, along with the genetic blueprint itself, since there were many who felt that the Alliance had been too compassionate with the enemy. Several species that had endured the brunt of the invasion were still demanding that the entire warrior caste be executed, an act of reprisal even Omis might have sanctioned were it not for Nas Choka's steadfast willingness to oblige. Still, no one wanted to risk a sudden recanting by the Warmaster, so immediately following the summit, all Yuzhan Vong warriors had been transferred to the bellies of several star destroyers and troop transports, and the vessels that had comprised the mighty alien armada had been launched into Coruscant's sun, carrying with them all weapons of war. On Zonama Seacoat, repair work to the cliff dwellings and other damaged structures continued day and night. The Pharaohans were nonplussed by Seacoat's willingness to bestow half of Zonama on the species that had tried to destroy it. But except for a few of the younger Pharaohans who had decided to depart, most of the indigenous population had simply resigned themselves to Seacoat's decision. 
Luke had been awaiting an opportunity to gather all the Jedi in one place, and was finally able to do that when Errant Venture returned to Zonama Seacoat, bearing the children and other Jedi from the Maw. He gave everyone a day to mingle and catch up, then requested that everyone assemble at the forest clearing where the first coral skippers had been brought to ground. In groups of three and four, the Jedi arrived until all were present, including Luke, Mara, Markra Mejiv, Kean Farlander, Tam Azar Jamin, Octa Ramus, Trasina Lobi, Kent Hamner, Silgal, Kip Duran, Klin Fagai, Tanel Ka, Madurin, Streen, Jason, Jaina, Cam and Tion Solusar, Zek, Lobaka, Saba and Tisar Sebatine, Izal Waz, Corin Horn, Kirana Tai, Tekli, Alima Rar, Kyle Katarn, Waxarn Kel, Tresk Imnal, One Ton, Hivrech Wal Cheklev, Tyria Sarkin and Doran Sarkin Tainer, Tahiri Vela, Sana, and the children, including Ben, Valen, Jaisela, and some twenty others. When everyone was settled, Luke stepped to the center of the large circle his friends and comrades had formed. Several of the children sat cross-legged on the loamy soil, others atop the grounded coral skippers. Ben sat contentedly on Mara's lap. The Yuzhan Vong will begin arriving in the coming weeks, Luke began, pacing while he spoke. The first collaborative act between them and Seacoat will be to restore the southern hemisphere forests, which were incinerated by the original reconnaissance team fifty years ago. By working with the Boris, the Yuzhan Vong will gradually get to know Zonama, and at the same time, Seacoat will gradually get to know the Yuzhan Vong. Their acceptance by Seacoat will constitute a second chance for a species that nearly doomed itself to extinction. He stopped momentarily. Now that we finally know what the Force wanted for the Yuzhan Vong, it's time to ask what the Force wants for us. He gestured to his nephew. Jason has already accomplished more than any of us could to speed the rebuilding of Coruscant, and I don't see it as our duty to devote ourselves entirely to shoring up the Galactic Alliance, as it takes its first wobbly steps toward becoming a true coalition. Our mandate to safeguard peace and justice remains, but we have to be wary of any who attempt to define peace and justice by their own terms. Should that happen, our mandate may require us to transcend the jurisdiction of any central government. I suppose we could consider initiating our own reconstruction efforts at Yavin 4, but I don't see much purpose in that task, either, since the days of the Jedi Praxium are behind us. Yavin 4 had its place, but there are countless worlds where the Force is strong, and any one of them can serve as a kind of academy. Luke gestured to Cam Solusar. Cam has suggested that we give thought to relocating to Asus, and I'm inclined to agree with him. But the real territory we're compelled to explore is the unifying force, as a step toward implementing a new Jedi Order. Luke fell silent for a long moment as he paced across the circle and back again. On Ithor, I surrendered guardianship of the Jedi. That doesn't mean that I can't still serve as a mentor and guide to some of you. Yoda instructed me to pass on what I have learned, and I mean to do just that. But others here are as equipped as I am to teach, and I encourage them to do so, should they choose to pursue that path. But here's what I wish to say to all of you. If I have learned anything from the events of the past five years... It is that the Force is more all-embracing than I ever realized. Light and dark do not always stand opposed, but mingle with each other in curious ways. More important, the Force seems to have a will, and it's when we're acting against the will of the Force that we can get into trouble. Anger by itself is not of the dark side, unless it is accompanied by a desire to dominate. When we act in harmony with the will of the Force, we disappear into it. 
when we struggle against it, we not only sever our ties with the Force, but also feed the needs of chaos. The evolution of sentience reflects the constant movement between those two poles. Evil, the dark side, won't be eradicated until it has been discarded as an option for acquiring power, subjugating would-be opponents, or offsetting feelings of anger, envy, or exclusion. Where victims of injustice exist, the dark side finds initiates. That is the cycle our actions are meant to forestall, and in this battle, the Force is both our ally and our guardian. We serve it best by listening to its will and serving the good with our every action, by personifying the Force. But I'm no longer convinced that we're meant to police the galaxy. For one thing, we're too few in number. That was made evident early in the war, and it's likely to hold true for whatever conflicts erupt in the coming years. The Jedi began as a meditative order. Our forebears believed that they could balance light and dark by remaining always in the Force, and thereby perfecting themselves. Gradually, however, as the Supreme Chancellors appealed to the Order time and again for advice in resolving disputes, the Jedi became adjuncts of the Old Republic, then marshals and warriors, taking it upon themselves to uphold the peace, and little by little being drawn away from the Force and into the mundane. I don't propose that we place ourselves in seclusion and pass our days meditating on the Force, though that might be the path for some of us but I do advocate attuning ourselves to the longer view and reaching out to others who seek to serve the Force. The genetic makeup of each and every one of us augments our ability to tap the Force, but everyone, regardless of his or her genetics, has the potential to use the Force to one degree or another. Perhaps not to move rocks and take giant strides, but in some sense those physical powers are little more than surface effects. The real powers are more subtle, for they involve adhering to the true path, avoiding the temptation to dominate, sacrificing oneself for those who have less, and living impeccably, by recognizing that the force doesn't flow from us, but through us, ever on the move. Luke scanned the Sea of Faces. Like our damaged galaxy, the new Jedi Order will require generations to define itself. Some of us have already committed to the roles we will play in that process. Kip, Silgal, Saba, Kenth, Trasina, and I will continue to serve on Cal Omas' advisory council and be the voice of the Force. He glanced at the tall Anks Jedi. I know that Madurin has decided to remain in service to Supreme Commander Kreefay and Kian Farlander and that Tenel Ka will return to the Hapes Consortium. Kirana Tai, Damaya, and Streen have much work to do on Dathomir, and Cam, Tion, and several others are eager to go to Asis. Again his gaze swept around the circle. As for the rest of you, I ask only that you give deep thought as to how you might best serve the Force. With the lifting of Seacoat's stricture regarding warships on Zonama's surface, the western rim of the middle-distance canyon had become a landing and launch zone. The Millennium Falcon was parked there, as was Jade Shadow, along with the few Seacotan fighters and the several shuttles that had carried the Jedi adults and children from errant venture. Dressed in a black, sin-fleece jacket, stylish trousers, a rakish cap, and fingerless gloves, Lando meandered with design among the ships, spotting Han at last, seated at a table with Talon, Booster, and Krev Bombasa, in an open-fronted shed built of Seacoton lamina. The three men were as bundled up as Lando was, and their amiable laughter rode out on short-lived breath clouds. Where is everybody? Lando asked when he joined them. This place is as quiet as a convention of devils. Big meeting in the Boris. Han said offhandedly. Lando grinned and prized a bottle of expensive Corellian brandy from his coat pocket. Perfect time for us to warm our bones. Besides, there's just enough to go around. Han rubbed his bare hands together in anticipation. 
Wasn't I just saying that cantinas are in very short supply around here? Krev glanced around in weariness. Maybe you should keep your voice low, you know, in case someone's listening. Booster tugged at his beard. It is a little spooky, isn't it? Talon gazed at the canyon and the distant tree line. Now that you mention it. Lando put his hands on his hips and laughed. I doubt that Seacoat would begrudge us a toast or two. From the jacket's other pouch pocket, he extracted five tumblers. Lining them up on the table, he began to fill them with the aromatic amber liquid. So, what do you think Luke and the rest are talking about? Same thing that's on everyone's mind, Krebs said with theatrical seriousness. Han Solo. Han laughed with them, then raised his glass. I'll drink to that. The glass was almost to his mouth when a male voice said, Got enough for two party crashers? The five of them turned to see Wedge and Tycho hurrying toward them, sporting flight jackets and brimmed caps. With their customary sense of flawless timing, Han muttered. Reluctantly, Lando pulled two more tumblers from his pocket, filled them, and passed them down the table. Anyone else is going to have to provide his own glass. And brandy, Krebs said. Talon shook his head and sighed. I've yet to meet a military man who's actually willing to pay for a drink. Tycho snorted. I've never met one who has to pay. Wedge lifted his glass. I'll drink to that. They all took long sips, smacked their lips, and set the tumblers down. Anyway, Tycho continued, that's ex-military, as of tomorrow. Han raised an eyebrow. Skulking back into retirement, huh? Tycho shrugged. It's either that or winter leaves me. She must have been talking with Iella, Wedge said. It's a conspiracy. Han raised his glass again. To last flings. They sipped, then fell silent for a moment. Wedge fingered the tumbler through a circle. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm ready for the simple life again. The Alliance will just have to make do with guys like Dark Lighter, Page, and Kraken. Pity the Alliance, Tycho said. Han regarded the two of them and laughed. The familiar strains of midlife. Tycho jerked his thumb at Han without looking at him. This from a guy who refuses to go quietly into the void. Not true, Han said. It's the Falcon that keeps leading me into trouble. Booster nodded soberly. I'm beginning to think the same of errant venture. Next time, maybe you should choose a different shade of red, Talon said. They laughed and downed what remained in the glasses. Lando was quick to refill them, emptying the bottle. So what's next for you guys? Tycho asked the four members of the Smuggler's Alliance. We're waiting for the dust to settle, Talon said, and I don't mean the Yorick coral dust. Everything from here to Helska and back has been given a good shaking. A lot of groups that were at the top are suddenly at the bottom and the other way around. Who, for instance? Tycho said. Talon considered it briefly. Well, at the top you've got Bothans, chiefly because of Phalia's brave last stand and Crefay's heroic victory. But vying for second place are the Sullistans, Hapens, the former Imperials, the Mon Calamari. Who do you figure has fallen? Wedge asked. Everyone rimward of Wayland. Plus the Athorians, Bims, Kuwadi, Corellians. But more than anyone, the Huts. Lando nodded. A lot of folk were forced to do without spice during the war, and have lost their appetite for it. In fact, just about anyone who had regular dealings with the huts has lost credibility. The Rhodians, except for the jungle clans, Whiffids, Clatuinians, Weequays, Vodrans, Eotrans, Nikto, didn't help that a lot of them supported the Peace Brigade. They're the ones who should be brought to trial for war crimes, Booster said. They will be, Wedge said. Cal Omis has left the decision to individual worlds and systems. Who else is on the way up? Tycho asked. Corporate sector and tie-in hegemony, Talon said, without having to think about it. Just about every system rimward of Ariadu on the Rima and Veranat on the Trade Spine. 
Lando looked at Han. I'll tell you who's gained the most. Your friends, the Rin. Han sniffed. Figures Droma would come out of this smelling like a flower. He paused, then added, Of course, knowing Droma, he's somewhere saying the same about me. Yeah, Tycho said. We didn't think you could become a bigger hero than you already were, old man. Wedge smiled. Someday they'll raise a statue. Han held up his hands. I've already heard that one from Leia. Besides, every world, every system's contributed a hero to this war. He put his elbows on the table and leaned forward. I haven't told this to anyone, but I swear on the Falcon that I saw Fett at Kalula, and he did as much as anyone to try to save that station from the Vong. Lando was staring at him in disbelief. As in Boba? Of course, Boba. Running with a bunch of other guys in Mandalorian armor and jetpacks. He even managed to come up with a new fire spray. Talon touched his mustache. Well, I wasn't going to say anything. But I heard that that same bunch showed up to help liberate Ord Mantell. And Tholaton, Krev said. And Gindine, Booster added. Lando shook his head as if to clear it. Hey, if Pelion can be considered an ally, why not a former bounty hunter? Han glanced from Lando to Talon. You're the people that deserve statues. But I suppose that'll have to wait until Wolum Tser or someone does a hollow documentary about the Notorious Smugglers Alliance. That would be ex-Smugglers Alliance, Talon said. Han rolled his eyes. It's true, Han. We've mended our ways. Seen the light, Booster said. Come around, Krev added. Reformed, Lando said. Tycho looked around the table. Anyone want to add another cliché? How about gotten too old for this, Han said. Wedge nodded. That'll do. Han glanced at Lando and Talon again. What, Tendra and Shada are making honest men of you? Talon shook his head firmly. Shada and I are business partners. That's it. Lando grinned at Han. Hey, it was your wife who wrote the book on the subject. Everyone laughed, then raised their tumblers. To the war's true unsung heroes, Han said, the spouses. When he had set down his glass, he turned back to Lando. Seriously, Lando, what's the game plan? Let me put it this way with the need for so much rebuilding of worlds, governments, trading routes, and new markets opening in the Imperial Remnant, Chiss space, even parts of the unknown regions, there'll be no shortage of opportunities for people motivated more by philanthropy than profit. To our noble selves, Tycho said, toasting with the final sip. Few of us left. Finishing the drinks, the seven of them slammed the tumblers on the table. More by philanthropy than profit, Han repeated. Taking a deep breath, he leaned his crude chair away from the table and gazed about him. I swear, this crazy place is having an effect on everyone. I already know that Tahiri and Tekli want to return to the unknown regions with Zonama Seacoat, Jaina told Jason as they were returning from the meeting. Most of the Jedi were proceeding directly to the canyon, but the twins were taking the long way back to their temporary shelter on the cliffside. Techly believes she can learn a lot from the Yuzhan Vong shapers, assuming they're willing to teach her. And Tahiri, well, I think she just wants to explore more of the Yuzhan Vong side of her nature, of Rena. I know someone else who plans to remain here, Jason said. Danny, Jaina said. Jason nodded. Before the war, all that interested her was the search for an extragalactic species. But the only one she practically discovered single-handedly she knows only as an enemy. She told me she has as much to unlearn as learn. Is that going to be hard for you? Saying goodbye to her? I'm happy for her. He glanced at his sister. Anyway, I'll always know where to find her. I didn't think of that. Jaina became thoughtful for a moment, then said, 
Corin, Mirax, and the kids are going to Corellia for a while. You think Mom and Dad will go there? Jaina shook her head in uncertainty. I've no idea what those two have up their sleeves. But what about you, Jason? I know what I don't want to do. I don't want to be part of an order or a select group. I don't want to be looked to as the guiding light of the new fealty. And I don't want to be surrounded by students who will ask more of me that I can explain. Most of all, I don't want to be an object of fascination or admiration, because that'll only distract me from what I really need to learn. I don't have dreams of being a lightsaber master or an ace starfighter pilot, and I'm not on a campaign to change anyone or anything, except myself, maybe, just to clear away some of the confusion that's built up. You sound like Seacoat, Jaina said. She gestured broadly to the giant trees. You wouldn't want to stay here? Among all this? I can't, because every part of me is desperate to stay, and I'm worried that I'd never leave. So you're going to wander the galaxy or something? If that's where the Force leads me. But right now, I think I'd like to spend time among some of the other Force users. The Jansari, the Theron listeners, the Sunesi. Maybe even try to find out where the Falanasi disappeared to. Jason laughed, clearly at himself. Anakin's probably ridiculing me for even thinking of going on a quest for answers. He'd probably say that I'd do better just to plant myself under one of these Boris and wait for the answers to find me, instead of roving around trying to find them. His voice took on a note of sadness. I wish I could see him, Jaina. But I can perceive him. I carry him around with me, the way some people do a hollow locket. I regret so many of the arguments we had, and so many of the wrong-headed decisions I made, but they were the best I could manage at the time. It'd be easy to say I wished we'd never gone to Mirker, but if we hadn't gone, then none of us might have survived the Voxen. There would have been no one to find Zonama Seacoat, no chance for the Alliance or the Yuzhan Vong. It would have been a battle to the death, with no winners. Jaina kept silent until she was certain he was through. Anakin was such a special person that even now it doesn't seem fair that he should have been the one to die. I know that fairness has nothing to do with it, but I'll never get over his death, just the way he might never have been able to get over Chewie's death. I never had any real doubts that I'd survive the war. But my worst fear was that I'd survive without you, Mom, and Dad. I didn't want to live after Mirker, Jason. If you had died there, I don't think I could have gone on. I wouldn't have just become the Sword of the Jedi, but the Sword the Jedi would have been sorry they'd forged. I would have made the Kip who destroyed Kirita look like a simple scoundrel. Jason whistled in relief. What about Kip? Now that we have survived. I don't know, I really don't. He's been something of a mentor, in the same way Mara has. She brought her right forefinger and thumb close together. I thought for about this long that I could actually feel something for him, but falling in love with your mentor isn't a sane thing to do, because you're not really seeing the person. You're seeing the statue on the pedestal. You're worshipping the idea. The way Jag does with you? Jag doesn't worship me. Now that he's gotten to know you, you mean? Jaina smacked her brother on the arm. Even though you're right, the thing is, I don't want to be at the center of anything, either. I know that Uncle Luke and Aunt Mara would like to see me mentor some of the young students. Maybe even Ben. But Cam and Tion have bonded with the kids much better than I ever could. Anyway, I don't want to be too far from the action. She looked at Jason. I have too much of Mom and Dad in me to give up fighting for peace and justice. Especially now that you've gotten so good at it. Jaina snorted ruefully. That's the real problem, right? When it starts to come easy? You just have to avoid the killing part of it. Unfortunately, that's part of the Starfighter pilot job description. So find some other way to satisfy your need for speed and action. I hear pod racing's making a comeback. Jaina laughed heartily. It's in our blood, anyway. 
more than the military is. I mean, Dad just about got drummed out, Mom was a rebel, and our paternal grandparents were... What? Jana shook her head. I don't know. But some people say that important traits tend to skip a generation. Streaking a cloudless azure sky, a dozen ships of motley design and capability soared high over Zonama Seacoat and gradually disappeared from sight. Everyone's leaving, R2, C-3PO said in a wistful tone. They're returning to their homeworlds, or going in search of missing friends. Masters Lobaka, Sabatine, Katarn, Zek, and Azur Jaman, Mistresses Ra, Ramus, and Karana Tai. The children. I already missed them. Four days had passed since the Jedi gathering, and the two droids were standing on the simple terrace that fronted Luke and Mars' cliff dwelling in the middle distance. The Skywalkers were completing repair work on Jade Shadow, and Han, Leia, and the Nogri had gone to Coruscant on unstated business. R2-D2 chittered a short reply. Of course I realize that we'll be seeing everyone again, R2, but under very different circumstances. The astromech fluted in a long-suffering way, and C-3PO tilted his head to one side. You can be the most infuriating little droid. I am fully aware of my need to adapt to change. But that needn't interfere with my ability to express sadness over the closing of an era. R2-D2 issued a flurry of buzzes, zithers, and hoots. I know it was a war, you... you mechanic. And I also realized that it was a war that threatened our existence far more than any other war has. But that's precisely the point, because for a moment we became as valuable as they were. As often as they fought with us, they fought for us. R2-D2 made a more decorous reply. You're correct, R2. They do need us, but they need us in a good way. C-3PO listened for a moment, then said, A far more dangerous enemy? Who or what could possibly be more dangerous than the Yuzhan Vong. R2-D2 warbled. Obsolescence? After mulling it over, the protocol droid loosed what amounted to a sigh. Perhaps I am deluding myself. With all the advances that have been made in droid technology, I suppose we are in danger of being considered obsolete. But what are we to do, R2? Retirement isn't an option for us. We will continue as relics of a sort, passed along to new masters, until our parts can no longer be replaced, or until we suffer some irreparable system failure. Oh, it's all very bittersweet, I think is the proper word. R2-D2's response was a surprisingly cheery burst of squeaks and peeps. Do you really believe that life will remain as unpredictable as ever? and that our adventures will continue? I hope so, my little friend, even if they don't quite measure up to adventures we've had, and even if they are lacking a dash of the old enchantment. R2-D2 made a rasping sound. What do you mean I used to say that all the time? Just what are you going on about? C-3PO paused, then said, I don't mind at all that it's a long story. After all, R2, we have nothing but time. Chapter 45 Jagged Fell had been assigned to the starfighter team that escorted the Yuzhan Vong transports from Coruscant to Zonama Seacoat. Inside two star destroyers were the weaponless Yorick Trima that would shuttle the tens of thousands to their new home in the planet's southern hemisphere. The trackless forests were severely scarred as a result of the blight the Yuzhan Vong warriors had delivered to the surface fifty years earlier, but the first groups to arrive were already settled in the warmest valleys, and their minchils, damoteks, grashels, and creches appeared to have taken well to their new circumstances. From what could be seen at an altitude of twenty kilometers at any rate, though Alliance personnel were prohibited from landing, Jag had received special permission from General Farlander to pay a brief visit to the middle distance, ostensibly to speak with the Solos, but, in fact, to one Solo in particular. He hadn't spoken to Jaina since parting company with the Millennium Falcon following the pursuit of the Supreme Overlord's escape vessel. 
circumstances had made for a rushed and confused conversation. Jag had returned to Coruscant to regroup with Twin Sun Squadron and the Falcon, with the Solos and Skywalkers safely aboard, had jumped for Zonama Seacoat. In the long weeks that followed, he had been unsuccessful at contacting Zonama Seacoat through either the Millennium Falcon or Jade Shadow. When at last he had gotten through to Errant Venture, he'd learned that Jaina was still on the living world. Talon Card had promised to carry Jag's message to her. She was waiting for Jag on the Canyon Rim landing field when he set his claw craft down among a throng of peculiar vessels and climbed out into the cold air. Fat flakes of snow were falling, but those only made him feel more at home, for he was no stranger to frigid climates. Jaina was wearing some sort of natural fiber poncho and a cap of similar weave, with flaps that covered her ears. After an awkward moment of staring at each other, she grinned and hurried into his arms, hugging him tightly, then kissing him on both cheeks and once on the lips. If she hadn't let go, he might have gone on holding her right through Zonama Seacoat's return jump to the unknown regions. Twin sons leader, she said, stepping back to appraise him. He straightened his shoulders. Jealous? Maybe a little. Jag gazed at the strange, triple-lobed ships that surrounded the solitary X-Wing. Are these the Seacoatan fighters? Jaina followed his gaze. Yep. I don't suppose. Don't even ask, she cut him off. They're not for sale. She grabbed his hand and led him to a shelter that stood at the border of the field. On the way, they waved to Luke and Mara, who were loading supplies into Jade Shadow's cargo hold, young Ben toddling beside them. Jaina was still holding his hand when she said, Thank you for everything you did at Coruscant. Flying support for the Falcon and all. Mara told me she had to stop you from searching the Citadel for me. I might have disobeyed if the escape vessel hadn't launched. People are saying that you and Jason killed the Supreme Overlord. I don't remember a lot of what happened, but Jason and Luke were the ones who fought Chimra and Onimi. Snow frosted her cap and the tops of her shoulders. Her cheeks and nose were red with cold, and she looked radiant. Jaina, time is scarce so I'll come straight to the point. I'm returning to Scylla, and I want you to come with me. I know that my parents and my sister, Winsa, would love to meet you. Even though a light smile formed on her lips, the answer was in her eyes, and Jag felt as if he had been deflated. I'd love to see Scylla, really, but this isn't the right time. For Scylla, or for us... Her face wrinkled, and she took her lower lip between her teeth. Don't make this too hard on me, okay? It's your parents, isn't it? They hate the thought of you consorting with the son of a former Imperial. It goes against the Skywalker solo grain. She frowned. You're way off. After what you did for my father at Hapes, and all you've done since, they practically consider you family. And even if that was true... Do you think that would stop me from going with you? It's Kip, then. Wrong again. Jag beetled his brows. I don't understand. What's made you change your mind about us? She shook her head. I think it's good that you're going to Scylla. I need some time to work through everything that's happened, Jag. I love you, Jaina, he blurted. Jaina made her lips a thin line, then sighed and said... I love you, too. Someday I want a partner, and I want what my mom and dad have, and what Luke and Mara have. I intend to raise a family. I just want to be sure that I can offer my children more than what mom and Mara have been able to offer theirs. She reached for both his hands. I'm glad that we found each other, Jag. You made the worst time of my life a lot easier to bear. But now I'm still on the move. I'm still a Jedi and a fighter pilot. Do you understand? Even a little? Jag blew out his breath. As much as I don't wish to, I do understand. I'd love to be some kind of diplomatic envoy. Her eyes sparkled. I'll tell you a secret. One day, I want to have a seat on the advisory council, 
alongside Luke, Kip, Silgal, and the others. Maybe then we can think about something more permanent. Jag smiled broadly. Then our paths may just cross again sooner than you imagine. She looked at him askance. I don't think I'll be getting to Chiss space any time soon, Jag. You won't have to. I've been appointed by the CEDF as liaison to the Alliance. You? A diplomat? I can be very diplomatic when I need to be. Oh, I know that, all right, but... Just think about it. The two of us rendezvousing on fabulous worlds from one side of the galaxy to the other. Jaina's eyes narrowed in delight. You know, that doesn't sound half bad. Gently, he pulled her back into his arms and lowered his voice. I'll work hard at making our encounters nothing short of wonderful. Jaina laughed. Maybe there is a touch of scoundrel in you after all. They kissed passionately while the snow continued to fall. Five years ago, at the signing of the Accord between the Imperial Sector and the New Republic, we met aboard your ship, Captain Solo and Princess Leia, Gillard Pelion said. Now I have the honor of your being aboard my vessel at the start of a new era. We're the ones who are honored, Admiral, Leia said. White-haired and mustachioed Pelion was attired in a pure white uniform, and Leia and Han were wearing the best of the few outfits they had left to their names. The three of them were in the Grand Admiral's spacious and elegantly appointed quarters, on the starboard side of Right to Rule's command tower. Beneath the viewport, an exquisitely carved table was spread with bowls of food and flasks of fine liquor. In stationary orbit above Coruscant, the flagship of the Imperial fleet was central to a group of other Star Destroyers, which themselves comprised only a part of the Alliance flotilla that remained in deep space anchor. The Falcon, with Cockmame and Miwal inside, sat conspicuously in the docking bay of the huge vessel amid Thai defenders and bombers. When do you plan to return to Bastion space? Han asked, sipping from his drink. Within a standard day, Captain, which is why I was pleased to learn that you were available to visit with me on such short notice. Eager to get back to your garden? Leia asked. If time permits, I will have much to do convincing some of the moths of the wisdom of participating openly in the Alliance. I never took the time to marry and raise a family. But I have my garden, and I tend to that as I might have my children. I may even allow a bit of randomness, a bit of nature to enter, and stay my hand from culling the weak and unfit from the rose. Han laughed shortly. A little disorder never hurt. It never seemed to hurt you, Captain Solo. That's only cause Turmoil and me reached an accord a long time ago. Well, perhaps I'll attempt to do the same. Pelion moved to the viewport that looked out on Coruscant. In any event, I never realized how much I missed the Corps, and Coruscant in particular. Returning here after so long a time, even under such circumstances, has made me reflect on my career, and on all the events that have ensued since the Battle of Endor. He turned from the view to look at Han and Leia. I feel that you have been instrumental in giving me back something I had lost, and I want to do the same for you. Leia smiled graciously. That's really not necessary, Admiral. Pelion waved his hand in dismissal. It's just a little something. Lifting a remote control from the table, he aimed the device at a screen, which folded against the cabin's inner bulkhead to reveal the object he had been saving as a surprise. It was a moss painting by the late Alderanian artist Ob Kador, depicting a tempestuous sky sweeping over a city of pinnacles, and in the foreground a line of insectoid figures representing the vanished species that had inhabited Alderaan prior to human colonization. Leia stared, speechless. And we thought you just wanted to give us another hyperspace comm antenna, Han said in astonishment. 
Killick Twilight had once hung outside Leia's bedroom in House Organa on Alderaan. At the time of the planet's destruction by the Death Star, the moss painting had been presumed destroyed, but in fact it had been returning to Alderaan as part of a traveling museum exhibit. Hidden within the painting's moisture control apparatus was the key to a vital Rebel Alliance spy code, which had continued to be used in the post-galactic Civil War years to communicate with agents deep inside Imperial-held territory. Four years after the Battle of Endor, when the painting had suddenly surfaced and been put up for auction on Tatooine, Han and Leia, recently married, had attempted to retrieve it. After changing hands several times, however, Ob Kador's apocryphal work had ended up aboard the Chimera, in the possession of none other than Grand Admiral Thrawn, whose collection of priceless artworks was already extensive. Aside from being an emotional link to Leia's childhood with her adoptive parents, the painting had added significance for both her and Han. Kador's execution of the Killicks left their reaction to the approaching darkness open to interpretation. Where Leia had seen the Killicks as running from the darkness, Han had seen the insectoid race as turning toward the storm. He had interpreted the painting as an admonition that darkness could be defeated by meeting it squarely and shattering it with light. And when Leia had ultimately accepted Han's view... It had allowed her to reconcile her ongoing confliction over the fact that Anakin Skywalker, her actual father, and Darth Vader had been one and the same person. In turn, the reconciliation had allowed her to emerge from the shadow of the Sith Lord and decide to have children. Gilad, Leia said at last, I can't tell you how much this means to me. Pelion smiled. It is one of the few pieces of Thrawn's collection that survived, and I thought that you, of all people, should have it. Han put one arm around Leia's shoulders and extended the other to Pelion. I know just where to hang it, he told Leia as he was pumping the Admiral's hand. Leia raised her eyes to his. Hang it? Han, we don't even have a home, unless you mean... He nodded. Our cozy cabin space on the Falcon, right over the bunk. Jade Shadow was the last ship to launch from Zonama Seacoat with Mara, Luke, Ben, and R2-D2 aboard. Mara took the craft to a distance of 300,000 kilometers, then cut the sublight engines and swung her about to face the living world. Luke ducked into the cockpit, leading Ben by his tiny hand, with the astromech trailing slightly behind. No sooner had Mara swiveled her chair around than Ben climbed into her lap. Won't be long now, she said. Luke nodded and sat down. I'll calm them. Seven weeks had passed since the surrender. For all intents and purposes, the transfer of the Yuzhan Vong had been completed, though several dozen remained on Coruscant, and fighting continued in some of the more remote star systems. Their presence lingered also in the form of countless Dovan Basil mines, and in the refugees that crowded nearly every spaceport, and most tragically of all in husks of the worlds the invaders had crisped, poisoned, and altered beyond recognition. A reply to Luke's hollow transmission finally arrived. He had left the comm unit in Danny's care, but it was a diminutive and noisy image of Magister Jabitha that resolved above the cockpit's projector, and the voice of Seacoat who spoke through her. Farewell, Skywalker, Seacoat said. With the Jedi in the known regions, and myself in the unknown, we may eventually succeed in making this galaxy whole. We'll do our part, Seacoat, Luke said. We're greatly indebted to you. There can be no debt when we serve the same design, Skywalker. May the Force be with you. And with you, Seacoat. Gazing at something outside the hollow field, Jabitha said, I give you to your comrades. And shortly an image of Harar appeared. I leave today by airship for the far side of the planet, the priest said. 
it will be interesting to see what becomes of my people. Our challenge will be to keep from giving vent to the warrior instincts we cultivated over the generations, and refrain from making war on ourselves, as we did during the transit of the intergalactic void. That transit brought you home, Luke said. The priest returned a tentative nod. When all you Jean Vong have accepted that, then our circle will be closed. I hope that you will visit us, Master Jedi. In time, Luke said, until then, you have our envoys. Tahiri, Danny, and Tekli crowded into the field. Goodbye, Luke, they said in unison. Goodbye, Mara. Goodbye, Ben and R2. Ben buried his face in Mara's chest, and R2 whimpered and rocked from side to side on his treaded feet. Tekli, have the Shapers agreed to allow you to study with them? Mara asked. The Chadra Fan nodded. I'll be traveling with Harar. What about Danny and Tahiri? Luke said. Who do you think's piloting Harar's airship? Danny said. Tahiri, Luke said, I'd like you to make it a priority to locate Widowmaker. I will, Master, she said. Mara looked sad. It's not too late to change your minds and come with us. Oh, but they have to remain here, Jabitha interrupted. Someone is going to have to succeed me as Magister. Perhaps some three. Luke smiled in understanding. Have a safe jump. The Pharaohans have their shelters, Jabitha said. The Yuzhan Vong theirs. The jump will go well. The transmission ended abruptly. Luke gazed out the viewport to see engines flare to life across Zonama Seacoast's northern hemisphere, their intense plasma cones propelling the planet slowly, majestically, out of the cold orbit it had adopted. It struck him that the planet had never looked more enchanting. It glowed in the star-strewn blackness like some finely wrought orb of glass. Instinctively, Luke reached out to grab hold of the console. She's leaving, a familiar voice said. She's leaving, he repeated aloud. She, Mara said. Luke looked at her. Obi-Wan's words, not mine. The stars around Zonama Seacoat's circumference appeared to withdraw, then rebound. An enduring melancholy settled over Luke like a shroud, and he experienced a sudden and profound void in the Force. A wail from Ben brought him back to himself. The child was struggling in Mara's arms, stretching out toward the viewport as if to reach for the vanishing planet itself. Don't cry, sweetie, Mara comforted him. We'll visit some day. Luke stroked his son's head and glanced at Mara. He's meant to be there. One of a handful of worlds along the rimward edge of the invasion corridor to have survived attack or occupation, the Wookiee homeworld of Kashyyyk looked even more lush now than it had before the war began. Many of its tall, furred denizens had served in the war as soldiers, technicians, and couriers, but most had returned to their festive planet and had been rejoicing almost continuously since Zonama Seacoat had carried the frightful enemy from known space. Millennium Falcon and Jade Shadow had arrived only the previous day and sat side by side on landing platform Thys, the fire-blackened stump of an enormous Rochure tree, close to the village of Ruwak Rora. Having passed the night in the treetop community, the Solos and the Skywalkers, along with their faithful droids, had trekked to the massive fallen branch where a memorial for Chewbacca had been held several years earlier, though not to the day. Accompanying them were many of the Wookiees who had attended the somber remembrance, including Chewie's father, a Tichacuck, his sister, Auburn-furred Calibo, his widow, Malatobuck, and their son, Waru, Ralra, who could speak basic, and Dulanamapia, Gorlin, Jowdrill, and Drianta. As on that day, fog swirled in the upper branches of the giant trees, 
and a cool wind stirred the leaves and kashii vines. In homage to the late Chewbacca, a celebrated Wookiee artisan had carved a portrait of Chewie into the trunk of one of the trees that supported the fallen branch. Han stood before the likeness, speaking as if directly to his former first mate and closest friend. You can relax now, pal, he was saying. It's finally over. We fought the good fight and won. And for me, anyway, it was you who set the tone. Your sacrifice at Cern Padal was symbolic of the whole war, with millions giving their lives to save family, friends, people they didn't know, members of species they'd never seen before, even droids. Thank you for that, Chewie, and for giving Anakin the extra time he needed to fulfill his own destiny. I'll never forget you. Tears running down his cheeks, he turned to Luke, who had brought something that had been discovered by a demolition crew near the remains of the Citadel on Coruscant. It was Anakin's lightsaber, which Tahiri had dropped while helping carry Luke to the Falcon. Han and Leia hadn't planned to leave the lightsaber with Chewie until the moment when the Falcon had put down on Thys. Hefting the hilt, Han looked at gray-muzzled Ralra. You sure the branch won't mind? Aged Ralra shook his head. It won't. Han got a two-handed grip on the handle as one might a staff so that the blade would point straight down. Activating it, he raised it over his head, then drove it down almost vertically into the flattened area of the fallen limb. The tip of the energy blade struck the hardwood and began to burn through, producing a rich, fragrant smoke. And when it had burned a hole deep enough to bury four or so centimeters of the pommel itself, Han switched it off so that the handle stuck fast in the limb. Luke stepped forward. Should the need ever arise, it can be withdrawn by someone as virtuous as yourself, Chewbacca. One by one, the rest of them advanced to cover the area with leaves and vines. Then they all returned to Urwakrora and spent the rest of the day indulging in the feast of food and drink the Wookiees had prepared. By the time the sun was setting, the wind had picked up and the chimes were tingling without let-up. Like the light, the laughter, too, was dying down, and Han noticed that Luke had become introspective. "'You okay?' Han asked. Luke smiled lightly. Just thinking that it seems like yesterday, we set out to find a place where you and Leia could take a vacation, and Mara could cure herself of the illness no Manor gave her. Han nodded. And the day before that, when you and I met in a cantina on Tatooine. Luke looked at him. You've lost a son and a best friend, and the Jedi have been reduced by half their number but the galaxy is more unified than it has been in generations. The years since the conclusion to the Civil War seem like an unavoidable period of transition to a present that no longer rings with uncertainty. There's a lot of things I'd probably do differently, Han said, but I'm not complaining. It can be a fresh start, providing I can keep your sister from getting involved in politics. And providing I can keep you from adventuring, Leia interjected. Han gestured to himself in false innocence. Hey, I don't have the time for adventuring. I've got a ship to rebuild, practically from the framework up. How many rebuilds will that make? Luke asked. Han grinned with secret knowledge. More than you know. Where are you going to perform this rebuild? Mara asked. We checked out Denon. Leia started to say. But it's not for us, Han completed. Corellia? Luke asked. Han shook his head. Not the place it was. Han wants to go to the corporate sector, Leia said. We're long overdue for celebrating our twentieth wedding anniversary, and I know some worlds there. He allowed his words to trail off, shook his head, and began to smile. Luke and Mara traded knowing glances. What would you say to having Mara, Ben, and me as company? Luke said. We're supposed to meet with Cam and some of the others on Asis, but that's not for a couple of weeks. 
Asus, Hans said. Why, that's practically next door to the corpse sack. No two ways about it. You've got to join us. We promise not to get in the way, someone said in Shri Wook. Han glanced to his right to see Waru and Lobaka approaching him. Now that the war has ended, Chewie Sun continued, Loi and I will be assuming my father's life debt to you. Han's jaw dropped and his eyes went wide. But we're going on a vacation, and we finally managed to convince Kok Mame and Miwal to take one themselves. No one said a word until Leia broke the silence with an explosive chuckle, then out loud laughter, which Luke, Mara, Jason, Jaina, Ben, and the Wookiees were quick to amplify. Han tightened his lips and sent a scowl around the table. Then he too began to laugh, warmly and continuously, until tears were streaming down his cheeks and his side started to ache. And gradually their bittersweet laughter floated from the wooden table, up past the lanterns, the wind chimes, and the thick branches from which they dangled, meandering up through the crowns of the tallest rochure trees, and gliding weightless into the twilight sky, up, ever up into stars too numerous to count, defying the stillness of vacuum and dispersing, vectoring out across space and time as if destined to be heard in galaxies far, far away.